Good evening. This is Sergeant X. They say that ghosts and the like just don't exist. That when a person passes on, he just lies quietly, not bothering another soul, so to speak. You believe that, don't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, did you ever hear about the skull that walked? No? Then listen, my friends, to the Mystery Playhouse. I guess uh, superstition is a pretty hard thing to down completely, isn't it? I mean, uh, under certain circumstances, almost anybody can get the creeps and get them good. I guess most of us are a little bit afraid of the unknown. For instance, uh, taking a midnight stroll through a graveyard isn't exactly your idea of fun, is it? And I don't suppose you'd particularly go into ecstasies if you happen to witness a good gory murder, either. Well, there's a fellow I know who thinks this all comes under the heading of good, clean fun. His hobby is horror, and he likes to tell stories along those lines. I think he has one for you right now. Wait till I try this door here. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is... Raymond, your host. Well, come in, won't you? Yes, how are your spirits this evening? Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Our spirits are fine, too. Would you like to see them? Oh, it's no trouble at all. Now, um, which would you care to see first? The spirit or the body? Oh, well, the body is right over there on the floor. And the spirit is right next to it. Oh. Oh, you can't see it. I forgot to tell you, you have to be one in order to see one. (laughs) Shall we get started? Well, naturally. Now, uh, turn out the lights. No, no, you won't see any ghosts in the dark, but... (laughs) I'll be able to see you. (laughs) Far from town, there are a group of three hills. On the summit of the highest of them is the Cruz estate, owned by two brothers, Arthur and Carl. At this moment, Carl and his wife, Lucille, are digging a hole at the entrance of the estate, planting young poplar trees. Carl, I think it's deep enough. Oh, I think we ought to go a little deeper down. Oh, here comes Spears. Spears, you, you're digging? Yes, we're going to plant a whole row of Lombardy poplars. Mm-hmm. You you mean right here? Yep. We're going to line both sides of the road. Well, perhaps you'd better let me do it. I, I'm your caretaker. I should do the gardening. Oh. Spears, you look upset. What's the matter? Well, where you're digging is an old Indian burial spot. There's a curse on it. Oh, don't worry about it, Spears. You don't believe it? Of course not. Lucille and I don't go in for superstition. Yes, but it's no superstition, sir. It's uh... You hit a rock. Uh-huh. Oh, I... That sounds like a rock. It's a little hollow. Dig it up, whatever it is. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, it's a skull. Yes. A skull. Well, Spears is right. This place must have been an old Indian burial oh, ground. Please put it back. No, I'll keep it. Carl. Perhaps you'd better put it back. Please, please bury it again, Mr. Cruz. It will bring bad luck to all of us. No, Spears, that's just a silly silly superstition. Well, uh, what about the rest of the skeleton? Well, well, there doesn't doesn't seem to be one. No, just a skull. Uh, uh, You bring it into the house, will you, Spears? uh, I'd rather not. All right, I'll take it in myself. Don't either of you mention this to my brother, Arthur. He's terribly scared of things like this, and he's just gotten over his nervous breakdown. Carl, perhaps you should put the skull back. Why, Lucille, you're not being taken in by this hokum about curses, are you? Oh, that that sounded like my wife, Mary. She was cleaning the windows. Good heavens. She fell 
fell out of the window. Mary. 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 Well, she's unconscious. Please do something. You must do something. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do, Spears. She hit her head against a rock. She's dead. How, Spears? He's quieted down. I can't understand it. There's only one rock underneath the window, and Mary hit that. That one rock. There isn't even a pebble around for yards. Well, don't go imagining things again, Arthur. Spears kept talking about a curse. Spears believes in pixies and gremlins, too, don't forget. Well, I feel rather funny about it all. Oh, Carl, maybe you'd better switch some more lamps on. This living room feels gloomy. Oh, let's cut this nonsense out. Wait. You hear anything? Oh? No, I don't. Yes. I think it's coming from the ceiling. What's coming from the ceiling? I don't hear... What is it? It must be the beams. I sometimes do that from the heat. It's not the beams. It's too regular a sound. What room is directly above us? It's, it's an old bedroom. We use it as a storeroom now. It hasn't been opened in years. There's something up there. Well, of course there is. A lot of old things from years back, Lucille. Did you put the skull in the score of the room? Yes. Yes, I did. What are you two whispering of... Coming down the stairs. We'll take a look and settle this. So far. <gasps> look at your feet, Carl. The skull. How, how, how did it get down here? It came down the steps. Seems to be looking up at us. A skull. How, how did it get into the house? Carl found it while digging. Spears said it belonged to some Indian. Spears was right. There is a curse on the house. We'll all be killed. I'm leaving. I can't stand it. Well, Carl, what are you going to do with the skull? Well, lock it up in the closet. Lock it. Carl, you'd better bury it again. No, I... I can't do that, Lucille. If I do, it means I believe in all this tummy rot about ghosts. Well, then suppose you tell me how a skull could open a door and then come bouncing down the steps. I don't know. Maybe someone's playing a trick on us, dear. What happened to Mary was no trick, Carl. Nor is this, and you know it. Well, whatever it is, I I'm not going to bury it. We'll keep it locked up in the closet. Oh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, yes. What is it, Spears? Well, it it isn't my place to tell you, sir, but I... You're referring to the skull, aren't you? Yes, sir. Well, it won't bother us anymore. The whole thing's some queer trick. I've got it safely hidden in this closet. I'm putting a lock on the outside. But the lock isn't going to do any good, sir. It will break through the door, just like the last time. I don't think anything like that can happen again. I'm the only one that has a key to this lock. If the skull wants to break out, you will have to come to me for the key. <laughs> How are you feeling, Arthur? I'll never feel right in this house again. Oh, nonsense. Why don't you put a light on? Arthur, it's, it's morbid sitting here in the dark by yourself. We're all going to die. Don't be ridiculous, Arthur. Where is the skull? Where it can't get out. Tomorrow I'll take it into town and let the police look at it. Tomorrow will be too late. Look, I... I'm getting tired of this. You've got to get hold of yourself, Arthur. You, you'll go completely to pieces. You think I'm a coward, don't you? Oh, Arthur, no. Well, you're not a coward. You're just a victim of your own exaggerated imagination. Wait. There's someone at the door. I'll open it. Who is it? I... I don't know. No one came in. Something came in. For heaven's sake, put the light on. The skull. I, I can't believe it. You can't believe it. <laughs> there it is, grinning at you from the floor, but you can't believe it. You don't believe in these things. I, I, I put a lock on the door. Locks aren't going to help. 
Nothing is going to help. We're all going to die. It's, uh, it's an hour later now. Arthur has gotten over his hysteria, but he is still terrified. I'm not going to spend another night in this house, Carl. But, Arthur, there's got to be some logical explanation. I'm not in the least bit curious. I just want to get out of here tonight. I'm going to go with him, Carl. Lucille. Well? Perhaps we'll bury it again. We'll put it back in the same place we found it. That won't do any good. It's too late now. Don't be ridiculous. If it wants anything at all, it wants to get buried again. I'm sure all this mysterious business will come to an end as soon as we bury it. The house won't ever be the same. Oh, stop it. Both of you. You're acting like a couple of scared children. We'll put the skull back where we found it, and, and we won't be bothered by it anymore. Spears! Spears! Uh, yes, Mr. Cruz? This, this skull. Let's take it out and bury it in the same place where we found it. Oh, I'm glad you reconsidered, sir. It's the only way. I don't seem to remember the spot. Well, it's on the other side, sir, right near the entrance road. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, sir. Here it is. Yeah. But the hole we dug, it's not here. I I filled it in, sir. Oh, well, we'd better dig it up. Yes, sir. If you'll hold the skull, I'll dig it open. We might as well do it right. I know exactly how deep it was. If you don't mind, Miss Cruz, I'd rather not touch the skull. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's about right. There. Now we'll put the thing back. Well, it it doesn't seem to want to go back. Oh, I just missed dropping it into the hole. Uh, hold the fire side down here. Yes, sir. Well, that does it. Oh, I hope we'll have no more trouble. Well, Carl, did you bury it? Yes, same place. That's all. Forget about it, shall we? Maybe it's easy for you, Carl. But I won't forget about it for a long time. Neither will I. I'll be having nightmares about it for months. I don't know what's gotten into you, Lucille. You were never easily frightened. I'm not. But skulls that roll by themselves give me a funny feeling. Mm. Well, uh, look, come on, let's play cards, huh? Hearts? We don't need more than three hands to play. We'll forget the whole crazy business, huh? Okay? Well, I might as well. All right. Deal the cards. Okay. You. Yeah. Oh, well, we're getting back to normalcy, huh? Arthur, pass your card. That wind came up suddenly. Who's first? You are, I see. Oh, all right. Uh, nine of diamonds. Your go, Arthur. Come on, Arthur, throw a card. I think I hear something. Of course you do. The wind. No, I... I thought I heard a rapping sound. Look, just pay attention to the game and stop listening for sounds. Here's my card. You threw a club, diamonds, the suit. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Arthur. Did you hear that? What was that? It's only the wind blowing the shutter. Oh, come on, let's play. Throw a card, Arthur. There's someone at the door. It isn't the wind. Someone's outside. All right, I'll open the door. No, no don't open it. Please, Lucille. Sitting here frightened isn't going to do us any good. We've got to open the door. Don't open it, Carl. Who is it, Carl? What? It, it was it, nothing. It's just the wind. You're lying. Your face is white as a sheet. I know. It's the skull. It's come back. I, I tell you, it's nothing. It, it, just the wind. Nobody was there. I'll see for myself. <gasps> the skull. Oh, Mrs. Cruz, I, I didn't hear you knock. I didn't. I want to talk to you, Spears. Uh, yes, Mrs. Cruz, but it, it's rather late. You've been up late before. Oh, yes, but it's just that I'm tired tonight. I I don't mean to be rude. You've been doing a lot of night work? What are you referring to, Mrs. Cruz? 
Spears, you don't really believe in skulls that move around by themselves, do you? Well, I... I warned your husband about it. It's a curse. Is it part of a curse for a skull to use a trowel to unbury itself? Your trowel? My trowel? Why, you're mistaken. (laughs) No, I'm not. I just came from there. Why would I want to do anything like that? Mm -hmm. Why? That's why I'm here. I'd like to know why. Please, Mrs. Cruz, I'm tired. We'll talk about it in the morning. We'll talk about it now, Spears, right now. Get out of my room. All right. I'm going straight to the police. I've got the trowel. We'll see if the skull left any fingerprints. You won't do that, Mrs. Cruz. Oh, yes, I will. All right, Spears, just sit right where you are. I'll shoot. Oh, please. Put the gun down. Start talking. It's all a mistake. If you don't start talking, I'll shoot. In self-defense. Did you dig up that skull? Why, I... I, Did you... Yes. Yes, I did. And you rolled the skull down the steps. The first night it was in this house, didn't you? Well, it was only a joke. I... And you also managed to open the closet. Yes, but I... Whose skull is it? I don't know. You're lying. That skull has something to do with you. I checked up on it. Your first wife disappeared. Perhaps the police can identify the skull. Oh, please, don't go to the police. I... Well, it was my first wife, Jane. I, I killed her. I didn't want your husband to bring the skull to the police, so I tried to scare all of you away from here as the safest measure. Go on. Yes. Wait a minute. Who rolled the skull into Arthur's room? It wasn't me. It must have been... That's right. It was me. Perhaps you and I can work things out. I tried to frighten my dear brother-in-law Arthur away so that I can have complete ownership of the entire estate. You see, Arthur is leaving tonight. Yeah. Perhaps we can help each other. No one has to know of our little conversation. No one is going to know. Well, now that we've both accomplished our purpose, maybe it would be the best thing to bury the skull again. Yes. We'll do it now. Here we are. Let's hurry. They'll miss me if I'm out here too long. Perhaps we'd better dig another hole. Oh, it doesn't matter. Will you hold the skull? No. I... I'd rather not. You haven't suddenly gotten squeamish, have you, Mrs. Cruz? Put the skull in the ground and dig that hole. Oh, all right. <laughs> What's the matter? The skull. Look at it. What about it? It's moving. Can't you see? Why, well, I did it. It is... Just the wind pushing it. Hurry up. There. Yes. There. It's deep enough now. Hand me the skull. Oh, I forgot. You you won't touch it. All right, I'll get it myself. What's the matter? My hand. I can't get my hand out. The jaws clamp down. Your hand. Please. Help me. You've got to help me. Do something. You've got to do something. It it won't let go. I can't. Oh, please, Jane. Jane, darling. I didn't mean to kill you. You're my wife. I, I didn't mean it. It was an accident. Please believe me. I, I'll do anything. Anything. Oh, no. No, Jane. No. Oh. How is she, Carl? Oh, it's pretty bad. The doctor says it's hopeless. There's nothing more I can do. Her hair, Arthur. It's turned completely white. She's just out of her mind. Horrible. Spears died this morning. He never recovered consciousness. Died of fright. Everything else seems to make sense, but I... I don't understand how the skull could have clamped its jaws on his hand. When he picked it up, he must have picked it up upside down. The lower jaw, which swings on a hinge, came down. He was so frightened that his hand froze to the skull. Spears was just frightened to death. (laughs) 
I want that skull. Yes, sir, I want it as a knocker for the inner sanctum door. Good night. Pleasant (laughs) dreams. (laughs) Well, uh, thank you very much, friend Raymond. Your sense of humor is really quite refreshing. That is in a ghoulish sort of way. We'll be trying your creaking door again soon for some more laughs. Well, right now, let's look in on the green room where the players are rehearsing the next performance in the Mystery Playhouse. Follow me, please. Come. What a crowd. Say, Dexter, how's it feel to be both a spy-catching hero and a prospective bridegroom at the same time? At the moment, it feels like being the 13th sardine in a tin built for 12. Well, the doghouse is always like this. Hey, finish your story, Stanley, about Dexter reporting the German agent that, uh, what's his name? Quartz. Quartz, yeah. Well, Dexter here figures that Quartz is up to something, so he tips off the FBI. Hey, yeah. hey, you guys, take a look at that gal in the black dress. <laughs> That's fine talk for a guy who's about to get married. Well, go on, Stanley. <laughs> Dexter's only trying to change the subject. Well, following up Dexter's tip, the federal men trapped Quartz. Uh-huh. That was six weeks ago. So today, in three minutes, in fact, Quartz is going to get quite a shock. Quite a shock. You mean they're going to... That's right. At six o'clock, that'll be less than three minutes now, Quartz is being electrocuted. You ought to read the newspapers, Lieutenant, and find out about things. Well, when you've just got back from the canal zone, you're likely to neglect the newspapers for the first few days. Hey, the gal behind us. <laughs> What'd you say, Dexter? The gal behind us. One in the black dress. Oh. Mob's too thick. I can't even turn around to get a look at her. Hey, go on, Stanley. What was this Quartz after? Plans of a new type mortar, wasn't it, Dexter? Mortar? Oh, I, I can't say. Oh, don't be such a clam. But it's taboo, I tell you. Well, don't get sore about it. Oh, who's sore? Come on, come on. Let's get out of this mob and find some less crowded joint, huh? Oh, take it easy. Let's have at least one drink here. Now we finally got to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! Who? What the hell? What's the matter, Dexter? Somebody step on your corns? Oh, no, it... <laughs> Felt like someone stuck a needle in my hand, but the way I'm wedged in here, I can't even lift my hand to see. <laughs> Probably a pen scratched you. With all these women about. Hey, Dexter, according to the clock on the wall there, Quartz is being executed right this second. I'll say, it's kind of close in here. Let's get out and get some fresh air. Huh? Take a look in the mirror over the bar, Stanley. That woman behind me. Mm-hmm. That's what Dexter's been muttering about. The brunette in black. Smooth. Hey, do you know her? What makes you think I know her? Well, I thought she nodded at you. Just my natural good looks. <laughs> I never saw her before in my life. It's uh, kind of close in here. Let's get out. I can hardly breathe. Oh, stop clowning, Dexter. Quit leaning on me. What's eating, Dexter? Just because he's going to be married. <laughs> ah, you shouldn't have mentioned marriage, Stanley. From the way he's leaning on me, he must have fainted. <laughs> That's all her fright. <laughs> Come on, Dexter. Take your weight off him. Of all I can do to take care of myself. And... This. Say, Stanley. He has painted or something. No kidding. Oh, Dexter's a practical joke. No, this isn't a joke. He's all gray about the lips. Huh? Look at it. I mean, hold him. He's falling. Oh, Dexter. <laughs> Dexter. Dexter, what's the matter? Dexter. Dexter. Lieutenant, is he all right? What's the matter with him? Is he all right? No. He is not. I, I think he's dead. Well, it's impossible. Uh, is, is there a doctor here? Uh, open his collar or something. Just don't let him lay there. Come on. Oh, over here, Doc. Back up, please. Let the doctor through. Lieutenant, what on earth's happened? Mr. Doctor, maybe he can tell us. Hey, Doctor, right over here. Ralph. Here, let's have a look. Oh. Help me turn this man over. Sure. There. Looks like he's been suffocated. Doctor. Is he dead? Oh, yes, he's dead all right. He can't be. Only a minute ago, he he was standing here talking with us. He said something about somebody sticking a needle in his hand. What's that piece of black paper on the back of his right hand? Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Hmm. It's thin black cardboard. Perfect circle, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. With a tiny hole in the exact center. Hmm. There's a small puncture in the skin on the back of the right hand. Right over the place where this circular piece of cardboard was. A drop of blood caused the cardboard to adhere to his hand. Somebody better call the police. The police? Why? Because it looks as if your friend here has been murdered. But that oh, couldn't have been murdered. I was standing right beside him all the time. No one's to leave. Everybody stay right where you are. And you over there. Call the police department and ask for homicide. <laughs> Uh, I'm 
Detective Sergeant Locke. Are you the doctor who called headquarters? Yes, that's right. Who's the guy on the floor? What happened to him? Willard Dexter. As to what happened to him, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Who was nearest Dexter at the time? Well, the lieutenant and I were with him. That's and right. I was behind him, and so was this lady. Oh, you were, huh? How about that lady? Yes, I guess that's right. Okay, then I want to take you two ladies, and you, lieutenant, and you, mister, aside for questioning. We'll go in this office here. Oh, and Doc, uh, would you come along too, please? Well, of course, Sergeant. All right, just step in. Every... All right, Blondie, you two. Oh, I can't. I got a date in ten minutes. Go I'm on, going. get in there. Am I arrested? Are you up? Look, Blondie, you will be in just about one second if you don't get in there. Oh, all right. But don't call me Blondie. Hey, Duggan, don't let anyone in here. Right. Now, we'll get a little privacy. Uh, Lieutenant, let's have your story first. Well, we were standing in the crowd. Your name? Lieutenant Max Lerbach. Okay, go ahead. Well, Stanley and Dexter and I were at the bar. In what order? Order? Oh, uh, well, Dexter was on the right. I was in the middle and Stanley was on the left. All right, go on. Dexter said that someone stuck a needle in his hand. Then suddenly he went limp and fell to the floor. Sergeant, on the back of his right hand, I found this little black cardboard disc. Eh? Under the disc is a small wound, and I've made a study of poisons. I believe that this man, Dexter, was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes. There's a poison which, taken internally, may do no harm at all. But the smallest bit introduced directly into the bloodstream causes almost immediate paralysis of the nerves which control the breathing. What poison? Carare. Huh? There's a trace of what seems to be Carare on the underside of that black cardboard disc. And you'll think he was murdered? It appears probable. Your idea, Doctor, is that someone jabbed a poison-coated needle into Dexter's hand? A minute or so before he collapsed. Now, where would a guy get this stuff? Well, certainly not from the average drugstore. Carare is made by the South American Indians. It's a very rare in this country. Say, Stanley, did you notice... Dexter died at the same time Quartz was executed. Say, I hadn't thought What's of that? that? The spy who was electrocuted? Yes, Sergeant. Dexter was the clerk in the Army Ordnance Department who suspected Quartz and tipped off the FBI. Yeah? It couldn't have been a coincidence that they both died at practically the same minute. You don't suppose... The I don't agent... suppose anything yet. Hey, Sarge. Photo and fingerprint boys are here. Right with you, Duggan. Now, everyone, just sit tight a minute. Say, that's a rather unusual way to kill somebody, don't you think? I wonder if that police sergeant is right, and the killer really is one of those four people. Well, it's too bad our time is all up, or we could stay around and find out. I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next time when we present the entire story of Death in the Doghouse. This is Sergeant X, closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. I said, who are you? What are you doing here? My name is Gabriel. I am butler to the Holloways. Gabriel? But you... You can't be. Well, you're... You're dead. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The House That Time Forgot. 
And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is The House That Time Forgot. Early evening on a desolate part of the Virginia coast, along a road near the beach comes a car with two people in it. I guess we've done enough looking for today, Eva. Oh, it's really beautiful country around here, dear. Wild and lovely. Mm-hmm. Darling, if we can't find a house, perhaps we should buy some land and build. Well, we'd better start back to town. It's getting dark, and I, I think we're in for a storm. Oh, look, Fred. Hmm? Look at that house we're coming to. Where? Oh, now, isn't it a beauty? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody that owns that one would want to sell it. Drive slowly, dear. I'd like to take a good look at it. All right. There's a for sale sign. Yeah? This house for sale. See Mr. Cecil Smith, Westfield, Virginia. Oh, that's interesting. Well, let's drive in there, into the grounds. I'd oh, like we to... can come back tomorrow, Eva. It's really starting to blow up. But it'll only take a minute. I've, I've just got to have a close look. All right, but we're going to get caught in the rain. I'll back in to save time. We'll watch the fenders on that side. All right, dear. I'll watch. Come ahead. Am I clear? Okay, you're all right. Fine. Fine. Ah, there's a light in one of the gable windows. Well, I guess somebody's home. It's beautiful, Fred. Simply magnificent. Yeah, the grounds look a little neglected, though. Grounds? Who cares about that? Go ahead and knock. Okay. I wish they'd hurry. We're going to get caught in the storm. Oh, don't worry about it. They don't seem to answer, do they? Try knocking again. Hmm. It's odd. Must be somebody home. We saw a light in the window. Mm-hmm. Maybe they can't hear us. Let's try calling them. Oh. Hello, there. Hello? <laughs> That's very strange. Yeah, I... What? I hear something. Listen. It's a clock striking. Now, let's, let's try the door. Oh, it's not loud. Uh, what do you think? Uh, well, uh... Let's go in. Hmm. It's a big place, but lovely. Wait a minute. Anybody home? Well, if there is, they can't hear us or don't want to. Uh, come on, dear. We'll, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> place needs fixing up, but it's worth the fixing. Shall we take it? Well, I... Well, I don't know, Eva. We'll talk to the agent in Westfield, and then... Well, we'll see. So you're interested in buying the Holloway house? Yes, Mr. Smith. It's just the kind of house we've been looking for. Uh, It's a fine place, all right. Even got a private inlet to moor a large-sized boat. It's got everything except... uh... Except what, sir? Well, it's only fair that I tell you all its uh, defects. <laughs> what defects, Mr. Smith? You see, Mrs. Jordan, it's kind of hard to put your finger on it. There's something very queer about the house. Huh? Oh. <laughs> you mean it's haunted? <laughs> well, I don't know exactly, Mr. Jordan. No one has seen a ghost there yet. <laughs> well, we we don't mind ghosts, do we, Fred? <laughs> no, no, we don't believe them, Mrs. Well, Smith. I, I didn't say it was haunted, but... Well, people say that the house is alive, that that it has a life and a will of its own. A life? Well, I don't know what you mean. Well, I've had four caretakers in the Holloway house since I took possession of it, and none of them stayed more than a few days. Well, why did they quit? I don't know. They didn't see any ghosts or apparitions, but they all felt the same way, that, that the house was alive. Every one of them. Oh, well, there must have been something that scared them away. Well, I'd better tell you the whole story. Yes, we'd like to. Please do. Now, the house originally belonged to Richard Holloway. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, in 1939, Richard and his wife, Diana, went on a short cruise in their yacht, the the Viking Second. That's an interesting name, isn't it? They never came back. Oh? They had two friends visiting them who refused to go with them. 
And the strangest part about it is that these friends warned them that they'd never return alive from the cruise. And the Holloways laughed at them. Oh, well, well, how did they know, the, these friends, that the Holloways wouldn't come back? I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, uh, did, did you talk to these friends? No, I never saw them. Uh, I only know about it through John Gabriel. He was the Holloway's butler. Oh. He's been dead for two years now. As a matter of fact, even Gabriel didn't know these friends. He'd never seen them before. Uh, it's a mystery that I've thought about for years. Uh, I'm afraid it's going to be a mystery forever. Hmm. Very interesting, but uh, we'd still like to buy the house. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, there was a light shining in one of the windows when we were there yesterday, and we also heard a clock chiming. Mm, that's funny. No one's been inside that house in over a year. Oh? Uh, Eva, perhaps we ought to think this over. Oh, huh? nonsense, darling. You're not going to let some old wives tail bother you, are you? No, no. But how could a clock still be going if no one's been in that house for a year? Well, there's a life boy not far from the house. You might have mistaken it for the clock. Now, you see, everything has a logical explanation. Yeah, what about the light in the window? Well, it was probably a reflection from the sun or something. We'd like to take the house, Mr. Smith. Well, if you wanted, I'd be glad to sell it to you. I just thought it fair to tell you all about it, so if anything happens, you can't blame me. Well, here we are, darling. Our house. Mm, I hope we'll like it. Oh, of course we will. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Do you have the key, dear? Yes, but we don't need it. The door was open, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Hey. Huh. It's locked again. Oh, Mr. Smith must have locked it. There we go, and there you go, dear. Well, look. Hmm? Darling, everything clean, dusted. Why, it's spotless. Oh, now, Mr. Smith really is a dear. Hey, it looks lived in, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I told you we'd like it. Ah. Uh, I suppose. Hmm. He also put flowers around. It does smell of flowers. Roses. But let's look around. Hmm. Bright-looking kitchen, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. And this wonderful big refrigerator. And it's full of food. No. Fresh food. Oh, that Mr. Smith. Why, he thought of everything. Oh, the bedroom is even bigger than I thought. Look at the beds. What? Someone has slept in them. That man Mr. Smith sent to clean the house must have slept in it. Yes, and he apparently slept in both beds. This library. Darling, look at that paneling. Yeah, yeah, it's a very lovely room. Everything is charming. But... But what? Look at the fireplace. Well, what's wrong with the fireplace? Is there is just some half-burnt logs in it? Yes, yeah, just some half-burnt logs. Still it, smoldering. Well, it was the cleaning man. I don't think there was a cleaning man. Now, don't be absurd, Fred. Huh. The clock we heard the first time we were here. Eva, I just can't shake off the feeling that someone is still living here. You're being ridiculous. Well, maybe I am, but I I feel like an intruder. Oh, darling, it's, it's that story Mr. Smith told us about the Holloways and their mysterious friends. It, it, it's got you all keyed up. Yeah, well, I'm going to call Mr. Smith and find out about that cleaning man you think he sent here. Uh, operator. Oh, operator, give me Westfield 403. You're really being a fuss part, Fred. Yeah, we'll see. I'll try... Oh, h- hello, Mr. Smith. Yes? Uh, this is Fred Jordan. Oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. How's everything up at Holloway? Oh, everything seems fine. Uh, thanks for having the house cleaned up. Cleaned up? I don't understand you. Didn't you send a cleaning man to straighten up the house? Uh, no, Mr. Jordan. The house was sold as is. I never sent anyone over. Uh, might interest you to know we found the house in a spotless condition. Cleaned and ready for occupancy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. I'll be in touch with you later. Oh, it's such a lovely night, darling. I'm glad we came out. Yeah, we'd better go back to the house. Oh, now, please don't be upset. There, there must be some logical explanation. Mm. Maybe 
Maybe somebody took advantage of a boarded-up house and was living in it rent-free. I'd like to correct you, dear. Someone is still living in it besides ourselves. Sometimes, Fred, you get very ridiculous. Mm, maybe. Let's go back inside. Look. What? There's a fire burning in the fireplace. Well, now, what's wrong with that? I haven't touched this fireplace since we got here. You didn't. Look. The table is set for tea. Did you do this? No, I... I, I didn't. Oof. The teapot is hot. Somebody... Somebody must be here. Hiding. If they are, I'll... I'll find them. Come on. I, I don't understand it. I, I just... Cellar to attic and there's no one here. But it's incredible. Someone is living here and we can't see them. It, it, it doesn't make sense. There's somebody here right now. Right in this room. It sounds crazy, but I know it. Fred. What? The clock. What about it? It it just struck midnight and it's it's only ten o'clock. A house that is deserted except for invisible tenants, and a clock that is running backwards. Has it just struck twelve for murder at midnight? <laughs> To Murder at Midnight and The House That Time Forgot. Fred. Hmm. Fred, wake up. Huh? Get up. Huh? Uh, what? What is it, dear? What's the matter? Look out there, out the window. Why? Get up and take a look. Oh. At what? That boat out there in the inlet? It must have put in while we were sleepy. Can't you read the name, dear? Huh? It's the Viking Second. The Viking Second? Yes. Wasn't that the Holloway's yacht? The one that never came back? That's what Mr. Smith said. Uh, either Mr. Smith is a fantastic liar or something very fantastic is happening to us. Perhaps the Holloway's have finally come back. After seven but, years? But it doesn't make sense. None of it. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. Darling, we... We ought to take a close look at the boat. You don't sound very enthusiastic about it, but... Yes, I suppose we ought to. Whoever's on it might be able to tell us something. Well, the plank is down. Mm. Somebody must have come off the boat. Well, they couldn't have, dear. At least they didn't come up to the house. Well, let's... Let's go up and see. Hmm? All right. No one on deck. There. Anyone here? No answer. Maybe they're down below. They must be. I'd rather not go down there. Oh, we've got to find out. Let's uh, let's both go down together. All right. You keep right behind me. Oh, don't worry, dear. I will. <laughs> Here's the stateroom. Oh, that's... There's nobody here either. Anybody here? No one. At least... Yeah, but the beds are still warm. Somebody just left the stateroom a little while ago. It, it seems so. Let's get out of here, Eva. I've got a peculiar feeling down my spine. It, it, it is chilly. Well, we'd better go back to the house. <laughs> lights are on in the living room. Did you put them on? Just one of the lamps. A floor lamp. Well, all the ceiling lights are lit. I can see that, dear. Let's go in. Here. The door's locked. We didn't even close it when we went out. No. I remember. We left it up. Good evening. Who are you? 
I beg your pardon. I said, who are you? I'm John Gabriel, butler to the Holloways. Gabriel? What? That's right, ma'am. Whom do you wish to see? We don't want to see anyone. We, we live here. I'm afraid you're mistaken, sir. The Holloways live here, have been living here for years. But this is our house. We bought it. And, and, and the Holloways are dead. Dead? Yes. I'm afraid someone has misinformed you. Oh, this, is, this is like a nightmare. Look here, Gabriel, or whoever you really are. We bought this house from Cecil Smith, a real estate agent in Westfield. He's not the kind of a man who plays practical jokes. No, he's not. He's a very sober man indeed. He told us you were dead, too. As you can see, madam, I'm very much alive. Oh, the... This is crazy. We'd better talk to the people who call themselves the Holloways. Perhaps you should. They'll be in any minute. Please come in, won't you? Will you excuse me if I close the windows? We're going to have a storm. Perfectly all right. Would you care for some tea? Yeah, look here, Gabriel. We've been waiting an hour for Mr. Holloway and his wife. They haven't shown up, and I don't think they will. Now, just what is your game? Would you care for some tea, Mrs. Jordan? No, thank you. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir, I did. As soon as Mr. and Mrs. Holloway arrive, I'm sure you'll be convinced of your error. They should be here any minute since they plan to leave tonight on a cruise. Oh, this is mad. Fantastic. Uh, ah, they come. Just this the storm, Gabriel. Oh, hello. I don't believe I know you. This is Mr. and Mrs. Jordan, Mr. and Mrs. Holloway. Oh, I'm glad to meet you, Mrs. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Well, thank you. you. Are you Richard Holloway? Yes. I can't believe it. It's all terribly confusing, Mr. Holloway. These people claim that this is their house. What? That they bought it from Cecil Smith. They also claim that you, Mrs. Holloway, and myself are dead. Somebody's playing some kind of a joke on them. I'd say it was a very unpleasant joke, Dick. We've been living here for years and years, Mr. and Mrs. Jordan. Oh, uh, before I forget, Gabriel, uh, get our suitcases aboard the yacht, will you? We'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, sir, right away. Fred, do you suppose that maybe we're dreaming this? Well, if we are, we're dreaming it together. I'm sorry. I don't know how this happened to you. Uh, perhaps you'd better stay here for the night. There's plenty of room. And we'd be delighted to have you. Uh, would you mind if I called Mr. Smith? Oh, please do. The phone's right there on the table. I know. Thanks. Operator. Operator, let me have Westfield 403. Never. Hello, Mr. Smith? That's right. Uh, this is Mr. Jordan. Who? Uh, Fred Jordan. Remember, you sold me the Holloway house? The Holloway house? Yes. You must be mistaken. I never sold it. That property's not for sale. What are you talking about? Who is this? Listen, Mr. Smith, you know very well who I am. You won't get away with this. I'll have you brought into court now. I never heard of you in my life. You must be crazy. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. He, he hung up. What did he say? He said he'd never sold the house and he'd never even heard of me. You must have been taken in by someone who posed as Mrs. Smith. That's really a shame. You have to be very careful these days. We'd be glad to have you stay here until you find other quarters. Well, I... As a matter of fact, you can stay for a few days until we get back. We're taking a trip on our boat. Perhaps you'll be able to get it all straightened out in the morning. I, I, I just don't understand it. The Mr. Smith we had dealings with wasn't a crook. I know he wasn't. Well, that was my feeling, too, but I... You're not going out to sea in this kind of weather. Oh, we don't mind a little rain. My husband's a very good sailor, Mrs. Jordan. He can handle the Viking second in any kind of weather. It sounds like a gale coming up. No, we like them. Exciting. Well, it's dangerous to set out in this weather. It's very dangerous. Oh, now, don't worry about us. We don't drown easily. Oh, darling, we'd better get started. Oh, yes, yes. I, I'm all set. Uh, are the suitcases aboard? Yes, uh, Gabriel took them. Uh, uh, something's wrong with your grandfather clock. It, it only struck eight times. Uh, yes, it's correct. Uh, my watch says eight o'clock, too. Well, how can that be? It's, it's after midnight. <laughs> you really are mixed up, Mr. Jordan. It's only eight o'clock. Well, my watch says one thirty. Uh, well, so does mine. I'm afraid ours is right, Mrs. Jordan. It's very old, but very accurate. Of course, there's a legend about it. The story is that it will sometimes go backwards in time. Has... Has that ever happened? <laughs> no. No, it's only a story. It's never gone anything but forward, like any other clock. But it's a nice story, isn't it? Yes. Yes, delightful. <laughs> but might even be true. Mrs. Holloway. Yes? Uh, what is today's date? What? I believe it's September 10th. What, what year? <laughs> 1939, of course. 
Nineteen. Thirty-nine? Yes, yes, of course, Fred. Uh, Mrs. Holloway, I'd, I'd like to ask you and Mr. Holloway something. Yes? Please, please, don't go out on this trip you're planning. Why not? Because if you do, I, I don't think you'll ever come back. What? What a terrible thing to say. Please, Mrs. Holloway, please. I don't know what's wrong with you two. You came in here with a strange story about owning my house, and now you tell us we're never going to come back. She's right. You won't come back. You'll pardon me for saying so, Mr. Jordan, but I think you're both crazy. I don't care what you think, but please don't go. Why, Mrs. Jordan? I, I have a hunch about it. We don't believe in hunches. Well, it's more than a hunch, Mr. Holloway. I know you're not coming if back. If you'll excuse us, I think we'd better get started. Come along, darling. I'm ready. I've put everything on board. Is there anything else, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, just take care of our guests. So that they're comfortable. Goodbye, Gabriel. Goodbye. A pleasant voyage. Make yourself at home and we'll be back, despite your hunches. Oh, you must go, please. Oh, well, it's gone. If you wish, you can occupy the master bedroom. I'll go up and make it ready for you. Was there anything else you wished, Mr. Jordan, ma'am? Uh, no, Gabriel. Just go to bed. We'll we'll sit here for a while. It's rather late, sir. Nearly midnight. By your clock, Gabriel, but it, it seems to have stopped. So it has. It needs rewinding. It's going now. Yes, Seems to be ticking rather fast. Something's wrong. It never did that before. Fred. Something's happening. The lights. Switch them on, Fred. As soon as I find the switch. So what, what happened? I, I don't know. Maybe the storm, lightning. Where's Gabriel? Oh. Gabriel. Gabriel. Oh, never mind, dear. Can, can't you find the switch? Uh, yeah. Here it is. Oh. Fred. Fred. All, all that dust. Like the first time we saw the house. Darling, it's as, it's as if no one had been here for years. Where's Gabriel? There, there is no Gabriel. We're back in 1946, and that means he's dead. You mean the clock did go backwards? Something else. You understand, too, now, don't you? We were the friends that Mr. Smith told us about, the mysterious friends that urged the Holloways not to go on that trip. Yes. Fred. What? The clock has stopped. Well, it needs rewinding. No, 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 don't touch it. We, we won't wind that clock again, ever. A house without tenants, except for the dead, and the clock that runs backward in time. If it was your clock, would you wind it? Or are you afraid it would keep you up nights while you waited for it to strike twelve for... Murder! again when death comes out of the past, out of time gone by, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The Jordans, husband and wife, were played by Vinton Hayworth and Elsie Hitz. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.
Murder by Experts. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, world-famous mystery novelist whose books have been translated into 17 languages and have sold over 10 million copies, and author of the recently published detective novel, Below Suspicion. Good evening. This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time... Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective story writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery writer, Mr. Hugh Pentecost. From the thousands of thrillers he has read and enjoyed, Mr. Pentecost has chosen a most unusual and gripping drama by Joseph Rusko. And now we present Miss Anne Shepard. And Mr. Larry Haynes in I Dreamt I Died. It's 2 a.m. I wish you'd let me get some sleep. Oh. Oh. Thank heaven, then it, it was... Must have been a dream. Oh, Ernie, it was so real. I dreamed someone was leaning over me just now with a pillow. It was horrible, trying to smother me to death. And... Ernie. Yo. It was you. What? <laughs> me? Oh, that's a cute. Oh, where's the light? Oh, my aching back. Oh, why, you poor foolish little... Come here, come here, boy. I'll kiss you back to life. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't touch me. Keep away. Say, what is this? That pillow. There in your hand. Oh, for crying out loud. Can't I even straighten it out? Oh, Sorry, dear. Gee, I, oh, don't mind me, but that, that horrible nightmare, it seemed so real. Oh, darling, wasn't that crazy? You, the sweetest, gentlest husband in the world. Oh, Ernie, please don't look so hurt. No, I can't even look hurt. I just murdered my wife in her sleep, didn't I? No, you were just about to. I mean... Oh, now, everything's happening tonight. Hello? What? Who? Wrong number. What's more, this is a heck of a time to be ringing. What a nerve. What a night. I thought maybe that was the police you phoned in your dream. Now, will you go to sleep now? Bernie Kraft, I'm sure I didn't mean to insinuate anything. I was just telling you my dream. You asked, didn't you? Oh, you're a character. You know, I think I'll put you in that book I never wrote. <gasps> now what? That was in my dream, too. Huh? That book you never wrote. Well, you've nagged me about it so much, no wonder. Well, that look when you bent over me with a pillow, like a madman. Uh, in your dream, sweet, a technicality. Lights out. No, no, wait. Ernie, what on earth do you suppose made me have a nightmare? Well, that's easy, dear. You would insist on eating hamburgers after the show tonight. Yes, I did, didn't I? Mm -hmm. When we got out of the movies. Hamburgers, of course. Ernie, they were part of my dream, too. Oh. Hamburgers. Ernie, stop punching that pillow, please. All right. 
Okay, okay. Go ahead, then. Tell me a dream, all of it. Neither of us will sleep until you do. Go. Wait, I light this cigarette, huh? All right, let's have it. The gruesome details. Well, if I can... Terrifying. Mm, uh, what happened before I smothered you with a pillow? Well, it... It's all like a crazy quilt, something about your job. And I was a millstone around your neck. And hamburgers. And you hated me. On September 13th. September 13th? Yeah. I can't imagine what it meant. Oh, well, look, look, start at the start. Huh? Why did I decide to murder you? Because of that other woman, your secret love. What? Yeah, you you promised her you'd kill me tonight when I was asleep. My secret love? Yeah. She had you in her spell. <laughs> well, honey, that's kind of bad casting, isn't it? I'm the dishes and dustpan type, remember? In the five years we've been married, have I ever looked at another woman? I know. It was a crazy dream, I told you. Yeah, oh, all right, all right. Who was my secret love? Did, did she have a face? Oh, this is the silliest part of it, Ernie. It's absolutely ridiculous. It was that girl, Betty Daniels. Uh, Betty Daniels? Who's she? Remember that tall, dark-haired artist I introduced you to at Cape Cod this summer? Cape Cod? Yeah, the exhibition. No, no, no. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, trousers and, and a long cigarette holder, very intense. Yeah, very intense. Oh, now, what the devil? What was she doing in your dream? Well, we said hello to her, we walked off, and that was that, casual. I know. I hardly remember her myself. I can't imagine why I dreamt of her. Oh, that dream, that awful dream, was so crazy. And yet it seemed to be telling me something, warning me. Strange and weird, you know how dreams are. First thing I remember is Provincetown and us looking at that art exhibition exactly as we did this summer. Only now, the picture was about ten feet tall and hanging crooked. And then she came along, Betty Daniels, just like then, black corduroy trousers, a yellow shirt... Long cigarette holder, exotic. But this time, oh, so menacing. And she recognized me just as she was about to pass and stopped. Hello, Helen. And I introduced you the same way as I did then, only not exactly the same, like in a dream. Silly, you know? Betty Daniels... This is my husband, Ernest. He is very faithful to me. How do you do? How do you do? We've never met. That's a marvel. I saw your painting, Helen. Don't you think? Or do you prefer hamburgers? Well, my I... My wife prefers hamburgers, Miss Daniels. Oh? I didn't know. Oh, only after a movie, though. <laughs> Betty and I met on the beach, Ernie. She's a, a painter. Really? Our rowboats got tangled. That's how we met. Yes. It's all very casual. I hardly remember. Well, well. Ernie and I are going back to New York today. Isn't it a shame? I wish you two wouldn't stare at each other, so... Well, we'd better be running along, Helen. Lots of packing to do. Ernie has to get back to his silly old job. He's a reporter. A reporter? Shouldn't he write a book he never wrote? Well, imagine that's what he always says. Well, goodbye, and I'm certainly glad you two won't be seeing each other again. Goodbye. Goodbye, you two. Goodbye. The scenes sort of dissolve into each other like a kind of dream movie. And I'm trembling with fright because I have a vague feeling I know how the plot's going to end. The next thing I remember, Ernie... I'm in a penthouse apartment on Park Avenue. Everything zigzag, even the butler. And I'm the maid Marie there. And what I'm doing is turning pages for Betty Daniels while she plays the piano for you, Ernie. Isn't it crazy? 
Neither of you hardly notice me at all, and I keep trying to open my mouth, but it's stuck, and I'm absolutely frozen at what I overhear. Darling. Yes, Butch. Love our love nest. Mm-hmm. Out of this world. Ah, oh, this is heaven. Ernie, mm. do you ever call your wife Butch? <laughs> no, never. I'll give you that idea. I hate the very sight of her. She's really a little ignoramus. You're telling me she prefers hamburger. Ernie, do you think she suspects? No, no, of course not. She thinks I'm at a gin rummy game. Darling, you're blind. She knows. She knows? How'd she find out? You may go, Marie. Marie, do you hear me? Why don't you go? Answer me. Have you lost your tongue? Oh, well, there's murder in the air. How'd she find out, Betty? Tell me. Darling, do you suppose she doesn't know what happened this summer at Provincetown? After we all said goodbye, you came back to look for your cigarette lighter. She knew you hadn't lost your lighter, that you'd come back to ask me for my New York phone number. <gasps> she knew? Of course. Intuition. And she knows we've been having a secret affair ever since. Oh, Ernie, I can't go on like this. I'm tired of just being a gin rummy excuse. If you love me, you'll do what you promise. Yes, but I pity your soul. Don't be a fool. Has she ever encouraged your genius? Isn't it her fault you never wrote that book you never wrote? Yes, that's true. She wouldn't let me give up my job. She's a millstone around my neck. Then get rid of her, Ernie. Get rid of her, and I'll bring your genius to the world. I have plenty of money. You can give up reporting, write that book, fulfill your destiny. Fulfill my destiny. Betty, you'll help me. Yes, but only if you forget September 13th. You'll forget all about it, September 13th. It won't mean a thing to you from now on. Not a thing, I promise. And you'll do away with her, the way I told you. Yes, as you told me. The pillow? The pillow. <laughs> shh, shh, don't let her hear. Just look at her there, standing at the piano. You've been spying on us, Marie, haven't you? Answer, have you lost your tongue? Oh, don't try to fool us. We know you're not the maid. You're Ernie's wife. So we'll have to kill you now. <laughs> unless, unless she gives me a divorce. Will you give him a divorce? Answer or we'll finish you right now. Very well. Here's the pillow, Ernie. Right now. <laughs> I'll hold her arms. Now answer, Helen, don't make me do it. I pity you, but I hate you. Oh, let her cry. Look at her. Stricken dumb. Her mouth's moving, but she's not saying anything. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Helen, please don't make me do it. Will you give me a divorce? Now tell me. Tell me or... Wait, Ernie, stop. Oh, what fools we are. Do we want her body found here? We'll hang for it. She's got to die. She's got to. No, no, not here. Not like this. Oh, there must be another way. Later tonight, Ernie. After a movie. Hamburger. She'll get hungry for hamburgers. She's bound to. The waiter will ask her how she wants them. And that will give you the clue. And then, when she's asleep... <laughs> and they'll find her in her bed. The perfect crime. Don't you see any? Hamburgers. <laughs> Oh, so this Betty What's her name and I were going to commit the perfect crime with a hamburger. Huh? <laughs> oh, honey, you ought to sell that dream to Abe Burroughs just for the last. No? <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but it didn't in the dream. It was terrifying and so real, but so real. <laughs> and then yeah. you dragged me out into the street and then into a movie and then out again. I looked at you and you were crying. 
Because you had made up your mind to finish me off when we got home. Holy smokes. You know, that dream of yours sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> well, as we went down the street, you kept crying out. You should have let me write that book, Helen. You should have let me. No kidding. Yeah, and I kept crying. I love you, Ernie. Don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Uh-huh. And then what happened? Then you pulled me along through the streets again. I was terrified. I shrieked as loud as I could. He's going to murder me. He's going to murder me. But no sound came. I saw a policeman and I tried to run to him, but my feet seemed paralyzed. But finally, I caught up with him and I cried to him, Officer! Officer! Yes, what is it, lady? Please save me. My husband here wants to kill me. Well, now, wants to kill you, huh? Why, that's a crime. <laughs> a felony. Oh, why are you joking? Don't joke about it. Do something, please. I'm frightened to death. Don't pay any attention to her, officer. She's dreaming. No, I am not. Don't believe him. He wants to wait till I go to sleep tonight. And then, as soon as I fall asleep... Oh, come now, lady. He wouldn't do it to you in your sleep. You're cute. Not in her sleep, now, would you, mister? Of course not, officer. Not in her sleep. As a matter of fact, we're... Stopping off first for a hamburger. She's hungry. No, 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 I'm not. I am, but I don't dare. I'm starving, but I don't dare. He's just waiting for me to order one to see what I say. And then he'll take me home and kill me. Oh, lady, stop. You're breaking my heart. Come along, dear. No, no, officer, please protect me. Don't let him take me. Come along, I say. Darling. And then, we were in a little lunchroom. In our neighborhood, around the corner from our house, sitting on the stools, the counterman came over to us. He winked at you, Ernie, and you winked back at him. And then he said, Evening, folks. Well, you have. I'll tell you what, Joe. Make it two hamburgers. Right. Rare, medium, or well? Medium. Joe, make mine medium. Right. And, uh, the little lady? How will you have yours, Helen? Answer. How do you like yours? <laughs> make hers medium, too, Joe. Two hamburgers, medium. What do you have on them, folks? Relish or onions? Relish. Make mine with... Relish, Joe. Right. And the little lady? The man's talking to you, Helen. How will you have yours? Answer him, I say. Go on, answer him. This is it. This is the payoff. How will you have yours? No. I won't tell him. If I do, you'll know. You'll know how to do it, so I won't tell him. I won't. <laughs> The next thing I dreamt, we're home again, sitting in the parlor. Everything exactly the same, Ernie, just like tonight before we went to bed. But in my dream, I was sitting paralyzed, in a cold sweat, waiting for the word, the word from you that meant my death. Oh. Oh. Well, Butch, I guess we'd better hit the hay, huh? What do you say? What do you say, darling? No, wait. Ernie... I did tell that counterman how I wanted my hamburgers served, didn't I? Of course, dear. What did I say? I I can't seem to remember. (laughs) I forget, too. Don't read anything into it, dear. Now, come along to bed. I don't want to go to bed yet. Please, don't make me go to bed. I'm scared. Helen! (laughs) Come to bed, darling. Like a good little girl, huh? We went to bed. Then you said... And now lights out, huh? That's it. I tried to think of everything I knew to keep awake. I wondered whether I ought to count to a hundred or whether counting would put me to sleep. I tried not to count, but I felt myself getting sleepier and sleepier... Asleep, honey? I heard, but I pretended not to. I fought to keep my eyes open. I knew I would die if I closed them. 
Asleep, Butch? I didn't answer. I couldn't if I wanted to. I was so scared. And then pretty soon I heard you stirring ever so quietly. And in the moment you were leaning over me. Oh, Ernie, I know it was just a dream, but it was so real. And there was hatred in your eyes, and there was a pillow in your hand, and I knew you were going to do it right then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, that's a beaut. Oh. You know, that's really a honey. <laughs> you know, when you have a, a nightmare, you should do it up golden brown and creamy. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't it crazy? <laughs> Oh, darling, wasn't it mad? <laughs> but, Ernie, how does a person have a horrible dream like that? What does it mean? Well, it's a cinch. I'll, I'll interpret it for you. And without a dream book. You will? <laughs> Good, then tell me. All right, easiest thing in the world. Darling, where did we go tonight? To a movie. Uh -huh. What kind of a movie? Uh, it was a, a murder mystery. Gee, that's right. You think uh, that uh, was Don't, don't, why? don't interrupt, Butch. Now, who was starring in the movie? Betty Davis. Now, repeat that first name. Betty. Uh -huh. And the villainess in the dream, my secret love, the girl we met last summer, was also Betty. Betty Daniels, huh? Well, that gave you Betty on the brain when you went to sleep tonight. And movies and murder and those hamburgers you did stop to eat after the show wrapped up the whole sequence. And no wonder. You know, they're still lying on my stomach, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the pillow doing in it? Oh, oh, darling, what were you talking about this evening at supper? That chore you intended to do tomorrow? Huh? Oh, I've got to stuff the pillows. Ah. They're caved in the way the feathers have come out. Right. That's your pillow you had on your brain. Which uh, brings me back to the hamburgers. Yeah, I was going to ask you. I mean, that nonsense of how did I want the hamburgers... What all that mean, for heaven's sake? Precious, how did you order your hamburgers done tonight, remember? No, I don't recall. Oh, no, no, of course you can't think now. H how do you almost always order your hamburgers? Well, smothered in onion. Huh? Oh, Ernie, of course <laughs> smothered in onion. Smother, <laughs> pillow, smother with the pillow. Check. Oh, for goodness. Oh, my gosh. So that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that doesn't... Ernie, that was wonderful. Really? Uh -huh. The way you did that, figured it all... I think you'd make a terrific detective. <laughs> so I'm a police reporter. Close enough. Ernie, dear. <laughs> it made me think, though, about maybe I have been a little selfish. So, what do you mean? Well, that book you always wanted to write. Maybe I ought to let you give up your job and try. Oh, no, nuts. Have us both starve? No, thanks. Anyway, in my sane moments, Helen, I've always known the truth. I'm no writer. If I had it in me, it would have come out of me, job or no job. I could uh, take up nursing again. It, well, it was hard, No, but... no, nonsense. I won't have it. I don't say any more about it, and that's final. You, uh, you're a swell guy, though, Butch, to offer to. <laughs> oh, Ernie, there was one thing more. Yeah? What do you suppose that was about September 13th, about your forgetting September 13th? What does that mean, do you know? Mm -hmm. Don't you? No, I can't. Well, it does seem familiar enough, but I can't seem... Where are you going? Uh, get something out of my wallet. Wait a minute. Helen. Hmm? Helen, what's the date of our anniversary? Hmm? Uh, it was September 13th, of course. That's tomorrow. Was that... Right, right. You've had that on the brain, too. Uh, by the way, here. little present for you, darling. Tickets, two airplane tickets to Havana. Right again. We're taking an anniversary trip. I wanted to surprise you when you woke up, but... Oh, <laughs> happy anniversary, baby. Oh, Ernie. Oh, you great, big, precious darling. How can I ever... Then you didn't forget. You always did before, but this time you didn't. Oh, Ernie. I can't stand it. First that dream, and then finding out it did mean the opposite. <laughs> Oh, 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 now, Helen, don't, don't now, come on. Oh, but it was so sweet of you. I'm so thrilled, Havana, where we had our honeymoon and you haven't forgotten. Oh, Ernie, I do hope I've been a good wife to you. And if there's anything I ever, I mean, if you, if you want me to, I can always change. <laughs> Darling, I, I wouldn't want you any different for the world. I want you to stay just the same sweet little girl I married. And now let's get some shut-eye, huh? Lights out? Hmm? All right. Hmm. 
I'm going to put the tickets right here under the pillow. There. And have a happy dream for a change. <sighs> Good night, Butch. Hey, you haven't kissed me. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, dear. Sleep, darling. Darling, are you asleep? Hello? This is Betty, Ernie. Oh, it's you. Well, is it done? Are we free? No, no, not yet. You shouldn't have phoned before. She was awake. Did you get the plane tickets? Yes, yes. It has to be tonight. You promised. Yes, I know. What's the matter? I think she suspects... Suspects? Yes, yes, it's incredible, but she had a dream just the way everything's happened. A dream? What are you talking about? I'm trying to explain. She was telling me of the dream she had. Everything in it was just the way it happened. And she dreamed what was coming. Ernie, is she asleep now? Yes. Then what are you waiting for? With a pillow? A pillow. I'll do it now, right now, as soon as I hang up, Betty. Right now, this pillow slip out of bed easy, easy. There, pillow right now. <coughs> oh, Helen, Helen, you, you had it, you had it, God. There was one part of my dream I left out, Ernie. In the end, I killed you. And so the curtain falls on I Dreamt I Died, which was chosen by guest expert Hugh Pentecost, whose latest novel is where the snow was red. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of three people caught in a whirlpool of intrigue, with death their fourth companion, as selected for your approval by Miss Helen McCloy. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us next week at this time. I Dreamt I Died was written by Joseph Rusko. In our cast were Ann Shepard, Larry Haynes, Grace Coppin, and James Stevens. Music on the program is under the direction of Emerson Buckley, composed by Richard U. Page. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. All characters in our story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons, living or dead, was purely coincidental. This is Phil Tonkin speaking. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Presents the Mysterious Traveler.
this is the mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope that you enjoy the trip, that it thrills you a little and chills you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Tonight we're going to join Bill Storm, a newspaper reporter, on the strangest manhunt ever conducted, or should I say woman hunt, as he searches frantically through a great city for the most dangerous and deadly woman you've ever imagined. In the story I call... The Woman in Black. And now here is the story as Bill Storm himself wrote it down uh, when he began to be afraid that maybe he was going to succeed in his hunt for the woman in black. My name is Bill Storm. I'm a newspaper reporter. And I'm writing this because I have a date tonight. A date with a gorgeous brunette with big, dark eyes and the smoothest, softest voice in the world. <laughs> Sounds nice, doesn't it? Well, I'd like to believe she's nice, but I can't. In my heart, I know she's the most dangerous woman in the world. Up to a week ago, I'd never even heard of her. A week ago, the day of Rusty Dean's funeral. You know, the, the big shot, gambling, slot machines. Killed by a solitary gunman while stepping out of his nightclub. They didn't catch the killer, but they gave Rusty the biggest funeral since Prohibition. I was on the rewrite desk that afternoon. My best friend, Tom Jervis, was covering the funeral. And along about four, he phoned in. First, he gave me all the dope on the funeral, and then he started telling me about some brunette he'd just met. <laughs> he was always a sucker for brunettes. Bill, she's a knockout. Big black eyes and the smoothest, softest voice in the world. I want you to meet her. Oh, blonde's more my style, Tom. Anyway, you're supposed to be working. Or have you forgotten? I am working. Listen, Bill, I've got a front-page story here. Theda led me to it. Who did? Theda, that's her. T-H-E-D-A, Theda. Just like Theda Bear, the old silent picture star. Oh. Well, uh, this is how it happened, Bill. I was watching the crowd at Rusty's funeral. I spotted a trim little number all in black, uh, whispering to Joe Nelson. Well, who's Nelson? Joe Nelson, a small-time thug. Well, anyway, she moved off. I thought she might be a relative of the deceased, so I asked Joe about her. He claimed he'd never seen her before. That all that she'd said to him was... Four o'clock at the Banner Bar and Grill. Four o'clock at the Banner Bar and Grill? Sounds like a message. That's what Joe figured. Oh, he decided that she'd delivered it to the wrong guy. Well, I uh, sort of wanted to see her again, so I persuaded Nelson he needed to drink. We slipped around the corner here to the Banner Bar and Grill. Sure enough, she was here waiting for us. Now, Tom, watch yourself. Bill, you've got the wrong idea. She's a perfect lady. <laughs> yeah? What about that big story you claim you had? I'm coming to it. But honest, Bill, I want you to meet Theta. You'll go for her. Hey, look, look, I'm going to put her on the phone to say hello. Here's here. Uh, uh, Theta? Hello, Bill Storm. Hello, Theta. Is that your real name? Yes. Don't you like it, Bill? Well, sure, I like it. What's the rest of it? Any girl my sidekick goes overboard for, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know her name. There isn't any rest of it, Bill. Just Theta. Oh, nobody. It's just one name. Not these days. Sorry, Bill. It's all I've ever had. Here's Tom again. Uh, listen, listen, Bill, I'm going to fix up a date with her for you. But here's the story that I promised you. Joe uh, Nelson has been getting quietly plastered. And from what he's let slip, I'm positive he's the gunman who killed Rusty Dean. He is? Well, then hang on to him. I am. You get a car, come down here. We'll smuggle him up to the office and work on him. Maybe we can get the whole story out of him. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Keep buying him drinks till I get there. Uh, what's the address? Uh, it's, uh, it's on the corner of Fifth and Spruce. Bill. Two men just came in the door. They got Tommy guns. They're after Joe Nelson. Tom, what happened? They just mowed him down. Theta's gone. She slipped away when they came in. I think she fingered him for them. Yeah, yeah, that explains everything. And Bill, they're coming over toward this phone booth. They're going to shoot. Bill! Tom! 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 five minutes, even before the police got there. The place was deserted, except for the two dead men. Joe Nelson, the gunman, and Tom. 
charm, my best friend. Led to his death by a Delilah in a black dress. Well, the police didn't find the gunman who did the shooting, so I set out to find the girl, to track them down through her. Once I found her, she was going to talk plenty. I began the hunt by calling on the man who had been Rusty Dean's chief lieutenant and was running his enterprises now, Nick Murray. Sit down, Storm. You said you wanted to talk to me. What about? Murray, did your boys kill Joe Nelson this afternoon? My boys? No, Bill. Why should they? Maybe because it was Nelson who bumped off Rusty Dean. He did? How do you know that? You mean you didn't know it? Listen, if I'd known that Nelson would have been dead long before this. I figured that. That's what made me think that you were in the clear. You haven't told me how you know Nelson killed Rusty. Well, he had a few drinks this afternoon. He let it slip out to Tom Jervis, my sidekick. Just before those two hoodlums riddled them both. A brunette named Theda put Nelson and Tom on the spot for them. A brunette named Theda? I never heard of her. Oh, I hoped you might have. A good figure. Deep, dark eyes, low, soft voice. Looks like a lady. <laughs> Some lady if she works with a bump-off gang. No, I never heard of her. But if she's working with any local mob, I'll hear about her all right. If any of my boys run across her, I'll let you know. Thanks, Murray. But warn them. If they meet her, watch out. She's pure dynamite. Well, that was one lead that got me no place. So next I dropped in on Captain Hughes, the head of homicide, to ask if the police had gotten any fingerprints off the glass the girl had been drinking from before the shooting started. Sorry, Bill. No dice. You mean you, you didn't get anything from the girl's glass? Not a thing. You see, she hadn't touched it. None of the liquor was gone. Well, now, that proves that she wasn't on the level. Not necessarily, but uh, well, I've issued orders to have her picked up if she's found. Not much to go on, though. We try to get a description from Gomez, the waiter who served them, but... Uh, but what? Well, he says he didn't get a good look at her. When she slipped away, he didn't even see her go. Some eyes he must have had. I suppose he didn't even see the shooting. Not much of it. He dived down the cellar steps when it started. He's in uh, Civic Hospital now. Well, I'm going out there to talk to him. He must have noticed something. Oh, and uh, so long, Captain, and thanks. It wasn't much of a lead, but it was all I had. It was pretty late by now, and when I got there, the hospital had settled down for the night. They put Gomez in a ward, and outside the ward, I found a nurse on duty. The blonde kid who, who turned as I came up. Oh, good evening. You looking for someone? Yes, my name is Storm. I'm looking for a patient named Gomez. Gomez? Oh, yes, broken arm and internal injuries. Uh, how is he? Is he awake? Yes. He's feeling badly, complains of pains in his chest. Well, if he's awake, I want to talk to him. Uh, this is police business. What bed's he in? The last one, down by the far door. But I'll have to ask the doctor if you can see him. Uh, will you wait here? She disappeared down the hall, but I didn't wait. The ward was dark, except for a couple of dim lights. I started for the far end, and... Then I saw her. She was just a figure in a black dress, bending over the last bed. But it was Theta, all right. It had to be. I tiptoed down the room. She was talking to Gomez, and he was moaning a little. It hurts, doesn't it, Gomez? Yes, of course it does. But it'll go away soon. He mumbled something, and then he reached for the glass on the table beside his bed. A drink of water? Of course. Let me help you. She helped him lift the glass to his lips, and then I knew what she was up to, and I yelled, Gomez, drop that glass. Don't drink out of it. He dropped it all right, but it was too late. He'd already drunk from it. He turned to stare at me, his mouth open, and she moved toward the door right beside her. I ran after her, but it was too late. When I reached it, she was gone, swallowed up in a dark hall. I knew it wasn't any use hunting for her, and I turned back to Gomez. In my impatience, I grabbed his shoulder. Gomez, who was she? What did she want? Mr. Storm, you're not supposed to be in here. What are you doing to my patient? I'm going to make him answer Take me. Take your hands off him. He's not going to answer any questions for you tonight. And I say yes. I'm afraid not, Mr. Storm. He's dead. Yes. He was dead, all right. The only possible witness who could have led me to her and she eliminated him. And then I knew that whoever she was and whatever her game was, 
trying to find her was going to be about as safe as moving into a den of rattlesnakes. I put in a bad night trying to figure it all out. Next morning, when I got down to the paper, my eyes looking like two holes burning a bladder, I handed up my editor, Harry Holloway, in the city room. Well, well, look at Frankenstein. What happened to you, Bill? Oh, I'm all right, Harry. Listen, anything new come in about those thugs who killed Tom? Not a thing. Papers needling the police, but, well, so far, no results. And there won't be either, until we find that girl in black. She's the key to the whole thing, I know it. Aren't you getting a little hipped about that girl in black? After all, she may be perfectly innocent. Oh, yeah? Then how do you explain her killing Gomez last night, just before I could question him? Bill, are you sure you didn't imagine you saw her at the hospital? After all, nobody else did. Not even the nurse. Imagine it. I heard her talking to him. In a soft, honey voice, as if she was bringing him flowers instead of poison. Yeah, that's another thing. The hospital autopsy in Gomez found no trace of poison. They claim it was internal hemorrhage and shock that killed him. Sure, the shock of a nice, healthy slug of poison in his glass of water. Suppose they didn't find anything. They weren't looking for it, that's all. Harry, look, I saw her kill her. Okay, okay, you saw her. Now what? I want to be relieved of all assignments until I find her, that's what. She's in this city and I'll run her down inside a week. Or I'll quit calling myself a reporter. A week, I said. Didn't take any week to find her. Not that girl. She got around too much. I saw her again just one hour later. It happened like this. I went back to my apartment and I dropped into a chair beside my window. And I started trying to figure my next move. Now, I have an inside room, and the window looks right out on another building across an air shaft, not ten feet away. I've been sitting there about half an hour, when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone in the room directly across from me come to the window and stand there, looking over at me. It was a girl in a black dress, wearing a cute little hat with a black veil down over her eyes. And as soon as I saw her, I knew it was Theta. Don't ask me how I knew, I just did Standing there with a ten-foot air shaft separating us. Well, I did what I could. I turned so that she couldn't see what I was doing, and I got Captain Hughes on the phone. He said that he'd have the building surrounded if I could keep her talking for five minutes. Well, I hung up the phone, and I turned back toward the window, trying to act casual. Hello, Theta. Looking for me? Hello, Bill. No, it's just accidental that I'm here. But you're looking for me, aren't you? Her voice did something to me. I, I can't explain it. It sounds crazy for a hard-boiled crime reporter to say, but it seemed to get down inside me and twist things all around. Why, a minute ago, I had hated her. And, and now... Well, now I knew why Tom had gone overboard about her. I said something, anything to keep her talking. Why, yeah, Theta, I've been looking for you. <laughs> You're a hard girl to find. I have to be, Bill. But why, Theta? Look, you're just a kid. What kind of a racket are you mixed up in, anyway? I'm sorry, Bill. I can't answer that. But listen, you, you could be anything you wanted. You don't have to be mixed up with murder. Then you think I'm a murderer? Oh, what else can I think? Last night you killed that poor devil at the hospital. I saw you. Yes, I know. You wouldn't believe me if I told you you're wrong, would you? Oh, I'd like to, Theta, but I can't. I can't. I'm sorry, Bill. Someday you'll know the truth. Now I have to go. Oh, no, wait. Let me look at you. I think we met someplace before. Yeah, it, it was Chicago. But I, I can't remember where. Please don't try to, Bill. And don't try to find me anymore. Now, goodbye. Oh, no, wait. But she was gone. And then somebody else appeared at the window. A window washer. He started to climb out on the sill to fasten his belt to the safety hooks, and I yelled at him, Hey, you! Uh, uh, that girl who was there, stop her! You made a little number in the black dress? Yeah, where did she go? Uh, she went out just as I come in, but... Well, go after her, grab her, she's wanted by the police! Hey, listen, mister, I'm here to watch windows, not to chase dames. If the police want to let them catch her. Now, quit bothering me, I got a job to do. Hey, look on. Huh? Your safety hook! No! Ah! Right in front of my eyes, he fell 15 floors. I saw the safety hooks break as he leaned his weight against them. And then I knew why she'd been there. She'd been there to weaken those hooks to make sure that poor devil...
felon killed himself. Well, Storm, we didn't get her. She slipped through our fingers somehow. But she was there, Captain. I saw her. I talked to her. Oh, she was there, all right. We found a handkerchief in the room, a woman's handkerchief. Initial J on it, heavy perfume. Here it is. Lilac. It's drenched in lilac. Uh, but look, the initial's J. She said her name was Theta. She was kidding you. But she did the job, all right. Those safety hooks had been filed away to nothing. One of the local mobs is trying to get control of the window washers union. That's why she was killed. Intimidation. Sweet little lady, that one. Hey, but Storm, the elevator boy who took her up says she was a blonde, no, not a brunette. he was crazy. Her hair's as black and soft as midnight. Getting poetic, aren't you? I wonder if you're still as anxious to find that girl as you were. What? Of course I am. Yeah? And when I find her, she'll get what's coming to her. That's what I said. I didn't know for sure whether I meant it or not. I just knew that I had to find her again. For four days, I combed the town for that girl. And then, uh, two nights ago, as I was walking home, just about midnight, I ran into Dutton, a cop I knew, looking down the dark street and scratching his head. Hello, Dutton. What's the matter? You see a ghost? Oh, hello, Mr. Storm. No, but I got a funny feeling I just saw that girl Captain Hughes once picked up. You did? Where? When? Uh, just a minute ago. I was walking my beat when this dame comes past me, all dressed in black, and she smiles at me. Yeah, go on. What happened then? Where'd she go? Uh, down the street. She turned into that door down there. Well, come on, then. If she's still there, we got to get her. In 30 seconds, we were standing before the dark door that Dutton said the girl had turned into. It was partly open. That's the door, Mr. Storm. But that's the entrance to a first storage loft. Why would she go in there? I don't know, but we'll find out. Well, better let me go first. I got a gun here. I'll see what's going on inside. He pushed the door open, stepped into the dark hall. And then I heard him call out. Hey, lady, I want to talk to you. I... Hey, you up there. Put down that fire. Put it down. Oh, oh. Dutton. Dutton. Who shot you? Was it the girl? No. no. She was just standing there. It was two guys upstairs. I... I Jack and the furs. They... They... Dutton! But listen, Storm. You say you didn't see her. Then how do you know it was the same girl? I know, Captain Hughes. She was acting as a lookout for those fur thieves. She deliberately lured him in there to his death. Maybe, or maybe not. Now, I'm seriously beginning to doubt if it's the same girl mixed up in all these cases. I think it's just a theory. Your theory. I'll prove it to you. She's definitely mixed up in these rackets. And by now, Nick Murray and his boys must have learned something about her. I'm going over there now and find out. When I got to Murray's club, one of the boys showed me up to the office. Hello, Storm. Come in and sit down. Thanks. I will. Can I fix you a drink? No, no thanks. No? I just wondered if you'd picked up any trace of that girl I was asking you about. Theda? No, the boys haven't turned up a thing. Look, are you sure you're not just imagining her? <laughs> That's what the police are beginning to think, too. But I'm not, Nick. She's real, all right. Listen, if there was any such girl working in this man's town, I'd know about her by now. Unless she's awful smart. And it looks like this one is. Oh, well, I guess I'd better go and get some sleep. I need it. Oh, uh, before you go... Yeah? I don't know anything about the girl, but tomorrow I may be able to tell you who killed your sidekick, Tom Jervis. You may? Yeah. When? Well, I won't have the dope until tomorrow night. If you'll meet me around 10, I can give it to you. I'll meet you. Just say where. You know the tambourine bar on 3rd Avenue? No, but I'll find it. Okay, there's a back room. Meet me there about 10. And come alone. About 10? Right. I'll be there. I went home, but I didn't get much sleep. I was too keyed up. About three, I get up and I put on a dressing gown. I sat down by the window to smoke. And then, behind me... Hello, Bill Storm. I turned, and she was there, standing in the doorway. I started to get up, No, but... stay where you are, Bill. Unless you do, I'll leave. Theda, why have you come here? You've been looking for me so hard, Bill, I thought I ought to. Look, I won't touch you or, or try to make you stay, but... 
Let me get up and fix you a drink. I'm sorry, Bill. I can't stay. But I did want to tell you the time has come when you can know the truth about me. You mean you're going to tell me who you are and why you've done what you did? Everything, Bill. But not tonight. I'll see you again tomorrow, though. When? Where? You have an appointment, don't you, with Nick Murray at 10 o'clock? Oh, yeah, at the Tamarine Bar. How do you know? Are you working for him? No, Bill, I'm not. I don't work with anyone. Yeah, but Theda... Please don't ask me any questions now. I can't tell you anything until tomorrow night. Good night, Bill. Oh, no, wait. You can't go yet. But she was gone. By the time I reached the door, she was out of sight. So I went back to bed, but I didn't get any sleep. I was groggy, punch drunk. I knew she was guilty, but I wanted to believe she was innocent. Well, now I'm going to learn the truth. I'm waiting in the back room of the tambourine bar. It's almost ten. And I'm just finishing this report that I started this morning. She should be here soon. So should Nick Murray. If what she tells me satisfies me that she's innocent, I'll tear this up. But if she isn't... Well, I'm going to find out because she's coming through the door now. Hello, Bill. Hello, Theda. You did come, didn't you? Of course I came, Bill. You believe bad things about me, don't you? Oh, yes. How can I help it? Believe me, Bill, I'm not wicked. Look at me and see if you really think I'm bad. She lifted her veil and... And for the first time, I saw her face clearly. It was just as I thought it would be. A beautiful face. With dark eyes that I could see into the deeper and deeper. Like looking into the heart of the night itself. Now, Bill, do you really think I'm wicked? Oh, no. No, I don't. I've been wrong. But who are you, then? What's your connection with these murders? You'll know in a moment, Bill. I have to leave you. Just for a minute or two. Just while you talk to Murray. He's coming now. She slipped out one door while Murray came in the other. Nick closed the door behind him and sat down. Well, I see you're on time, Storm. Yes. If you can tell me who killed Tom Jervis, I want to know. That's what I'm here for. Two of my boys killed him. Two of your boys? That's right. You see, Joe Nelson killed Rusty Dean on my orders, so I could take over. Then I saw your friend trying to pump Joe. I couldn't very well afford to take chances. I had to get rid of both of them. I see. That explains a lot. What about the girl? I don't know a thing about her. I think you just made her up as an excuse to come asking me questions. Oh, no. No, I didn't. She's real. I know better. Because you did see a girl in that apartment where the window washer fell, but not a girl in black. You saw Janice, my girl. She filed those safety hooks. Dropped that handkerchief the police found. She did? You mean you had that fellow killed? Yes, Storm. Just a little business deal I'm interested in. And last night I decided you were getting to be a nuisance. That's why I'm telling you all this now. Because you're not going to pass it on. Oh, no. No, put that gun away. You can't get away with it. You... Goodbye, Storm. We won't be meeting again. Theda. Theda. Here I am, Bill. Uh, Theda, help me. Call a doctor. I'm sorry, Bill, I can't. But it won't hurt long. Theda. Yes, Bill. I, I recognize you now. I know where I saw you that time in Chicago. Yes, Bill, I knew you'd remember. Oh, no. No, stay away from me. Bill, don't be afraid of me. Oh, no. Stay away from me. Stay away. Bill, come back. You mustn't run away from me. Come back. Come back. No. No, I won't. I won't. You're not going to get me like you did the others. Mr. Storm. Mr. Storm, can you hear me? What? Where am I? You're a nurse. Yes. You're in Civic Hospital. You were brought here an hour ago, shot in the chest. You were found crawling down 3rd Avenue by a policeman. Oh, yeah. yeah I remember. Nurse, take this down. Nick Murray shot me. What? Get word to the morning ledger. Certainly, Mr. Storm. Now, please lie quietly while I get the doctor. I'll only be a minute. Hello, 
Bill. Hello, Peter. You followed me here. Yes. You shouldn't have run away, Bill. I did it because I remembered where I saw you last. In Chicago. The time I was in a taxi accident. I saw you in the other car just before we hit. Three people were killed. That's right, Bill. You did see me then. And now you know who I am. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Now I understand why you have to be around when people die. You don't kill them. It's just your job to be there. But I... I, I never expected you to be a, a beautiful girl. Why not, Bill? Just because people think of me as an ugly old man with a scythe, does that make it true? I'm not really ugly, you know. I'm not someone you have to be afraid of. Oh, no. And I'm glad you're beautiful. Makes it easier this way. Now take my hand, Bill. It's time for us to go. Yeah, sure. I'm ready. He recovered consciousness a minute ago, Dr. Clark. I came to you at once. He seemed to be quite strong, and I... Doctor... Dr. Clark! He's dead. This is the mysterious traveler again. So that was the secret of the girl in black. Fida, a strange name. T-H-E-D-A. I wonder if Bill ever did realize that those are the same letters that spell death. But he did what he set out to do. He learned the truth, and he avenged his friend, and he... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Chet Stratton, James Van Dyke, Wendell Holmes, Mort Lawrence, and Joan Tompkins. Original music was played by Jack Ward. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Rob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled... Death Wears My Face. Another strange and shivery tale of The Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler came to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Avenger, sworn enemy of evil, is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. The telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes, and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now... The Avenger and the Blue Pearls. Inspector White is addressing a group of detectives at headquarters. You men have been selected for this emergency detail because we've got to put a stop to these hit-run accidents. During the past few weeks, eight people in this city have died and twice as many have been injured because of reckless driving and unnecessary speeding. It's up to you men to ferret out these reckless drivers and get them off the road. I'll see that they're apprehended. We've got to get out and put the brakes on this situation, even if we have to revoke half the licenses in this city. Reckless driving is a crime against public safety. Jim, is this road a shortcut to the beach? I know, Fern, but it gets us out of that heavy traffic on the main highway. I'm glad you came this way. Maybe we could enjoy the drive. Fern, look at that car ahead of us. Why, it's weaving all over the road. A woman's driving. Maybe there's something wrong with the car. Well, she must be crazy. She's speeding up. Jim, she's sure to have an accident. Can't we do something? We'll, we'll try. Hold tight, Fern. I'll catch up with her. Jim, she's driving off the road. She's going to hit that tree. Oh, Jim, she's crashed. Come on, Fern. We've got to get her out of there. The car's bursting into flames, Jim. Stay back a little, Fern. Well, be careful, Jim. The hood's on fire. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I've got her. Is she all right? I don't know. She's unconscious. Oh, put her down here, Jim. Oh, she's in pretty bad shape, Fern. Go back to our car and radio headquarters. Tell them to send an ambulance. Right, Jim. In the meantime, I'll wrap this coat around her and try to bring her to. Oh. Yeah, there, you're all right now, miss. You're safe. My... My... My pearls. Never mind your pearls, young lady. We've got to worry about getting you to a hospital. My pearl. Fern! Fern, tell them to hurry that ambulance. I got the message through, Jim. It'll be here in a few minutes. That'll be too late, I'm afraid. This woman's dying. You must be mistaken. We've been through every scrap of this wreckage, and there's no sign of any pearls here. I'm not mistaken, Inspector. That girl's dying thought was of her pearls. They must have been valuable, Inspector. She didn't have them on, so they must have been in the car. Well, they're not here now, Fern. I'll vouch for that. Jim, as soon as my men finish here, I want you to come down to headquarters and make a full report on this accident. At least we know this wasn't one of those hit-run affairs, Inspector. No. This was even more serious than that. What are you talking about, Jim? I thought you said that this yes, was... Yes, technically it was an accident, Inspector. But it wasn't caused by carelessness. That woman was doped. Gosh, Jim, this club rendezvous is lovely, but a very disillusioning thought just struck me. Oh, what's that, Fern? I think we're here on business, not pleasure. <laughs> Sometimes your hunches are uncanny. Well, let me in on the big secret, Jim. What clues are you tracking down in this expensive manner? I did a little checking this afternoon, Fern, and discovered that several persons who have figured in automobile accidents lately were known to frequent this club. Well, here we go again. So I know the inspector thinks it's impossible for dope peddlers to be operating in the city, but I'm not so sure. But why don't you let the narcotic squad take care of it, Jim? Because there's very little to go on so far, Fern. And besides, to get the kind of evidence we need will require the utmost caution. Well, Mr. Brandon, the dinner is delicious and the atmosphere is elegant. I don't mind proceeding with caution this evening. I 
I think we'll call it a night, Fern. It's almost closing time. I had a grand time, Jim. Let's have one more dance before we leave. All right, Fern. I wouldn't mind if all our blind trails were as pleasant as this. <laughs> I'm afraid there's a little of the butterfly in you, young lady. <laughs> oh, my pearls are broken them. Help me pick them up. Pearl? Oh, be careful, Jim. Huh? There's one right beside your foot. Waiter! Waiter, help me find my pearls. Yes, miss. Uh, we find them all. Uh, would you be so kind, everyone, to put the pearls you find here on this plate, please? Well, I found two, Jim. How many do you have? Uh, three. Don't put them on the plate, Vern. Why, Jim? I'll explain later. Just keep them. I, I think they're all here now, miss. Just a moment. I'll count them. There were 40. Oh, Jim, for heaven's sakes, we'll be arrested as thieves. I don't think so, Fern. Uh, are they all there, miss? Yes, Frederico. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Jim, she didn't even miss us. Come back to the table, Fern. All right. Now, would you mind explaining? I don't get this at all. Fern, those pearls are absolutely worthless. The whole string could be bought for ten cents. Then why did she make such a fuss about getting them back? Just an act. She didn't really count those pearls on the plate. She just pretended to. That means she broke the pearls on purpose and expected some of them to be missing. But why should she do that, Jim? Well, it would be an extremely clever way to deliver a pearl or two that contained dope, wouldn't it? All the customer has to do is pick up the right pearl and put it in his pocket. But how would he know which pearl it was, Jim? Mm, well... Probably a slightly different color. Oh, I see. When that particular pearl isn't put back on the plate, she knows it has been delivered to the proper party. That's it, Fern. Well, what are we going to do, Jim? Do we follow that girl? Oh, we can't. She's already gone. We'll check on her later. I want to get a line on her set up here. She must have an accomplice. That way to me. Yes, I think so. She called him by name. Well, I'll soon find out. Oh, there he is now, Jim. Yes, Frederico. Uh, yes, sir. Frederico, while you're clearing off this table, I want to ask you a few questions. Uh, yes, sir. What's the name of the girl who broke her pearls? Oh, I, I do not know. A customer... Frederico, I'm Jim Brandon of the police department. Do you prefer to talk here or at headquarters? Oh, uh, on what charge? Aiding and abetting in the traffic of narcotics. Oh, no, no. I, I do nothing like that, honest. I just do what is part of my job. I need the tips. We'll see. What is that girl's name? Uh, she is Brenda Clegg. She started coming here two months ago. How many times has she broken her pearls here? Uh, four or five times. And you always help her to get them back? Yes, I ask people to put them on the plate, and that is all. She tips me well, and I ask no questions. And she always gets all the pearls back? Uh... Why, yes, uh, of course, she counts them always, and... How do you explain these five pearls I have here in my hand? She didn't get these back. Why, I don't know. She counted them, she said... I that... heard what she said. Now, do you know where Brenda Clegg lives? No, I, I know nothing of her but her name and what I have told you. Maybe the doorman. Do you want me to ask... Never him? mind, I'll ask him. Rodrigo, I don't believe you're mixed up in this. But you're going to have to prove it. How? How can I prove it? By keeping quiet about this little talk we've had. And by following any future orders I may give you. Oh, I, I'll do whatever you say, Mr. Brandon. All right. Go about your business as usual. Uh, yes, sir. I'll get back to my station. Well, Jim, I have to hand it to you. You've certainly hit on something here. Fern, we can't take a chance on this, Frederico. Go call Inspector White and tell him to send someone down here to trail him right away. Yes, Jim. Hurry, Fern. Because we're going to call on Brenda Clegg tonight. I tell you, Smokey, that's the last time I'm going to deliver the pearls at the club rendezvous. It's not safe. Shut up, Brenda. You do what I say. Not anymore. I'm not making enough out of this to take a rap. Oh, so it's the dough you're griping about. I thought so. Yes, it's the dough. I take all the chances in this racket, and you and the countess get the grade. Shut up. You do what I tell you and take what I pay you. Maybe you forgot. I got enough on you to send you to college for life. That goes double, Smokey. Why, if I want to turn state's evidence and expose this snowstorm you're stirring up shut here... Shut up, I said. Oh! There's more where that came from if you don't keep your trap shut. You've hit me for the last time, Smokey. Ah. I'm going to see that you get the book. 
I don't care what they do to me. You wouldn't dare squeal to the cops. Wouldn't I? I've had this on my mind for a long time. Drop that phone, Brenda. That rod doesn't scare me. You don't have what it takes to pull the trigger. You're yellow, Smokey. Hello? Police headquarters? I want to turn myself in and make a confession. All right, Brenda. This is for you. Why, Jim, how did you get here so soon? Who tipped you off to this shooting? Uh, What shooting, Inspector? Fern and I came here looking for Brenda Clegg. Yes, this is where she lives, isn't it? Well, you're a little late. Brenda Clegg was shot half an hour ago. Two bullets in the heart. Oh, no. That means it's murder. Any leads, Inspector? One or two. She was on the phone to my office when somebody shot her up. Well, I'll pick up the trail, all right. Maybe this information will help you. I find good reason to believe that girl was peddling dope at the club rendezvous tonight. Yeah? Listen, Inspector. We can kill two birds with one stone if we handle this right. What do you mean, Jim? Keep Brenda Clegg's death a secret for a few days. Now, Jim, I... 24 hours, then, Inspector. We've got to give this dope ring a chance to keep operating if we want to pull in the whole mob. Well, I guess you're right at that, Jim. A public murder investigation might drive them undercover for months. Well, you're a reasonable man, Inspector. Meantime, I'll put everything in this apartment through the sieve. Right. I'll check with you first thing in the morning. Okay. Come on, Fern. I've got to get you home. I'll have a big job for you to handle tomorrow. Now, Fern, when you get to the club rendezvous, you'll be seated at the table where Brenda sat last night. Frederico will see to that. Yes, Jim. But I doubt if any of Brenda's gang will show up tonight. Well, they might, if they don't know Brenda is dead. And I have a feeling that her murderer isn't doing any talking. Well, let's hope you're right. Now, let me go over this again. Posing as a friend of Brenda's, I'm to try to find out how and where this dope ring operates. That's right. We found a key in Brenda's apartment that we believe to be a motorboat key. Now, that might mean that the dope is picked up from a ship, or it may merely mean that it's hidden somewhere off the mainland. Try to find that out. All right, Jim. I'll do my best. The inspector will have men stationed outside the club, and Frederico will keep an eye on you while you're inside. Now, put on your pearls, and you're ready to go. To the Avenger and the Blue Pearls. Young lady, there must be some mistake. His table is reserved. Yes, I know. I have an appointment to meet Brenda Clegg here. Oh, I see. Then I suppose we should introduce ourselves. I also have an appointment with Brenda. And the Countess Calstro. Oh, how do you do? My name's Fern Kalia. It's a pleasure. I don't believe I've ever seen you with Brenda. Uh, do you know her well? Oh, oh, yes. You'll pardon my prudence, Miss Collier, but uh, as a sort of credential, 
Would you mind telling me Brenda's address? Certainly. It's 105 Hillcrest Boulevard. Thank you. One cannot be too careful. Oh, I understand, Countess. Perhaps you would also be interested in knowing that Brenda and I have a mutual fondness for pearls. I thought so. And we've taken several trips in her motorboat. Really? To the island? Yes. I am surprised. I was not aware that Brenda had ever taken anyone to Lark Island. Oh, I wonder what could be keeping Brenda. She's late. I'm getting worried. You're nervous, Miss Collier. Yes. Well, I hope Brenda won't let me down. You came here for a blue pearl, did you not? Yes. And if Brenda doesn't show up, I, I don't know what I'll do. Don't worry, my dear. I can help you. You can? Yes. I have some blue pearls of my own I would be willing to sell you for a fair price. But we will wait for another half hour. Brenda may show up by then. Do you suppose something could have gone wrong, Countess? I don't think so. However, we will not wait for Brenda any longer. Come with me. May I ask where we are going? Surely you do not keep such valuables in your apartment. No, not in my home. I have another place. Come, my dear. Just a moment. I'll take care of the check. Frederico? Uh, yes, miss? Uh, check, please, Frederico. I'll sign it. Of course. Sign on the bottom line, please. Yes. Uh, there you are. Oh, oh, Frederico. Yes, miss? If Brenda Clegg comes in later, tell her I left with Countess Castro. Good night. <laughs> Collier, keep your eye on that black sedan behind us. I think we're being followed. Oh, surely not, Countess. Why should we be? I don't know. But in this business, one can never tell. Yes, I'm sure of it now. That car is following us. What are you going to do? Now listen carefully. In a moment, I'll put on speed and turn up Lake Mont Avenue. I'll pull up quickly in front of a certain small apartment house there. When we get in the lobby, help me press all the doorbells there. And someone is certain to push the door buzzer to let us in. Got that? Yes. But whoever is following us will know where we went. Your car will be outside the house. There's a back door at the end of the hall in that apartment house. We go straight through, come out in the alley in the back, turn left, and run for a taxi on the other side of the block. We can make a clean getaway if we are lucky. Here we are. Hurry. Quick. Quick. Help me press all these bells. Yes. What if no one answers? There, open the door. What did I tell you? Run for the door in the back. What if it's locked? It never is. Hurry. You'll see we've given them this slip. Now for a taxi. Come on. Smoky, what in the world are you doing here? Hiding out, Countess. Hiding out? What for? Are the cops on to us? Hold it a minute. Who's your girlfriend, Countess? A friend of Brenda's. She wants to buy some blue pearls. That's yeah. right. Smokey, put that gun away. What's the matter with you? This dame's no friend of Brenda's. How do you know? She says she's been to the island with Brenda. That's a lie. Brenda never went to the island except when I took her. This dame's no snowbird. She's a plant. There's one way to settle it. Why don't you call Brenda and ask her? Because Brenda can't answer and you know it. You're from the cops, and you know Brenda's dead. Brenda's dead? Smokey, what are you saying? Countess, I killed Brenda last night. I had to. She was going to turn us all in. You are a fool, Smokey. You have ruined everything. Uh, shut up, Countess. You haven't made such a good showing tonight yourself. Well, what are we going to do? A snowboat is scheduled to pull in at the island early tomorrow morning to deliver a shipment. We just hop aboard and get out of the country. What about this girl? What will we do with her? I'll take care of her right now. No, no, Smokey, you cannot shoot her here. Use your head. Well, we could just as easy drop her in a bay on our way to the island. That's it. Tie her up and gag her. No, no, don't. Take the gun, Countess. Keep her covered while I tie her up nice and tidy. Hurry, Smokey. We must start for the island right away. Have you got your motorboat key, Countess? I forgot mine at Brenda's place. That's why I couldn't hit for the island last night. Yes, I have mine in my purse. And I have a car in the basement garage. Okay. We're as good as out of the country right now. Well, Inspector, what do your men report? Well, nothing new, Jim. 
We know that Fern and the Countess went straight through that apartment house on Lake Mont Avenue. But they left a cold trail after that. Keep trying, Inspector. Don't worry, Jim. I will. I have the whole force working on this. I've just come from the rendezvous club. And Federico gave me a lead that I'm going to work on right now. Can I help you, Jim? Yes, Inspector. Give me that key you found in Brenda Clegg's apartment. The one we thought might be a motorboat key. Sure, Jim. I've got that stuff here in the safe. I'll get it. Want some of my men to go with you? No, Inspector. I'll handle this myself. Well, be careful now, Jim. Don't do anything crazy. We'll find Fern, all right. Oh, I should never have let her go to that club, Inspector. This whole thing is my fault. No, no, my men bungled this badly, Jim. And I'm willing to admit it. They weren't quite up to the tricks of that countess. Well, I asked for 24 hours to wrap up this case, Inspector. I've still got two hours to go on that. Well, uh, here's the key, Jim. Oh, thanks, Inspector. Stay close to the phone for the next two hours, will you? I'm going to try to close this case on schedule. Well, we made it, Countess. Yes. Wait a minute, Smokey. What are we going to do about this car? Huh? We can't leave it here. The police would spot it before morning. Say, I never thought of that. This car would sure tip them off to where we went, all right. Well, start thinking. What can we do with it? Yeah, I got it. I'll send it over the end of the pier. The water out there is deep enough to cover it. Good idea. All right, get out. We'll put this dame in the motorboat first. Come on, sister. This is the end of the line for you. Here's the boat, Smokey. Hurry up. This dame's a wildcat. She's kicking like a steer. Over down there in the bow. I'll be glad when we're rid of her. Now, send that car over quick. Not so fast, Countess. I'll take the key to the boat, if you don't mind. You, you do not trust me, Smokey. No, after the things I've seen you pull. I know you're counting on me pulling out and leaving me here waving on the dock. Here, then take the key. But hurry. I'll be right back. I'll get rid of this car in a minute. Stupid fool. I will think of a way to get rid of you later. Well, that's that. Now we're ready. Smokey, what was that noise? I don't know, but I'm not investigating. Let's get this motor running. I don't think you'll take that little trip to Lark Island, Smokey. Huh? Who said that? Where did that voice come from? There's no one in the boat. Pull out, quick. Well, you take this gun, Countess. You see anybody on that dock, don't stop shooting until it's empty. There's nobody there, Smokey. I'm here, Countess. Ugh. And there goes your gun into the water. What is this? Who are you? What do you want? I'm the Avenger, Countess. The Avenger? Take the wheel, Countess. I'll find him. Yes. Yes. Smokey, the voice came from the back of the boat. I'll throw him overboard. Nobody's going to stop us now. I'm going to stop you, Smokey. Like this. Oh. Oh. Smokey. Smokey, get up. He's out cold, Countess. Now, turn the boat around and make for the dock. Unless you prefer to swim back. No. No, I will do as you say. And make it fast. We've got a deadline to meet.
Well, Jim, did that boat pull into Lock Island on schedule this morning? It certainly did, Fern. And the whole narcotic squad was there to meet it. I suppose the inspector's having a wonderful time down at headquarters, bringing charges against everybody. Well, that's right, Fern, and you can't blame him. This is quite a feather in his cap. How long had that dope ring been operating in this city, Jim? Only two months, Fern. And the inspectors got the whole tribe in jail. That's fast work. And don't forget Smokey. There's a charge of murder against him. Don't worry. The Countess isn't letting him forget it. She's talking her head off. I thought she would. Well, Fern, since you risked your life to crack this case, I thought you might like to take a look at Exhibit A. Oh, Jim. A blue pearl. Yes. Here. The shell of the bead is made of wax and tinted blue. Just enough coloring for a discerning eye to distinguish it from an ordinary pearl. Then this bead was strung on a necklace with other cheap pearls of the same size. Exactly. Then it could be delivered at a certain time and place merely by breaking the beads. Brenda Clegg broke her pearls just once too often. Yes, Brenda was the weak link in this chain of crime. Jim, what about Federico, the waiter? Will he be prosecuted... You know, I really owe my life to him. If he hadn't delivered my message to you, I'd be at the bottom of the bay now. All the help he gave us will be considered when his case comes up. And by the way, I want to congratulate you on the way you got that message to me, Fern. Signing Lock Island instead of your name on that check in the club was quick thinking. Thanks, Jim. Maybe if I stick around long enough, you'll make a real detective out of me. (laughs) I don't know whether I'd like that or not, Fern. Real detectives are supposed to have long noses and big ears. They are. Then you're an imposter, Mr. Brandon. Your ears may be a little big, but you've got an awful pretty nose. Characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought. A thought. A thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger... All we're listening. Wilkie Collins. Where can I hear these stories? Listen to the weird circle. Out of the past... Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale, the heart of Ethan Brand. (laughs) Ethan, what are you doing here? What do you want? I've come to share a joke, Brother Barton. A wonderful, colossal joke. No man enjoys laughing alone, you know. Come in. Come in, Ethan. I don't fancy myself laughing at your jokes. Sit a few minutes. I have a new fireman coming to keep the kill going tonight. I'll have to go out directly and get him started. Don't fidget, Brother Barton. You have a lifetime to tend the fires of the lime kill while I... (laughs) My good Brother Barton, I have quite a tale to tell you. In fact, you can't relish the joke until you've heard the strange story of my wickedness. You haven't changed, have you, Ethan? Oh, yes. Yes. Much for the worse. I've learned to manipulate men as a chess player would move his pawns. I've made men commit crimes they had never dreamed of. And I've enjoyed every moment of my evil life. Oh, you're still as crazy as ever. What are you talking about? You'll understand when you hear my story. And by the way, Barton, I haven't been able to finish my search. I haven't yet found 
the unpardonable sin. You're talking in riddles, Eve. Now, I'm a plain man. Talk to me simply. Don't tell me you've forgotten. Forgotten our long talks as we used to watch the fires of the lion kill together. I'm not likely to forget working side by side with you. I don't recall all you've had to say, though. You talk wild and crazy most of the time. Sometimes when you stood poking the fires in the kill and the sparks flew round and the red glare lit up that cynical smile you always wore, you... You look like the devil himself. <laughs> it was at just such a time, brother, when my face still glowed from the heat of the lime kill, that we began to talk of the unpardonable sin. Think back, Barton. Think back to a certain day when we stood together on the side of Mount Greylock firing the furnace. Stand back, Ethan, while I stow in this log. We don't need it. Fire's going good enough now. All right, then. Get up the door. I like to watch a blazing fire. I guess it's about the only excitement I get. What a life. Why don't you go to the city, Ethan? Get some kind of job there. I don't want some kind of job. I don't want to work just for the sake of working and making money. I'm not made like that. Sometimes I think, brother, you're not made like anybody else in this world. You flatter me, Barton. But there is no doubt that I'm unique. Yes, the only thing that would drive me to labor industriously would be some unusual, interesting motive. A wicked motive, if I know you. I'll bet my life on it. Before you die, Ethan, you're going to commit some kind of unpardonable sin. Unpardonable sin. Now, what does that mean? Unpardonable sin. We don't all yield the same temptations. Our weaknesses are all different. Our sins are different. And which sin is unpardonable? Well, I guess I don't rightly know, but the way I look at it, a man's weakness can lead him to sin and maybe to an unpardonable sin. Now, take Willie Sheridan coming along there riding up. Horses are his folly. Maybe they could lead him to commit his unpardonable sin. Well, he ought to be tending to his paper mill, but instead here he comes in the middle of the day horseback riding. Hiya, boys. Fine day. Sure is, Willie. Good hunting, Willie. What? <laughs> You've inspired me. You've given me a reason for living. I'm going out in search of the unpardonable sin. By hickory, I almost think you mean it. You got the same kind of expression you used to have when we were kids, and you'd pull wings off of flies just to watch them wriggle. A minor experiment, Barton. But now I shall embark on a master plan, on a large-scale experiment in sin. Find out a man's weakness, and you can control his life. And perhaps make him commit the unpardonable sin. It should make a lifetime of interesting research. No doubt, Ethan. No doubt. Hey, look. Look over there in the valley. Must be a big fire. There's a lot of smoke. Yes, looks like it. Isn't that Willie Sheridan's place? Yeah, it's just about where it is, all right. Say, if there's a fire in his stables, Willie will be fit to be tied. Well, Willie was on his way home just now. I think I'll run over and see the excitement. I always did like a fire. Surely you haven't forgotten that day, Brother Barton. The day Willie's stables burned down. When I arrived, Willie was running around frantically, not accomplishing very much. Some of his horses were trapped, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. As I watched Willie's mounting hysteria, I suddenly decided I had meant what I had said about the unpardonable sin. And I realized I could go about my research in a cold-blooded way. Willie would be my first experiment. He had, as we all know, a bad temper. And his fights with Tom, his groom, were known around the whole countryside. So I went up to Will and I said, Willie, you know how the fire started? No, no, no. I'd give anything in the world to find out. It must have been somebody's confounded carelessness. Or revenge, maybe? What? Revenge? What, what do you mean? Speak up, man. You must know Tom hates you. Everybody heard him say he'd get even someday. Oh, I see it now. Yes, it all adds up. I had a quarrel with Tom just before I took out the new filly. Look. Look at Tom leaning against the fence, yes. that satisfied smile on his face. He's got his revenge, all right. Why, that dirty up. I'll fix him. I'll kill him. Oh, no, no, I'll tell him. Now, don't lose your head, Willie. Hey, what's the matter, Willie? Somebody stop him. He's got a pitchfork. Let me Tom. go, Willie. I it wasn't. It wasn't it. Tom's fault. Tom wasn't even here. Ah! 
Too bad, wasn't it, Barton, that Willie had such a bad temper and loved his horses so much. Those weaknesses led him to murder. As I stood looking at Tom's body, I wondered, was murder the unpardonable sin? But I knew that though the law would punish him, most people would find it in their hearts to forgive Willie. I would have to look further for that unpardonable sin. As I walked away from the fire and the crime and past the burning stables, I suddenly felt that I was two persons. All not good and bad, as the Morris believe. But I felt I was two bad persons in one body. I know it sounds fantastic to your matter-of-fact mind. But to me it was clear. One of my cells was inexperienced in evil. But I knew I had an older self, a second soul as aged as the world, and great in the knowledge of men and wickedness. And as I walked down the road in the evening shadows, my second soul spoke to me. Ethan Brand, you're a rare bird. You're cold, calculating, completely without heart. We ought to go far. And if you listen to me, I'll set you on top of the world. That might be interesting. How do we begin? First, you must have money. Not too much to start with. It would look suspicious. Ethan, your old friend Esther will help you. Esther? Esther's only a clerk in a bank. That's what I was thinking. Remember, Ethan... Find a person's weakness, and you can control his life. Ethan, you are Esther's weakness. Go to Esther and say... I'm not going to see you anymore, Esther. I want to give you a chance to forget me. Oh, Ethan, I can never do that. Goodness knows I, I wish I could, but... I just can't get you out of my mind and, and my heart. I... I guess I've never really explained myself. You see, I'm not the type to be satisfied with a little cottage with a white fence all around and a clothesline in the backyard. I want the best, and I want my wife to have the best. If I had a future and money, I'd ask you to marry me tomorrow, Esther. Ethan, you've never said that before. You've never mentioned marriage. I've never had the right. Oh, Ethan. And now, ironically, the chance of a lifetime has come to me. I have an opportunity to buy a share in a good business. All I need is small capital. But, of course, I I can't even think about it. Well, there must be some way to get the money. How much do you need, Ethan? Ten thousand dollars. Of course, I'd only need it for a short time. Once I had an interest in the business, I could borrow money and pay back the ten thousand in a few months. Yes, yes, of course you could. Ethan, let me help. You know, Mother left me quite a little income. No, I... I didn't know that. But you don't think I'd take money from you? From a woman? Oh, I'm not any woman. I'm the woman you're going to marry. Please, Ethan. Please let me help you. All right, Esther. But I wouldn't take help from any other woman in the world. You see, brother, how easy it was to get people to do what you want was like playing a fascinating, mischievous game. That night, as I walked home from Esther's in the moonlight, my second self spoke again. You handled that nicely, Ethan. Esther will have that money just when you need it. It'll just take a little time to arrange matters. And what do I do now? Ethan, call on Willie's poor, bewildered, beautiful sister, Grace Sheridan... Offer your sympathy over the recent tragedy. Grace can be a big help to us, Ethan. Yes. Yes, that's a brilliant suggestion. I'll see that my talk with Grace Sheridan is highly satisfactory. And that the results are according to plan. Awfully nice of you to come and see me, Ethan. I'm just so confused... Willie was so crazy about the horses, he neglected the mill, I'm afraid. Tell you the truth, I'm going to be lucky if I don't have to go into bankruptcy. Grace, let me help you. What? I'd like to put some money into the mill, manage it for you. Oh. You see, paper interests me. Paper's used for a thousand purposes. It's used all over the world. 
I'd turn your paper mill into a big business. Well, you sound like a miracle, Ethan. Do you really mean this? With all my heart. Well, how much money can you put into the mill? About $10,000. That's fair enough. Then it's settled. Fine. Here's to my very charming senior partner. Oh, it's funny, Ethan, that we haven't seen much of each other in these years. Where have you been all the time? Just waiting. Waiting for this day and this moment. And we're going to see a lot of each other from now on, Grace. Everything happened, Barton, just as I had planned. Esther brought me the $10,000. I bought the interest in the mill. And soon the long-neglected business was going along far better than we had dreamed. I became a leading citizen. Then one night, as I was turning out the light to go to bed, I heard the voice of my second self. Ethan, it's time you made some political connections. For you and I are going farther than this small town and this state. Yes, I, I've been thinking about that. Your man, of course, is Jake Sampson. You must make him indebted to you. You've heard the gossip about Sampson, haven't you, Ethan? Yes, everybody talks about it. Jake's a big man. The political boss in this state, and he could go far if it weren't for a woman. The woman he can't get rid of. Jake will be at the Chateau, the gambling casino outside town tomorrow night. And you must make a friend, a loyal, grateful friend, out of Jake Sampson at any cost, Ethan. At any cost. What better place, Barton, to study men than at the tables of chance? Perhaps there, I thought, I would find the unpardonable sin. So, the next night, I went over to the chateau, and I finally found Jake Sampson brooding over a glass of brandy. Hello, Ethan Brand. Join me. Help me drown my sorrows. You certainly do look despondent, Sampson. What's the trouble? Uh, I'm putty. Just putty. You mean putty in a woman's hands? You're a mind reader, Ethan. Well, then I guess everybody knows my personal affairs. I can be as hard as nails about everything else in the world except... A woman. It's the old story, isn't it? You've ceased to care and the woman's still wrapped up in you. Yes. She's not come along with me, if you know what I mean. I've gone up and Babette has stayed just the same. I tried to explain it to her again tonight, but it's no use. I'm a man doomed to the woman he doesn't want. You ought to let me take over. I use direct, hard methods. She's, uh, she's right over there, Ethan. That little blonde in a red dress at the roulette table. I see her. Well, Samson, maybe I can do you a favor. I'd never forget it, Ethan Brand. I'll never forget it. <laughs> You're not having much luck tonight, are you, Babette? This night or any other night. Say, how do you know my name? I asked somebody. I think you're very attractive. Ah, oh, save the sugar. Well, maybe you'll bring me luck. Mister, all I got left in the world is $50. What'll I do? Put it all on the black or just part of it? I can't make such an important decision for you. But then you see, I'm a gambler. I gamble all or nothing. Yeah, me too. Here, here's 50 bucks. All on the black. Now, watch that old wheel. Ray! 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 I win! I win! And I've lost everything. Well, goodbye, mister. Hope you have better luck than I have. Oh, uh, just a minute, Babette. I'm going for a walk. Let me come along. Why not? 
<laughs> Say, the lake looks cold, don't it? Come on, let's walk down there. All right. Say, who'd you ask about me when you found out about my name? Jake Sampson. I asked him if he minded if I tried to, uh, cut in. What'd he say? Was he... Was he mad? No. No, not at all. He said that you and he had parted. Jake seemed glad that I was interested in you. Oh, he was, was he? Yes. Yes, Jake was full of plans tonight. Of course, you know he's going to be married tomorrow. She's an awfully nice woman, and she'll be a big help to... Wait a minute. Say, say that again. No. No, don't. I guess I... I've known something like this was coming. But Jake ought to told me himself. You're no right. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Perhaps Jake just didn't have the courage to tell. Oh, go away, mister. Leave me alone. I want to walk by myself. All right. You, uh, you won't get lost down there by the lake. It's slippery on those wet rocks. Thanks for telling me. Well, goodbye, Babette. Goodbye. Hurry, Ethan. Hurry, so you won't be caught near the lake. No one must see you running away from the drowning. After Babette's suicide, Jake Sampson began to make great political plans for me. So, Barton... I had two things I needed for advancement. A growing business and political backing. Then one evening, Esther came to my house. Ethan, I, I've got to have that money back quickly. You see, I I stole it. I stole it from the bank. I, I took it in dribbles and fixed the book so they wouldn't find out. But in a few days, the accountants are coming, Ethan. But, Esther, you, you told me it was money from your mother's estate. Oh, I lied, Ethan. I lied. I wanted you to have the money. I thought we were going to be married. We are going to be married, Esther, very soon now. And I'll get you that money by noon tomorrow. Oh, Ethan, I knew you wouldn't let me down. I, I knew it. I, I've got to go now, dear. Goodbye, Ethan. Goodbye, Esther. Ethan, you must not marry Esther. I've never for a moment seriously considered it. Grace is the woman for you, Ethan. I know that. Don't I know I'd get full ownership of the mill from Grace? Besides, she has the social connections I need. You must get rid of Esther some safe way. She's the kind of woman who would be troublesome. The kind who would fight for you. Hang on to the end. You must get rid of Esther without hurting yourself. Yes, but how? How? Remember your rule, Ethan. Control people through their weaknesses. Now... Charles Townsend, the president of Esther's bank, loves power. Power over people. He likes to make people suffer. He acts quick and he has no mercy. Go to Townsend now, tonight, and say to him... Mr. Townsend, I've come as a friend to do you a favor. But in return, I'll expect one from you. Well, it depends upon what it is, Mr. Brand. You must keep the source of the information I'll give you a secret. My name must be out of it. Hmm. That's a reasonable request. But should you just happen to forget, and just, of course, by accident, mention my name, I'm afraid I'd be forced to take my banking business elsewhere. Why, really, Mr. Brand, now, uh, <clears throat> what do you take me for? Uh, now, what's on your mind? I just thought you might like to know one of your clerks has stolen $10,000. Which one is it? Esther, I'd advise you to get to the bank early in the morning, Mr. Townsend, and check the books. Check the books early. Well, Brother Barton, that brings us up to date. I should be sitting very pretty indeed. Esther is out of my way in the state penitentiary. I'm engaged to Grace Sheridan. I shall be owner of a prosperous mill. And Jake Sampson has great political plans for me. Yes, Barton. I'm on my way to that coveted place on top of the world. You're mad, Ethan. Start mad. You and your second self. Get out of my house. But wait, brother. You haven't heard the end. You haven't shared my joke. I'm on my way to the top. But I'm never going to get there. I came here from Dr. Myers. 
I haven't been feeling very well lately. I made him tell me the truth. I've but a few months to live. I'll never realize any of the glory ahead for me. Isn't it a joke, brother? A colossal joke. What are you made of, Ethan? You don't even care about yourself, do you? Doesn't seem to mean anything that you're going to die. Not a thing. I don't know why I haven't any feeling, any emotion, Barton. But there it is. I haven't. Well, I've had quite a career, haven't I, brother? And to think it all started over a search. A search for the unpardonable sin. Which I never did find. Ethan, you caused a girl to steal. Drove a woman to suicide and egged down a man to murder. You found the unpardonable sin, Ethan. You've committed it by deliberately leading people into temptation. The unpardonable sin, Ethan, is in your own breast. Now, please get out. I can't stand the sight of you any longer. All right, Barton. If that's the way you feel, I think I'll go up on the side of Mount Greylock and have a last look on the scenes of my boyhood. See our rustic lime kill once more. Then I shan't be going there. My new fireman knows his business anyway. I don't want to see you again, Ethan. But perhaps, brother, perhaps you shall. It didn't turn out, Ethan, as we planned, did it? No, but I've decided what I must do. Yes. Yes, it's the best way. Come. Come ahead. Joe. Joe, wake up. Oh, a fine fireman asleep on the job. Wake up. Oh, it oh, oh, is a bad head I have. Your brother, your brother Ethan, he... He socked me in the jaw, he did. Ah, the blasted fool. Uh, your brother wanted to stir the fires in the kill, but I, I wouldn't let him. The fires was just right. I, I didn't want no interference. So so he socked me, he did. I, oh, I guess I've been out for some time. And look at that. The idiot left the furnace door open. Now wait till the fires are out. Joe. Joe. What's the matter now? Come here. Look. Look inside the furnace. <gasps> oh, the saint's preservers. The skeleton. A white skeleton of a man lying there on the red hot coals. And here, here outside the door on the ground is the man's hat. Maybe it's your brother. Yes, it belonged to Ethan Brand. Ah, uh, he must have been a madman for sure. Joe, hand me those prongs. Yes, uh, here they are. What, uh, what are you finding now? There, there on the skeleton is a hard object. There's a lump on the breast. Ah, so there is. Why, why it's the shape of a, of a human heart. Here. Look at it. It's... It's marble. It's a marble heart. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the immortal tale, The Heart of Ethan Brand. Bellkeeper! Hold the bell! In just a moment, suspense with Ann Southern. Billy, turn that radio down. How can we play bridge? Okay, Mom. I like the auto light show, but not so loud. Whose deal is it, May? Mine, Mary. My husband Ed always listens, too. When he's home on Thursdays, our house sounds just like his service station. I know what you mean. Tonight's probably spark plug night. You'd think the announcer with his commercials would be enough, but no. It's switched to auto light resistor. Spark plugs. <laughs> I know. Batteries and ignition systems. <laughs> Well, Dora, what are you dreaming about? Oh, Autolite? You mean the show with Ann Southern? Oh, Mary, tell Billy to turn up the radio again. I wouldn't miss suspense Billy, for all... Billy, will you turn the radio up, your Aunt Dora? Yes, ma'am. Suspense.
Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Anne Southern in Anton Leder's production of Beware the Quiet Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. soda with a twist of lemon. Okay, coming right up. Say, your name Margie? Yeah. How'd you know? You generally come in here with a heavy set guy, black wavy hair, wears a big diamond? Yeah. Yeah, he was in a while ago. Said to tell you he'd be late, but for you to be sure and wait for him. But I can't wait. I gotta get home to my... I gotta get home. How late do you say he'd be? Oh, about an hour. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, give me some nickels. Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Hello? Mr. Banning, please. Yeah, Mr. Arthur Banning. Arthur? Margie. Uh, I I'm going to be late for supper. Yeah, I, I ran into a girl I used to know at Lincoln High. She wants me to have a drink with her. Yeah. And say, will you pick up some hamburger on the way home and start the potatoes? I'll be there as quick as I can. Bye. Uh, here's your drink. Well, here's mud in your eye. Um, uh, there's a young fellow down at the end of the bar who wants to buy you one. No, thanks. Well, it looks like a nice guy. That tall blonde fellow over by the mirror? None other. And you got a whole lot to kill. Is he... He isn't drunk, is he? Nah, he's had a few, but he always carries it good. I might help pass the time. Say, what's it to you anyway? Five bucks. You say, I'd sure appreciate it. He offered you five bucks to get me to have a drink with him? Yeah. <laughs> he is kind of good looking. Well, okay. Sure, what the heck, I'll have a drink with him. <laughs> Okay, so you're married. Nothing wrong with having a drink together, so what? I figure what your old man don't know won't hurt him. I said I'd have a drink with you. If you've got any other ideas, I'll buy my own. Oh, now, don't get me wrong, honey. I spotted you as a good kid the minute you ankled in here. You just like excitement, that's all. And I'm the guy that can dish it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, I'm a private eye. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Like you hear about on the radio. Gee, what a break for me. You just stick around me, honey, and you'll get plenty of excitement. Yeah, I'll bet. You know, you take this new client of mine now. Bet you anything he makes a headlines tomorrow. <laughs> Ten to one, he'll murder his wife. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. He hired me to find out if his wife's been stepping out. I felt kind of sorry for the guy. Probably doesn't have the money to take her out himself. He's a bank teller at Second National. Bank teller? Bank teller? My... What's his name? Oh, honey, no, no, that, that stuff's confidential. Matter of fact, I, I'm not supposed to talk about cases at all. Oh, go on. I won't tell anybody. Well, no, you don't look like the kind of babe that blabs everything she knows. How about that drink, huh? Sure. Hey, Charlie, two over here, huh? In the works. You know, he, he sort of gave me the creeps, this guy. He sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, and all the time figuring how to kill his wife. How'd you know what he was figuring? Well, for one thing, he didn't want evidence for a divorce. He sort of looked at me funny and said, I just want to know, that's all. If Margie is stepping out, I'll take care of it my own way. Margie? Yeah, yeah, that's his wife's name, Margie. Oh. Hey, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. N nothing at all. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you drank the last one too fast. No, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just naturally pale, that's all. Y you were saying about this client... You figure he's going to murder his wife? Oh, sure, sure. It's in the back. Either that or suicide. Suicide? But he's more the type for murder. Oh, one of those big, brutal guys. Sort of, sort of mean looking, huh? No. <laughs> Quiet, mousy. Kind doesn't have much to say. Those are the guys you got to watch. But why? Because they never let you know what they're really thinking. 
Not until it's too late. They don't? You know, most guys, when they find their wives, step in will raise Cain. Maybe they'll even get a divorce, but they don't get sore enough to murder. <laughs> yeah. But these quiet fellas, you know, they put the little woman on a pedestal. You wouldn't catch them out with other women, not in a million years. And when they discover their one and only has been kicking up her heels, oh, brother, watch out. Golly. And the worst of it is they go on acting like nothing's wrong, you see. And then all of a sudden, whango, they explode. They explode? Yeah, yeah. You know, like I always say, beware the quiet man. Like this new client of mine, for example, calm. You never met anybody calmer, but I'll What does bet. he look like? Oh, uh, well, he's just about average, I guess. Brown hair, getting sort of thin on the top. A little bit stoop-shouldered. Medium height? Wear glasses? Yeah, yeah, you know him? No, no, I, I don't know any of the boys. Excuse me. Hey, where are you going? I gotta make a phone call, just remember something. Don't go away, I'll be right back. Ralph? Margie? I can't see you this afternoon. No, I'm not sorry about you being late. But whatever you do, don't come into Charlie's place. Yeah, that's where I am now. You bet there's something wrong. There's plenty wrong. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Anne Southern. In radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, Dora, we're down 200 on that hand. Oh, are we? It's easy to see there's no playing bridge with you girls with suspense on. So let's stop playing and switch to Autolite spark plugs or whatever for the rest of the half hour, huh? Oh, Mary, I could kiss you. You're such an understanding sister-in-law, and I don't want to miss a single word. What about you, May? Dora, did you know that my husband knows Frank Martin, the Autolite salesman? He does? Mm -hmm. Well, then let's listen to Mr. Martin. Right now, you can get Autolite resistor spark plugs almost anywhere in the United States. They're sensational. Why, no other spark plug will give and maintain such performance. Autolite worked with leading car and truck manufacturers, and the ignition engineered a 10,000 ohm resistor right into the Autolite spark plug that permits a wider spark gap setting and maintains it far longer than in other spark plugs. Actually, when you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. Oh, dear. And to think that I'll hear every word of that again from Ed when I get home. Now, here's the simple lowdown. As a result of the wide gap in the resistor spark plugs, your engine idles smoother, you have better luck with lean gas mixtures and save gas. And within established limits, you reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Yes, and today you can get the resistor spark plug from almost any of Autolite's 60,000 dealers. That's the biggest spark plug news in years. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Ann Southern as Margie in Beware the Quiet Man. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I stood there in the phone booth a minute after I hung up. I wasn't scared exactly, but I had to let those words sink in. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. I went back to the bar. I had to find out. Oh, beautiful. I thought you got lost. Sit down, sit down. <laughs> Thanks. Now, about this fella, the one who's going to murder his wife. Oh, let's can the shop talk. I want to hear about you. I don't even know your name. Did he say what made him think she was stepping out? Ah, she's supposed to belong to some bridge club. The bank teller's wife's got up. But uh, friends of his saw her downtown a couple of times on our bridge days. Is that all? You know, honey, you're pretty smart. You, you, you make like you're really interested in a guy's work. Oh, but I am. You know, I had a little doll once I thought plenty of. W would have married her, maybe, but only every time I, I started talking about a case, she shut me up. Never mind about your little dolls. What about this guy? <laughs> hey, you're jealous. Well, what do you know? I'm not jealous. I only want to know. It's okay, honey. It's okay. Sure, a cute little doll like you doesn't want to hear a guy spotting off about another dame. Yeah, maybe I had a few too many. I just want to hear about this bank teller. Have you met his wife, maybe? 
No, but he showed me a picture of her. Oh, then you know what she looks like. Oh. Hey, what's so funny? <laughs> Never mind, the joke's on me. <laughs> hey, maybe you better not have him any more to drink. You're acting kind of screwy. Oh, I feel wonderful. Well, here's to you. A long life. Yeah. A long, long life. Yeah. Down a hatch. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, poor little Margie. You know, you showed me a snapshot of her in a bathing suit. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, was she stacked. As a matter of fact, uh, about your height and uh, build, you're blonde like you, too. Was she as pretty as I am? No, I, I couldn't see her face. It's kind of blurred. He, oh. He's bringing me a better picture of her tomorrow. Oh, I think I'd like another drink. You know, honey, you better start taking vitamins or something. You're pale as a sheep. I said I wanted another drink. Oh, yeah, oh, sure. Hey, ch Charlie, two more the same, huh? Okay. Yeah, poor little Margie. You know, that's one thing I can never figure out. The cute little dolls with flirtatious eyes always pick some homely, quiet gink when it comes to settling down. And the handsome he-man who has to beat off the dames with a club, what does he do? He marries a drab little pigeon. Yeah, that's why we get so many axe murders, I guess. Axe murders? Only in this case, he'll use a gun. But he doesn't have a... I mean, most bank clerks don't own guns. Oh, well, this one does. Now. Oh. Give me a light, will you? Yeah, sure. There you are. Hey, maybe if you lay off a booze, honey, and take a tonic or something, you'll feel better. Oh. Look at your hands. They're trembling. How do you know he has a gun? Oh. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Why'd you tell me? Tell you what? You got a squeamish stomach. Oh. All this talk about guns and shooting. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. I, I won't say one more word about it, I promise. I'm not squeamish, and I don't need vitamins. I want to know how you know this bank teller guy has a gun. All right, so I'm going to a pawn shop and buy one. Oh. You know, honey, I, I could really go for you. It's a funny thing, we never even introduced ourselves. That's something we got to do. My name's Closen. Lem Closen. What's yours? You, you mean that man bought a gun and now he's home waiting to murder his wife in cold blood? Oh, no, no. He won't do anything until he gets my report. Oh. You see, tomorrow I check with her friends to see if she's been going to bridge club like she's supposed to. Yeah. And I meet my client for lunch and get a picture of Margie. Mm. And I take it around to the downtown bars to find out if she's been seen with anybody. And then I give my client the report when he gets off work. Yeah. And then? And if his suspicions are right, and they usually are, it's all over but the shooting. The shooting? Yeah. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. <sighs> say, um, what'd you say your name was? I've got to get home. <sighs> Hello, dear. Hello, Arthur. Oh, I was beginning to worry about you. Well, uh, I really couldn't help being late for dinner. I, I wanted to leave, but Maybelle, that's her name, you know, the girl I used to go to school with, she kept talking yatta to yatta, and I just couldn't walk out on her in the middle of a sentence. Oh, that's all right. I didn't mind. Say, the potatoes are already like you told me. Shall I... Uh... No, no, I I'll hurry dinner. You just sit down and read the paper. Huh? Well, well, thank you, dear. You all right? You, you look a little flushed. Oh, well, I'm, I'm fine. I was just rushing, that's all. Uh, it'll be ready in a minute. Uh, Did you have a hard day, darling? Oh, usual. People are taking out more money these days than they're putting in. Yeah, prices are awful, aren't they? Hmm. Nothing unusual? I mean, nothing happened today? Oh, a, a funny thing. Man came rushing in this morning, first thing the doors were opened. Wanted to withdraw all the money from their joint account before his wife beat him to it. Seems she was leaving him for another man. Oh, how awful. Oh, yeah. And while he was there, she appeared. You should have heard her carry on. Huh. She was a real shrew. Well, what happened? Oh, nothing. He didn't say a word. He, he was a gentleman. But I'll bet if he'd had a gun, he'd have killed her. <gasps> oh, well. <clears throat> Seems things like that happen all the time. Newspapers full of it. Are you mad at me, Arthur? Hmm? Are you mad at me? Am I mad at you? I know. Should I be? Arthur, darling, I've, I've got something to confess. Well, far away. I didn't go to bridge club last week. No? I thought you'd die before you gave up bridge. <gasps> oh. Really, honey, you look awfully seedy. No, I, I'm fine. I, I feel fine. I, 
I had sort of a quarrel with Lorraine. I, I, I didn't want to tell you because you're always talking about how women can't get along with each other. Instead of going to bridge club, I went shopping. Instead. Well, fine. Only I hope you didn't go over the budget. Oh, no. That's good. I always said bridge was a waste of time. Then you're not angry about anything? Why, no. Why should I be? Oh, Arthur. What's the matter now? I don't deserve a swell husband like you. <laughs> oh, I'm not so hot. Oh, you always do the dinner dishes and bring me my breakfast in bed on Sunday mornings. The only morning you have to sleep. Arthur, I'd feel terrible if anything ever happened to us. Well, what's going to happen? Suppose someday you got real mad and exploded. Exploded? Yeah. What if, it, what if you got a gun and shot me dead? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Margie. Where do you get those crazy ideas? You mean, no matter how mad you got, no matter what I did to make you mad, you wouldn't shoot me dead? Well, Margie, you know I'd rather die than hurt one hair on your head. Oh, uh, they're not suicide. Say, how many drinks did you and Maybell have? Arthur, I want you to know I'm going to change. I'm going to be a better wife from now on. I'll stay home all the time and darn your socks. You? <laughs> Darning socks. You just wait and see. I'll get up every morning and, and make your breakfast. Oh, Margie, you know you won't do any of those things. I will, too. The nonsense. Women like you never change. I will, too. I'll change right away. Tomorrow. Besides, I don't want you to. Oh, come here, baby. I want you to stay just exactly the way you are right now. Just exactly, Arthur? I love you very much, just the way you are. Oh, Arthur. <sighs> Hey, that reminds me, I made an appointment for you tomorrow at 10. You're having your picture taken. My picture? I showed a fellow that old snapshot of you today. The one we took at the beach. Oh. It was so dog-eared he couldn't see what you looked like, and I realized we didn't have a single decent picture of you at all, so but, I... But why have it taken tomorrow? Well, the studio next to the bank is having a special advertising the new 60-minute service. 60-minute service? Yeah, that way I can pick up the finished picture before I go to lunch. I don't want my picture taken. Well, now you're being silly. I won't. I won't do it. Oh, honey, what's the matter? Don't touch me. I won't have my picture taken. I won't. Sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, all the time figuring how to kill his wife. <laughs> Quiet, mousy. That's the kind you gotta watch. Never let you know what they're really thinking. All of a sudden, wango, they explode. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Arthur wouldn't hurt me. He wouldn't. I won't think about it. I'll take a sleeping powder and go to bed. The gun. He did buy a gun. It's all true. Every word of it's true. Hello? Ralph! I told you never to call me here. No, no, it isn't all right. Arthur bought a gun home last night. Yes, a gun! Claimed he was keeping it for a friend. That's all he'd say. Yeah, I, I think so. Just a minute, I'll look. Ralph, the gun's gone. He must have taken it to work. Oh, but don't you see? As soon as he finds out for sure, he'll kill... No, 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 no! I never want to hear from you again! I've got to think. I've got to think. Oh, not the doorbell. Oh... Lorraine. Well, who'd you expect, darling? Frankenstein? Aren't you going to invite me in? Well, I, I was just going out. Oh, don't be silly. You're not dressed. I'm in a hurry, Lorraine. Well, I, so am I. I'm late at the beauty shop now. But I was driving past anyway, so I thought I'd drop in and give you the latest on the girls at the bridge club. Well, some other day. I've, I've Honestly, been... Margie, this is choice. You know what I heard about Mrs. Dentler? You know, she's the wife of Ben Dentler, the new teller at the bank. The one from Chicago. Lorraine, if you don't mind. Oh, that's right. You haven't met her. Of course, you haven't been around lately. Well, she's kind of a pretty little thing in a plucked eyebrow sort of way. But, but it... you should hear what her husband told my husband. Lorraine, I... Of course, I promised Ed I wouldn't breathe a word. For crying out loud, Lorraine. Well, what brought that on? I haven't time to stand and gossip. But 
wrong with you today anyway? You're as nervous as a cat. I'm all right, perfectly all right. But here it is, 10.30. 10.30? Good heavens, I'm a half hour late. Well, goodbye. I've got to run. Oh, darling. Be sure and read the Gazette tomorrow. They're running a story about our bridge benefits. Okay, goodbye. Pictures and everything. They didn't have time to take a new picture, but I gave them the one we took at the Valentine party. The one I was in? They're publishing it? Why, sure. I don't want my picture in the paper. But yours was the only flattering one in the group. The reporter picked you out right away. He seemed quite smitten. He? Oh, yes, yes. He asked all about you. Of course, I told him that you didn't come to meetings very often. The Gazette doesn't use men reporters for society? Well, they do now, dear. He didn't sound much like a reporter, though. He kept calling me honey. Tall, blonde, fast talker? Well, uh, yes. And you gave him my picture? Well, of course. What was his name? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, yeah. Funny name. Mm. I think it was Cluson. Lem Cluson. <laughs> But, Charlie, it's a matter of life and death. I've got to get a hold of Lem before noon. Well, like I said, he ain't been in. You sure he never told you where he works? No, he's come short for some private detective outfit. Oh, give me some nickels, lots of nickels. i got some telephoning to do. Acme Detective Agency. Do you have a man named Cluson working for you? Lem Cluson? No? Thanks. Brandon Agency? I want Mr. Cluson, Lem Cluson. Oh, yeah, I guess I have the wrong number. Hawkshaw Detectives, I'm looking for a man named Lem Cluson. No, I don't want to hire you to find him. But you're the last one in the book. He's got... Okay, sorry. No luck? No. See, I just remembered. Lem said the guy he worked for just opened up in town. Probably ain't no phone book yet. Go on, kid, get out of here. Bank tell a suicide, XP, read all Ah, that fresh kid, just because I won't let him in here peddling his papers, he yells in the door. Did he say bank suicide? He yells in here every darn day. Oh. Hey, wait, wait, hey, you didn't finish oh. your drink, hey? Hey, Newsy, Newsy, oh, hey, boy, hey, newspaper, boy, give me a book, boy. Read all about boy. it, bank suicide. Hey, you, boy. Paper lady? Did you say suicide? Right in the second national bank. You want a paper? Yeah, here. Guy's wife steps out with another joke. So the poor dope says, goodbye, Marge, and pulls the trigger. Here you are, lady. Frank suicide. Read all about it. Well, well, if it isn't Margie. Get away from me, Lem Cluson. Heard you were looking for me. Here I am. Boy, have I got a lot to tell you. Let me alone. I want to read. Oh, that write-up's no good. Here, give it here. Uh, yeah, that's better. Now, come on into Charlie's, and I'll give you the insight. Give me back my paper, you, you murderer. Murderer? Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I get it. You figure he bumped himself off on account of my report. <laughs> That's a screwy part. He didn't even wait for the report. I got it right here in my pocket. Take your hand off my arm. Oh, look, honey. Now, come on. You're coming into Charlie's if I have to drag Why you. Why don't you leave me alone? Yeah, I figured you'd be sore. I spouted off the way I did in Charlie's yesterday. But how did I know who you were? Oh, here we are. Hey, Charlie, yeah. two bourbon highs double. I don't want a drink. Should have seen my face this morning when that screwy friend of yours gave me the picture of your bridge oh, club. Oh, never mind. And there you were, as real as life and just as cute. I says to myself, why, you dumb ox, you got that little doll worried sick. And then when I read in the paper about my client giving your husband the gun to keep for fear he'll use it on himself, I think, holy cow. What did you say? And then I think, I bet she figures I planned the whole thing just to scare her. What do you mean? Oh, now, don't try to kid me, Margie. You know you figured that client of mine was your husband. That he was going to bump you off? You mean he wasn't? No, no. Your name's Banning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my client's name was Dentler, Benjamin Dentler. <laughs> Funny thing, his wife being named Margie, too. Yeah, I never thought he'd do it anyway. Oh, I think I'd like that drink after all. Well, here's to us, honey. So that's the gossip Lorraine was trying to tell me. Dentler, the teller from Chicago. You know, I've been thinking a lot about you. And Arthur you? really was keeping the gun for a friend of his. Hey, I'll tell you what, honey. I know a quiet little spot across town where we can eat, dance, anything we want. He might have told me about Dentler. It's a cute little place, baby. They got a knocked-out band and what a floor show. I wonder why Arthur wouldn't talk to me about it. Well, what do you say? Say? To what? Well, you and me, honey. Our date. Oh. <laughs> You're asking me to step out with you? <laughs> Why not? How about my husband? Oh, that mousy little guy. We got nothing to worry about from him. But I thought you always said, beware the quiet man. You never know what they're really thinking. But this is... No, but. 
If you'll pardon me, Mr. Lemclusen, I'm going home and start his supper. Thank you, Anne Southern, for a splendid performance. Miss Southern will be back in just a moment. Dora, I apologize. That show was better than a six no trump hand. Why, Mary, first thing you know, you'll be in Ed's class, quacking about Autolite resistor spark plugs like Donald Duck. Deal me a great big hand, Mary, and watch me get back that 200 we went down. You know, I must get me a set of those spark plugs. Why not? Ask Ed tomorrow to put a set of those Autolite resistor spark plugs in your car. Oh, well, then, May, will you tell Ed I'll be over tomorrow? I certainly will. My old car is going to get Autolite resistor spark plugs, too. Yes, switching to Autolite is safe, sane, sound, sober judgment and a sure way to spark plug satisfaction. That's why everybody's switching to Autolite. Autolite means resistor spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Miss Ann Southern. Hmm. I've enjoyed this appearance on Suspense very much. And as a regular Suspense listener, I'm looking forward to next week when Martha Scott stars in Crisis, a powerful study in... Suspense. Anne Southern appears by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, producers of Julia Misbehaves, starring Walter Pidgeon and Greer Garson. Tonight's suspense play was written by Toby Hall, with music composed by Lucian Morawick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Martha Scott in Crisis. calling the people of the USA. Here's your party, sir. Thank you. This is CARE Incorporated. It's been nine years now, nine years since Europe's people have been able to live decently, buy clothes to wear, get enough to eat. That's a long time. It's far too long. Our government is doing something about it. Its long-range program will help restore economic prosperity. But there won't be any immediate direct help for the people who are hungry today. They can look only to us, to you and me. We can send help through CARE. The 40,000 calories of food, good food, in a CARE package goes a long way. Because CARE is non-profit, government approved, it will deliver your package in Europe for just $10. $10 sent to CARE will supplement rations of a family of four Europeans for a month. Won't you help? Remember the name and address, CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. Museum. A museum of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a fountain pen, a cufflink, a high heel shoe, all are touched by murder. Now here's a scar, torn and ragged. The faded tartan, a cheap reproduction of the honorable colors of the Stuarts, red with green blue crossings, and a double over check of white and yellow. This scarf belonged to Walter Hoffman Pievsky, known to the police and his friends in the underworld as the Pike. 
There's no doubt about the scarf being his property, Superintendent. He was wearing it when he was sent to Dartmoor ten years ago. Ah, the description tallies, does it? Exactly. It's all written down in the prison property book, even to the patch on it. Mm. So the pike's our man. Right. Well, get him. And get him they did. And all because of a scarf, appropriately known in Cockney circles as a choker. The pike applied his choker to a human throat. The throat of the driver of a post office van. The pike pulled the choker too hard. It was instrumental in convicting him of murder. And that's why it's earned its place here in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Museum starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum. Beyond these gray walls, the mighty roar of London never stops. But in here, it's quiet. Come with me under the freeze of death masks. The masks of criminals of bygone days, suspended grimly under the ceiling. Come. To our right and left, rows of murder exhibits, each one carefully labeled. That cut glass scent spray, it's attractive even now. Might even take its place on Madame's dressing table. So we stop and read the label written under it. Yes, it's been used to spray anesthetic over the faces of helpless women as a prelude to murder. No sickly aroma now as we squeeze the bulb. Except for its grim associations, the fragile exhibit is insignificant, easily broken. But it was strong enough to hang the man who used it. There, there's a brass candlestick. Over there, a taper to go with it. Ah, here we are. Here's what we're looking for. The faded tartan scarf. As I take it out of the showcase, I ask you to come with me back to the time when this scarf was new, 15 years ago. Walter Piersky bought it from a stallholder in one of London's famous street markets, Petticoat Lane. Yes, sir. I'll take one of the scarves, mister. Right, sir! Fine East Worcester well then! What's your clan? Campbell's, Cameron's, MacDonald or MacLeod! All genuine tartan today down from the islands! All right, all right. I've bought it already. Don't need to give me that stuff. I'll take this one. It's the Stuart! And better than that you cannot do! Not half a nicker! Not five bob! Half a crown and cheap at the price! Thank you very much. Come and get your Scotch checkers from Honest John McKay. If your next wall... While Honest John continued his honest trade, the pike went about his own particular business. It was less exhausting than John's, and it was worked from a public call box. In professional circles, they called it the hospital trick. Hello? Uh, Is that Mrs. Peterson speaking? Yes, who's that? 
The London Hospital here, Mrs. Peterson. Hospital? Why, what's happened? Oh, there's no need for immediate alarm, but I'm sorry to say that your husband has met with a serious accident. Oh, Bill? Is he hurt? Oh, no, what's happened? He was knocked down by a bus in the Whitechapel Road about half an hour ago. A mean, crude trick. But more often than not, it worked. While the stricken woman hurried to the hospital to find the husband, who of course was not hurt at all, the pike would visit her house. With the coast clear, he would help himself to whatever he could lay his hands on and get out before the bewildered woman returned. And you notice that the pike could almost camouflage that accent he had. This gift gave him a confidence which was almost his undoing. One time when he and some friends were removing the entire contents of a house while the owners were away on holiday. What about the piano, Pike? Do we take that? Of course we take everything. Who'd think of moving out and leaving the piano behind, eh? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get us blue people like you, Will. <laughs> OK, boys, piano next. Oh, crikey, the phone. Here, what do we do about that? Let it ring, I suppose. No. Maybe it's someone's seen the van outside and checking up. I'd better answer it. Yeah, yeah, go easy, Don't Pike. worry, Ed. I know my job, don't I? Oh, yeah. Hello? Is that Mr. Wilson? No, I'm awfully sorry. He won't be back until about seven o'clock. I'm his brother-in-law. Can oh, I help you? if your sister's there... Oh, Julie's just gone out for half an hour. Can I take a message? Yes, I think you can. I'm her brother. Who the blazes are you? Quick, boys. Let's get out of here. Right out. So the piano was left behind after all. But Pike got away with most of the household belongings and observed not only were his operations becoming bolder, but he had planned his action carefully. He even knew that Mrs. Wilson's first name was Julie. But he didn't know she had a brother. That must have shaken him, because from then on he changed his tactics. The Pike entered the motor racket, a racket which was to take him in turn from Dartmoor prison to the scaffold. But in his early days as a motor thief, there was still a trace of strange humour about his work. The padlock car was a case in point. Who's that? Okay, Eddie, it's only me. <laughs> you wouldn't go reaching for a gun when Parky walks in on you. Oh, I'm oh, oh, sorry, Parky, it's me nerves. Well, relax. Now, listen to me, I've got a job for you. No, nah, no, nah, I'm laying off for a bit. Okay, well, who pays the rent? Oh, I'm only going in for the small stuff. Well, this is a small job I'm offering you. Uh. What is it, busting into the Bank of England, eh? <laughs> no, no, no. It's a simple matter of knocking off a nice new motor. Ah, uh, well, what's the dope? Well, it's this way. The car belongs to a fellow named Lambert who lives at 14 Graysdyke Crescent. See? He can't get it into the garage beside the house on account of it being too big. Why didn't the mug measure it before he bought it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not our concern. He locks the car up at night, and I've obtained a duplicate set of keys. Oh, nice work, nice yeah. work. Yeah, what do you want me in on the job for? You can do it yourself. Oh, there is a little complication. Oh, I thought there would be. This fellow Lambert is like a mother with a child over this car. He fixes it to a lamppost every night with two big padlocks and a double chain. Wonder he doesn't put a nappy on it. <laughs> well, what do we do? Take the lamppost as well as the car? And before I tell you, are you in with me? All right, Pike, I'm in. Then listen to what I tell you. In the early hours of the following morning, the pike and his assistant went along to Graysdyke Crescent, and there, sure enough, chained to the lamppost outside number 14, was a fine new motor car, its cellulose and chromium work glinting invitingly under the lamplight. We can clean up 450 on this, and all we've got to do is to remove the back wheel which is chained to the lamppost. We put on the spare and we're away. OK, pike. Let's get cracking. The offending wheel was removed from the axle and left, still chained, to the lamppost. And by the light of the helpful rays from above, the spare wheel was bolted on, the tools were replaced in the boot, and the two men climbed into the car. I hope that ignition key of yours works, Pike. Of course it works. I tried it out last night. Ah, uh, good for you. And here we go. <laughs> I told you it was going to be easy, didn't I, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> it's money for old rope. <laughs> ah, you're a good one, you are, my dear. Uh, just let me know when you need any more help. I'm your man. Walter Piewski pulled his tartan scarf snugly around his throat and agreed that he would certainly keep his assistant in mind. 
The car itself was taken to a garage where its numbers and appearance were carefully changed and, in due course, found its way by devious routes back to the open market. The pike, of course, had to split the profits which hurt him, so on his next job, he decided to work alone. And it was the next job which put him on the long, long walk which was to finish on the scaffold. Now, what's the number of that garage? Ah, here it is, I've got it. If this works, Park my lad, you're in the money. But it all depends on how good I can sound on the phone. Uh, I'll copy my father's voice, twist his soul. Here we go. Greens Motors, good evening. Hello? Uh, Brins? Yes, sir. Can I help you? Uh, my name is Maurice Bluet of 17 Grandford Court. Oh, yes, sir. I know. The big block of flats in uh, Collerton Drive. Uh, that's right. I am staying here with a friend, uh, Major General Lewis. Oh, yes, sir. He tells me that you have a new Rolls Coupe in your showroom. Yes, sir. Indeed we have. Yes. Well, I'm anxious to take such a car back to the continent with me, but... Time is pressing. Are and, uh, you at 17 Grandford Court now, sir? Yes, if someone could bring round the car, I, I should like to see it. Right, I'll, I'll be with you in a quarter of an hour, sir. Are you sure that is not too much trouble? Oh, no trouble at all, sir. Thank you very much for ringing. Thank you. I should be waiting for you. Fifteen minutes later, the car drove up to the block of flats. The driver salesman got out and went inside. Entering the lift, he went up to the third floor and knocked on the door of number 17. Needless to say, the occupier had never heard of either Maurice Bluett or Major General Lewis. But while the questions and explanations sorted themselves out, Walter Piewski was already driving the luxury car toward the garage where practiced hands were waiting to completely change its identity. First, what the Pike did not know was that he had provided the police with a vital clue and was to lead him first to prison and then, by reason of the tartan scarf, to the gallows. But the scarf was yet to earn its place, of course, among these strange exhibits here in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> And now we continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. We return to Walter Piewski, known as the Pike, elated at the success of his confidence car trick. He made a handsome profit on the rolls, and despite the fact that the police subsequently traced it, they never traced the theft back to the pike, not until he tried the same operation again. Certainly he changed the district, but, as is so often the case with a regular criminal, he develops regular habits, and the routine served up to the local garage was almost exactly as before. Yes, I'm staying with Sir Leslie, and he tells me you've got that straight eight in the showroom. I'm most anxious to take a car back to the continent with me, but... Time is pressing, and oh, you see... I'll be delighted to bring the car around to you right away, sir, if that's convenient. If you're sure that it's not too much trouble. No trouble at all, sir. I'll be with you in ten minutes. Oh, that is most kind. Thank you. Excellent. But you wouldn't think it was so excellent from your point of view if you knew what was happening at the garage, Pike. Uh, 
Hello? Give me the police. Is that Scotland Yard? Yes, information room. Listen, my name is Slater. I run a garage, uh, Carlsbrook Street, North 1. Yes, sir. A few weeks ago, the local police warned me about a car thief who worked a telephone trick, asking salesmen to take cars round to fake addresses for inspection. He just and... rung you, has he, Mr. Slater? Yeah. It might be him, or it might be genuine. But he asked me to take a car round to 21, Goldston Court, Cadimar Street. On the advice of Scotland Yard, Mr. Slater took the car to Goldston Court. To make it easier for the thief, he left the doors unlocked and went into the building. When he was safely inside, the pike left his telephone box and walked smartly over to the waiting motor. There were just two things he didn't know. First, an ignition wire had been snipped. And second, he was being watched. She'll never start until that broken wire is mended, Pike. You're wasting your time. You're going to waste a lot more time, too. Seven years, to be exact. Hello, sir. Uh, You're having a bit of starting trouble. Oh, hello, officer. Uh, Yes, I I don't know what's happened here. Uh, I'm used to this sort of thing, so is the other constable here. Oh, there's two of you. There's a lot more at the end of the road. Suppose you hop out of that and let us see whether we can't get the car going for you. No, I can manage. All the same, you might let us have a go for you. Okay. That's the idea. Are you the owner of this car? Hold him, George. He's got a knuckle there, sir. Let me go, you, you swamp. No, you don't. Oh, oh don't. Put the bracelets on him, quick. You all right, 71? Oh, well, how is he? Looks as if his jaw's broken, Inspector. Right, take this man to the station. What's his name? I'm talking. Very well. I'm charging you with grievous bodily harm and resisting arrest for the attempted theft of this vehicle. There may be further charges. There were further charges, including the theft of the big rolls. Walter Piefsky, alias the Pike, had played the same game once too often in a search of his flat in the East End, produced more evidence of his varied career in crime. The police been waiting for him to make his first mistake. This time he'd done it. At the Old Bailey, pleaded guilty to over a hundred crimes and there were hundreds more with which he was never charged. He was sent to prison for seven years, and immediately on his reception, his personal belongings were entered in the property book, and he was wearing the tartan scarf, which later was to hang him. Silviet, grey, seven and a half, collar, 16, brown, one scarf, red background, green and blue stripes, white and yellow overcheck. <laughs> a can to it. Oh, how do you know that, Peepsky? The fellow I bought it from in Petticoat Lane told ah, me. I'll take his word for it. Oh, there's a small tear, five inches in one corner. Been roughly patched. Yeah, better put that down. Don't worry, boys. I won't accuse you of doing it. Don't you worry. Out. I'll be retired by then. One pair of leather gloves, size eight. One pair of black socks, ten. Brown shoes, knee. The tartan scarf had been duly entered, and little did the retiring prison officer dream that his hastily scribbled details were to be subsequently brought up as key evidence in a murder trial. But Piewski signed the list of his personal property, and for the next seven years he was a guest of His Majesty's government in the most famous prison in England, Dartmoor. But in 1946, justice had run its course. The pike was given back his personal property, which included the tartan scarf, of course, all duly signed for, and so he was released upon a battle-scarred London. Time passed. And he added to his lawful wages by meagre pickings from the black market. And more time passed. Until one day the inspiration came to him like a bolt from the blue. He mulled it over in his mind. He carried out the research. And not until the plants were cut and dry did he put Ed Javison in the picture. This is it. This is going to be the clean-up, Eddie. Yeah, what is it, Pike? We're going to stick up a post office van, see? Uh, a post office van? Shh. I've been standing in for a chap selling papers right outside a big post office in the West End. Every night I've watched the mailbags coming out and going into the vans around six o'clock. Uh-huh. Well, the other night I hired a car and followed one. It cut through Braston Mews to Park Lane. Yeah, did you say you hired a car? Yes, what about it? Ah, uh, uh, never mind. Uh, go on. Well, I had it out three nights and I found the vans don't change their route. It's the Mews every time. Cuts off a bit of traffic, you see? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Now, the mews are very dark. Badly bombed and no residents that I could see. Yeah, I'll get it, yeah. All we have to do is get a fast car 
and wait there until the last van comes through. Yeah, how many are there? Only two. We draw our car out in the path of the second one, as if we were going to back into the garage, see? Yeah. The van stops. Yeah. We fix the two men in it, fill up our car from the back, and bring the stuff back here to salt. To salt? <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> yes, yes. Here we can bring it through the back way. When do we do it? Well, I think our most profitable haul will be tonight, Friday. Well, what about a car? Oh, you can leave that to me. And Walter Piewski ran through to Ford. He wanted a fast car in a hurry. He applied the methods he knew. He worked the telephone trick on a young and trusting motor salesman who duly delivered a shining, high-powered limousine to a block of flats. As he disappeared into the entrance, full of expectation, the pike drove off rapidly to Braston Mews, where his partner was waiting for him. The timing was perfect. As the car stopped, the first post office van was already approaching. Here, keep your head down, mate. Here it comes. The second one won't be more than a minute or so behind. We must turn the car broadside onto it. How did you get this bad? I'll tell you later. It's hand picked, see? <laughs> Plenty of room in the back for the luggage. There we are. Nothing can get by now. What happens if something tries to get through before the van arrives? Well, we make way for it and come back another night if necessary. Here, yeah, what's this? It's the van. We're going to be all right. And nobody about it. Couldn't be better. Now, get out. Yeah? Keep your chin tucked into your scarf like me. Oh, no. Pretend to be pushing the car. Right. What's up, Compton? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, afraid oh, so. Uh, yeah. Could, could oh. you give us a push? Sorry, it mustn't leave the van. Oh. oh. Well, look, in that case, I wonder if you'd like to earn yourselves ten bob, eh? If you could ring this number for us when you get to your own destination, it's it's my garage. I'd like him to send a breakdown for you, eh? That's the idea. Oh, don't mind doing that for you. I'll do it for nothing. Oh, thanks, Sam. You're very kind. If you got a pencil, I'll, I'll jot down my name. It's rather a difficult one. Yeah, here's a pencil. Oh! Help! Dirty thieves! Oh. That's got the both of us. We'll start getting the bags out, quick. No, you don't. I'll shut you up, you snivelling idiot. I'm choking... This skull's choking me. Here, quick in the bag, Ed. Oh, no, here they come. Look, <laughs> darling, you'll swing for it. <gasps> Start getting the stuff in the car. Okay. <laughs> oh, right, that's about as much as we can take. Uh, oh, what's happened to the driver? Oh, don't worry about him. Get moving. Here. Here, look at his tongue. His eyes. You've killed him. Stop talking. Get on with the job. There's a car coming. They've got us in their headlights. It's the cops. Well, let's get out of here. Oh, tight on the corner. Keep going there after us. Oh, watch the traffic lights. They're red. Something's coming. Oh, we got through. Oh, I thought we'd had him. Oh. Uh, the police car's hold up by the other car. But get away, Ed. I'm going to make it. Wait the men! Slow up, we can't get round! <laughs> Ed Javison died in that crash, so mutilated that his body could not be identified. By some miracle, the pike escaped and staggered away into the shadows. But his tartan scarf was still round the throat of his victim, lying in the mews. Now let Superintendent Brandreth take up the story of the hunt. Well, the hunt was soon over. In fact, as soon as the car was reported stolen, I had a call from one of my inspectors. I thought you'd like to see this. What is it, Harrison? Oh, stolen car. Hmm? Well? Well, I checked with criminal records, sir. Yeah, there was something familiar about the method. You know, calling up a garage and getting the salesman to deliver the car to a block of flats. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the list of men who practiced that. Now, these two are inside at present. Yes. This one's going straight. Well, he's out of London anyway. Hmm, that leaves this one, Walter Piewski. Yes, sir. The Pike. Know where to find him? Yeah, he's sharing a place with a man named Javison in the East End. Right. Bring him in. Yes, sir. But before the Pike was picked up for questioning about the car, his scarf was... The car was immediately recognized as the one which we believe Piewski had stolen. In theory, the evidence against him was already piling up. If he was the car thief... He was probably the murderer as well. But I needed that extra piece of evidence. I called for everything that was known about him, including the list of his personal property which he had signed in prison. 
It was a shot in the dark, but it yielded results. There's no doubt about the scarf being his property, Superintendent, even to the patch on it. Within 24 hours, the pike was caught. Still dazed by the car crash, he offered no resistance. In due course, he was convicted of the murder of William Price, the driver of the post office van. And at 8 o'clock, one cold morning in February, he was hanged. All because of this tartan scarf, which has earned its place today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Now here in person is Orson Welles. Under English law, there are no degrees of murder, and the death sentence has to be pronounced on a man or woman convicted of the crime. Recommendations to mercy by the jury are always carefully considered. But in the case of Walter H. Piewski, no such recommendation was made. The evidence against him was unshakable, and on the eve of his execution, he reproached himself bitterly, not for the death of his victim, or even his unfortunate partner, but for two other reasons. The supreme crime of murder had brought him no profit, and as his last hour approached, he became increasingly angry at his own forgetfulness. Ah, oh, yes, they usually overlook something. And that's why the faded piece of tartan has earned its place here among the other exhibits in the Black Museum. Now until we meet again in the same place for another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. Museum starring Orson Welles is presented by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer Radio Attractions, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch, produced by Harry Allen Towers. <laughs> Thank you.
Gentlemen, Mr. Jeffers. Be seated, gentlemen. Be seated. The entire board is here, Mr. Jeffers, except Williams of the credit department. And why is he not here, Mr. Wilson? His wife is sick, sir. But his reports are ready. I've brought them for him. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We'll get to the credit reports in just a minute. Uh, Gentlemen, uh, this is a sales meeting. And the purpose of this meeting is sales. And uh, what creates sales, Mr. Wilson? A satisfied client and a client who is able to pay the price we ask. A satisfied client represents a sale already made, Mr. Wilson. To sell a product, the maker of that commodity must first create a demand for his product and then deliver to the satisfaction of his customer. But, uh, Mr. Jeffers, so far the market's been small. Our uh, prospects are limited. We sell an expensive item, Mr. Weatherby. But market research will reveal to us a larger demand for our product than you realize. So to make more sales, we must investigate the market more thoroughly. We're in business for profit, and we need a greater turnover. We mustn't forget the risks, though, Mr. Jeffers. Yes, we must give great consideration to credit risk, Mr. Wilson. And the percentage of profit must outweigh the percentage of risk. And where does our greatest risk lie? With uh, our clients? Exactly right, Mr. Weatherby. Therefore, the character, the reliability, the motives, and the credit rating of our prospective clients must be given careful scrutiny. Because we must remember, gentlemen, that the commodity we sell is murder. And now meet Dick Colmer as Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> What's the matter, Blackie? Nothing to do? Plenty to do, Mary. Only I don't have any of the details. Maybe I'd feel better if I knew what you're talking about. It's just this. I've had at least three tips during the past week that a new murder gang is working in this town, and Faraday hasn't told me a thing about them, nor has there been anything in the papers. Maybe the gang hasn't started operations yet. That's not the way I heard it. I'm more puzzled by the fact that Faraday's keeping quiet than I ever was in any case I've worked. Have you tried seeing the good inspector, much as I'd rather you didn't? I've tried phoning him, but he won't answer once he finds out who's calling. And my trick voices don't work with Faraday. He's too smart. Oh, the inspector would give an awful lot to hear you say those words. One of the reasons they're so valuable is that I'll never say them to him. But I'm still puzzled about this situation. You could be just as puzzled at dinner, and I'd like it better on account of I'm hungry. Your appetite and your figure are the greatest contradictions I've ever seen. I keep then worrying about you. (laughs) In that case, and rather than have you put on any weight, I think I'd better get down to headquarters and see Faraday. The police are selling tickets for some children's benefit, and I haven't bought any yet, so I might as well get them from a pal. There's nothing I can say to stop you from going, Blackie. hmm? You want to keep thin, don't you, Mary? Oh, I see what you mean. Goodbye, Blackie. Uh, Come in, Matthews. My name isn't Matthews, Faraday, but I'll accept the invitation. Get lost, Blackie. I'm busy. I get lost. You'll be busy trying to find me. The only place I want to find you is out. Well, that's where you'll find me. If you come to my apartment to sell me tickets to the children's benefit, so I've come down to your office to buy them. Well, I've got more to worry about today than selling tickets. Well, I'll make it easy for you. This is the last day of the sale. I'll buy every ticket you have left. I'll give you a check for them right now. Okay, here are ten tickets. Now get out of here! Where will I make out the check? Say, uh, what's troubling you today, Faraday? What's usually troubling me? Murder. Oh, uh, tell me about it, Inspector. Your troubles are over. It isn't it, it's them. At any minute, I expect to hear about another one. I haven't seen anything in the papers about murders. That's because I can't prove there's been a murder. I know of five killings in the last month, but I can't prove one of them. Elusive killers? Elusive corpses. In the last 30 days, five men have disappeared without a trace. I even know who killed them. But I can't prove murder because I can't find the victims. Good old corpus delecti, huh? Uh, Complicates more murder cases. Who's the trigger man? It's not one trigger man. It's a whole corporation which is selling murder. Wholesale. Wait a minute. You know all this, but you can't do a thing about it? Nothing but wait for the corporation to make a slip. It's run like a business, Blackie. And by a former big businessman, too. Ed Jeffers. He used to be head of a large wholesale house. Here's your check for the tickets. Thanks. You certainly were informative, Faraday. You haven't told me about this case before. Why now? Because I don't want to be bothered with your questions. <laughs> but you do want to be bothered with my health, don't you? Oh, do what you want. Who cares? I can. 
Now, uh, just tell me where this murder syndicate can be found, and the corporation will have company. Hello. Mr. Jeffers, please. Speaking. Uh, Mr. Jeffers, this is Weatherby. Oh, yes, Weatherby. I've been waiting to hear from you. Did you close the deal with Harry Brown? Yes, sir. I just took care of it. Fine, fine. You fulfilled every clause in the contract? Yes, sir. You can tell Mr. Brown everything's been taken care of. I'll be happy to. I have another prospect for you, Weatherby. It's a Robert Engels of 11 Elm Road. But I must warn you to exercise the usual extreme caution. Investigate the prospective client's background thoroughly. Don't worry, Mr. Chambers. I know how to handle these things. I have the greatest confidence in you, Weatherby. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, uh, Wilson. Yes, Mr. Jeffers? There's a gentleman in the outer office waiting to see me. Will you send him in? Yes, sir. Thank you. Come in. Mr. Jeffers? Yes, come in. Thank you. My name is Jones, Mr. Jeffers. John J. Jones. Yeah, sit down. Thank you. Uh, I'll come right to the point. I need your services. My services? I don't understand. I happen to know what you sell, Mr. Jeffers. And it isn't what the name of your company implies. (laughs) I don't know what ever gave you that idea, Mr. Jones. Uh, We import some of the finest woolens in America. Oh, then maybe I do have the wrong place. You have the wrong name, Mr. Boston Blackie. My face is familiar. And your tactics, Blackie. Now, uh, what can I do for you? Nothing, I suppose. What you can do for me isn't important. If I were you, I'd worry about what I'm going to do to you. Inspector Faraday, the Missing Persons Bureau, just phoned. Again, Matthews? Who's missing this time? A man named Johnson. The Missing Persons Bureau questioned his wife, and she said Johnson's only enemy was Harry Brown. Well, let's get hold of Brown. He's already done that, Inspector. He has a perfect alibi. Johnson left his own office at 5 this afternoon. He told his wife he'd be home at 6. Brown was at home at 5 and was still there when we questioned him at 8 this evening. Mm. Several friends were with him all the time, and one of them is a friend of the mayor's. Brown's alibi is perfect. Well, in that case, Brown certainly didn't kill Johnson. Now, Brown has money, of course. Yes, a lot. Then this is another one of those things. Another killing by those guys who sell murder. You have everything but a body and proof, Inspector. Yeah, I've got everything, all right. The best police force in the country. The best scientific methods of crime detection. The best criminologists in the world. But I've also got a company specializing in murder. And that's exactly what they're getting away with. I'm sorry I'm late. Have you ordered dinner? No. I've been waiting for you. I expect you to be late when you're working on a case. How do you know I'm working on a case? Your face has a puzzled look. (laughs) I know. Any of the pieces missing? None of the important ones. I don't (laughs) think. Let me see. One nose, two eyes. No. You're all there, Blackie. That's not Faraday's opinion, believe me. I just called the inspector and found there's been another killing. That makes six. And the police can't even find one of the bodies. How can you say there's been a murder when there isn't even a body? I can't. But Faraday's so certain the missing men have been killed. I've gone along with the murder theory, too. Oh? Faraday even knows of the corporation that has killers for hire. Huh? It uh, sounded just like you said something about a corporation that sells murder. It's not funny, Mary. I went up to see the president of the company this afternoon, and I think Faraday's right. Oh, Blackie, it's too fantastic to believe. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. John Gardner phoned your apartment looking for you. Gardner? What did that weak sister want? Well, he said something about socking you on sight. That's the best news I've had all day. What? He's suffering from a bad case of too much money and too little feeling for his fellow man. He's putting pressure on a little shopkeeper I know, and I've warned him to lay off. Oh, that's my Blackie. Always helping somebody else out and getting himself in trouble. Oh, God, there's no trouble, Mary. I can handle three like him as an appetizer. Well, if you can, you'd better begin now. He must have followed me here because he's heading for this table right now. Oh? So I found you, have I, Blackie? So it seems. Go away, Gardner. I'm going to have my dinner. You won't have any teeth to eat it with after I get through with you. You're kidding, of course. Get up for that table and see if I am. Don't do it, Blackie, please. Hiding behind your girlfriend, are you? Well, that's what I thought. They call you Boston Blackie, but you're a little yellow. Excuse me, Mary. Blackie. What were you saying, Gardner? I was saying I'm going to knock your teeth in. Right now. 
My teeth seem to be still there. I wonder if your chin will be in a second. <laughs> Get up, Gardner. Get up and get out of here. All right, Blackie. Only I won't forget this. And believe me, I'll see to it that you never do either. Hello. Oh, hello, Blackie. This is Faraday. Oh, hello, Inspector. I, I don't just... want to hear what you say. I want you to hear what I say. Okay, say away. What's the idea of clipping John Gardner, Blackie? The best idea I've had in months. Oh, it was a good idea, was it? Well, this is not in my department, but I got wind of it. So I'm just giving you a little tip. You just slugged your way into a good case of assault. You don't say. Gardner just filed a complaint against you. Well, that's not the only complaint he has against me, but this is the first one he's ever had nerve enough to file. I don't know anything about that. I just want to tell you, a sergeant from the 18th Precinct is coming up to arrest you. I don't want you to pull any tricks. All right, Faraday. I'll promise to be a good boy. Good to myself. I'm leaving here right now. Blackie, if Gardner makes that complaint stick, you're going to be in a jam. Why did you clip him? I had a reason, Faraday. You see, he had a chin I love to touch. And now back to Boston Blackie. Ed Jeffers runs a well-ordered business in a strictly business-like manner. But what his company sells is murder. Police in Boston Blackie are sure of Jeffers' activities, but cannot prove murder against him because they have no evidence. And the bodies of six men his firm has allegedly killed cannot be found. Unable to make headway with a baffling case, Blackie apparently drops the matter to settle a personal difference with wealthy John Gardner. As we return to our story, Gardner is at home. Yes? Uh, Mr. Gardner, there's a gentleman to see you. Tell him I see people by appointment only, Jameson. I told him that, sir, but he says the matter is urgent. Now tell this man... Well, all right, all right, Jameson. I'll see him. Very good, sir. Uh, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Gardner will see you in the library. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Come in, sir. That'll be all, Jameson. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? <laughs> I think there's something I can do for you, Mr. Gardner. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Wilson. I represent the Jeffers Importers. I'm not interested in... Ah, but you'll be very interested in our services, Mr. Gardner. We, uh, we do specialized work, and I can assure you that we're the best and most thorough in the business. The best and most thorough at what? Uh, Mr. Gardner, we read in the papers last evening that you brought an assault charge against Boston Blackie. Yes, it's true, I did, but that uh, has nothing to do Mr. with... Mr. Gardner, the... if you won't take offense... Uh... During the past 12 hours, my company has taken the liberty of investigating your background, your character, and your financial status, and your, uh, well, uh, acceptability as a client. What in the world are you talking about? Your acceptability as a client, Mr. Gardner. This isn't the first time you've had trouble with Boston Blackie, and it probably won't be the last. But buy what we have to offer, and we'll settle everything for you. What, uh, what do you have in mind? <laughs> Murder, Mr. Gardner. Murder. You, uh, you'll, uh, kill Boston Blackie? Well, for a price, and I don't hesitate to say it'll quite naturally be a considerable sum. Yes, naturally. Of course, you're interested, Mr. Gardner. Well, I don't know. How can I be sure I, I won't be involved? Oh, you won't be. You see, our method is flawless. First, we investigate our prospective clients. Our investigation determines whether or not they'll cooperate with us in keeping quiet about what we do for them. Oh, I see. Then we, uh, we kill the person. Our client is not involved in the crime because we kill his enemy at a time our client has a perfect alibi. You're very thorough. Mm, very. The killer, one of our employees, can't be charged with a crime because the police can never prove a connection between the killer and his victim. <laughs> Besides, the victim's body disappears. Do you uh, see how perfect our method is? Yes, quite clearly. Well, uh, what do you say, Mr. Gardner? Mr. Wilson, you have a client. I got Gardner, Mr. Jeffers. Here's the money. He paid the entire amount in advance. You're a good salesman, Mr. Wilson. Well, Weatherby, we have another account for you to service. What do I call kill this time? Boston Blackie. Blackie, huh? Well, I hope we got a good price. Make the job as good as the price and we'll all be satisfied. Well, it would be just as good as all the others. Maybe better. Where does Blackie live? At 6 Sunset Park, apartment 9A. Sam here will give you all the data you need on Blackie, the layout of his apartment, his habits, and so on, the usual material. 
Within 24 hours, the terms of our contract with Mr. Gardner must be and will be fulfilled. Hello? Hello, Mary. This is Blackie. Hello, Blackie. Where are you? In my apartment. Oh. Well, I told you your fight with Mr. Gardner would make the papers. Aren't you sorry you hit him now? I'm just sorry I didn't hit him harder. Blackie, what's the matter with you? Nothing. I just don't like guys who... Uh-oh. Hey, what's the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all. Oh. Blackie! 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 I'll get you another way, Blackie. Not with your gun. It stays on the floor where I just knocked it. Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, then you go on the floor with it. <coughs> yeah, you fuck. <coughs> oh. Well, you want to get up for more? No, thanks. Then I'll help you. There. Who are you? None of your business. You came up behind me with a gun in your hand. I suppose that was none of my business either. You're one of Ed Jeffers' men, aren't you? I'm not saying. Well, I am. To tell you the truth, I thought someone like you might come calling. That's why I sat so I could look in the mirror and see what was behind me. You sound like you were expecting me. I was expecting someone. What's your name? You mean to say there's something the great Boston Blackie doesn't know? How would you like the great Boston Blackie to go to work on you to find out what your name is? It's Weatherby. That answers my first question. My next is, who sent you here? This was my own idea. Oh, it's going to be like that, huh? You wouldn't happen to know a man named Jeffers. Who? You're being awfully stupid, Weatherby. But then you were pretty stupid to think that you could keep getting away with what you and your boss were doing. Let's get down to police headquarters. Maybe Faraday can think of a way to improve your memory. Inspector, I've got to see you. Uh, Apparently. From the way you just crashed into my office, Miss Wesley. Look, Inspector, a little while ago I was talking on the phone to Blackie when suddenly something happened. I know what it was. He got tired of talking to you. No, 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 Inspector. He stopped so abruptly. I know something happened to him. I tried to get you on the phone, but you weren't in. I just got here. Well, Miss Wesley, either Blackie hung up or someone hung one on him. Now, I got no time. Oh, now, look. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hello. Hello, Barney. This is Blackie. Oh, fine. I've got Miss Wesley here. She's scared stiff. Now, what goes on? Plenty. Tell Mary I'm all right. I tried to call her back, but her line was busy. Well, I'm busy, too. What is this, the telephone exchange? No, but I'm doing a little exchanging. I'm exchanging a theory of mine for the murder syndicate you're trying to grab. And I'll be down to headquarters with the syndicate's production manager in half an hour. Here he is, Barney. His name is Weatherby, and he's one of the syndicate's killers. How many men have you killed for Jeffers, Weatherby? Two, three, four? Uh, I'll handle them, Blackie. Sure, when I'm through. Weatherby, you were hired by Gardner to get me, weren't you? Come on, talk. Talking bores me. Weatherby, I'm going to give you two... It's no use, Faraday. We're going to have to find a way to make him talk. I know a way. Only regulations won't let me use it. How did you grab him, Blackie? He sneaked up on me while I was on the telephone in my apartment. That is, he thought he was sneaking up on me. Mm, But you just happened to see him in the mirror, huh? I was looking in the mirror, just waiting for him. And the minute he got close enough, I clipped him with the telephone. Great, so we got him. So what do we have? Nothing. You're not very complimentary, Inspector. Come on, this other room a minute, Faraday. I have one more idea. Yeah. Well, if it works as well as your others, I hope it's your last idea for 20 years. Things are really working out better than you think. You almost get yourself killed and you say things are working out? Yes, Faraday. I'll tell you a little secret. Go ahead. I'm sure Jeffers plans to try to kill me. And I plan to stop him. The plan of one of us is going to work. Jeffers, I want to talk to you. Well, sit down, Mr. Gardner, sit down. I know exactly what you want to talk to me about, too. Yes, you should. I know Boston Blackie is still alive. I know... And I know I paid you to kill Boston for me. But your man didn't kill him. Do you want your money refunded? I'd rather have Boston Blackie dead. In that case, I promise you, you are a satisfied customer. Give us another 24 hours and we'll fulfill the terms of our contract. Phone Blackie and have him up to your house for a reconciliation. Have him there at 10 o'clock tonight. All right. Make sure the servants are out. I'll ring the bell at 10. You'll open the door for me and then join some friends next door so you'll have an alibi. All right, Mr. Jeffers. Very good. I'll see you at 10, Mr. Gardner, because this job I'm going to do myself. (laughs) 
Well, you're right on time, Mr. Jeffers, and you are doing this job yourself. I promised I would, Mr. Gardner. Is uh, Blackie here? Yes, in the library. Alone? I told you we'd be alone here. <laughs> Who's that? Blackie, in the library. I thought you said he was alone. He is. Oh, why is he laughing? We're going over some old cartoons. He must be leafing through the rest of them. You see, we patched up our differences. Uh, he thinks. He has no idea whom I came to the door to meet. Fine. Now, where is he sitting in there? In what position? Well, if he's just as I left him, he has his back to the door, sitting in a low-back chair. You can open the door and get a clear shot at him. You're being a great help, Gardner. I really shouldn't charge you the full fee for this. <laughs> All right, never mind. Get the job done. It's as good as done right now. Oh, you're leaving? Yes. I want to be sure I'm next door when the shots are heard. You will be. Good night. <laughs> Don't move, Blackie. Oh, hello, Jeffers. You want to see these cartoons? They're wonderful. And I'll have to take your word for it. But you won't have to take my word for the fact that you'll be dead in 30 seconds. Take my gun's word for that. You're going to kill me, are you? That's what he thinks. Huh? Drop that gun, Jeffers. Faraday. I said drop the gun. <laughs> oh, my hand. You're not hurt, friend. Guns in guys' hands make me nervous. Oh, though. about fists. <laughs> you want to play, do you? Keep away from here, Blackie. This is my fun. Okay. Go ahead. Enjoy yourself, Faraday. <laughs> Hey, hey, you handled your hands pretty well, boy. Nice going. Thanks. Well, we've got enough on this guy now to hang him. Providing we can get Gardner to talk, where is he? He's supposed to be right outside the door. Oh, Gardner. Right here, Blackie. Well, apparently our plan worked. That's the president of the murder syndicate lying there on the floor. Yeah, and we've got enough on him to hang him now. Thanks for your help, Gardner. Oh, that's perfectly all right. But the next time you and I stage a fist fight like we did in the restaurant... Take it easy, will you, Blackie? <laughs> My jaw still hurts. Oh, well, I had to make that punch good. I had to hit you hard enough to knock out a gang of killers. Some night. Some rain, eh, Jack? Yeah, it is, Tom. No kind of a night to be hauling $100,000 in cash to the countryside. All you gotta do is protect the dough. I gotta drive this truck. And I ain't sure if we're in the country or the city. This rain's so thick I can't see ten feet in front of me. It is a heavy rain, all right. Yeah, it's some black night, too. If it wasn't for that white line in the middle of the road, I'd have to pull up and wait for the rain to quit. Oh, I guess there's no danger of running off the road as long as you can see that line, Tom. No, but it's the only thing keeping us on the road. Well, let's step on it, huh? We'll get where we're going fast. Uh-uh, enough. Jack. Nothing doing. The road's too slick. There's no telling who will meet her on the next bend. There's nobody on this road on a night like this, Tom. Anyhow, this isn't the main highway. It's just the truck route. Truck route, yeah. If I was hauling anything but a load of cash, I wouldn't have to drive on a night like this. I'd be able to... Uh-oh. There's a turn up ahead. Boy, I'd have sure kept going straight if it wasn't for that white line. Boy, will I be glad when I get this... Tom, look out! What? We're off the road! You're heading for those big trees! Jump, Jack! Jump! 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 <laughs> <laughs> what a plan, Harry. What a plan. That armored truck cracked up just the way I said it would. Yeah, Bob. Split wide open. Now all we gotta do is climb in and haul out that hundred grand. Ah, uh, sure thing. But first go around to the cab of the truck and see how the driver is. And if the crash didn't kill him, see that you do.
Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to wind up with me depending for my life on the only weapon I've got. A mighty powder puff. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do. Steve, how would you go about firing a rocket if the firing mechanism was frozen? What? You mean you'd drag me in here just to try out a riddle on me? I'm serious. Now answer my question. Okay, okay. So if the firing mechanism was frozen, I probably wouldn't be able to fire the rocket. I suppose that's the wrong answer. No, it's the right answer. And that's what's wrong. Right? Wrong? Hey, look, before we get into a vaudeville routine, I think you'd better start at the beginning. Steve, as you know, the entire Arctic area is a potential battleground. But sub-zero temperatures do a lot of strange things to weapons of war, all the way from impairing their accuracy to rendering them completely useless. So what am I supposed to do? Dream up a new plastic made out of pumpkin seeds to protect them from the cold? You don't have to. It's already been dreamed up. I don't think it's made out of pumpkin seeds, but it's a liquid which does protect weapons and electronic devices from the effects of sub-zero temperatures. Well, that's all very interesting. Commissioner, but I still don't see where I fit into the deal. I'm coming to that. The private company which developed this new plastic has just concluded exhaustive field tests with it up in the Arctic. They learned under actual conditions just how much of this liquid is to be used, how it's applied, and how it affects the accuracy of the weapons. In short... In short, they found out a lot of pretty important information. Vital eh? information, Steve. Their field representative, a man named Holcomb, wrote up a complete report on it for the Western Hemisphere Defense Meeting, which is slated to be held in Quebec, Canada, tomorrow. Oh, I get it. You want me to go up to Quebec and bodyguard this guy Holcomb? I'm afraid it's a little too late for that. Last night, Mm -hmm. on a side street in Quebec, they found Holcomb's body. Mm -hmm. He was quite dead. What? And the report was missing. It's vital we get it back. Any contacts in Quebec who might be able to help me? One, Jack Manville, head of research for the plastic company. He's waiting for you in Quebec right now. Now, Steve, get up there, talk to Manville, and go anywhere and do anything that's necessary to find that report. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. In all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Just a simple matter of flying to Canada to find a missing report containing secret information about Arctic warfare. The only hitch is whoever's got the report is already killed to get it, and it's a cinch he'll kill to keep it. All of which means happy times ahead for lucky me. Well, it's Thursday when my plane lands in Quebec. Jack Manville of the plastic company is waiting for me at the airport, and he hustles me into his car. Looks like a real nasty mess, Mitchell. Yeah. How much do you know about it, Manville? Not very much, I'm afraid. Holcomb went up to the Arctic and made the tests. Brought a report back to present at the defense meeting. Last night, they found his body, and the report's missing. You're uh, head of research for the company, aren't you? Yes, that's right. But you didn't make the trip up north with Holcomb? Oh, I couldn't get away. Well, I told him to wire me when he got back here to Quebec, and he did, so I flew up here to meet him. Looks like I got here too late. Holcomb was the best friend I had, Mitchell. Yeah. You know, that report he had, I suppose you know it's worth a lot of money. Money? Yeah. I'm sure that certain interests would pay a big pile to get their hands on it. And wouldn't be too particular what else they had to do to get it. Well, my job's developing plastics. I'm afraid I'm not up on the international aspects of it. Sure. Uh, you happen to know if Holcomb was alone here in Quebec? No, his secretary, Phyllis Baxter, was waiting for him here. Oh, and I guess we'd better talk to her. See if she can give us any additional information. I thought you'd want to talk to her. That's where we're heading now. Oh, good. You know her pretty well? Oh, just slightly. Why? Uh, she pretty trustworthy? Uh, sure, as far as I know. No, this is her apartment house here. Mm. When did the Holcomb arrive in Quebec? The day before yesterday. And he was killed last night. Well, that means he was in town about 24 hours. I... Go ahead. I, I didn't get in until this morning. The way things turned out, I sure wish I'd gotten here sooner. 
Uh, when did Phyllis Baxter arrive, do you know? Several days ago, I think. Uh, oh, this is her apartment. Uh. Looking for Miss Baxter? Eh? Uh, yeah, I am. Afraid you're a little too late. What do you mean? I'm Mrs. Gaines, the manager here. Miss Baxter moved out last night. What? Uh, you know where she went? Well, she didn't say. Left in sort of a hurry. Oh, great. Where could she have gone, Mitch? I don't know where, but I've got a pretty good idea of why. Uh, Mrs. Gaines, have you had her apartment cleaned up yet? Oh, no. I haven't had time. Well, I'd like to have a look uh, inside, maybe get some kind of a lead. Uh-huh. You a policeman or something? <laughs> or something. Here are my credentials. Mm-hmm. I see. All right. Well, there you are. Help yourself. I'll be down the hall if you need me. Thanks. Come on, Manville. All right. Mitchell, I can't believe Phyllis could be involved in this thing. Oh? Why can't you, Manville? Well, it, it just doesn't seem like her. She's always been... Wait a minute. What is it? Some ashes here in the fireplace. Yeah. A couple of pieces of charred paper. You think that could be the missing report? It might be. I don't understand. If Phyllis did steal the report, why should she destroy it? Because she was through with it. We're through with it? Well, look, man, she couldn't memorize a report like that. Well, that's not what I mean. Let's see. Not in the room anywhere. Let's try the closet. No, nothing but a few empty hat boxes and... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, here we are. A couple of white enamel pans, a bottle of hypo solutions. Oh, that's photographic equipment. Yeah, there's your answer, Manville. She knew that report was too bulky to carry, so she transferred it to microfilm. Where are you going? Down to police headquarters. Somehow I still can't believe it. She had anything to do with this. Uh, look, what kind of a description of her can you give me? Well, she was blonde, but... Medium height, maybe five four, blue eyes. Pretty, but I guess that's about it. Well, that isn't much help. I know it's pretty general, but it's the best I can do. You want me to give you a lift to police headquarters? No, thanks. I want to talk to the manager here again. All right, you call me if I can give any more help, will you? I will. Uh, Mrs. Gaines? Yes? I'd like a little more information from you about Phyllis Baxter. Well, afraid I can't help you much there. She was only here for a few days. Does she have any visitors? I wouldn't know. She came and went mostly by night. Huh. Well, I guess my chances aren't too good. Trying to find a blonde girl with blue eyes of probably several thousand like that right here in Quebec. Well, one thing's sure. You'll never find Phyllis Baxter if you're looking for a blonde girl with blue eyes. What do you mean by that? Oh, she was a brunette with dark eyes. What? But, man, they'll just talk... Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe you'd better describe Phyllis to me. Well, as I said, she was a brunette. Rather tall girl, quite beautiful. She always used a great deal of makeup, as I remember. Mascara and heavy lipstick. I see. Well, thanks, Mrs. Gain. Thanks a lot. So, Manville was lying to me, and at this point he looks like number one on my suspect list. I start checking on him, and what I find out makes him sound even more interesting. Then I go to police headquarters and talk to a Lieutenant Billings. Well, Mitchell, I'll put out this description of Phyllis Baxter you've given me. See if any of my men can spot her. Okay. Well, of course, she's had a 24-hour head start. She could be long gone by this time. I know. You uh, think Manville is behind the scheme, eh? I don't know exactly where he fits in, Billings, but it sure looks like he's involved somehow. In the first place, he gives me a phony description of Phyllis. In the second place, he said he'd only know her slightly, and yet he took me right to her apartment. So after I got the real description of her from the manager... I started checking up on Manville, and I caught him in another lie. Oh? He told me that he didn't arrive here in Quebec until this morning, but I found out by checking the airport that his plane landed last evening. I see. Well, want to make an arrest? Not yet. It's more important that I find out where that report is, and to do that... Come in. Well, Manville. Hello, Mitchell. I knew you'd be here. I want to talk to you. Well, that's sort of a surprise, Manville. I thought you'd already done your talking. I lied to you about Phyllis's description. Yeah, I know. Why'd you lie? Well, because Phyllis and I were... Well, let's just say I had it pretty bad for her. Oh? I just couldn't believe, and I, I still don't believe she's involved in this, but, well, I guess I was trying to protect her. Well, that wasn't very smart, Manville. Yes, I know that now. Uh, you also lied about when you arrived here in Quebec. Yes. Why? I came here earlier than I said so I could be with Phyllis, but for several reasons I can't afford to have it known that I was involved with her. I see. Well, so far you haven't been what I'd call helpful in this deal, man, though. Well, maybe I can make up for it with this. Hmm? Here. A snapshot. That's right. A snapshot of Phyllis. Huh. Mrs. Gaines was right. She does wear pretty heavy makeup. Okay, this is more like it, Manville, Lieutenant. I'd like you to have a lot of copies made of this picture. 
Right. We'll put them out at the railroad depots, the airports, and all bus stations. Could be we're not too late after all. Summers, Lieutenant Billings, I'm sending a picture down to you. I want a hundred copies right away. Send some to the airport, some to the railway depot, the rest all... Two hours. We ought to be hearing something soon. She could still be hiding somewhere here in Quebec. Yeah, but I doubt it. Her job probably is to get that microfilm somewhere in a hurry. Lieutenant Billing speaking. What's that? You're certain? I see. Right. I'm afraid we are too late after all, Mitchell. What do you mean? A girl answering Phyllis Baxter's description boarded a plane for Paris three hours ago. Paris? Huh. Well, we've got an agent in Paris. Slater. Okay. I'll cable him to meet her plane, and I'll be on the next one. Fifteen hours later, I'm in Paris, but Slater isn't at the airport. I start walking towards the taxi stand, and then I spot a little guy hurrying after me. Uh, Mr. Mitchell! Uh, Mr. Mitchell! Huh? Uh, Mr. Slater asked me to meet your plane. I recognize you from the description he gave me. I am Jacques Duval, European representative for the plastic company. Oh, where is Slater? At the railroad depot. He wants you to come there immediately. What's he doing at the railroad depot? Didn't he grab Phyllis here at the airport? She was not on the plane. What? Oh, great. Don't tell me they made a mistake back in Quebec. Uh, Come, I I will take you to Slater. There is Mr. Slater over there, Mitchell. Yeah, I see him. Hi, Slater. Well, what's the deal? A uh, merry-go-round, you mean? I got your cable and met the plane all right, but when it landed, no Phyllis. I don't get it. Uh, neither did I. So I made a quick check and found out the plane landed in Ireland first. She must have gotten off there. She did get off there, Steve. I found that out, too. But from there, according to what I could piece together, she grabbed a plane for London, then a boat across the Channel, and the boat train here to Paris. That is the boat train just arriving over there now. Boy, she's sure trying to cover her tracks. That was good work, Slater. I... Hey, wait, look. That's Phyllis who just got off. Come on. Hey, she looks like she's trying for that other train standing there. Yeah, what train is that, Duval? Uh, the Orient Express. Its final destination is Istanbul. Hey, wait a minute. Where'd she go? She must have popped into one of those compartments. No, 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 no. Oh, there she is. She came out again. Hey, hey, not so loud. Look, she heard it. She, she's taking off through the crowd. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Mitchell. I did not realize how Okay, he... okay. Hey, Steve. There's a train coming along on that other track. Maybe she's trying for it. No, 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 no. She could not be. That is a true express train. It does not stop at the station. Hey, wait. She doesn't even see that train. Steve, she, she's right in front of it. Oh, oh, Come on. Oh, oh, oh. Let us through, please. One side, please. Let us... Oh, Steve. Yeah. Oh, brother. Oh, Sacre Bleu. Well, oh. this is sure the end of the line for Phyllis. Yeah, I sure hope she's got that microfilm on her, because if she hasn't, it looks like the end of the line for us. You are listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Phyllis Baxter's body is taken to the morgue. I give her purse and the rest of her effects are good going over, but I can't find the microfilm anywhere. Monsieur Mitchell, perhaps Mademoiselle Baxter passed along to a confederate before she reached Paris. Well, if she did that, we're dead ducks. But that doesn't add up either, Duval. If she'd already passed it along, why'd she go to so much trouble to cover her tracks on the way to Paris? <sighs> Most perplexing affair. It sure is. If I could only get a line on who her contact might be. Hey, look, you're the European representative for the plastics company. Has anybody approached you recently trying to get information about this new plastic? No, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, the development of the new plastic was kept such a secret that even I did not know of its existence until after the report was stolen. Well, it sure looks like we're up against the proverbial stone wall. That microfilm wasn't in any of her clothes and it wasn't in her purse. Hey, incidentally... There was something else that wasn't in her purse either, and it bothers me. Oh? Steve, what do you mean? What is it, Slater? Just got a code message from our agent in Istanbul. Yeah? According to the scuttlebutt there, the microfilm's been placed on the open market for sale to the highest bidder. What? But the microfilm couldn't have gotten to Istanbul yet. Who put it up for sale? He doesn't know. Hmm. And whoever it is must be pretty sure it's on the way. I... Hey, wait a minute. 
That train Phyllis was running for at the depot when we first saw her, Duval. You told me that was the Orient Express, that its final destination is Istanbul? Oui, but when Phyllis saw us pursuing her, she jumped out of the compartment again. That's right, Steve. Phyllis probably was planning to take that train. But she didn't, so where does that leave us? I don't think she ever was planning to take that train, Slater. Hmm? Well, what do you mean? I told you there was something else I didn't find in her purse, and it bothered me. Duval, there was no train ticket. But in that case, she... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I think I got it, Steve. You, you figure Phyllis jumped aboard the train just long enough to pass the film along to someone in that compartment, huh? Yeah. Hey, what compartment was that, anyway? Uh, let's see now. Third compartment from the front, I believe. Yeah, in the second car. Okay. Duval, what's the first stop for the train? At the Italian border. Okay, I can overtake it by plane. Slater, get me a reservation for that compartment. I'm getting on at the border. Okay, Steve. Uh, Mitchell, uh, I have business in Trieste. I will accompany you there. Perhaps I may be of some help. Yeah, you might at that. Okay, let's get going. Duval and I grabbed the plane for the Italian border. Our tickets are waiting for us there. We jump into the compartment just as the train pulls out. There are three other passengers in the compartment. Sitting across from me, holding a few assorted travel folders in her hand, is a freshly scrubbed-looking girl with Holland written all over her. And the kind of complexion that lipstick and powder would be an insult to. Next to her is a loud-talking gent who's waving a hunk of salami around between bites, perfuming the air with garlic. And over in the corner, a smooth-looking boy is reading a newspaper. He's got a briefcase in his hand. Ah, you like some of this salami? Eh? Oh, no, thank you. Oh, but this is the best salami you ever ate. You mean I never ate? Thanks a lot, but no thanks. I'm not a salami fan. Oh, it's a pity. What's a pity? Few people know what a wonderful thing is salami. Oh? The greatest thing is in the Linen Tower of a pizza. <laughs> salami. You know, it keeps me from catching a cold. It settles me in the stomach. And once, it even kept me from getting robbed. Getting robbed? See, a man came up to me once on the dark street in Milano. They demanded all my money, see? But with my good friend, the salami, I overcame him. Uh -huh. You breathed in his face, huh? No, I hit him over the head with it. Oh, it's a good salami. Well, it's powerful anyway. Look, would you mind not waving it under my nose? Okay, I'll wave it in my mouth. <laughs> oh, fine. Are you, you like some wine? No, thanks. Well, uh, how about your friend? Oh, oh, oh no, no, merci, no. The, the little lady, then, huh? N no, thank you. Well, so nobody likes the Pironi's wine, but Pironi. <laughs> uh, that looks like quite a collection of travel folders you've got there, Miss... Uh... Uh, Karen. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do not dream there are so many places in the world. Oh, not much of a traveler, huh? Oh, no. No, this is first time I ever leave home. What uh, part of Holland is home? Why, Rotterdam. But how do you know I am Dutch girl? Well, that freshly starched and scrubbed look is pretty hard to mistake. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I suppose if I am to travel, I, I should do as other women do. Mama would never let me wear lipstick, but now... Ah, you're doing fine without it. Uh, you on a vacation? Uh, no. No, I go to live with Uncle in Arabia. Last week, Mama passed away. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, nice cheese, anybody? Oh, brother, you must have a hollow leg. Oh, no, no. Eat and drink is good when riding. Yeah, how about when you're not riding? Well, it's just as good. Mitchell. What is it, Duval? That man in the corner reading the newspaper. Not much of a talker, is he? He has been watching you over the top of his paper. Oh? Look at the briefcase in his lap. Briefcase? Hey, it's ah, strapped to his wrist. Oh, <laughs> ah, whatever he's got in there must be pretty important. Microfilm, for instance. <clears throat> Anything uh, new in the paper? Hmm? Oh, no, only uh, the usual. Happen uh, to know what our next stop is? Uh, why, no, I do not. This your first trip? Oui. Monsieur, if you do not mind, I am reading... Yeah, yeah, so I see. Real friendly, isn't he? It would be very interesting to find out what is in his briefcase. Yeah, yeah, but how? I, I still got some salami left. Don't worry, we can smell it. 
I'm going out for some air, Duval. That garlic is killing me. Very well. I will keep an eye on them when you are gone. I go out on the platform between the cars. It's dark. I light up the cigarette. And then I hear the door open behind me. I start to turn around. But just then, something hard connects with the back of my head. I hit the floor, stunned. I fight my way to my hands and knees. And then I feel a rush of air. The outside door has been opened. I feel somebody dragging me towards it. I try to hold back, but I'm still groggy. A final shove and I slide out the door. But just as I do, I manage to grab the handrail. I'm swinging loose now. Hanging on by one hand. Then somebody's foot starts kicking at my hand. I can't hold on much longer. Suddenly the kicking stops. I hear running steps. Then I'm being hauled back up on the platform. Here, up with you. What? Oh, the conductor. I heard the commotion and found you hanging by one hand. You uh, spot the guy who tried to ease me out? I saw someone leaving as I approached, but it was too dark to tell you it was. I see. Okay, thanks for the lift, Buster. Dog. Deval. Deval. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Misha. Yeah, Mitchell. <gasps> Your hand, it is bleeding. Uh, here, I got plenty wine. Pour some over it. Uh, what happened, Mitchell? Hey, mm? where's the guy with the briefcase? Well, he left the compartment right after you did. Oh, great help you are, Deval. Oh, I am sorry, Mitchell. I guess the air in here made me so drowsy. Oh, here. Yeah. Here, I have handkerchief in my purse. I will bandage your hand with it. Oh, I... Okay, thanks, Karen. Yeah. There. There you are. How about you, Peroni? What, what about the Peroni? Did you leave the compartment? Oh, me? No. I've been busy eating. Trieste. Trieste. Hey, where are you going? Oh, I get over Trieste. But I leave you the rest of the salami. It's very good. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, this Peroni. What about him, Karen? Well... He lied to you. He he did leave the compartment after you did. What? Yeah. I was afraid to tell you in front of him. Mitchell, and now he is getting off here at Trieste. We had better follow him. I still want to know what happened to the gent with the briefcase. He... Well, speak of the devil. Are you referring to me, monsieur? I sure am, Buster. Where have you been? Why, I do not see that it's your affair. You could be wrong. I said, where have you been? I was getting a drink of water, if that meets with your approval. You sure you weren't out on the platform a few minutes ago slugging me over the head? I do not know what you are talking about. I tell you I was getting a drink of water. Pretty long drink of water. Monsieur, I am certain these things are none of your business. You were getting off here, Trieste? Do I look as if I'm getting off the train? Then where are you heading? Istanbul. Now see here, monsieur. I have had enough of these impertinent questions. What is the meaning of this? Skip it. Come on, Deval. We must hurry. The train will be starting up at any moment. I'm staying. What? But the girl has just told us that this Pironi lied about... Call it a hunch if you want, but I'm going on to Istanbul. But if this hunch of yours That's is a wrong... That's chance I'll have to take. But we'll be covered one way or the other. How do you mean? You're getting off here at Trieste anyway. But, but of course. Oh, oh, oh oui, oui, oui. I can follow this Pironi. Okay, go to it. But just one thing, though. And what is it? Try to stay awake, will you? Well... Ah. <laughs> Deval scurries off the train after the salami kid and I settle back in the compartment. The rest of the way to Istanbul, I keep my eye on the gent with the briefcase. He divides his time between reading his newspaper, taking a few naps, giving me an occasional nasty glance, and making a few mild pitches at Karen, who, in her wide-eyed way, seems thoroughly flattered by the attention. Finally, we arrive at Istanbul. Karen heads for a hotel, and the guy is close on her heels. I follow them into the bar and take a table near the corner, where I can keep my eye on him. Then... After a while, he gets up. I follow suit, but much to my surprise, he heads for my table. I think this matter has gone entirely far enough, Mitchell. Oh? I know exactly what you are after, but rest assured, you will never get it. Well, that's interesting to know. Well, now that we understand each other... You are obviously a nature. Well, a matter of fact... For I... a rival manufacturer, you hmm. have learned of our new creation. Hey, hey, and... hey, wait a minute. An agent for a rival manufacturer? What are you talking about? Ah, my friend, do not attempt subterfuge. Hmm? It is obvious you have learned of our new creation. Learned that we intend to introduce in the Middle East. And so you followed me, thinking you would get a chance to steal it. 
so that cheap imitations could be attempted. Cheap imitations? Hey, look, who are you working for, anyway? Uh, as you know, for Henri Bonnet. Whoever that is. You do not know who Henri Bonnet no, is? No, and I'm beginning to think I don't know what you've got in that briefcase, either. But you must have heard of the firm Henri Bonnet. In all of France, the most famous, the most exclusive creator of women's girdles. Girdles? You mean to say that's what you're carrying in your briefcase? But of course. Our new model, exquisite and revolutionary. Not a two-way, not a three-way, but a four-way stretch. Oh, great. A girdle salesman yet. <laughs> that does it. I it. Hey, wait a minute. What is the matter? I just remembered something I noticed on the train. It didn't make sense until right now. I'll see you later, four-way. I spot Karen just as she's easing out of the bar. I follow her upstairs and catch up with her just as she's entering her room. What? what? Mr. Mitchell? Yeah, Mr. Mitchell. Look, let's go inside. I want to talk to you. Oh, but, but I... Come on, come on, inside. What is the meaning of this? I think the meaning of it is in your purse. Let's have it. No. No, let's go. Ah, but... Thanks. Now we'll take a look. I will call the police. I don't think so. Ought to be here somewhere. Yeah, here it is. A compact. Yeah, but of course. What is so strange about a woman's compact? Nothing, except when it's carried by a woman who doesn't wear any makeup. Oh. I spotted it in your purse when you bandaged my hand with your handkerchief, but it didn't register until now. No, you don't wear any makeup, Karen. But Phyllis Baxter did. She passed this compact to you at the depot in Paris. No, no, that is not true. Oh, save the pretense, my dear. What with... Yes, I will take the compact, Mitchell. Well, what do you know, my friend Duval? What'd you do, fly here from Trieste? Precisely. It's been you and Karen right from the start, huh? Kill him, Duval. Oh, oh, presently. The compact, Mitchell. Give it to me at once. You're the boy who slugged me on the train pretending to be asleep in the compartment was a good cover for you. And Karen tried to throw suspicion on Peroni, eh? Mitchell. But I knew it wasn't him. If it had been, I'd have gotten a whiff of that garlic on the platform. Mitchell, I will not ask you again. Give me that compact. You know, hiding the microfilm in this compact's a good gag. Where have you got it? Inside this powder puff? For your information, it is behind the mirror. Now. Okay, okay, you want the compact, but wouldn't you like some powder instead? <laughs> you can't shoot when you can't see, bud. Uh, sorry, you're not leaving, Karen. Let me go. Sit down. No. I said sit down. You, you. Temper, temper. You know, you and Duval had a pretty neat scheme, Rig. And if you'd been wearing any makeup, I probably never would have tumbled to the compact gag. Oh. Yep. I guess you might say that that would have put an entirely different complexion on the matter. <laughs> Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous assignment came to you from Hollywood. Tomorrow, be sure to hear The Big Show on NBC.
I beg pardon, miss, but uh, do you happen to have any material at all dealing with the... If you please. Huh? What's that? Will you please lower your voice? But I... I and then you might read the sign over there. Or shall I read it for you? Absolute quiet required in this library. My, but you read beautifully. But I, I wonder Will if... you please lower your voice? Oh, oh, sure. I, I, I mean, oh, sure, sure. I'll be more than happy to help you. But you simply can't disturb the others here in the library. I see. Well, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, excuse me, everyone. Oh, I didn't mean to disturb you, folks. You please, please be quiet. Well, good heavens, ma'am. I, I just wanted to apologize. That's quite unnecessary. Now, may I help you? Well, I hope you can. I'm looking for some literature on hydrokinetics. Um, don't suppose a Hick library like this would have anything like that, though. You're a stranger in Jackson City, aren't you? That's right. Uh, how did you know? I know most of the people in town. And besides... Folks who live here never refer to the town as having a hick library. Oh, now look. No offense intended. But after all, I, I don't expect too much from a two-before place that probably doesn't have much more to offer than the encyclopedia and a, and a couple of copies of the Rover Boys. You said you wished to see something on hydrokinetics. Uh, uh, that's right. Um, hydrokinetics is a branch of kinetics which relates to liquids. Uh, you see, kinetics is the branch of dynamics Do you that... wish to read Kendall, <clears throat> Johnson, Abernathy, or Sandine on the subject? What? What's that? I said, which author do you wish to consult? Those four seem to be the authorities, but some engineers like Alexander and Bowen. Well, look here. Are you serious? Serious? Uh, about having books by Johnson and, and Kendall and Sandine and Abernathy on the theory of hydrokinetics. Will you follow me, please? Yes, certainly. But turn on that light if you wish. It's a little dark in here today. Uh, yes. All right. I think you'll find these quite up to date. I'm sorry that one of the Alexander volumes is out, but it should be back tomorrow. Oh, quite all right. Uh, it's Kendall I'm really after. Ah, uh, here we are. This one. That was printed sometime last year, I believe. Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, Kendall is propounding a new theory on hydraulics. I read it when I was in New York. I'm glad you didn't have to go back into the city to find what you wanted. No, I... Oh, look here. I owe you another apology, don't I? No, please, don't bother. Oh, but it's no bother. You may use any of the tables over there. Yes, but I, I'd like... You'll to... find the one by the window quite good. Hmm. Sensitive. Cute, too. Yeah, darn cute. Yeah, well... Well, let's see. Kendall says, when an ounce of plain lubricating oil is introduced into... Hmm, wonder what her name is. First one, I mean. Nameplate on the desk says, uh, Miss Marshall. Well, that's interesting. Miss Marshall. <laughs> oh, well... Well, as I remember reading about it three months ago, Kendall says that if you introduce one ounce of common lubricating oil into a cylinder two inches in diameter and four inches in height... <clears throat> Pretty girl. wonder why I can't get her off my mind. I wonder where she lives. Oh, confound it. Well... <clears throat> Then, according to Kendall, if an ultraviolet ray is permitted to cross the cylinder at the time pressure is applied to the top, the result will... I wonder what a good-looking girl like her is doing in Jackson City. She's smart, too. I just mentioned hydrokinetics, and she reeled off the four top authorities like she was a student on the subject. I wonder what she's doing tonight. Well, hang it all up. I say, uh, Miss Marshall. Oh, uh, I say, Miss Marshall. Yes, what is uh, it? Would it be possible for me to check this book out? I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid not. Well, it's really quite important. I'm an inventor, and I... I'm just on the verge of a very important discovery. I simply must have this book to use. I'm sorry. Perhaps you should buy a copy. Oh, I've tried that. 
Everywhere in town. There's none I can get a hold of. You could have one sent out from New York. I can't wait that long. I have to work on this thing while it's running through my head. It's very important. I might lose the whole idea by the time a copy came out of New York. I'm sorry. It's quite against the rules to permit anyone to take out a book without a library card. Well, suppose I take a card. Uh, how much? Oh, there's no charge, but you must have a property owner sign your application. Property owner? Application? Yes. Someone who can pay for the book in the event that it's lost and who's willing to personally guarantee your honesty must sign your application. Then your card will be ready within 48 hours. Oh, now look. That's worse yet. I'm sorry. This isn't any way to treat a Jackson City guest, you know. I'd like to help you. Really, I would. Would you? Really? Yes, I... I would, but... I can't break the rule. Now, wait a minute. I've got it. Yes? Your place. What? Uh, your place. Your your home. Uh, wherever you live. You mean... I mean you can take the book out yourself. You take it home. Then I'll come by tonight and use it there. That's not very clever, Mr... Mr. Whoever you are. Uh, Chase. Adam Chase. And not very original either. Well, there aren't any new ideas. At least give me credit for picking one that's not too bad. <laughs> are you serious about the book? A word of honor, ma'am. I need that book right now like anything. Seriously? Seriously. Well, then I... I just might be able to help you. Would you really? I might. Uh, tell me, can you take dictation? A little. Ah, good. You can help me. Uh, that is, if you'd like to. I might. I'll be glad to pay you. Oh, well, we'll see. You'll do it? You'll take the book home and let me study it there? Yes, I'll, I'll take it home. Ah, uh, good. Uh, where do you live? You won't have any trouble finding me. Just ask anyone for Cicely Marshall. Did you say uh, Cicely Marshall? Yes. What about it? <laughs> well, nothing. I, I, I just like it. it. It happens to be one of my favorite names. Um, what time? Tonight? Uh-huh. Oh, any time after 7.30. Good. How 7.32? <laughs> you better go now. We're beginning to disturb the folks who are trying to study. Yeah. All right. See you tonight. Now, just a minute. Yes? I've got to consult Kendall again. Hold on there a second. <laughs> Do you really think this invention will prove itself? Well, I'm not exactly an expert, but the idea seems sound. Wait a minute now. Let's see. Oh, yes. Here. Find it? Uh-huh. Now, will you take this down? Mm-hmm. Kendall, volume one, page 74. It has been my observation that hydraulic reaction often can be obtained through the use of a common water tumbler immersed in H2O. Uh, that's water. <laughs> oh, confound it. There I go again, treating you like a child. You probably know more about this entire subject than I do without my explaining chemical symbols. <laughs> Don't you think we'd better call it a night? No, it's early. It's 1 a.m. No, it couldn't be. <laughs> well, it is, though, see? Oh, brother. I'll bet I'm popular around this place from now on. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I really enjoyed it. Mister, you were serious there in the library, weren't yes, you? Yes, rather. I don't mind saying my complete future is probably tied up in this thing right now. If it's what I think it's going to be, I'm due to make a fortune out of it. I hope you do. Well, thanks. Uh, why? Oh, I like to know people who are successful. Besides, my father was an inventor. Was he really? Yes. He was a brilliant man. He had an invention. I, I never did quite understand what it was. It was before he was married. Someone filed for the patents just a few hours before he did. And he lost out. Someone stole his invention? No. No, it was just a coincidence. But my father was never the same after that. Something happened. I don't know what. I, I remember hearing my family talk about it in whispers when I was just an infant. Is he still alive? No. No, he's been gone three years. Oh, I'm sorry. He was a fine man. Grand, but... 
He, he never got over that, whatever it was that happened to him long before I was born. You, you mean there was something more than just the loss of the invention patents? Yes. Something that was, I think, even more tragic. I've never even been able to guess what it was. Maybe it's better that you don't know. Yes, maybe so. Well, really, I, I should go. It's late. Is there much more to do? Well, yes. I, I have to finish these papers before I can have the model of the invention built. Well, could I help you more? Would you? I'd love to, really. Tomorrow night? Can you wait that long? Well, no, I can't, but <laughs> I will. <laughs> There we are. All finished. Good. Well, now the model's next. How long do you think it will take to build it? Well, at least two weeks. We've been on these papers longer than I thought we'd be. Almost 30 days. I really don't know what I've, I've done without you. Oh, I've enjoyed it. Oh, we can relax now till the model's built. Then I'll have to go to Washington. Uh, what time is it? Oh, it's early. Nine o'clock. Oh, good. Time enough to catch the last show. Uh, uh, that is, if you'd like to go out with me like to. I can't think of anything I'd like better. Oh, Your train's leaving, Adam. I'll be back with those patents. You will come back? You try to stop me. Oh, goodbye, darling. Cecily? Yes, Adam? Uh... Will you marry me when I come back? What? I said, will you marry me? No. When I come back? Oh, yes. Will you ride? Just as soon as I get to Washington. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. <laughs> to my diary, January the 17th. It has been five days since Adam went to Washington. I'll never forget the unromantic but lovable way he asked me to marry him. Standing on the steps of the moving train. Shouting the question at me above the noise of the engine. How I loved him at that moment. How I love him now. But why? Why, oh, why hasn't he written? Five days and not a word from Adam yet. Word has just been received, ladies and gentlemen, that the crack limited from Washington nearing Jackson City less than an hour ago was held up and robbed by unidentified gangsters. The train was flagged down by two men who pretended their car had stalled on the track. The engineer and fireman were shot and killed. All passengers were held at gunpoint, and the mail car was entered and robbed. This train robbery will remind old-timers of the historic and dramatic train robbery on almost the same spot some 50 years ago. Well, to be exact, 53 years ago, January the 17th. There is no indication as to the identification of today's bandits, but it is believed police have found a vital clue. I want to send this wire to Mr. Adam Chase, Esther Arms Hotel, Washington. Yes. Darling, have not heard from you. Worried. I love you. Sicily. Yes, operator, this is the party calling Washington. Yes, I'm calling Mr. Adam Chase. That's right, at the Esther Arms Hotel. Oh, you have a hotel? Hello? 
What's that? Checked out. Two weeks ago. Oh. No, thank you. Just cancel the call. April the 17th. It has been three months and five days since I last saw Adam Chase. He promised to write immediately from Washington three months ago. He seems to have dropped out of the world. I can't locate him any place. I've just returned from ten days in Washington. Searching. I found nothing. Yes? Come in. Adam. I... I had to come back. Oh, darling. Darling, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. You look so ill, so thin. I guess I shouldn't be here. Since you didn't want me. Didn't, I... didn't want you? Didn't want you. Oh, my darling, what makes you say anything like that? I wrote you ab about the invention. I didn't get your letter. I haven't heard a word from you. I told you what happened. That I was ruined. My darling. That if you loved me, you'd come to Washington and we'd make it some way. I didn't get it, Adam. I tell you, I didn't get that letter. I waited. You didn't answer. You didn't come. You didn't want to come. Darling, will you listen to me? I didn't get that letter. What? What, Cecily? I didn't get that letter. You didn't get it? No. No, I, I waited and waited. I wired you, phoned. Well, I just got back from looking from one end of Washington to another for you. Cecily. Oh, my darling, my darling. I was too late. Just... Twenty-four hours too late. Adam. Someone else, someone from California, had just filed for the patents to the same invention. Oh, sweetheart. I was just a few hours too late. Oh, but the invention isn't everything. I wrote to you. I told you what happened. I asked you to come to Washington to marry me. I'd have come in a minute. And I thought, no... The thousands of things I thought. Oh, don't think of them anymore. I, I had to come back. I couldn't live without you. I had to come back to see you. Just once more. I couldn't live without you, Adam. We'll be married. Promise me we'll be married right away. Right away, darling. Yes, right away. <laughs> I've been married two months today. We're very happy. Somehow, there's something more than just our love for one another that makes us so close to each other. I can't explain what it is. We've rented a large house, an old one, but it's adorable, and we're planning to... Cecily! Oh, darling! Yes, dear? Come on up here. To the attic, will you? I've stumbled onto something. All right, Adam. Look what I found. Back among the rafters. What, what in the world is it? Well, it's an old mail sack full of mail. What? Yeah, look. Look here. These letters. None of them have ever been opened. Why, Adam. Dozens of letters, all sealed. All stamped and dated. Look. Look, Cecily. Postmarks. They're all the same. January 17, 1889. But how in the world did they get here in this attic? I don't know. I wanted to run a radio aerial, 
out there on the roof, and I had to crawl way back in the rafters. It was hidden back there, up near the roof. It's evidently been there for years. But how did it get there? Fifty-three years ago. 1889. Look at these letters. Addressed to people all over the country. Everett Holton, Detroit. Jessica Young, New York. Paul Reimer, Chicago. Mr. and Mrs. F.C. Uh, Halliday, Grady, Pennsylvania. And look, here's one addressed to President Benjamin Harrison from someone in Maine. Wait a minute, Adam. Oh, look. Huh? This letter. Addressed to Miss Cecily Drew of Youngstown. What? The return address, Mr. Aaron Marshall. My father. He wrote this. I know the handwriting. Cecily Drew was my mother's maiden name. Adam. Yes. Cecily Drew. And she lived in Youngstown. My father? Your mother? Open it. Open it. What? I, I said open it. Oh, all right. Oh. What is it? It was my father. Listen. My darling Cecily, I have bad news. I have just learned that someone else has filed for the patent rights to my invention. By some queer trick of fate, another inventor had the same idea as I. Only he has been fortunate enough to get his application for patents into the bureau ahead of me. I fear all my work has been in vain, all my sacrifice useless. I have nothing to offer you now, my dear, but my love. If you still love me, hurry here to marry me. I shall surely never exist if you don't. All my undying love, Aaron. He wrote that your father to my mother. Adam, the train robbery. What? I remember hearing about it on the radio. The train your letter to me was on was robbed. The mail was stolen. And the same thing happened 53 years ago to your mother and my father. Only she believed he failed to come back to her. And he died, never knowing she hadn't read his letter. And his letter has been here, hidden all these long years. Your mother and my father... The Letter from Yesterday, tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, originating in the studios of WKY. This is Tom Paxton reminding you to buy United States war bonds and stamps. Dark fantasy comes to you each Friday night from Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of Romantic adventure? You want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. It is September of 1939. The Germans are about to march into Poland, and you are standing in the English manor house with a complete list of Nazi agents in your possession. While facing you, guns drawn, are three people who, to get that list, would gladly kill you. Today, with Ben Wright starred as Sir Everard Dominey, we bring you an exciting story of super espionage, as E. Phillips Oppenheim told it in his fascinating novel, 
The Great Impersonation. Incredible. Von Ragestein, this is incredible. He is drunk? Dead drunk. He has seldom otherwise. Ah. Hold the light closer to the cot so I can see here, him better. Here, here. Uh, truly incredible, von Ragestein. You and he are as alike as... Well, I would swear it was you lying here on the cot. Yeah. Hair, nose, mouth, everything like a, a smudged and smeared portrait of yourself. Identical features. And we have the same color eyes. And there's not an inch of difference in our height. Where did you find him? Oh, he staggered into camp three days ago. He had been hunting lion up river until his boys deserted him. He had not paid them in several months, I gather. I sent a runner to fetch you at once. That is something I shall have to report to Berlin as a serious breach of discipline from Ragestein. You are to avoid all contact with me except through the usual channels. But, Dr. Schmidt, may I... Permit me to finish. Obedience to orders is as necessary in the secret service as it is in any other branch of the German army. I understand. I have spent 20 years here in Tanganyika, establishing myself as a harmless old archaeologist. During that time, I have created an espionage organization second to none, right under the noses of the English. And not once have they suspected me. Is all that to be ruined because you choose to engage in a little frolic of your own? This was not a frolic. Sir, I, I, I weighed the risk very carefully and considered it worthwhile. I, I, I believe you will agree with me when I tell you that this man is Sir Everard Domini, an English baronet, and that we attended Oxford together. Shall I continue? Yes. Yes, continue, von Ragestein. He is a ne'er-do-well. He lives on a small sum that comes to him each month from his estate in Norfolk. He has been here in Africa almost as long as I. Eleven years. Oh, but I could go on for hours. I know as much about him as he does himself. And I've been thinking that... That you it... could go to England as Sir Everard Domini, and no one there would be the wiser. Dr. Schmidt, a German agent in England, operating at the highest social level... Would be invaluable, I agree, but... But what, sir? The proposal raises three questions in my mind. Ah, so? What about the assignment upon which you are engaged here? A certain flexibility is necessary in these matters. And how will Dr. Goebbels feel about your leaving Africa? Oh, surely by this time he has either forgiven me or forgotten the entire incident. <laughs> you don't know the little doctor if you think that. When someone steals away one of his women, as you did, uh, what was her name? Stephanie Strom. Yeah, yeah, as you did, Stephanie Strom. He never forgets and never forgives. But I will undertake the responsibility for initiating your plan. Prepare to leave for England at once. You will receive further orders before you embark. Thank you, sir. I must go now. There are many arrangements to be made. Sir, as you said that there were three questions raised in your mind. Hmm? Oh, yeah. I was wondering what to do with this Englishman. Kill him as soon as possible and dispose of his body. Good luck, von Ragestein. Heil Hitler. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Heil Hitler. That night, a new Sir Everard Domini was born, and Leopold Ragerstein vanished from the face of the earth. Dr. Schmidt's arrangements were most thorough, and I arrived in London less than a month later. Uh, Mr. Mencken will see you now, sir. Well, thank you. My dear Sir Everard, a most unexpected pleasure. Most un... Oh, dear me, how changed you are, and how well you look. Credit Africa, Mr. Mangan. A wonderful country. It's done wonders for you. Dear me. Uh, are, are you thinking of settling down here for a time? Well, that depends a little upon what you have to tell me. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, regarding the matter of Roger Unthank, nothing has been heard of him since the day you left England. His body has never been found. And uh, my wife? Her ladyship's condition is, I believe, unchanged. She is in excellent physical health, but mentally... She still swears to take my life if I ever I sleep under the same roof as she again? Uh, well, I... I uh, see. She... Uh, I, uh, I may very likely settle down at Domini Hall. 
Oh, I'm afraid the estate is still not in very good condition. All those debts you left oh, yes. behind. Quite, us. quite. Yes. Uh, the business object of my visit to you is to ask you to make arrangements as quickly as possible for the paying off of the mortgages of the Domini estates. What? I, I've been making a good deal of money in Africa. Great Scott. A Domini making money. <laughs> in the 40 years I've managed the Domini interests, I've never known that to happen. <laughs> Dear, dear, I can hardly believe it. Well, have lunch with me, Mr. Mangan, and I'll tell you something of my speculations in Africa. Why, thank you, Sir Everard. Oh, uh, my knowledge of restaurants in London is a bit uh, dated. Uh, may I suggest the Carlton? Oh, excellent. Uh, give me your hat, Sir Everard. I shall check it. I'll be with you down All right, I'll wait for you right here. Leopold. Leopold. Huh? Why didn't you let me know you are in England? Oh, Leopold, how happy I am. I to... think you're making a mistake. My name is not Leopold. <laughs> Darling, do you deny knowing me? Madam, I do not have the pleasure. Uh, my name is Domini. Everard Domini. I don't understand. Leopold, my address is 17 Belgrave Square. Come there at seven this evening. But, my dear I lady... I shall expect you at seven. Here we are. Seven sharp. Uh, dear me, Sir Everard, wasn't that Stephanie Strome? Oh, well, I, I don't know. She mistook me for someone else. Oh, she's a marvelous actress. Marvelous. I saw her in Macbeth last month. And she... Uh, table for two. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. She played Lady Macbeth, you know. And in that scene... Oh, excuse is, me one moment, Mr. Mangan. Uh, Seaman! Seaman, my dear fellow, how are you? Well, Everard, what a surprise. <laughs> May I introduce my friend and legal advisor, Mr. Mangan? Uh, Mr. Mangan, Mr. Seaman. Uh, how do you do? Uh, Seaman and I were business associates in Africa. Uh, will you join us at lunch, Seaman? Thank you, but I cannot. Uh, where are you staying, Everard? At my estate in Norfolk, near Flankmere. I, I, I'm driving there this evening. Why, um, I have to be in Norfolk on business tomorrow. Be my guest, will you? Uh, thank you, Everard, thank you. Good day, Mr. Mangan. Uh, good day, sir. Now, as I was saying, I... Uh, what was I saying? Uh, you were about to ask me if I cared for a drink, and I was about to say yes, a scotch and soda. Oh, yes. Uh, the same for me. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir Everard, do you think it wise to return to Domini Hall before uh, Lady Domini has been prepared for it? Mr. Mangan, does she really regard me still as the murderer of Roger Unthank? The mystery has never been solved. It's well known that you two fought that night and that you staggered home almost senseless. Roger Unthank has never been seen since. If I'd killed him, why wasn't his body found? Oh, there are many theories and quite a few superstitions. You may as well be prepared for one of them. There's not a soul for miles around Domini Hall who doesn't believe the ghost of Roger Unthank still haunts the black wood near where you fought. Oh, but that's incredible. Yes, yes, I would agree. Except that from time to time... It has been heard shrieking and sobbing. Oh, come Sir now, Everard. Megan. Sir Everard, I have heard it myself. Tired, Mr. Mangan? Uh, just a bit, but we shall be there in a few minutes. I telephoned before we left London that they have rooms ready for us. Um, any of the old servants still left? Oh, none. Every servant and caretaker we've had there has given notice within a month. At least a dozen swore that they had seen the ghost of Roger Unthank and heard his call at night. That's the sole reason why I haven't recommended long ago that you should get rid of Mrs. Unthank. Oh, she is still in attendance upon Lady Domini? We couldn't get anyone else to stay there. And her ladyship absolutely declines to leave the hall uh, through that gate, Sir Everard. Yes, I remember. Oh, some of the old wall is down, I see. That wall has been down, to my knowledge, for 30 years. Of course. I'd forgotten. We've kept the old place weathertight. And I don't think you will miss the timber we were forced to sell. Oh, any from the black wood? Not a twig. Not one of the woodmen would ever go near the place. You and I will take a look at the black wood in the morning. Well, if you insist, Sir Everard. How, how does it feel to be at home after all these years? I feel as though this is my first visit. Uh, oh, uh, good evening, Mrs. Unthank. There's no place in this house for you, Everard Dobney. 
No place here for a murderer. Oh, really, my good Can woman. Can you face we... me, Edward Germany? You who murdered my son and made a madwoman of your wife. Mrs. Unthank, return to your duties at once and understand that this house is mine to enter or leave when I choose. And you will treat Sir Everard with respect. Have, have rooms been prepared for us? You will be in the West Wing, Mr. Mangan. And the Oak Room has been prepared for Sir Everard. You mentioned respect, Mr. Mangan. If he stays here against my bidding, perhaps her ladyship will show him what respect means. Good night. Oh, dear, dear, dear. My dear Sir Everard, I'm dreadfully sorry that... Oh, that's a... quite all right. I... Quite all right. Well, I... Uh, I think I'll turn in immediately. Well, we'll make the rounds of the estate after breakfast. Sir Everard, I... are you really going to sleep in the oak room? Yes. Yeah. Why? Have you forgotten? It's next to her ladyship's. And, and... No, I have not forgotten. Good night, Mr. Mangan. I do not know how long I had been asleep when I felt the thin, cold pressure against my throat. I opened my eyes and I saw a hand. A small, slim hand in the moonlight just beneath my chin. If you move, you will die. Remain still. I wish to look at you. Rose. You are very brave to have come here. Braver than I remembered. Why do you wish to kill me? Doesn't it say somewhere? A life for a life. You killed Roger Unthank. Last night, his spirit called to me below my window. No. No. Don't move. Let me look at you, my husband. The strange thing to own after all these years. A husband. What? What do you see? You're wonderfully changed. Better looking. I have changed, Rose. And I've come back a rich man. I shall bring some wonderful doctors here and they'll make you quite strong and well again. I've been wondering why I don't kill you ever, as I've sworn to. I know now. I know why I don't. Why, Rose? Because I've just realized you aren't ever at all. Yes, that's why. You needn't fear ever that I shall kill you. Because... You're not ever at I spent the most of the next day going over the estate with Mangan, and when he left for London in the afternoon, he carried with him my check for £90,000 to settle the mortgage on Domini. And soon after his departure, Seaman arrived. And it was very good of you to have invited me. Or come into the library. Uh, how was your trip here? Oh, very pleasant. Very pleasant. The countryside is lovely this time of year, and... Uh... How did it go, Leopold? Well, I think... Good. Mangan accepted me completely as ever our Domini. And if I say so myself, I think that I have made a very convincing transformation into an English country gentleman. Oh. Now, of course, <laughs> it's been uncommonly expensive. Yeah. Every penny you gave me when we met at Cape Town is gone to pay off the mortgage of Sir Everard's... Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. On my estate. Well, we could not have you return home to a poverty-stricken domain... You'd have held no place whatsoever in English social life and no welcome from those with whom we desired you to stand well. Now, there is no button to our purse in these matters and more will be deposited to your account. Ah, from my African investments? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, from your African investments. So, all has gone smoothly? Yeah, yeah, all except for one thing. Oh? Uh, Stephanie Strom met me by chance in a restaurant yesterday. She recognized me at once, of course, and seemed quite piqued when I denied knowing her. She demanded I called upon her at her home yesterday evening. Well? Has it occurred to you that she has claims upon Leopold von Ragerstein which would altogether interfere with the career of Everard Domini? Our relationship before I left Germany was fairly well known. And if we are seen together now, someone might put two and two together and... Yeah, 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 you're right, of course. I'll see what I can do. It will not be easy. Stephanie is extremely strong-willed and impetuous. She will do... As she is told. See? Anything else? No. Good. Now listen very carefully. I have instructions for you. I am listening. 
We move upon Poland in September. Now, if England declares war, it will, of course, render espionage work here extremely difficult in two major respects. Yeah, one, right. one, the English will redouble security precautions, mm. and two, it will be almost impossible to bring in money with which to pay our agents in this country. It is with the second difficulty that you will be concerned. Your function will be that of paymaster. Go on. Now, from now until September, three million pounds will be given to you. Ah. To whom do I disperse this money? Ah. The day we begin to conquer Poland, written instructions together with a list of all our agents here and in Ireland will be placed in your hands. Understood. So, until then, live the life of Sir Everard Domini Baronet. So, I will visit you from time to time to keep you abreast of events. So, goodbye for the present, Leopold. I have a million things to do. Oh, and, uh, good luck in your... Impersonation. Thank you. I think I shall need it. In just a moment, we will return to escape. But first, six years after the last battle of the American Revolution, the people of America were in the midst of a great debate whether to vote for or against the Constitution. Here is what Governor Clinton said to the people of New York in 1787. Your fate and that of your posterity depends on your present conduct. Do not give them reason to curse you and do not give yourselves cause to be blamed. As individuals, you are ambitious to leave behind you a good name and to your children a fair political inheritance. Yes, the men who framed the Constitution did so not only for themselves, but for the future. We today are that future. And now with our star, Ben Wright, as von Ragestein and Sir Everard Domine, we return to the second act of Escape and the Great Impersonation. <laughs> I followed Seaman's instructions to the letter and pursued exactly the course I thought Sir Everard Dominey himself would be likely to take. I put Lady Dominey in the hands of a Dr. Harrison, a psychiatrist. I pensioned Mrs. Unthank off, but to my surprise, she remained in the vicinity. I began to entertain upon a lavish scale shooting parties, hunts, dinners, and dances. Unavoidably, Stephanie appeared among my guests from time to time, it was evident from her manner that Simon had spoken to her concerning me, and quite forcibly. It was also evident that she did not like it. I could see her patience wearing thinner and thinner. And one Friday to Monday, as I was walking through the garden after breakfast... I wish to speak to you alone. But my guests will be... Your uh... guests are well occupied. And in any case, I'm one of them. What is it, Stephanie? Leopold... Can it be you've lost your love for me? You've changed so much and in so many ways. Stephanie, I thought it had been impressed upon you. I am not Leopold, but Everard Domini, an Englishman and the owner of this house and the husband of Lady Domini. <laughs> I can almost believe you are an Englishman. You stand there cold and aloof as one. You whose tears have fallen upon my hand, whose lips... You speak of one who is dead. What has changed you like this? What has dried up all the passion in you? Careful, Stephanie. Someone has come. Yes, what is it, Parkins? Big pardon, sir, but Lady Dominie has returned. Oh, thank you, Parkins. Uh, Stephanie, will you excuse me? Leopold, something has just occurred to me and I shall not see you. Or rather trouble you for a while. I'm going to take a sea voyage. A sea voyage? Where? To Africa, Leopold. To Africa. May I see my wife, Dr. Harrison? This evening, perhaps. It's been a fatiguing journey for her. I would prefer her to rest as much as possible. How is she? Well, except for one hallucination, she's in perfect health. And this one hallucination... But you're not her husband. It's not within my power to dispel this hallucination. You are the one to do it. That's why I brought her home. What can I do, Doctor? She needs warmth and affection, Sir Everard. I see. I, I'm very grateful to you, Doctor. I, I shall do everything I can to complete her recovery. Thank you. Yes? 
It's I, Rose. May I come in? Yes, I will. Rose, I... I couldn't go to sleep before welcoming you home. Thank you, Everett, dear. That makes me very happy. You're looking well. And extremely lovely. I am well. All the foolishness is gone. I know that whatever happened to poor Roger, it was not you who killed him. I know that I never really heard his ghost call to me. It, it was my imagination. I can't think why I ever wanted to hurt you. I'm sure I love you. Then why do you doubt that I am your husband? You're so like me, yet so unlike him. His daddy died in Africa. Then who am I, Rose? I don't know. But you're kind to me. And when you're near, I'm happy. Rose, look at me. I am Everard. I am. Can't you see? <gasps> it's Roger. He's calling me. Everard, I do hear it. Don't I? It's not just in my head. Rose. Let me go. I must wave to him from the window. He never rests until I wave to him from the window. Please, I've Rose, got... Rose, if you love me, do one great favor for me. Do not go to the window. Don't wave. I must wave. I can't stand his cry. It's Rose, just... as you love me, please. Oh. All right, Everett. I'll do as you say, but hurry, hurry, please, hurry. I ran out of her suite and down the stairs. Parkins was standing in the entrance to Dominey Hall, a heavy walking stick in his hand. I told him to follow me, and we hurried through the garden. And there, beneath Rose's window, I saw a dark shape. Slowly now, Parkins. <laughs> Slowly and quietly. <gasps> no! Parkins! Parkins, help me! Come on, your stick! <coughs> oh, well... Well done, Parkins. Do you have a match? Uh, yes, sir. Well, strike it, man. Strike it. Oh, very good, sir. Hi. Right. Take a look. And who is it? It's... It's Roger Unthink. Ah. Oh. Telephone the hospital and flank me to send an ambulance for him at once. Roger. Right. Roger! Oh, you've... You've killed him. You've killed my son. He's not dead, Mrs. Unthank. Oh, he, Though he deserves me. to be. Oh, his jealousy drove him mad. If now, Lady Dominie recovers, I will forgive both you and your son for this revolting hoax. If she does not, I wish you both the blackest corner of hell. Rose had received a great shock that night. But as the summer wore on, she began to mend, and Dr. Harrison told me toward the end of August that he had every hope for her complete recovery. Meanwhile, the drift toward war quickened, and on the morning of the 1st of September, the German army smashed its way across the border into Poland. Simon telephoned me that morning to inform me that he would be at Dominey Hall that evening for a business conference, and about nine o'clock, he arrived. Mr. Seaman is here, sir. Thank you, Parkins. Oh, hello, Seaman. Oh, have you heard the terrible news, Sir Everard? Have you heard the wonderful news, Leopold? Our army is simply leaping ahead. I know. I have been listening to the wireless. We have to work quickly, very quickly. I must be in Ireland by tomorrow morning. Here, take these. What is it? These are microfilms, no larger than postage stamps. Ah. They contain your orders and the list of all our agents in these islands. Uh -huh. Now, Leopold, the fate of our espionage service here is now in your hands. Yeah, I understand. Good. And speaking of precaution, yeah? as you stooped to sit down just now, I distinctly saw the shape of your revolver in your hip pocket. Oh? Do you think it is wise to be carrying firearms about just oh, now? Oh, yeah, yeah, quite right. Here, here, take care of it for oh. me. Quick, quick, get the films out of sight. Into this straw. Yes? yes? What is it? Sorry to disturb you, sir, but Miss Strom is here and she... And is... insists upon seeing you. Uh, Stephanie. Uh, thank you, Parkins. That will be all. Yes, sir. Stephanie. I did not know you had returned from <laughs> Africa. This afternoon, and I brought a visitor with me. Now tell me, Dr. Schmidt, who is this man? Leopold or the Englishman? Why... Right. He is, uh, he is the Englishman. The English. English. What have you done with Leopold? What have you done with him? He met with the fate he prepared for me. His body sleeps on the bed of the Rumor River. Uh, I uh, don't understand. You came to me at Cape Town. You had all von Hagerstein's letters. You know his history. We exchanged the most intimate confidences in his camp. 
The letters and papers I took from him. And, and, and the money, the three million pounds? If the German Secret Service wishes to formulate a claim and sue us... What are you? You two lumps of earth clods. You let this Englishman stand oh, here. You... The lists. He has the lists of agents. Yes. And they should prove of great interest to His Majesty's government. Do something. We are three against one. Seaman. That doctor, not another step or I'll shoot. Seaman. Get Grab him. Get back, Seaman. No, no. No, no, no don't, don't shoot. Don't, don't shoot. No, 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 please. Don't, don't, don't shoot. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Yes, don't shoot. Rod. Telephone the military barracks at Norwich. Ask them to send a car and a strong escort immediately. Yes, sir. And then, uh, uh, Parkins, uh, come back here and see what uh, my guests will have. Going now, Sir Everard. How is she? She's well. She's entirely well. well see for yourself. Everard. Oh, Rose, my darling. Oh, my dearest. There were times when I couldn't believe you were my Everard. And now. Now. Now I know. <laughs> Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have presented Transcribe, The Great Impersonation by E. Phillips Oppenheim, adapted for radio by Walter Newman, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Starred as Sir Everard Dominey was Ben Wright, with Gene Bates, John Daner, Gabriel Windsor, Ted Von Elts, Edgar Barrier, Anne Morrison, Parley Bear, and Ramsey Hill. Escape has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Rice Checks and Wheat Checks, the bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages, present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space, missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are climbing a steep mountain on the planet Venus in pursuit of a criminal. We're running straight, all right, Commander. See? There's where he dug a foothold. Yeah, watch your step, Happy. It's a 2,000-foot drop if he slip. I think I'd better rest a minute, sir. I'm getting dizzy. Everything's getting dark. I noticed the same thing, but it's not dizziness. My head's perfectly clear. Hey, look at the sun. I can hardly see it. It must be an eclipse. Venus doesn't have a moon. There can't be an eclipse. Smoke of rockets. It's pitch dark. This is Vogan's work. He's got the blackout beam on us. If we try to move another inch in this darkness, we'll drop into the chasm. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting space patrol adventure, The Serpent of Saturn. Here he comes, gang. Here he comes. The fastest boy on roller skates in the neighborhood. Get up and go, and look at him go. Wow! 
Now, there's a space patroller who really has it. He just got up from a good nourishing breakfast. Just finished off a big bowl of rice checks with plenty of milk and sugar. He's packed full of action energy. The kind of action energy that'll help to make you a wizard on rollers. And help make you so alert that you can come up with the right answers in your classroom. Yes, sir, space patrollers, you start off any day ready for action when you eat a whopping good breakfast with rice checks. Because rice checks is tops for get up and go. Tops for taste, too. A delicious triple toasted shredded rice treat that's good with milk or cream and super good with fruit. And tops for size because it's bite size. The just right size for easy eating. So, gang, try rice checks yourself. And try Wheat Checks, that wonderful, wonderful whole wheat cereal. Rich in energy, swell tasting, and bite size. So don't forget checks, rice, or wheat. It's tops three ways. For taste, for size, for get up and go. Look for them in the red and white checkerboard packages with the picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the neat free Space Patrol trading card inside. Rice Checks, Wheat Checks. <laughs> And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Serpent of Saturn. Ordinarily, the appearance of the monthly Space Patrol bulletin is a routine event. It causes no excitement, except perhaps among the officers and men of the publication section who are charged with the responsibility of preparing this official monthly report on Space Patrol activities. But this time, there is considerable interest in the document by every level of command. In his central office at Space Patrol headquarters on Terra, Commander Corey frowns and shakes his head as he examines a copy of the bulletin. Cadet Happy, returning from an errand in another part of headquarters, fails to notice the commander's unusually serious manner. Gee, Commander, everybody's sure studious all of a sudden. All over headquarters, people are reading the bulletin, even the file clerks. I guess the editor's added a page of jokes. (laughs) There's certainly nothing funny in this issue of the bulletin, Happy. Sorry, sir. Especially in the Secretary General's notes in the margin of this copy. Something wrong? Plenty. Those robberies, is that it? Partly, but it's more than that. Do you realize that in the past ten days, there have been 23 cases of assaults against space patrollers? And all apparently without reason. I heard about a couple of them, sir. One on Venus and another one on Pluto. If we hadn't been so busy on Neptune in the past week, I'd have alerted our men to take special precautions. Now, take a look at this breakdown here in the bulletin. Hmm. All over the solar system. Lowell City, Jupiter City, the Lunar Fleet. And in every case, our men were the victims of unprovoked assaults. Jumped from ambush, beaten. But why? Well, I think it's part of a carefully organized attempt to demoralize the space patrol. You mean some sort of a gang is behind it, Commander? Yes. Looking at each incident individually, one might think that a group of hoodlums just decided to gang up on a space patroller. Uh Uh-huh. When you put them all together, a rather interesting coincidence shows up. You notice whenever a beating occurred, a robbery followed within a day or two in the same locality. Oh, then you think the gang behind the robberies is also behind the beatings. Yeah, it's about the size of it, Happy. Apparently, the plan is this, to try to get our agents concerned about their own personal safety and reduce their efficiency. Well, if it keeps on like this, it might work. Mm, we're not going to let it. This gang has succeeded so far because it's well organized and evidently has spies in high places. What's the plan, sir? Well, the last attack on space patrollers occurred in Jupiter City at the spaceport, right? Well, yes, sir. Those two off-duty pilots... Oh, you mean if they follow the pattern, the gang may be planning a robbery at Jupiter City. Exactly. And the only thing we can do now is to alert our men in Jupiter City. Major Robertson to Commander Corey. Robbie's calling, sir. Yes, Robbie? Hey, Commander, we've got another one. A robbery? Yeah, and it's really serious. A model of the blackout beam has disappeared right out of the Jupiter City lab. Jupiter City? Hey, Commander, you sure called that one. Yes, but too late. Robbie, blast off for Jupiter City immediately. Yes, sir. Make a thorough check of security measures. I want a brainograph test made of everyone at the Jupiter City lab. Space phone a complete report to me. Meantime, in one of the finest buildings in Saturn City, capital of the ringed planet, a huge, broad-shouldered man sits behind a desk in a large but simply furnished office. Coiled on the desk, in a lifelike pose, is a startling example of the taxidermist art. A hooded cobra. The large man presses a button, and a moment later, a door opens and Thad Vogan swaggers in. Yes, Mr. Gargoth? Vogan, the Venus Express will blast off in half an hour. You will be aboard. Yes, sir. When you arrive in Venus City, you will charter an atmosphere ship and go to our hideout at the base of Mount Janik. You will pose as a botanist collecting samples. 
I understand the Venus wildflowers are quite beautiful this time of year. <laughs> you can admire the flowers while you wait for Preston. What's my business with Preston, Mr. Gargoth? You will give him an instrument which you will find in the emergency tool locker of the atmosphere ship. The light neutralizer. Oh, you've got the blackout beam. Of course. Right out of the Jupiter City Space Patrol Laboratory. I'll bet <laughs> Corey's tearing his hair. Unfortunately for our cause, Corey is given to more direct and effective action. However, I think we can divert Corey's attention. I'll rough up some more of his men. This time I'll rough up Corey himself. That's taken on quite a job, isn't it, Mr. Gargoth? It's time we struck at Corey before he strikes at me. Yes, but how? It's very simple. Corey will be informed that the Cobra will rob automatic factory R-18 outside of Saturn City. But, Mr. Gargoth, the Space Patrol doesn't even know your organization exists. Why tip him off? We can't hope to keep our operations a secret indefinitely. Corey must have figured out by now that these robberies have been masterminded by one organization. Yes, but to use our secret name. Why do you think I selected Cobra as my insignia? Well, I... You think I'm just being melodramatic, don't you? I selected the Cobra as an emblem because of its psychological effect. To the average person, the Cobra suggests something silent, ominous, and deadly. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yes, Mr. Gargan. Fear is a useful weapon. Before long, we will have the inhabitants of all ten planets shuddering at the mention of the Cobra. <laughs> Even the Space Patrol. But how does that take care of Corey? You think Corey would miss a chance to capture the leader of a gang that has pulled off more than 20 daring and successful robberies? Oh, I don't suppose he would. That's why I'm going to lure him to factory R-18. Just how are you going to do that? There's a civilian clerk named Walter Reiner at Corey's headquarters on Terra. Oh, yes, he gave us some information well, once. Reiner isn't much use to us, too undependable. But I'm going to plant some information on Reiner and have Corey tipped off. Corey will think he's uncovered a plot. <laughs> and fly right into our trap. Sometime later at Space Patrol headquarters on Terra, Appy enters the commander's office with an extremely nervous young man, Walter Reiner. This is Reiner, sir. Oh, thanks, Happy. Sit down, Reiner. Yes, Commander. Thank you. I'll tell you why I've brought you here. I've received two anonymous tips that you have some information about a robbery. A robbery? No, sir, that's not true. And somebody seems quite determined to get you into trouble. Can you think of anyone who would have reason to do this to you? Why, no, sir. Uh, believe me, if I knew anything about a robbery, I'd report it at once. According to these two informants, you're supposed to be carrying written information on you right now. Information that you're to pass on to someone else. But that's not true, Commander. You can search me if you want. Uh, here, I'll empty my pockets. You can examine everything. Here's my identification folder. You can look through that. There is nothing in it but... Something wrong? It's a slip of paper. But I don't know how it got there. Yeah, let me see it. Plan 4 is now in effect. A Cobra will personally supervise a theft of radioactive strontium from automatic factory R-18, north of Saturn City, at 1800 hours universal star time. Smoke and rockets. I don't know anything about it. Honestly, Commander. I know it looks bad, but I swear I don't know anything about this it. This Cobra that's mentioned here, does that mean anything to you? No. No, sir, not a thing. It's a horrible trick. All right, Reiner, all it's right. It's somebody's idea of a joke. I said it's all right, Reiner. You mean, you mean you believe me? Somebody was very anxious for me to find this on you. Just go back to your work and don't say anything to anybody about it, understand? Yes, sir. Thank you, Commander. Thank you very much. Well, somebody sure must have it in for Reiner to play a trick like that. What Reiner watched, Happy. I'll assign a man to trail him and contact Saturn Space Patrol. I'm going to put a heavy guard on Factory R-18. You mean the Reiner isn't on the level and there really is going to be a robbery? I think someone's trying to lure me to the factory. As for Reiner, he may be an innocent dupe. We'll watch him for a while. Commander, he's coming back. Commander. Commander, i got to tell you something. Yes, Reiner, what is it? I didn't tell you the whole truth before. When you let me go, I, I was relieved. Then I got scared. I'm afraid of what they might do to me. Well, who do you mean by they? The gang. The Cobra gang. And you did know about that note? No, sir. Well, who is this Cobra? I don't know. 
But he's got a powerful organization of criminals. They're behind all of those robberies. And you're a member of the gang? No, 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 not exactly. I just sold him some information a few months ago about some security control procedure. Whom did you deal with? Uh, it was a man named Wogan. Thad Wogan. He's one of the higher-ups. Why are you telling all this now? Because I think they want to get me out of the way. They're afraid I... Double-cross them the way you did the space patrol? I'll make up for it. I know more about the gang than they think I do. I know their secret space upon frequency. All right, Rannan. Start at the beginning and give me the whole story. Even after hours of careful questioning, Commander Corey is able to obtain only a few useful bits of information about the band of criminals. Then, with Reiner in custody, Buzz and Appy begin the tedious task of checking the gang's frequencies. Nothing on this band so far, sir. You suppose Reiner made a mistake in the frequencies? Well, what he told us checks with the brainograph test. Imagine that little rat selling security secrets. I'd sure like to know who's the head of this. Bogan calling Cobra. Bogan to Cobra. We've got something. Bogan to Cobra. Cobra here. Go ahead, Bogan. I'm set up at Marjanic. Have you tried the neutralizer? Yeah, it works fine. We can put it to uses the Space Patrol never dreamed of. They've got the light neutralizer. All right. Preston will relieve you of the machine at about 1,700 hours tomorrow. Just sit tight, Cobra out. Mount Jarnick. It's about 300 miles north of Venus City. Let's get to the ship, Happy. Vogan is going to be relieved of that light neutralizer sooner than he thinks. High above the cloud-draped peak of Mount Jannick, the Terra 5 circles slowly. Then, using repeller ray, begins to descend as Buzz and Happy scan the terrain by sensitive view scopes. In a small building at the base of the mountain, Thad Vogan clicks on a spacophone. Cobra calling Vogan. Come in, Vogan. Vogan here, go ahead. Something's gone wrong. Don't wait for Preston. Take the light neutralizer and get out of there. What's the matter? Corey didn't fall for that robbery. He's arrested Reiner, and the little sap knows more about our organization than you thought he did. He doesn't know a thing about it. Nothing that could hurt us anyway. Look, Vogan, do what I tell you. Get the neutralizer and get out of there. I'll contact you later. Go Brown. Now listen, boss. Now, what's he getting all excited about? Everything was just fine and... Who could that be? Now, this paralyzer ray will take care of the situation. All right, drop that gun. Sure, Space Patroller. Like this. Get him, Hap. Yes. <laughs> now, while you're both relaxed, enjoying the effects of my paralyzer ray, I'm going to make sure I won't be bothered by you again. This building is quite flimsily constructed. Have you noticed? <laughs> a few touches with this Atomo torch, and this room will be a roaring inferno. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Dick Tufeld in Los Angeles reporting on a plane that can fly a thousand miles without refueling, the North American FJ-2 Fury. In a moment, we'll hear from the well-known test pilot on this Navy jet plane, J. Ray Donahue, Jr. The Fury is a carrier-based fighter armed with four 20-millimeter cannons. It flies 650 miles per hour. Has an altitude mark of 45,000 feet. Its length, 37 feet. Now, J. Ray Donahue, Jr., recorded at Edwards Air Force Base. To fly at supersonic speeds, a test pilot must have plenty of energy. That's why I always get a good night's sleep and start the day off with a good breakfast cereal like rice checks or wheat checks. They have plenty of energy, and they taste mighty fine. And I know that you'll like them, too. No other cereal, puffed or flaked, contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. So take a tip from J. Ray Donahue, Jr., Bob Love, and other top test pilots. Make your cereals rice checks and wheat checks. And now back to our space patrol adventure, the Serpent of Saturn. Gargoth, who calls himself the Cobra, has organized a band of criminals that has successfully committed scores of daring robberies. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy traced Gargoth's chief henchman, Thad Bogan, to a hideout at the base of Mount Janik on the planet Venus. 
When Buzz and Appy entered the small building, Bogan rendered the space patrollers helpless with a paralyzer ray. Then, to prevent pursuit, he set fire to the building. Now, as the flames roar about them, Buzz and Happy struggle against the effects of the paralyzer ray. Hey, Commander, I can move a little. Try to stand up, Happy. The heat. This place is like a furnace. If we can't shake the ray effect off in a couple of minutes, we're finished. I can move my arms, but I can't stand up. I made it. My legs are numb, but I can walk. Here, give me your hand. There. Lean on me. It's wearing off. I'm going to make it. A few more steps, we'll be outside the building. We made it. Wow. Yeah. I got a lucky break. The charge in Vulcan's ray gun was fairly light. Commander, look back at the building. We got out just in time. Can you see Vogan anywhere? Oh, no, sir. The smoke is too thick. Hey, but he couldn't have blasted off yet. Would have hurt his ship. Uh, there he is, headed for his ship. Yeah, I see him now. Hey, what's that he's carrying? Must be the light neutralizer. Oh, my legs weren't so numb we could catch him. Uh-oh, he saw us. I just wish he'd come back here. He acts like he's considering it. Well, he's not going to risk getting within range of our ray guns. I bet he wishes he'd taken them from us. He was so sure his fire trap was going to work. Hey, that's funny. He's not going to his ship after all. He's heading for the mountain. Come on, Hap, let's try to follow him. Yes, sir. Why didn't he go to his ship? We couldn't have stopped him from blasting off. Well, it's an atmosphere job. Logan probably figures we could space a phone for a patrol ship to go after him. Yeah, sure. He's taking a chance on losing us on the mountain. You have your miniature space phone, Hap? Yes, sir. You report to Venus City headquarters and keep on after Bogan. With Buzz and Happy doggedly following him, Thad Bogan climbs higher and higher up the steep face of Mount Jenik. At first, he outdistances them. But as the minutes go by, the effects of the paralyzer ray wear off, and Buzz and Happy start gaining on Bogan. <sighs> Bogan's sure hanging under that light neutralizer. If you throw it away, he'd be able to climb a lot faster. He won't drop it till he has to. I hope he hangs on to it. After the way we're risking our necks to get it back. I'll say this for Bogan. Climbs like a mountain goat. I'll say. Hey, Commander, is that model the only light neutralizer in existence? Yes. This model was to be tested, then if proved successful, a larger model was to be made into a spaceship. Well, does the... Well, does it really black out light completely? It can, but it's designed to reduce the sun's glare on ships making flights on sunward vectors, particularly between the inner planets. It sure would come in handy on construction jobs and space platforms. Uh-huh. Hey, it looks like Vogan's going to take us clear to the top. Make sure he doesn't get directly above us and drop a rock on us. Hey, we're still on his trail, sir. See, that's where he took a foothold. Watch your step, Happy. It's a 2,000-foot drop if you oh. slip. I think I'd better rest a minute, sir. It's getting dizzy. Everything's getting dark. I noticed the same thing, but it's not dizziness. My head's perfectly clear. Hey, look at the sun. I can hardly see it. Hey, there must be an eclipse. An eclipse on Venus? Hey, that's right. Venus doesn't have a moon. But there can't be an eclipse... But something's shutting off the sun. It's a heavy fog, maybe. Don't move, Hap. Smoke and rockets, it's pitch dark. Bogan's turned the blackout beam on us, the light neutralizer. If we try to move another inch in this darkness, we'll drop into the chasm. Well, isn't he in the same fix we are? Not necessarily. The neutralizer can be adjusted to dim out light all around you, or it can be focused in a beam. If we only had our Otomo lights. They wouldn't work, Happy. The feel of the neutralizer cuts out all light waves. Well, what are we going to do? We can't go back down. We can't go ahead and... Well, Vogan's got us at his mercy. There's one thing. He can't see us. He doesn't have to see us. All he's got to do is wait until we make a false move and we're goners. Oh, wait a minute, Hap. There's a good-sized rock here next to me. I can feel it. I'm going to try to give it a shove down the side of the mountain. When it drops, let out a yell. I get it. Make him think we've fallen. Right. Here goes. Hap, look out! Look out! How was that? Very realistic. For a minute, I was afraid you did fall. Press close to the cliff and keep very still. Hey, he turned off the neutralizer. I can see. He'll probably wait to be sure we're gone. Well, I hope he doesn't come back down here to investigate. Vogan to Cobra. Vogan to Cobra. Listen, he's got a miniature spacer phone. Turn your volume up, Hap. Vogan to Cobra. Cobra here. Where are you? Halfway to the top of Mount Shonic. Corey and this cadet were after me. Cor on Venus? I told... Take it easy, Mr. Gargan. It's all right. Corey and that cadet won't bother us anymore. I 
took good care of them. Good. How? I turned on the light neutralizer. They couldn't see in the blackout beam and fell off the ledge. Uh, nice work, Bogan. Yeah, but I'm still on the mountain, and I don't like it. I'll come and get you. Think I want to wait up here while you come all the way from Saturn? I'm not on Saturn. I'm in a spaceship not very far from Venus. Well, that's better. Get her as soon as you can. Corey may have notified the space patrol before he fell. All right, you get to the top of the peak. Everything looks clear. I'll land and pick you up. Cobra out. Hurry. So the Cobra's name is Gargoth. Vogan thought he was on Saturn. Probably that's the headquarters of the outfit. It's possible. What do we do now? Tip off the Venus City Space Patrol? We'll use our space phone. Vogan might hear it. Sure. We'll take a chance on sneaking up on Vogan. If we capture him before Gargoth gets here, we may be able to trick him into landing. Yeah, and then we'll have the Cobra. Come on, let's go. Stay close to the cliff so he can't see it. Slowly and cautiously, Buzz and Happy resume their climb up the steep mountainside. Occasionally, they get a glimpse of Bogan far above them. Then they press close to the cliff and wait. We've had one good break. Bogan doesn't ever look down. He's probably afraid he'll get dizzy. And the going's not so steep now, sir. We're getting near the top. I'm thankful for this growth of brush at the summit. It'll help us hide from Bogan. Hope we can get him before the cobra shows up. Drop happy. Hit the dirt. Did he see us? I guess not. He's going on. But he started to look down this way. We better wait a few minutes. At last, Vogan reaches the summit of Mount Janik. Wearily, he lays down the light analyzer, then sits on a rock to rest. Silently, Buzz and Happy creep closer. Careful, Happy. Don't let him hear us. There's not much cover from here on. Do we rush him? Let's try to get a few yards closer. If he has a chance to use that blackout beam, we could never find him. Yeah. Uh, oh, gee. Get the neutralizer, Hap. I'll handle Vogan. Corey! I'll take that gun, Vogan. <coughs> All right, Vogan. Had enough? Yeah. Happy, got the neutralizer? Yes, sir. Hey, Commander. It's a spaceship. It's probably Vogan's pal. Better all get out of sight before he gets close enough to see us. Come on, Vogan. Get over there by that brush. You stand out where you can be seen. We'll be in the brush right behind you. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm coming. Cobra to Vogan. Cobra to Vogan. Answer him, Vogan. But don't try to warn him. Okay. Vogan to Cobra. Go ahead. There aren't any ships in the vicinity. I'm coming in to pick you up. All right, come ahead. Corey, chair, watch out. Uh, give me that space of phone. Corey, you told me Corey was dead. I was very much alive, Gargoth. Or Cobra, wherever you are. Now make it easy on yourself and land, or I'll have every patrol ship in the Venus sector after you. You'd better talk fast, then, because I'm going to blast you off that mountain with a space torpedo. No. No, boss. Please don't. You've made a stupid blunder, Vogan. But I assure you that the rocket is meant only for Corey. If you get it, well, it's an unfortunate accident. Space torpedoes... We don't stand a chance. We've got to hide. We've got to hide. Happy sure your space phone's turned off. It is, sir. Good. Let's have a look at that light neutralizer. That's not going to save us, not from torpedoes. Oh, see, this setting ought to be about right for our purpose. Now, we'll just set the neutralizer here on the ground. Now, come on. Get out of the field of darkness, quickly. I can't see. Of course you can't, stupid. Just do what the commander tells you. Come on. Hey. We're out of the field. He can see us. If you stay in the brush... Just get far away from that field of neutralized light. Yeah, this should be safe enough. Commander, you've made a nice target. From here in the ship, the field of darkness looks like a black hole on the top of the mountain. A black round hole. Somewhere inside that hole you were hiding. <laughs> so futile, Commander. <laughs> so pathetically futile. He's making a pass right over us. Fired a torpedo. Smoke and rockets. The field of darkness is gone. And, and when you look at that hole, what a blast. Yeah, there goes a perfectly good light neutralizer blown to bits. Yeah. And also, there goes the cobra. He figures he finished us. Are you sure he's not coming back? Mm, doesn't look like it. I sure hate to see that crook get away. He'd better enjoy his triumph while he can, Happy. Because we're going after the Cobra, and we won't give up till we get him.
An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Hi, Space Patrollers. This is Captain Tufel. And Cadet Happy. I'm reporting to you on Rice Checks. And I'm reporting to you on Wheat Checks. Rice Checks. Triple toasted shredded rice biscuits. The taste mighty good. Tops for taste. That's Rice Checks. Wheat Checks. Boy, they've got a swell whole wheat flavor that just can't be beat. Tops for taste. That's Wheat Checks, too. And Rice Checks are made in that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. Tops for size. That's Rice Checks. Wheat Checks are bite-sized for super easy eating. Tops for size, too. And gang, after a good nourishing breakfast with Checks, rice, or wheat, you'll see their tops for get up and go. Real Space Patrol get up and go, like the commander has. Checks, a good word to remember at breakfast time or any time because... They're tops three ways. For taste... Size and get up and go. Look for the red and white checkerboard packages with the picture of the commander or the swell picture of me on the outside. <laughs> yes, and the terrific Space Patrol trading card on the inside. Rice checks. Wheat checks. <laughs> And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are exploring the system of unused water mains under Jupiter City, searching for a hidden laboratory operated by the Cobra Gang. After trudging nearly a mile in a crouched position, Happy moans. Oh, oh, my aching back. I sure wish this pipe was six inches bigger. Well, from the chart, the lab should be just a few hundred yards ahead. Commander, there's air blowing through the main. Yes, it's getting stronger every second. This is like being in a wind tunnel. What's causing it? The air's being forced to the main by the water behind it. Water? What water? From the reserve tank. Gargut knows we're down here and he's trying to drown us. Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Gems of Jupiter, when Rice Checks and Wheat Checks again present Space Patrol! Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmerer Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Deverin. Other players were Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Rice Checks and Wheat Checks again present Space Patrol! <laughs> Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast for armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. The American Broadcasting Company invites you to meet Great Caesar's Ghost. Someone once said, every man to his own friends, every man to the company he keeps. Well, this is well and good for most people, but not for Julius Caesar Jones, leading druggist in the little town of Kingston. No, with J.C. Jones, it's different. Because as we shall soon see, some of the company he keeps is, well, to say the least, unusual. As our scene opens, Julius is in the back room of his drugstore, putting up a prescription when the telephone rings. Jones Drugstore. Hello, Pop. Oh, hello, Buster. Do you know where Mom is? Oh, she's at home, as far as I know, having a tea party. I called, but nobody answers. Well, you know your mother's tea party, son. These women are always talking so loud and so fast, they'd never hear a dozen telephones. Gee, I let her ring for about ten minutes. Well, that's all I wanted to know, Pop. All right, son. I'll see you later. Okay, goodbye, Pop. Goodbye, Buster. And now, let's see, where was I? Oh, yes, yes. This is Flemington's prescription. Now, let me think. Sulfur. Yes. Ammonia. Mm-hmm. Sodium nitrate. Or did I put sodium nitrate in? Confounded, I can't remember. I'll have to start the whole thing all over again. <sighs> Great Caesar's ghost. Greetings, citizen. What? Hail and well met. Who, who are you? Uh, how did you get in here? All hail the mighty Caesar. Make way, knaves. Bow down. Tis great Caesar who approaches. Caesar? 
Now, 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 look here. What, what kind of practical joke is this? Who are you, and what are you doing behind the prescription desk in that nightgown? Nightgown? Forsooth, you make light of my toga. By Marius Jonesy, if you don't wish to discourse with me in a manner befitting my regal personage, and carry on as if you don't believe it is I when I stand before you, why did you call me? Call you? Well, that's the last thing in the world I do. But you did. Just as I was leaving my palace, I distinctly heard the words. Words? What words? I must say that you used them in an uncomplimentary manner. You used them rather as an expletive. Great Caesar's ghost, you said. Now, didn't you? Well, yes, but I... Those words will always bring me. Whenever I hear them, I must immediately put a halt to whatever I am doing and answer you. Oh, now, look here. This is ridiculous. You doubt the great Caesar? Stand back, Jonesy. Watch closely now. I'll disappear. There, now, you see. I mean, now you don't see. Say the words, Jonesy. You mean... Go on, Jonesy, and put a ring in them. Say them proudly. Uh, great Caesar's ghost. And Caesar is here. From the past into the present. From the invisible to... Uh, Jones Drugstore. But I, I don't understand. No, I can't believe this. It's very simple, Jonesy. You are a direct descendant of the great Julius Caesar. I am? But I hardly knew him. I, I mean, I... Well, I just happen to have his name. And his royal blood in your veins. You're the first one in over 800 years, Julius Caesar Jones, to have both Caesar's name and Caesar's blood. And you are great Caesar? He gets her. I am great Caesar's ghost. The spirit of the ruler of men. Uh, be careful, sir. My drugs. The emperor of the Romans. The leader of thousands. Uh, and don't whirl around like that, say, uh, Caesar. You do not uh, knock my bottles off the bed. The head of the great Roman emperor. Yes, and I, I will do anything you bid me do, Jonesy. You've done enough. You've ruined Mrs. Flemington's prescription. Yes, and spotted my toga with some of the most unpleasant of the ingredients. I almost certainly have to do something about that. Uh, not a very good start, Jonesy. But I repeat that I will do anything you bid. Anything? Anything. What do you have in mind? Well, would you mind helping me mop up this mess on the floor? A mop? He gad! What a pastime for Gaius Julius Caesar, the ruler of men, the emperor uh, of the careful, Roman Caesar. Empire. There are more bodies in here. Oh, yes, yes. Carefully. Very well, Jonesy. The great Caesar submits. Lead me to the mop. Oh, Cassandra, it was a wonderful party. Wonderful. Oh, do you think everyone had a good time? Of course they had a good time, Cassandra. Everyone always has a good time in the Jones's house. Oh, I wish I could say that about the Fisher house. Now, Effie. We always enjoy coming to your place. Maggie Kingston, you know that's not true. My husband's the city's only undertaker, and I've resigned myself to it. By every time I have the girls over, I know what they're thinking. I see them looking around under things. Oh. Like they expect to find I don't know what hidden away somewhere in the corner. Oh, Effie, nonsense. Now, we're going to have our next meeting of the Ladies' Benefit Club at your place, and no one's going to look anywhere for anything. Certainly not. Now, Cassandra, I'll help you clean up. Oh, no, really, don't bother. Oh, Maggie, don't forget to take your luncheon cloth. You were a lifesaver. Imagine having a party in all my claws at the laundry. I was glad to bring them. But I wish they had been a little better. That new linen cloth of yours on the dining room table certainly shamed my covers. Sandra, <laughs> where did you ever get such a lovely cloth? Oh, over at Clover City. I've always wanted a white linen with a blue border. The color picks up the blue in the wallpaper. Oh, it's beautiful. If it turns out missing one of these days, Cassandra, you'll know where to look for it. <laughs> my goodness, look how late it's getting. I'm in a terror. Well, I'll take you in my car, Effie. Oh, you didn't bring yours, did you? No, Fred had a funeral. He always takes our car when he has a funeral. Hmm, you should be glad you're the banker's wife, Maggie. You can have a car of your own. Fred's not doing so badly. Why don't you make him get your car? Oh, well, you know Freddy. 
He's never interested in anything unless it's a matter of life and death. Particularly the latter. Well, Cassandra, thank you again. Oh, I wish you could stay a little longer. Cassandra, it's been awfully nice. But you just wait until my next party. I got the most wonderful idea while you were passing out the cookies. I wrote it down and put it in my purse. Oh, my purse. I'm walking off without it. Wasn't that your purse in there on one of the dining room chairs, Oh, Maggie? yes. Now, isn't that just like me? Oh, never mind, Cassandra. I'll go get it. I know exactly where it is. <laughs> no wonder Banker Kingston's always saying Maggie's so scatterbrained. Oh, she's not scatterbrained. She just has a lot on her mind all the time. <gasps> Did you find it, Maggie? Oh, yes, right where I left it. Well, I think I'll be ready. Uh huh. Well, goodbye, Cassandra. Bye. Bye, Mr. Jones. Yes, I will. Bye. Bye. In a banana. Fa- Buster. Buster. Remember what I told you. We have to wax the floors before your father gets home. Oh, they should have been waxed yesterday. But the girls were all so busy admiring my new linen tablecloth. <gasps> My tablecloth. My tablecloth. It's gone. Jones Drugstore. Julius, I have to talk to you. Yes, dear? Well, um, I don't know what to say. I had my white linen tablecloth with a blue border out so the girls all could see it. And now it's gone. Gone? The last time I saw it, Maggie Kingston and Effie Fisher and I were all admiring it. And then we got to talking about something else, and the girls started to leave. We got as far as the front door, and Maggie suddenly noticed she'd forgotten her purse. Well, she went... Oh, she wouldn't take her tablecloth, Cassandra. Well, I don't like to think she would. Of course she wouldn't. My banker Kingston could buy more tablecloths than I've got pills in my drugstore. But she did go back after her purse, and she was in the dining room alone. And when I went in there just after she and Effie had gone, my cup of cloth was missing. Didn't you borrow some cloths from Maggie for your party? Oh, well, yes. Well, then she must have accidentally mixed your cloth up with hers. Oh, dear, I'm sure you're right. Why don't you call Maggie up and ask her? Oh, Julius, I don't want her to think I'm accusing her of stealing the cloth. Can't you think of some way to get it back without embarrassing the Kingston? Well, I'll try to think of something. What did the cloth look like? Well, it was white linen with a blue border about two inches wide all the way around the edges. White with a blue border. Uh, All right, Cassandra. I'll stop by the Kingston's and see what I can find out. You're going over there? Yeah, I might as well. I'll be in that neighborhood anyway. I have to deliver a bottle of medicine to old Mrs. Flemington out on the north side of the town. Julius, nice to have you drop around. Here, have a cigar. Thanks, Banker Kingston. I uh, didn't know you'd be at home this time of the day. Yes, yes, indeed. Bank is ours, you know. <laughs> uh, I uh, was just passing by. Thought I'd drop in and say hello to you and Maggie. Well, Maggie isn't here just now. She was over at your place earlier, and then she had to go over to see Mrs. Mitchell about getting a dress fitted or something. She, uh, she's been here then? Since she left my place, I mean? Mm, yes, in and out, so to speak, yes. Mm-hmm, I see. Uh, you know, Kingston, I've always admired your place. Never have talked to you about it much. Uh, find it pretty convenient, do you? Convenient? Well, yes, certainly. Mm-hmm. Lots of room, plenty of windows, and good light. Nice big hallway out there. Uh, Judas, uh, do you want to take a tour of the house? Hmm? I, oh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I forgot I was company. Uh, for goodness sake, Judas, you company, why you're as welcome in this house as Maggie, my own daughter, Penelope. Well, thank you, Kingston. By the way, where is Penny? Mm, still at school, I imagine. I suppose she's a big help to Maggie, huh? Mm, yeah, Penelope's a good little helper, yeah, I suppose so. Sets the tables, I suppose. Clears it, too, and uh, puts away the luncheon cloths. Luncheon cloths? You know, covers for the table. I uh, gather Maggie keeps most of them here in this uh, hallway linen closet. Mm, well, uh, yes, yes, I, I suppose so. Uh-huh. By the way, oh, uh, do you have a copy of the last lodge report, Kingston? Lodge report? 
Why, why yes, I, I have. Uh, could I borrow it for tonight? I've mislaid my own someplace. Why, oh, certainly, Judas. I'll go right up and get it. It's upstairs in my den. Oh, now, if it's a lot of trouble, don't No bother. trouble. You just wait there. I'll be right back. All right. Oh, great Jupiter. I, I feel like a sneak thief. Oh, but Cassandra said to find a way not to embarrass the Kingstons. Uh, this is where Kingston said Maggie keeps her linens. Let's see. Uh, white tablecloth with blue border. Mm, blue border. Here's one that's blue with a white border. This must be it, all right. Oh, Cassandra was just so excited, she got the colors mixed. Yeah, sure as anything, that's it. Wait a minute. This red check cloth. Oh, that's ours, too. I remember Cassandra used it at breakfast just the other morning. Ah, oh, poor Maggie. I wonder if Banker Kingston knows that she's that way about tablecloths. <laughs> Albert Kingston, I don't mislay things. I told you that I'd put them here in the downstairs linen closet. And when I went to get the blue one to put on the table for supper tonight, it was gone. Mother's right, Daddy. She showed me the drawer. Someone had rummaged all through it. Albert, was anyone in the house while I was at the dressmaking? No. Well, no one but Julius Jones. He just dropped in to get a copy of the Lodge Report, and then he just... Hey... There was something peculiar at that. Judas Jones. Why, after all these years, why, that, that, that pill roller, a, 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 a pilferer. Poor Cassandra. I wonder, does she know that Judas is that way about tablecloths? Well, Cassandra, there they are. My goodness, Julius, these aren't my tablecloths. What? Mine was white with a blue border, not blue with a white border. And whatever made you bring along this red check one? Well, you used it just the other morning. Julius, are you out of your mind? There's never been a red check tablecloth in this house. But I, I thought that... Ooh, what's this sticky stuff all over them? Hmm, smells like medicine. Well, it is medicine. Old Mrs. Flemington spilled some of her prescription. Well... There's only one thing to do. I'm going to wash them out and iron them just as nice as I possibly know how. And then you're going to march right back to the Kingston's place and return them. There now, Julius. Don't they look nice? All washed nice and clean. Cassandra, I've been thinking about all this, and I don't see how I'm going to get those things back into the Kingston's without them finding out. Julius... You managed to steal them. I didn't steal them. So you can manage to get them back where they belong. Well, thank goodness it's a dark night out. I can hang them on the line and no one will know. But, Cassandra... I'll be back in a minute. Oh, if Kingston ever finds out, he'll skin me alive. He'll make me the laughing stock of the town. And what's more, he... The lights. Who turned out the lights? Buster? Buster, are you fiddling around with the electric fuses? Buster! Turn those lights back on. Great Caesar's ghost. He got Jonesy, what now? Caesar? That you? Forsooth, who else? Listen, Jonesy. You'll simply have to do something about that broken cord in the bathroom. Broken cord? In the bathroom? By the bones of Brutus, yes. I was trying your electric razor in there a minute ago, and all the lights went out. Push, push that doorbell button again, Penny. But Father... Push it, push it. I'm going to stir Jones out of there if it takes me all night. All right, Father, but can't you see the Joneses aren't home? They are home, I tell you. But look, not a light in the house. Penelope, I distinctly saw lights in the house as we came around the corner. Penelope, Father? did you push that doorbell button? Several times, Daddy, but I don't think it rains. Why, of course it rains. Jones' doorbell always rings. Uh, Jones is, is just hiding, that's all. He, he's he gone underground. Underground? Like all criminals do. Oh, Dad. Don't be so melodramatic. I'm not being melodramatic. Simply want those tablecloths back. Uh, come on, let's go try the back door. Maybe if I call for Penny, Buster. don't you dare. I came over here determined not to raise our voices. 
be no shouting over this matter. But, Daddy, I always holler for Buster when I don't see him outside. Mm, Penelope, we will not create a disturbance under any circumstance. Why, you know how these things are in a small town. The minute someone finds out, everyone else in seven counties will know about it by morning. Shall I knock on the back door, Daddy? No, wait a minute. Penelope, do you see what I see? What's that, Daddy? It's so dark out here. There, there on Cassandra's clothesline. Aren't those your mother's tablecloths? Tablecloths? <gasps> Why, Daddy, I do believe you're right. Of course I'm right. They're exactly the ones your mother described as missing. Daddy, where are you going? To take those tablecloths off the line. Why, the nerve of Cassandra. She was probably trying to wash out all of Maggie's identification marks. We'll return to Great Caesar's Ghost in just a moment. As we re-enter the troubled life of Julius Caesar Jones, we again find him answering the ring of his drugstore too. Jones Drugstore. Oh, Julius, thank heavens you're at the store already. You just opened up, Cassandra. Julius, they're gone. Gone? Who's gone? Maggie's tablecloths. When I went to get them, they weren't on the line. Well, maybe Buster brought them in. No, I asked him. But, dear, who would take tablecloths off our clothesline? Oh, Julius, this is terrible. If they were our own, I wouldn't mind half as much. Oh. Now, now, Cassandra, don't get all excited. It won't help a bit. But what are we going to do? Well, there's only one thing to do. Go down to Bircher's department store, Cassandra, and try to replace them. If you can find two, just like them to give her, she'll never know the difference. Now, Buster, where are you going? Over and look at the new marbles Bircher's got in yesterday. Buster, you are not going to buy any more marbles. But holy smoke, Mom. They're all over the house now. You just stay right here with me. I brought you along for a purpose, and I don't intend to have you running all over the store while I'm in here shopping. But, Mom, they've got some swell new Aggies. I don't care what they have, son. You can look at them some other time. I want you to stay right here, and if you see Maggie Kingston coming to the store, let me know right away. Holy smoke, Mom. Well, good morning, Mrs. Jones. May I help you? Yes. Uh, I'd like to look at some table covers. Oh, certainly. Uh, do you have anything special in mind? Well, yes, I do. Uh, first of all, a red-checked luncheon cloth. Red-checked luncheon cloth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I think there's one in this box right here, Mrs. Jones. Oh, well, isn't that fortunate? There's just one left. That's exactly the one I wanted. <laughs> How much is it? That's uh, uh, five fifty nine, marked down from seven fifty. I'll take it. All right. Now, uh, was there anything else? Oh yes, uh, something blue and a dinner cloth, a light blue with about a two inch white border. Oh my, we're terribly short on dinner cloths, especially in blue. I do have one, however, but I don't think you'll like it. It's really a ghastly thing. Is it blue? Yes, but not a very pretty blue, Mrs. Jones. Does it have a white border? Yes, it has. And it's a full-size dinner cloth. Shall I show it to you? It's the only blue dinner cloth you have. The only one in the store. Oh, well, I might as well look at it. I'll get it for you right away. Will you excuse me? Mom, there's Hanky Davis overlooking at the marbles. Hi, Hanky. Buster, hush. My goodness, yelling like that. Where are your manners? Oh, Hanky doesn't get embarrassed very easy. Well, perhaps not, but I do. Everyone in the store is looking at us. Hanky, are you finding any new ones you don't have already? Buster, stop making faces at that boy. I'm not making faces. I'm trying to talk to him. Well, you can see him later. Now behave yourself. Here we are, Mrs. Jones. But I just know you aren't going to like it. Like it? My goodness, that's just like the one Julius took from Maggie Ke <gasps> Well, That's exactly what I want. Uh, you do? My goodness, yes, and you just about didn't show it to me. No, th that is, I, I just about didn't, did I? Oh, but it is a lovely cloth. Don't you think so? Oh, I certainly do not. I agree with you. It's ghastly. 
My goodness, Mrs. Jones. How much is it? It's very reasonable. Just eighteen dollars. <sighs> Never thought I'd pay eighteen dollars for a pen wiper like that. But you are going to take it? Both of them, I mean, the red check too? Oh, yes, I'll take them. <sighs> How much is it altogether? Uh, the twenty three fifty nine, Mrs. Jones. But if you'd like to wait until our next shipment of blue covers comes oh, in... Oh, no, no, no. You don't understand. I'll take both claws. Oh. Will you wrap them, please? Oh, certainly, Mrs. Jones. They'll be ready in just a minute. Can I go now, Mom? No, Buster, you cannot. I want you to help me when we get home. Holy smoke, Mom. Help you? Yes, dear. I can't give those table covers to Maggie looking like they do. Looking like they do? Oh, they're too new looking. I'll have to wash them out so Maggie won't know they haven't ever been used. Well, Penelope, I guess I'm not getting so old at that. (laughs) Old, Daddy? No, not when my very beautiful young daughter chooses to wait an entire half hour at the bank to walk home with me. Oh, here, Penny, we go this way. Across Burns vacant lot? Yes, saves a minute and a half. Do you always come this way when you walk home? Sure, it takes me right by Schaefer's backyard and... And the Jones. Well, I sometimes stop a minute and say a few words to old F. Schaefer. I don't see him out to There's save, Buster right? going in his house. Hey, Buster! Oh, I guess he didn't hear me. Yeah, he probably doesn't want to hear you. He's more than likely ashamed. Ashamed? Yes, of Julius, his father. Daddy, I still don't think there's... I still think there's some mistake. Why, for heaven's Hold on sake. a minute, Penny. What? Look. There on Cassandra's clothesline. My heavens, Daddy. Mother's red check tablecloth. And the blue one with the white border. The Jones has got them back again. Well, did you Penny, ever... Penny, you wait here. Daddy, where are you going? Where do you think I'm going? I'm going to get those tablecloths and take them home to Maggie again. <laughs> My heavens, Julius, I've been trying to get you for 20 minutes. Julius, you won't believe it, but I saw it happen with my very own eyes. Believe it? You saw what happened? Banker Kingston. I was in the kitchen, and when I looked out of the window for Buster, I saw him going through the back gate. uh, Buster? No, Julius, Banker Kingston. And he was carrying off those two brand new tablecloths I brought this morning for Maggie. Great Jupiter. Julius. What are we going to do about it? Well, it's time to close up the store. I'll come right home, and we'll both go over to Kingston's and have a talk with him. Will you hurry, Julius? Sure. I'll get there as fast as I can. All right, dear. Goodbye. Oh, dear. Now, who could that be? Oh. Oh. Maggie Kingston and Banker Kingston. Uh, Cassandra, uh, we um, uh, we want to talk to you. Yes, and I want to talk to you, Maggie. <laughs> Maggie, my dear, will you uh, take the package now? Just hold it a while longer, Albert. Well, uh, shall we invite ourselves in, Cassandra? Oh, oh yes, do come in. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, uh, let's not get uh, excited about this. I'm sure there's been a misunderstanding all the way around. So Albert and I thought that we should come right over. Well, Julius made a terrible mistake in taking those tablecloths. He thought he was doing right, but, well, we all make mistakes. What do you mean that Julius thought that he was doing right when he stole my tablecloths? Julius did not steal the Maggie. He only thought he was taking what belonged to us. Well, how on earth could he have thought that? Well, Maggie, after all, you took my brand new white linen tablecloth to begin with. I took your white linen? Why, Cassandra, Oh, see here, Cassandra. Cassandra, do you deny that my husband found two of my tablecloths on your clothesline? Two of your tablecloths? <laughs> two of mine, you mean? Why, I saw him take them off my line with my own eyes not more than 30 minutes ago. I don't mean those two. I brought them back to you. Albert made a mistake when he took them. Well, then you admit he took them. Yes, I took them, and I took two others last night. Last night? You took the ones last night, too? Why, of course I did. They were Maggie's. They had our laundry mark on them. 
Why do you deny they were our clothes? No, I don't deny it. Julius took them when he went over to talk to you about the new white linen you took from me. Cassandra Jones, I have never taken a single thing from you in my life. Then perhaps you can explain how my new cloth disappeared. Disappeared? Between the time you and I and Effie Fisher left the dining room and the time you went back after your purse. Look here, Cassandra. Are you insinuating that? I'm not insinuating anything. I'm simply you are saying... You are You're calling me a, a, a thief. And I'm not going to stand for it while... Well, <laughs> No, this whole thing has me so upset, I... Oh, dear, I've even forgotten to take off my apothecary jacket. I must be losing my mind. Oh, great Caesar's ghost. He can't, Jonesy, not again. Oh, I keep forgetting. That great Caesar... Oh, oh. Caution, Jonesy. Don't say it, or I shall disappear before we've had our little chat. Oh, yes, Jack. Yes. Listen, you promised to help me, didn't you? Anything your little heart desires, Jonesy. Well, then, find out who took my wife's tablecloth. Well, as you moderns say, this is a tough pecan to crack. You mean nut? Who is? Oh, never mind. Just please... Find Cassandra's tablecloth. Time, Jonesy. Patience, boy. As you can see, I don't have it on me. I'm not concealing it. I have on but my toga, a white bit of cloth, trimmed it. In blue. That's it. The tablecloth. This? Don't be insane, Jonesy. I found this toga lying on a table with a bowl of fruit in the center. No, no. Precisely. Uh, what a queer place for a bowl of fruit. Don't now, you look. Know? That's my wife's tablecloth. It's been causing an awful lot of trouble, and I have to get it back. You want my toga? But, Jonesy, what will I wear? Besides, it uh, wouldn't look well on you. You're too short. Now, see here. I don't want to wear it. I want my wife's tablecloth, and I want it right now. You can have my work jacket. Come on, slip it off. You said you'd do anything. Well, very well, Jonesy, as you wish. Now I'm to wear that... Drugstore jacket. A little while ago, it was mops, tablecloths, drugstore jackets. Ah, I think I shall go back to Rome tonight and rest. <laughs> We'll get back to the conclusion of Great Caesar's Ghost. Oh, Julius, I still don't get it. Where on earth did you find it? Well, dear, I didn't exactly find it on earth. Eh, that is, I... Well, I just found it, dear. Well, I'm just tickled to death that it's all settled. Where'd you find it? Now, Cassandra, honey, the important thing is that we have the tablecloth back. Well, yes, I suppose that's right. And it's settled with the Kingstons, and everybody's happy again. That's right, sweetheart. Doesn't it look nice on the table where it belongs? Oh, yes. I'm so proud of it. Well, I'll go get dinner, dear. <sighs> Remarkable. I should thank him. He really didn't know. I wonder. Yes, I think I will. Great Caesar's ghost. He can, Jonesy. I'm certainly glad you called. Yes, I just wanted to thank you. Do you realize what's happened? Well, no. Well, I'll tell you what's happened. I have just returned from Rome where I was laughed and booed off the Appian Way. But why? Why? Great Julius Caesar, the leader of men, the ruler of the entire Roman Empire, Caesar, the all-powerful, labeled... Jones Drugstore. Great Caesar's Ghost was produced in our San Francisco studios. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We 
shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Crawling Thing. Be quiet. I don't want to wake the others. Look at the cage. What do you mean? The mouse. What happened to the mouse? Let's go over to the cage. The spider, it's doubled in size again. I know. The mouse is gone. Now, look at the partition between the two pens. But there isn't any partition. That's right. And I don't think the partition slipped down between the two cages. I think that the two holders for it were opened and then the partition slipped down. Well, that means you're endowing the spider with... With them. intelligence. Yes, that's right. Remember what I said earlier? What would happen if the yes quantity also enlarged the ability of the brain to think? Well, it's happened. That spider will kill. It can think. That hairy, crawling thing can think. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present The Crawling Thing. And now for our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Crawling Thing. Quite by chance, I've come upon this little diary of Emery's. The mirror of a man's mind. I shall read you only those parts which concern the experiment. The months which brought him into contact with his ultimate death. Oh, yes. It begins on this page. July 7th. Today, I met Dr. Henry Sindler. I've always recognized him to be one of the greatest research men in this field. I applied for the position of his assistant. I only hope that he accepted me. It would be a great opportunity for me if I managed to get the position. I remember when he walked out to meet me. I take it that you are Mr. Bolton? Yes. Sindler, Dr. Henry Sindler. Yes, I know. Uh, please sit down, Mr. Bolton. It distresses me to see a man like you nervous and shaky. I'm not going to hurt you. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, now, you no doubt are aware that I drive my assistants to a state of utter exhaustion, that I expect quite a good deal from them? Yes, I'm aware of that, Dr. Sindler. Yes, all right, good. And thank you for, you for coming to see me, Mr. Bolton. I have many other applicants to see before the day is over. If you are accepted, we will notify you. The Dr. Sindler... That is all, Mr. Bolton. Good afternoon. July 11th, I was accepted. He called me this morning and said that he had chosen me to fill the position. Yesterday, I felt sure that I'd been rejected and almost accepted the position with Gates, but something held me back. I am to see him tonight for dinner. This is Donna Atwell, Mr. Bolton, another member of the research team. How do you do? It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Atwell. Will you join us in the martini? Yes, certainly. The laboratory up in the mountains should be completed by the end of this month. I have a few things to clear up here before we start on this new research. I imagine you're willing to live with me and the rest of my staff? Oh, yes. By all means, Dr. Sindler. Yes, excellent. I'm very interested in knowing what we're going to do. Tell him, Donna. Dr. Sindler is endeavoring to discover a method by which he can make plants and animals larger. Larger? Yes, Emery. Well, how? Every living thing, be it plant or animal, gives off electricity to a greater or lesser degree... By means of the electroencephalograph, science has already discovered the human brain gives off small microvolts of electricity. When a man becomes angry, this charge is strengthened. With the increased flow of electricity, his physical strength is also increased. Dr. Sindler is looking for the chemical which is released into a man's body, along with adrenaline, which gives a man this added strength and which also increases the microvolts of electricity. I see. Your cocktail. Allow me to propose a toast to our work together. May we have success. July 23rd, the laboratory is finally completed. Sinver and I are going up by car tomorrow. I am impatient to begin. July 24th, we arrived shortly after noon today. I'll take you on a tour of the building later, Emery. Now I want you to meet the others. Donna, will you and Dr. Henderson come into my office, please? Yes, Dr. Sindler. 
Besides the four of us, the only other persons in the building are the cook and janitor. I dislike having too many people engaged on one problem. You understand, of course. Certainly. Miss Atwell and Dr. Henderson have been my colleagues on several other occasions. Well, the building is perfect, Henry. Yes, Henry, they've certainly given us everything to work with this time. Emory Bolton, this is Dr. Paul Henderson. You already know Miss Atwell. How do you do? Glad to have you with us, Bolton. Emory, you are to work on the effects of the unknown chemical which is released into the body at moments of anger or peril along with adrenaline. I shall try to isolate the chemical. You are to discover what effect it has upon the nerves and brain. August 4th, Sindler has isolated the chemical. He calls it the strength quantity or S quantity. He fed some to a lab mouse. How much time has passed since the injection? Three hours, Dr. Sindler. Let's look at the pen. I hope we have more success this time. I think we will. Maybe I'm wrong, but the mouse does seem to be larger. It is larger, Donna. Then we found the formula. We can't be too sure if it's safe. The other subjects died. Dr. Sindler. Yes? How large will the animal grow? We have no idea of knowing that, my dear. Do you think there's any possibility of it growing too large? What do you mean? We're changing the size of that animal beyond all proportion to what nature has evolved. Do you think there's any possibility of the subject growing too large for us to handle? That mouse there might grow into some hideous monster that, that could destroy us all. <laughs> Back now to our story, an original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Crawling Thing. I'm here in this seemingly deserted laboratory. In my hands, I hold the diary of Emery Bolton. Though there's nothing in his words that should cause me to feel any alarm, still there's something, something I feel that causes me to look back over my shoulder into the shadows. I continue with the diary. August 5th. The, the animal is three, three times its normal size. It killed two other mice. Emily! Yes? How is your part of the research cutting? I've written it down for you. Here. Mm. Let me see. The effect of the S quantity increases the microvolts of electricity, and we go on. Dr. Sindler. Yes, what is it, Donna? Paul wants you in the isolation room immediately. Why? What's wrong? I don't know. He just told me to get you. Oh, come with us, Emery. I wonder what's happened. We'll know in a minute. What is it, Paul? Henry, the mouse died a few minutes ago. What? Yes. As you know, the S quantity has an immense effect on metabolism. I imagine the animal wasn't able to stand the strain. What are we going to do? We'll try it again. Failure may mean nothing. Perhaps the animal was sick. We're not sure that the strength quantity will kill. August 9th. Sindler told us to feed the S quantity to another mouse and also to one of the large, hairy banana spiders, a member of the deadly tarantula family, in the cage next to the mouse. I was with Henderson when the feeding began. Open the cage door. Right. I'll set the food in here like this. All right, close the door. Mm -hmm. Now the other one. Open the cage door. All right. There, that'll do it. Paul, do you think the spider will react to it? I don't know. I imagine so. Spider, I... What's the matter? <laughs> Ever since I was a small child, I've, I've hated them. I get nervous whenever I see one. This type, especially. You're a scientist, Paul. You should be completely objective in this experiment. I know I should, but... That spider, that hairy, crawling thing, I, I wish I could forget my fear and hatred of them, but I, I can't. They always seem so cold. A person feels that they have an unearthly, inhuman intelligence behind their beady little eyes. Of course, that's not possible. I think it's just the same. I wonder if the S quantity will also increase the size of the brain. And its ability to think. Still, August 9th, four hours later. The mouse has increased slightly in size, but the growth of the spider has been amazing. Its twice the size has been more than trebled. It's almost as large as a child's fist. August 10th, 3 in the morning. 
Henderson woke me, and we went into the isolation room where the mouse and spider were kept in a double cage. Be quiet. I don't want to wake the others. Look at the cages. Now, what do you... The mouse. What happened to the mouse? Let's go over to the cage. The spider... It's doubled in size again. I know. And the mouse is gone. Now, look at the partition between the two pens. There isn't any partition. That's right. It slipped or was moved down to the bottom of the cage. Then that means that the mouse and the spider had nothing to separate them. But what happened to the mouse? Don't you know, Emery? Unless... Unless what? Unless the spider... And that's just what happened. And another thing, Emery. I don't think the partition slipped down between the two cages. I think that the two holders for it were opened and then the partition slipped down. That means you're endowing the spider with intelligence. Yes, that's right. Remember what I said earlier? Would it happen if the S quantity also enlarged the ability of the brain to think? Well, it has happened. That spider will kill. It can think. That hairy, crawling thing can think. <laughs> August 10th, forenoon. I didn't get much of a chance to see Sindler before 11. When I did, I discovered Henderson had already told him what had happened in the isolation room. And you know about the spider. Yes, Emery, I do. Henderson told me earlier. What do you think about it? Think? What do you mean? Don't you think we ought to destroy it? Destroy it? Of course not. This may be what we're looking for, Emery. This may lead us to success. But, Dr. Sindler, it might be dangerous. Yes, it might be. But you remember that the development of the atomic bomb was dangerous, and so is the research going on in countless laboratories across the nation, across the world, Emery. That spider has intelligence, Dr. Sinder, a crafty, cunning intelligence. Yes, I know that. We have found a new formula to increase the intelligence and size of an animal. And, Emery, it will increase man's intelligence, too. Our contribution to the science of the world will be invaluable. There's nothing to worry about, absolutely nothing. <laughs> August 15th. The spider has grown so large that it cannot be kept in the cage anymore. The isolation room is its pen now. It has the run of the entire room. It's as large as a large dog. I must admit that every time I enter the isolation room, I'm nervous lest that thing should attack me. But it generally stays over in one corner of the room. Apparently, it has no desire to harm us. August 25th. Donna and I are taking a stroll outside the laboratory. Emery. Yes? Emery, I've... I've been with Dr. Sinder for several years. And all that time, he's never made a mistake. That is, up to now. What do you mean, Donna? I think he's created something that will only bring evil. That will only... Oh, I wish I had the words to express myself. I know exactly how you feel, Donna. I've talked to him about this before. I'm going to talk to him again when we get back. I wish you would, Emery. I wish you would. What are you doing in here, Emery? I want to talk to you, Dr. Sindler. Can't it wait till later? No. That noise, what... It's the sound of the spider as it moves closer to us. What did you want to say, Emery? I'll be quite frank about it, sir. I think we should destroy it. Why, that's nonsense, Emery. No, it's not. It's true we may learn something. It's true that we may even succeed in our research. But let's start over again. Let's experiment with something else, something that doesn't look like a monstrous throwback to a prehistoric age. It crawls and slides across the floor with its large, beady eyes always open, staring at you. Let's destroy it. What's the matter? coming towards us. Come with me, Emery. Quickly. The creature... It was crawling towards us. I wonder if it can understand us. I wonder if it knows what we're saying. Either that or it sensed that I was urging its destruction. Maybe I'm wrong, Emery. But I feel there's something malevolent about that spider. I get the feeling that it's waiting for the right moment. Waiting for the time when it will kill us. Back now to our story. An original tale of fantasy by Richard Thorne, entitled The Crawling Thing. I am beginning to feel some of the terror that Emery Bolton must have felt. 
I'm beginning to feel the presence of the crawling thing about which he writes through the words upon these pages. The diary continues. September 8th. September 8th. The cook and janitor left today. If we remain here, we'll be forced to do all the work they did. Henderson has been acting queerly. It's a strange, haunted look to his eyes. He barely eats at all. Either he's ill physically or mentally. What's the matter with you, Paul? What do you mean? You look ill. You're not yourself. Can you be yourself, Henry? That crawling monster in the isolation room? Well, can you? No, not exactly. Let me tell you something, Henry. My dreams, I see it. My dreams in the dead of night. I, I see those beady eyes looking for me, trying to pierce the darkness. And I feel drawn to it. As if it hypnotizes me. And I feel that I'm caught in its web. Just like a fly, Henry. Just like a fly. It's only your imagination. I'm not insane, if that's what you think. But I'm quickly being driven there. Did you ever look at those eyes for any length of time, Henry? Did you ever see the hatred and loathing and evil mirrored in them? I'm not imagining it. I see it. When the opportunity comes, I'm going to destroy it. Sindler or no Sindler, I swear to you, I'll kill it. October 10th. Henderson has been so quiet lately that I know he has some plan in his mind. Some plan that will culminate in the destruction of the spider. Sindler hasn't noticed any change in Henderson. He's engrossed in his work. October 16th. Henderson whispered to me this evening that tonight he will kill the spider. I sit in my room and write this with only the desk lamp lit. It is almost 11 o'clock now. And I have the feeling that the moment is drawing near. <laughs> I don't know. I think we may find the answer in the isolation room. Come with me. You don't mean that Henderson went in there alone. I'm afraid he did. But that's against all my orders. Why would he want to go in there? Let's kill it. What do you mean? He hated and feared the spider. We'll see what happened right now. Here's the key. We don't need it. The door's open. Turn on the light. (gasps) Good heavens. Back. Back to the other side of the room. To understand you, Dr. Sims. Probably from the tone of my voice. Now, to examine Henderson. He's dead. Dead? Yes. After all, in the spider's original size, the poison could kill a man. Here, give me a hand. Help me get him out of here. All right. Look out! The spider's coming towards you. Help me with Henderson. Hurry! All right. All right. Let's get out of here. Hurry, hurry! Lock the door, Donna. Yes, of course. Oh. I don't want that thing to get out of that room. Don't you think we should destroy it? No. Henderson was a fool. He went in there to kill the spider. I think the spider sensed it. That's why Henderson's dead. We are still going on with the experiment. October 17th, we buried Henderson in the graying light of dawn. Even Sindler was quiet. October 18th, I am in charge of feeding it. Donna and I were in the isolation room today when a curious thing happened. Emery, look. What's wrong? The spider. It's crawling over to the table where the S quantity is. I wonder if... If what? The spider's trying to get more of the S quantity. Stop growing now because we stopped the injection. If it were to get more of the serum, it would grow larger. Going to get that bottle and take it out of here. Be careful, Emily. Don't worry, I will. Look out! It, it won't let me get past. Maybe we better get out of here. Oh, it's crawling towards the table. We have to stop we it. We can't. It's lifting one of its legs. What is it trying to do? Get the bottle, Donna. The bottle of serum. Knock the bottle to the floor. It's going to drink that serum. Let's get out of here. You're right. What are we going to do, Henry? I don't know. I don't know. I heard some commotion down here. What's the matter? Spider just got through knocking the bottle of chemical serum to the floor. What that means is that it'll grow larger. I told you we should destroy that thing in there. Now it's too late. We don't know how large it'll get. Be quiet. I have to think. That's right. 
Use your mind now, Cinder, when it's too late. We had a chance to destroy it earlier, but no, you wouldn't have any of that. A man of science, that's what you are. But you're a fool, too, Cinder. A stupid, misguided fool. That thing in there can kill us all. What the hell? It's trying to break the door down. We'd better barricade that door. If we don't, it'll break it down in a matter of seconds. <laughs> October 24th. Six terrifying days have passed. That creature in the isolation room is out of all proportion. Though we've barricaded it. The door is weakening. It won't hold up much longer. I called Frank today. We can't leave that thing alone. If it were to get loose, we must destroy it. Cinder has a plan. We've placed explosives just outside the door. It'll give way any minute now. Only a matter of time now. When it breaks down the door and comes through that doorway, the explosive will automatically go off. I hope we're successful. Why don't we just leave? We can't do that. We have to see it destroyed. That's the only way we can be sure. What if... If the explosive does not kill it, I... I don't know what will. The door is starting to give. It's starting to come through. I were hypnotized. I, I can't move. It's so close to me. Look out! Look out! Ah! Even though the last entry in the diary was marked October 24th at 7 in the morning, in my mind I've reconstructed what must have happened after that last entry. There is evidence all around me of the death and destructive power of that hairy, crawling thing. It must have left the building after what happened. I'd better get back to the city and notify the... In front of me. Something so large. Gigantic eyes. Looming up that thing. I can't move. Tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. It's mystery time. Time now for the best in mystery. Tonight, Mystery Classic stars Mason Adams in The White Curtain. Good evening. This is your host for Mystery Time, Don Dowd. Tonight, Mystery Time reaches into the files of the world's finest stories to bring you a mystery classic. This is a highly suspenseful story of two strong-willed men and a beautiful woman, thrown together by the forces of nature on a rampage. Listen now as Mystery Classics presents the chilling drama, The White Curtain. From May to November... Mount Frosty, the highest peak of the Yellow Mountain Range, is alive with tourists. They drive up the winding auto road in station wagon taxis from the coach house at the base, or they make their way up the trails on foot. The weatherman on summer duty gets plenty of company. All he wants 
It's only when my stint begins in September that it gets lonely up there. And it stays that way for eight everlasting months. Nobody comes up anymore. Nobody at all. In loneliness like that, a man's dreams take on a peculiar substance and dimension. Often it's hard to tell where a dream leaves off and reality begins. There was that afternoon towards the end of November. I was sitting in my cabin just staring into the grate of the electric heater. I fell asleep and I began to dream about a beautiful woman. She was tall and slim... She had a feminine grace that made every motion of hers a figure in a dance. Her hair was black, black as night, with shining lights reflected from its waves. Her eyes were blue, no, purple, the hazy purple of the far horizon. And her skin, deep under the outdoor tan, was fair and smooth. Her voice was low, husky. And her mouth, her knowing, eager mouth was soft and yielding. Suddenly, a knock at the door brought me back to reality. Hey, open up in there. Open up. Uh, I ju- just a minute. Oh. Are you deaf what? or something? Uh, I've been knocking for five minutes. Wh- what do you want? You mind if we come in and warm up? It's cold out here. What are you doing here? Didn't you see the sign at the foot of the road? The mountain is closed to tourists for the winter. We came up one of the trails, stopped at the Devil's Cauldron, and then came on up to the top. If we could just rest a bit before we start down again. Oh, uh, this is my wife, Zoe. Your wife? Won't you come in? It was the girl I'd been dreaming about. Only her hair was different. It wasn't black at all, but a sort of honey brown. Oh, I'm a walking icicle. You must be exhausted. Sit down over there in front of the heater. That'll warm you up. Must be way below freezing up here on the peak. It's ten above zero right now and getting colder. Getting colder? Hear that, Zoe? We'd better get the chill out and then start right down again. Yes, I suppose so, Melvin. No. Although... No, you can't go. It's a four-hour trip going down this mountain. You won't make it before dark. Well, we'll take the auto road down. I have a flashlight in my haversack. No, I'm sorry. I can't allow you to go. (laughs) Come now, old man. You're not going to tell us what we can or can't do. But it's... It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. I suggest that you stay over. I've got plenty of room. You can start out in the morning, go down by daylight. Melvin, Melvin, listen, I'm tired. Why shouldn't we stay over? Well, that is if Mr... Parker, Fred Parker. But if Mr. Parker does have room for us... Oh, I have plenty of room. There are two bedrooms with a bunk in each of them. You two can have the bunks. I'll sleep out here on the couch. Please, Melvin, I, I think we should. Well, all right. Thanks a lot. Don't thank me. You're doing me the favor. Having company is something I can only dream about, ordinarily. I suppose it does get awfully lonesome up here, doesn't it? Yes, at times it does. Oh, by the way, I'm Zoe Colby, Mr. Parker, and this is my husband, Melvin Colby. Glad to know you. How do you do? You you just get your things off and I'll get supper started. You must be plenty hungry after that climb up the trail. Oh, maybe a little. Made it up in six hours, though. That isn't bad time. Oh, that's pretty good. Say, how come they didn't tell you at the coach house that the mountain was closed to visitors? We weren't staying at the coach house. We're on an auto trip cross country. Parked the car at the foot of the East Trail early this morning and came right on up. Isn't this an unusual time of year for a vacation? Oh, I'm not on a vacation exactly. Sold out my business four months ago and Zoe and I have been traveling ever since. Footloose and fancy free. No strings to hold us anyplace. No relatives to worry about. When we find some place we really like, we'll settle down. That's nice. Do you really spend the whole winter up here alone, Mr. Parker? That's right. Oh, I, I do get some visitors in May and June. Otherwise, it's eight months of solitary. Oh. But I get July and August off. I guess it gets pretty cold up here in December and January. Cold starts in November. The mercury can go down to 30 or 40 below overnight. <laughs> Just thinking about it makes me sure. Uh... How about a drink, Parker? Sorry, I don't have anything. Government regulations. I have a bottle in my haversack. You see, I'm prepared for all emergencies. Just let me open this. There, a pair of socks, sweater, knife, can of beans, can of meat, pistol. Here. Quart of the best. You'll have one, won't you? I don't mind if I do. Zoe? No, thanks. Here, here's a couple of glasses. Okay. Hey, if that's for me, that's enough. Really? <laughs> well, there you are. Thank you. No. Looks like pretty good stuff. It is the best. Well, here's how. Yeah. 
<sighs> well, we'll kill that in a hurry. How about another? Uh, no, thanks. Well, uh, I'll have a little more. That just hit the spot. Oh, Melvin, please. Lay off, Zoe. I can handle it. Uh, excuse me, folks, for a few minutes. I've got to go out and read the instruments. Well, uh, make sure you order some decent weather for tomorrow. I went out to the weather shed, made my entries in the log, and came back. I'd only been gone a few minutes, but Melvin was bent over the table with his head on his arms. I thought he was drunk. Zoe was at the window, staring moodily out at the gathering dusk. I went to the phone. Hello, McGuire. Uh, five o'clock reading. Temperature, dry bulb zero, wet bulb minus two. Relative humidity, 92%. Yeah. Partly cloudy, four-tenths alto stratus. The wind, northwest 39 miles per hour. Barometric pressure at the station, uh, yeah, 600 millibars. Yeah, it looks that way. Right, that's all for tonight. So long, McGuire. Well, that's done. How about some food? I'm afraid I owe you an apology. My husband's fallen asleep. The warmth and the liquor were too much for him. You don't owe me any apologies, Zoe. We'll let him sleep. Maybe it's a good thing all around. Zoe helped me get Melvin into a bunk. Then we had our supper. There wasn't much said during the meal, but afterwards it was snug and cozy sitting in the easy chairs. And when I noticed the first of the snowflakes flying against the double windows, I had to hide a smile. Now there wouldn't be any talk of going down in the morning. With luck, I could count on Zoe's being with me for a long time. Zoe and Melvin, too, of course. The next morning, I just finished phoning in my 8 o'clock report when Melvin came out of his room. Hi. Sure is snowing. Yeah, it's been snowing all night. When will it stop? Oh, three days, four days, week maybe, I don't know. That's great. There's going to be no cinch going down in the snow. You'd better not try it at all. But I'm not going to wait a week, that's for sure. You're going to wait until it's clear. Now look here, Parker, what are you trying to pull? No, no one ever goes down in a blizzard like this. Oh, no? Zoe, are you up? Yes, Melvin, I'm up. Good morning, Good morning. everybody. I got some news, Zoe. Fred's trying to tell me we're stuck here, maybe for good. Well, I've been watching the snow from my window. It's awfully thick. Well, have some coffee and get into your coat. We're leaving in ten minutes. Yes, but if Fred says we can't do it, well, perhaps he knows what he's talking about. I don't believe him. He wants us to stay. Misery, perhaps, wants company. Look, the thermometer is down to 20 below zero out there, and the wind is over 60 miles an hour. You won't get half a mile. It's all down here. There have been 18 inches of snow. That means drifts higher than your head in places. It's suicide trying to go down now. Well, if we waited for the snow to stop, could we make it? No. You're here indefinitely. You're wrong. We're leaving. You're staying here. Please, Melvin. Maybe he's right. If you try to leave... I'll have to slug you, Colby. No kidding. Well, maybe this revolver I brought along would make you change your mind. Zoe, I beg of you not to go with him. You'll never make it. So it's Zoe, is it? Now I see why you're so anxious to keep us. Come on, Zoe, finish your coffee. Get your things and we're off. In a few minutes, they left. I watched them from the window. I could see the wind tearing at their clothes, the snow driving into their faces. Then they turned a bend in the trail and disappeared. They'd be dead in an hour unless... I got into my hobnail boots and furs and started after them. I bent over their footprints, which the snow and the wind had already begun to fill in, and I struggled into the gale. A hundred yards and I was chilled to the bone. Another hundred yards and the trail divided. One set of footprints going one way, the second another. I followed the shallower set of prints. After a few steps, they seemed to wander blindly. Fifteen minutes later, I stumbled over Zoe's snow-covered body. I swept the snow aside and bent close to her pale white face. She was still breathing. 
I lifted her to my shoulder, and I clawed and fought my way back up the mountain. Oh, you found her. Yes, I found her. You found your way back here, too. Here, let Don't me Don't you touch her. I'll take care of her. Is she all right? She will be. I'll get her under some blankets. Oh, it was terrible out there. Terrible. I never realized. I put Zoe into a bunk, covered her with blankets and let her sleep. When I came into the main room, Colby was nursing a drink. Well, I suppose I ought to tell you how grateful, grateful. I am. Grateful? You're not grateful. You hate me for what I did. What? What are you talking about? Why should I hate you for saving my wife's life? I know how a man's mind works. I do lots of reading up here. You left her out there to die. By bringing her back, I showed you up for the coward you are. That's why you hate me. That is sheer, stupid, utter nonsense. I didn't want her to die. But still, you wish I hadn't saved her. And you know why? Because you realize she isn't yours anymore. You abandoned her and I brought her back. I've got a greater right to her than you have now. What kind of crazy logic is that? It's like, it's like the law of salvage. She belongs to the one who saved her. You're out of your head. You're talking like a madman. We'll see. We'll see. That night at supper, Zoe, pale and weak, sat across from Melvin. She'd slept all day and she still didn't know how she'd gotten back to the cabin. But I was ready to explain all that. Zoe, Zoe, you haven't asked me how you got back to the cabin this morning. Well, didn't Melvin bring me back? No. He left you out there in the snow to freeze to death. Melvin came back alone. Oh, I see. Don't listen to him, Zoe. You know how we got separated. The snow was coming down heavily. I couldn't see you. I couldn't find you. I shouted and you didn't hear me. You didn't look very hard or very far, did you, Melvin? You left her there in the mountain and came running back to the cabin. I came back to get you to help me. And when you didn't find me, you just sat down and waited. You're afraid to go out again. Your own sweet life was too precious. That's a lie, Zoe. Don't listen to him. It's all right, Melvin. All right. I understand. You listen to me, both of you. You've got to know this sooner or later anyway. I love you, Zoe. You what? Whatever rights Melvin had as your husband, he lost when he left you out there to die. You don't owe him a thing. Melvin is full of hate, Zoe. He hates me because I showed him up for a coward. He hates you because you know that he deserted you. And he even hates himself because he's lost his self-respect. And I say this right in his presence. That hate is going to explode sometime and he's going to try to kill me. Maybe you too. Please. Please, you mustn't say such things. You mustn't talk like that. It's the truth. That's why I've taken his gun away. You've gone into my yes, knapsack. Yes, I have it, Melvin. But even so, I'll have to watch him, watch every move he makes. No, no, you're wrong, Freddy. People like us don't kill. I won't give him a chance to try it. Now it's time to go out to the instrument shed again, but I'll be within call if you need me. I could see her staring at Melvin in horror as the realization of what I'd said slowly sank in. I rushed through my reading as fast as I could, and when I got back, I found them sitting on opposite sides of the room. I was certain then that she was finished with him, and she turned to me. I think you'd better go to bed now, Melvin. I want to make sure you're locked in your room before I turn in. Just a precautionary measure. Now, look Melvin. here. Melvin, do as he says. All right. If you say so. I want to thank you for saving my life. That was very brave of you. You don't have to thank me, Zoe. But about Melvin, I think you're wrong. He's ashamed, perhaps, of leaving Zoe, you. Zoe, but... he hates you, believe me. That's what gave me the courage to tell you... to tell you I love you. You may think it a little strange. Oh, no, no, Freddy, I, I don't think it's strange at all. These things happen, at least in books. I've always loved you. I dreamed about you for months, for years. 
And when you came through that door yesterday, I knew that everything I'd ever dreamed of was about to come true. I'm glad Melvin hates you because it leaves you free. Freddie, if he does and and if he's dangerous, well, you have a phone. But couldn't you phone down to the valley for help? They couldn't get up any further than the devil's cauldron. We'll just have to watch him. If worse comes to worst, I've got his gun. No, Fred. That would be murder and they'd hang you for it. Self-defense. But nobody would ever have to know. I could just drop his body into the cauldron and it would never be found. Yes, but you'd have it on your conscience. Yes, I might. But I'd do anything to set you free, Zoe. Anything. Zoe, would... Would you... Kiss me goodnight? Yes, Freddy. I I will. For the next two days, Melvin was very quiet and morose. He stayed in his room. I could see that he was planning something. Occasionally, Zoe would go in and talk to him, and I could hear the murmur of her low, urgent voice. She tried to reason with him, bring him to his senses. But his hate just couldn't be bridled. On the fourth morning, it stopped snowing. The thin, weak sunlight glanced off the smooth whiteness of the mountain, and through the window... It gave a false sense of security and warmth. I thought Zoe had managed to talk some sense into him or he'd never have caught me the way he did. I was in the storeroom getting some things for lunch when he jumped for the door and slammed it shut. Let me out of here, Melvin. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. By the time I broke the door panels, they had gone. My furs were missing, too, both suits of them. I threw on some sweaters and a leather jacket, switched the revolver to an outside pocket, and went after them. They were about 300 yards below, stumbling through the drift, slipping on the icy rock. It took an hour before I caught up with them. Melvin! Melvin, wait! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! No! No, don't shoot! Don't shoot! That was a nice trick you pulled, Melvin, but you're lucky I managed to catch up with you. Now turn around and start back. Please, Freddy, please try to understand. I'm not going back, Parker. Then go on alone if you think you can make it. I'm taking Zoe back with me. Why, you fool. Fred, Freddy's right, Melvin. You go on alone. I'll go back with him. Come on, Zoe. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, oh. 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 Melvin. Melvin. I had to do it, Zoe. For your sake. What? What are you going to do now? Get rid of his body first. In the cauldron. You, you'd you better come with me or you'll get lost up here. Yes. Yes. Anything you say. I shoved the gun into my pocket. Quickly, I stripped the furs off Melvin's body and put them on Then I tied his shoelaces to his hands and lifted his body over my left shoulder like a blanket roll, his feet under my right arm. And that way I could carry him and still have my hands free. Holding onto Zoe with my left hand, I started for the cauldron's rim. With the dead weight of Colby's corpse dragging at my neck, I felt the strength draining out of me. Inch by inch, foot by foot, we struggled down the mountain toward the cauldron's tip. After an hour, we took a ten-minute rest. The sweat in our clothes had frozen and the cloth crackled as we continued on. The grade was steeper now. Again and again, we slipped, fell, dragged ourselves to our feet, only to fall again. Zoe was crying now. Oh, don't cry, Zoe. It can't be much farther. I can't go on. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I dragged her on. And then, just a few feet away, a vast gray smudge separated the whiteness of the earth from the pale blue of the sky. It was the cauldron. In a few minutes, we were down to the rim. Everything was going to be all right. Even the wind was on our side. It had blown the snow clear of the stone fence at the rim. Zoe, we're in luck. Now help me get him off my neck. No, no. What's wrong, Zoe? She dropped to her knees, her face frozen into a mask of misery. I pushed upward against Kobe's underarm so that I could lift the body over my head. It didn't budge. 
I yanked and pulled with all my might, but it didn't give a single inch. I threw myself on the ground and clawed frantically at that rigid, frozen mass. It was no use. The body held me in a vice. Zoe, help me. I can't do this myself. I can't. Help me, Zoe. If I don't get out of this, we'll die here, both of us. I can't move. And I couldn't help you even if I wanted to. If you wanted to? Zoe! You're a Zoe! Fool. You're a fool, Freddy. Melvin never hated me. He loved me, and I always loved him. We were both terrified of you, Freddy, from the very first moment. You don't see things the way other people do. You, you imagine things. We tried to humor you until we could escape. That should have been the end. And it would have been if they hadn't gotten worried down at the base station when they didn't receive my afternoon report. They sent up a rescue party and found us unconscious at the cauldron's rim. I'm still in a hospital. And when I'm well enough, they say I may have to stand trial. But I don't care what happens. I can still have my dreams. My beautiful dreams. And if they never come true, well, perhaps it's better that they never do. This is Don Dowd again, your host for Mystery Time. Tonight's mystery classic, The White Curtain, was written by George and Gertrude Fass, starred Mason Adams, and was produced by Clark Andrews in association with Ronald Dawson and Robert Arthur. Featured in tonight's drama were George Petrie and Ann Loring. I'm Hyman Brown. Welcome to the Inner Sanctum. Let's say it's a bright sunny day with the sky high and blue and you are half dozing beneath a tree out in the country or on your patio. A dense dark shadow passes over you and for the briefest moment you shudder to the marrow, to the marrow of your bones with such intense cold that for that moment Life stops dead. You open your eyes and look up, but there is nothing in the clear sky. Then you will know that over you has passed the ghost plane. The plane always come down this fast. It depends on the pilot. This one seems to be quite a cowboy. It's hard to hear. My ears are kind of stopped up. You can pinch your nose like this, huh? Blow gently. What happened? Is it better? Oh, yes, Mr. Moore. Now listen to me. I don't know what you plan to do, but when we land, whatever it is, I'm getting off this plane. If you take my advice, I advise you to do the same thing. Our mystery drama, The Ghost Plane, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Casey Kasem and Richard Crenna. I'll be back shortly with Act One. For all intents and purposes, the plane on which we are traveling is no different from any normal jet, a 707 or perhaps a DC-9, with two exceptions. There is no first class, and it carries only two lone passengers, both of them apparently asleep. There are other, many other differences on this plane, but I leave you to discover that for yourself. Wake up, Jenny. Wake up, Jenny. 
wake up, Jenny. Where... Where am I? A plane? I wasn't going on a plane, was I? Who was I? If I am... Where to? What for? I can't be awake. It doesn't feel... And yet I'm... I'm not asleep, I know that. I can hear the engines. Feel the vibration. Oh, there, there's a stewardess. Except she looks so old. I never saw an old stewardess on a plane before. But at least I can ask her. Oh, why did she have to stop by him? I hope they don't talk too long. Herb Moss, wake up. Herb Moss, wake up. Herb Moss, wake up. I must have fallen asleep. It's funny, I don't feel tired. I can't remember. Chicago? St. Louis? No, I didn't have a kind of town trip this week. No, did I? It wasn't up at the lake. Yeah, well, then, how... Oh, stewardess! Yes, sir. Can I help you? Uh, the seatbelt light is out, so I guess it's safe to smoke. In the rear of the plane, it is permitted to smoke. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, how about rustling me up a double martini real dry to go with Al? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Moss. There are no drinks served on this plane. Not even a little wine with dinner? No meals I served either. No. That's the way it is with charter flights, huh? You could call this a charter flight. Yes, sir. It's not a through flight, I guess. There'll be some set-downs. That's correct, sir. Well, I hope for your sake business wasn't all that bad, just two of us. How many are you expecting at the next stop? I don't know that yet. Excuse me, I think I'm wanted up front, Mr. Moss. May I be of assistance, Miss Wallace? Oh, I, I know you're going to think this is real dumb of me, but I, I fell asleep, and waking up, I'm so spaced out, I, I can't remember. I, I mean... Where are we going? I'm sorry, dear. I'm not allowed to tell you that. You mean I, I'm some sort of prisoner? Oh, no. No, not at all. You can go anywhere in the plane you like, except the cockpit, of course. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think perhaps the captain wants to talk to me. Oh, no, wait. Wait, please. Oh, just a minute. Uh, uh, there, there's so many things I want to ask you. I it really wouldn't do any good. I wouldn't be able to answer. Oh, just one thing. Is is this some sort of a, a hospital plane or something? I've told you all I can tell you. Oh, Lord, what is it? Some awful dream. I'm scared. Oh, Mom. Mom. Someone, please. I'm so scared. Oh, excuse me, miss. Oh. oh. Hi. Hello. I, uh... <laughs> well, there are only two of us on the whole plane, so, uh... I want to tell you the truth. I could use some company. Uh, so could I. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I'll, I'll slide over so you can sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is, uh... Just, uh... Just a minute, I... I should have my... Uh, yeah, it's my business card. Herbert Moss. I'm in, uh... I'm with Troy, Train, and Kenward. That's... That's an advertising firm. Well, as long as we're talking together, I think I should ask your name. Me? Oh, it's... Jenny. Uh, Jenny, she called me. Oh, wait a minute. Let me look in my bag. There there ought to be... Oh, yeah, here. My ident card. Jenny Wallace. That's me. Lousy picture, huh? <laughs> no, not at all. Nobody your age takes a bad picture. You, uh... You also didn't seem to be sure of your name, Jenny. Jenny, right? But don't look so scared, dear. You have company. 
Why do you think I went groping for my business card? I wasn't sure of mine either. No kidding. You weren't honest? Honest. I'll tell you more than that. I don't know how I got on this plane. Do you? No. I've looked through all my pockets and I can't find any carbon copy of my ticket, luggage checks, anything like that. I, I feel so scared. You don't think it's like, like, well, like one of those skyjack things and where, where the hostage is like, I mean, well, I could figure you, but why me? Skyjack. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. It's possible, except... Except what? Well, why don't we know who we are? Remember where we're going. Let's try some questions. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Sure. Uh, uh, two sisters and a brother. How old are they? Uh, younger than me. Mary's 14, Margaret's 11, and uh, Tommy's only 7. Yeah. And your mother and father? Pop. Pop died a while back. Mom's alive. Mm. Do you live with the family? No, I... Uh, I was going to say I, I didn't anymore, but... Well, it, it's going sort of blank again. All right, now let's, let's not push it. Or you. All right, let's think about me. Well, uh, we know you work at an advertising agency. What do you do there? I'm an account executive, vice president in charge of Magnum Brands. What? Well, I bet you live outside the city and travel in commuter trains with bar cars and all like that. And I, I bet, I bet you're married, right? With kids near my age? Yes, yes. Brian's at college already and Adrienne is... is yes, yes, of course I'm married and I live in Greenridge. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, there's, there's a picture of kids a couple of years ago and it's my wife, Nina. And here's some other pictures of the kids <laughs> And that's the house. And this one, too. Oh, beautiful. Oh, whoops, how you dropped one. Um, who's this? Hmm? Well, that's my secretary, Barbara. Oh, good Lord. What is it, Mr. Moss? Well, it's nothing. <laughs> no, it's nothing. I, uh, I forgot to leave her some, some instructions about a meeting. I... day is this? I don't know. I don't even know the day. I have a feeling it's terribly important for us to know just what this day means. To both of us. Oh. Hey, what is it? Oh, just the way you said it. You gave me goosebumps all over. <laughs> I know the feeling. I don't like anything about this. Look, on a plane like this, there should be more than one hostess. I'm going up front to get some information about where this plane is going. Why don't you go aft and see if there isn't another hostess in the galley? You mean like in the back? Yes, I'm going to check the pilot. Okay, Mr. Moss. Pilot? Pilot or somebody, I want to talk to you. I demand that you open this door. This is your captain. Will all passengers please notice that the no smoking lights are on and that seat belts be fastened. Please resume your seats immediately. We are preparing to land. Passengers will resume their seats immediately and buckle their seat belts. Please put out all cigarettes. We are preparing to land. Oh, we're falling, Mr. Bond. The plane is falling. No, it's all right, Jenny. We're just diving a bit deeply. That's oh, all. I feel kind of sick to my stomach. Now, slide in my and sit ears. down. Sit down. Oh. That's the girl. Oh. Now, keep your mouth open and swallow. And fasten your seatbelt. Hold it tight. Oh. Now, listen to me. I don't know what you plan to do, but when we land, whatever it is, I'm getting off this plane. I'd advise you to do the same. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've only got a couple of dollars. Don't worry about that. I've got money and credit cards. Oh. You want to get off with me? Oh, yes. And the moment I tell you to, snap open your seatbelt and head with me for the exit. This is your captain. We are about to land. Remain in your seats, as this will be a short stop. Do not unfasten your seatbelts on that. We shall be taking off immediately. Oh, pig's eyes, sir. What's that? Oh, we're down. That's funny. 
I never heard him drop that landing gear. Are we all right? Hmm. Now, as soon as we come to a halt, snap open your seatbelt and follow me. Yes, Mr. Moss. Okay, now. Oh, oh I, I can't. The buckle won't open. As soon as I get mine. Oh, damn. Oh, I knew something was up. I sure would like to know what the devil is going on. What is it, Mr. Moss? These damn belts are gimmicked somehow. We're trapped in our seats. Whoever they are, they're not going to let us get off. Who are they? I don't know, Jenny. I'm afraid even to think. It is a good question. Who are they? Where is this strange plane headed for with only its cargo of two passengers? Why is the hostess an elderly woman? And what is the rest of the crew like? And why have they stopped at wherever they have stopped? And who else or what else is coming aboard? I'll return shortly with Act Two. The strange plane rests on the ground. Its engines idle easily and nothing happens. In their seats, Ginny Wallace and Herb Moss have given up struggling with their seat belts, which refuse to unclasp, pinning them helplessly in their seats. The cockpit door remains closed. The sense of unimaginable impending action is so palpable that both have dropped their voices almost to a whisper. Can you see where we are out the window? Nothing. Now rub the window off. I can't reach. Well, I did, but it's just that white mist, sort of like a cloud. I mean, outside. No lights? No movement you can see? No. What's going to happen to us? I don't know. Oh, it's that. Bring them on board. Who is it? I can't see over the back of the seat. I don't know about the passengers, but it's the stewardess who was up front. How did she get to the rear of the plane? I don't know. That's it. Mr. Schaefer in K-1. Strap him in and... Stewardess? In a moment, Mr. Moss. Miss Newman in S-1. And Mr. Downing in S-2. Make them secure. Stewardess, I demand to be released and let off at this stop. Thank you, boys. As soon as you're out, we'll button up and take off. Stewardess! Do you hear me? I... Didn't you hear? Why won't you listen? We are in the takeoff run. Please do not smoke. And make sure that all safety belts are fastened. Not release until a light goes on. Do not release. It's the last. Who has a chance? You stop it, Mr. Moss. Some way. Yes, I can't, Jim. I think you must be beginning to realize that as well as I do. Wake up, Danny Schaefer. Wake up, Danny Schaefer. Wake up, Danny Schaefer. Wake up. Where am I? What is this? A plane? Are you quite comfortable, Mr. Schaefer? Who the devil are you? The stewardess. You've got to be kidding. An old dame like you? Hey, what kind of an airline is this, anyhow? At the proper time, you know. Excuse me, I have other passengers to attend to. Wake up, Carol Newman. Carol Newman. Carol Newman. Carol Newman. I don't want to wake up. I don't ever want to wake up. I took care about that. What am I doing on a plane? This guy next to me. I don't fly tourist. Wait a minute. Let me think. Wake up, Bruce Downing. Wake up, Bruce Downing. No. Oh, no, I couldn't. Not now. Not now. I, I made the big chance. I can't blow it. I can't. Only I have. I know it. Damn motor is still running. It, it's still. What? I'm not under the car. I'm on a plane. It, it's all right. It must be all right. Quite all right, Mr. Downing. Uh huh. I say for the moment, it's quite all right. Where are we headed? On the passage you booked. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to make quite a few preparations. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Uh, or... Damn. What's the matter with this buckle? He's messing around with it. I tried. Some new safety gimmick, I suppose. Won't release till the seatbelt light goes off. Oh, well. What's the difference? You mind if I smoke? No. If you have a stick, I'll join you. Oh, no grass, ma'am. I mean, I'm strictly keep off the grass these days. Just straight old filter tip. Did I ask for anything more? You didn't have to. We're two of a kind, right? What does that mean? We've been down a lot of the same roads. Yeah. I've been down the same roads, I guess. Just a few more of them than you, Sonny. You weather pretty well. And a couple of years doesn't give you any right to that sunny. You can call me Bruce. Uh, Bruce, uh... Bruce will do. I'm Carol. I've got a case of the who the hell am I, how did I get here blues, too. I was hoping you could clue me in. About what, for example? This flight... Where we're going, how I got here. I think I'd be much help. You notice what I'm wearing? Yeah. It's uh, nice. Sort of. Uh... Yeah, I see what you mean. No use asking you if you've got a ticket. Scarcely. In a negligee, you can pretty well tell everything I've got. I'll get a blanket from the hostess. Do you have a ticket? Not that I can find. And you have no idea how or why you're here? No. Well, kind of hazy. But no. Oh, damn. If we could only get out of these seat belts. What for? You see that couple sitting down front? The older man and the chick in the jeans? Yeah. I, I, I've got a crazy notion they were already on the plane before it landed. Or anyway, before it picked us up. Maybe they have some answer. What about the mean-looking kid with the frizzy up ahead? One with the knife he's trying to cut the belt with. I don't think I want to tangle with that character. He's riding the edge of something. This is your captain. We have now reached our cruising altitude. And for a brief period till our next stop, we suggest you loosen your seat belts if you so desire, and stretch out a little. Smoking is permitted in the rear half of the plane. Mr. Moss? Yes, Jenny? What did you mean about me beginning to realize what's happening as well as you do? Aren't you beginning to remember things? I... I'm not sure. It, it's like a bad dream, things that couldn't really happen. It happened to me only. And the worst of all is... I don't know how to say it. How to explain it. You don't have to, Jenny. I know. I feel the same way. Sooner or later, we're going to have to face it. No. Jenny, my poor, dear little Excuse girl. Excuse me for breaking up the love scene, but I'm looking for a couple of answers, man. There's no smoking in this section of the plane. <laughs> you got to be putting me on, man. There's five of us here. That's all there are. Who cares? Them other two will lit up. In the proper section. And the lady beside me doesn't smoke. Oh, you mean love child here? Don't let her give you no run around, Dad. She not only smokes, turns on. She's a user, I can tell. Put that cigarette out, punk, or I'll run you aft and stick your head down one of the bowls. Tough guy, huh? Still feel so tough? <gasps> a knife? Oh, Mr. Moss! Take it easy, Jenny. I don't think he wants to try to use it. It's just supposed to scare me and try to prove what a big man he is. Hey, now, don't ever kid yourself. I got nothing to lose. Now, let's answer me a couple of questions. Such as? Where's this plane headed for? I don't know. Now, don't give me that. You were here before we got... A... Before... Or however we got here, you must know something. Don't you know why you're here? Hey, man, would I be asking you if I did? 
Hold it. What do you two want? The same thing you do, apparently. Information. Our seatbelts. Mr. Moss, we can loosen them Yes, now. Jenny. I already have. Come on, come on. Let's start cluing us in. What is this, a prison ship or something? And why would you think that? Will you lay out... Hey. Hey, what's the idea to get up your wearing? I don't know. It's what I had on when I woke up here on the plane. You mean you two were shacking up and he brought you aboard in your fancy nightshirt? No, there? she doesn't mean that. The first time I met this lady was on this plane. I, I, I don't even know how I got here myself. And why don't you put that knife away? And why don't you cool it? I ain't letting this out of my hand till I get a slant on what this whole gig is, see? My name is Herbert Moss. This is Jenny Wallace. Who cares about names? We should get acquainted since we're all in the same fix. Well, all right. I'm Danny. Uh, Danny... Uh... I don't know. Somebody must have slipped me a Mickey or something before I got caught it on here. I, I can't think. Uh, Jenny and I had trouble remembering who we were. How about you two? Uh, a, a kind of a voice whispered my name to me. Yeah, me too. That's how I knew my name. Yeah, yeah right on, right on. Same with me. Like I was, like, like, like I was coming to. Uh, uh, wake up, Danny. Uh. Yeah, yeah, the old bag in the uniform. She said, Schaefer. That's it. Danny Schaefer. Uh, Downing. Uh, Bruce Downing. That's me. And the voice said, Carol Newman. Newman! Oh, well, great. Now now we're all buddies, okay? But look, I'm asking you, Dad, what's going on? What do you know? I told you nothing. Don't give me that. I heard you say something to the love chick here when I came up. Something about face it. Face what? Doesn't anybody know... Or guess? It, it's all just bits, pieces, things that won't go together. I, well, I can't remember it straight. Yeah, I, it's like that for me, too. Mr. Downing? Uh, yeah, uh, that's about the size of it. One thing I do... Uh, it doesn't tie in right away. How about you, Dad? Well, I'm beginning to remember a lot more than I want to. All right, now, what does that mean? Now, answer me a question first. Do you remember anything? Yeah. I remember plenty. I've held up stores, run numbers, lifted, hoisted cars, you name it, ever since I was 14 years old. But only to put something in my stomach. The last thing I do remember is I finally went for the big one. Murder one. I was robbing a store and a cop tried to jump me, and before I could think, I I had the shiv in him, and I knew he'd bought it. So that's to clear the air. I don't really care about none of the rest of you. All I want to know is what am I doing in this bleeping plane, and where are we headed, and how do we get off of here? And this time, I expect an answer, Dad, because I think you know. I don't know exactly. I'm only guessing. For two reasons. Spill them. First, you all heard Danny. He's done plenty to be ashamed of, even if he wouldn't admit it. I think the first part of that statement is what all of us have in common. We're all deeply ashamed of something or things we've done. That's number one. What would I be ashamed of? Or me? I didn't do anything wrong. Shut up! What's the other thing we got in common? Take a look at your windbreaker, Danny. Yeah, what about it? There's a hole in the front. So what? Unzip it. Look at your shirt underneath. Or pull up your shirt and look at your chest. Hey, come on. What are you trying to pull? I'm trying to answer your questions for you. And for all of us. Okay. Hey. More blood. What happened? I'm guessing that police officer you knifed had a partner and that he shot you right through the heart. I got a hole in my chest. Big slug, at least, at least a 38. If I hit my dad, I, I must be... Oh, no. No, no, I can't be. I'm afraid you are, Danny. I'm afraid all of us are. 
You mean we're... We're This is your captain. Will you please be sure that you are seated and have fastened your seatbelts? Please extinguish all cigarettes. We are coming in for a landing now. Thank you. Better fasten up, everyone. What for? Not me. I'm getting off this plane when it lands, understand? They won't allow you to. You might as well follow orders. If he increases the pitch anymore, you'll be rolling all over the floor. You could break your neck. What difference does it make if I'm dead? I don't know that for sure. I'm only guessing because... Because I think I remember that... I am dead. Has Herb guessed the truth? And if he has, what are the passengers who ride this strange plane? What are they headed for at the next landing? That is, supposing the pilot can pull the plane out of this screaming dive that has sent Dan scrambling for a seat and for the welcome restraint of his seatbelt. I'll be back in a moment with Act Three. Let's go behind the scenes for this episode of Radio Mystery Theater. Richard Crenna stars as Herb Moss. Although best known to fans for his movie and television roles, Crenna began his career in radio serials as a squeaky voice juvenile. His early television exposure came through such series as The Real McCoys and Slattery's People. He began his big screen career in the 1960s and has been seen in many different roles. He's probably most familiar as the Colonel in all three of Sylvester Stallone's Rambo movies. He was Kathleen Turner's murder victim in Body Heat and appeared opposite the late John Candy in 1985's Summer Rental. And that was a behind-the-scenes look at this episode of Radio Mystery Theater. Again, the great plane sits earthbound and not in the act of flying. Again, swirling mists mask whatever may lie outside, outside the cabin where five people sit in prison. And again, the motherly appearing stewardess superintends the boarding of new passengers, this time only one who is seated in the rear. And now, with his arrival, there is a new surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Hey, look, I want to talk to you. Stupid. I want to get off. Please, please. 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 want to get off. Be quiet and listen to me, please. I have something to explain. This will be the last stop before your destination. The passenger who has just come on board is the Reverend Dr. Pell. He will join you as soon as you are airborne. I will not be with you for the rest of the flight. May I wish you all goodbye and good luck. Wake up, Morgan Bell. Wake up, Morgan Bell. Wake up, Morgan Bell. Oh, my beloved father. I do remember that article of the Acts of Religion which does concern the wicked. And such be void of a lively faith. Must I then be denied the partaking of the body of Christ in the use of the Lord's Supper? <gasps> what happened? Nothing. We just stopped climbing and leveled off. Then that means the seatbelt light should be going on any minute. And then, and then the horn will tell us that we can get off and get out of here, right? I suppose so. For all that means. Hey, look, we ain't dead. I ain't buying any of that bull, understand? Now, I gotta get to a dock and fix me up. Won't do any good. Too late. How do you know? I mean, what makes you so sure? Because I have a hole in my chest to match yours. Look. Your shirt is covered with blood. <laughs> oh. I had everything. A loving wife. Fine children. Successful career. I'm 48 years old, and my secretary was 22. I took advantage of her, made her my mistress, promised her a marriage I knew I had no intention of going through with. And I was just leaving her apartment when the young man 
she should have married. Emotionally insane. Shot me. The last thing I remember was the bullet tearing into my chest. And then the blackness. That's why I know I am dead and why I am on this plane. Why all of us are. Why? Why me? He said it before. We all have something to be ashamed of. What was your scene, man? Mention anything an actor can do to claw his way to the top, and I've tried it. I... I won't embarrass little Jenny by naming him. I wouldn't want to hurt a lady's feelings. I once thought I had talent as a designer. But I had another talent that men were more interested in. It was worth quite a lot of money, I found. It was after I'd been married and my husband walked out on me when, when I had a kid. I'm not excusing myself. But I did have to bring up my baby until she died. And by that time, as you can see, I wasn't all that young anymore. So, so much in demand. And what was there left to live for? I had uppers, downers, everything. So instead of my usual two before going to bed alone, I emptied the bottle. <laughs> Excuse the hearts and flowers. But it seems to be let's take our hair down time. But I thought you'd broken out of the trap. I had. At the expense of my best friend. Yeah, who? An actor friend who was playing the part in Uranus. Who got me the job as understudy. His first break, too. I slipped him a Mickey before the opening night performance. That's how I went on and got all the reviews. <laughs> I thought I was a big star already, had it made. Bought myself a sports job and became a party boy. Invited now instead of hired. I turned that car upside down, trying to make a right-angle curve at 90. Damn right I'm dead, and I know it. And maybe I'm glad. I... I killed my baby. I deserve to die. Hush, Jenny. Jenny, hush. I love been that bad. I loved him so... I wanted to be married, but Mom wouldn't give her consent. She thought he was too old for me. I thought if, if I was having his baby, Mom would have to agree about marriage. I waited till after three months, and I told her. Only he walked out on me, and it, it was too late. Too late for the hospitals to take care of me. So I, I didn't want his baby anymore. And I went to not even a doctor. Oh, it was murder. I deserve to die. We all do. And Mr. Moss is right. That's why we're here. And that's where we're all going. Straight to hell. Oh, no. No, sir, not me. Now, what do you think you're going to do? I've been looking. The door to the cockpit is open. The shiv's enough. I'm going in there and skyjack this plane. I'm going to make that pilot turn back. The belts are open. Come on, Bruce. we better get him. What, do you think there's a chance? I don't want that crazy kid to... What is it, Danny? Danny, what's the matter? There's no one in there. No one. There's no one flying the plane. Good Lord. I'm afraid not, Miss Newman. Not yours or any of ours. What do you mean, Father? I'm not a father. But you're still a minister. You could help us. I wish I could, my dear. I wish that with all my heart, but... You see, I am one of you. 
I've been listening to all of you, and I know now that's why I'm here. I no longer have any right to the name of minister. What brought you here to join us, sir? The greatest sin of all. I renounced my God. I spent the last four years in Vietnam. I saw such suffering and misery without reason that... Ah. But I was too busy then to think of the scars it left on the mind was only returning to the United States, wanting to pray for those poor people I'd known and for the agony of our country and all the world that... that suddenly I found there were no more words. There was no more belief. Everything had been wrung from me. And my faith was gone. How did you die? By God's hand. I was passing a crowd lost in my own thoughts and the struggle in my mind and a policeman came to me and said there was a boy on a ledge threatening to kill himself unless they found him a minister I went up to that high place and out on that ledge and I asked him to come in and he said to me father why should I come back to a world where there is no God Tell me, convince me that there is one and I will come in. Where were the words of comfort that can only be spoken from the soul? I, who had picked this mission to devote my life to, had none to offer. And the blackness hit me. I felt myself reeling, and like Lucifer, I fell headlong into eternal damnation. I wonder whose is the greatest sin. And does it matter after all? I guess that religion has touched me less than any one of you. I still have hope. Hey, man, what are you talking about? You're the one put the whammy on us from the beginning. You're the one first put us all behind the eight ball. Whatever all of us did, we were human. Human, born to make mistakes. Big or little, if we didn't, we'd be God or gods. Each of us carries our private hell within us. I cannot conceive of anything beyond that as punishment. But the whole idea of God surely means compassion. What's that? We're landing. Without any approach? In midair? What does it mean? Hey, help me. Hey, knock it off, Danny. Hey, ain't you scared? Sure. But not so much after what Mr. Moss said. Plane's coming to a halt. Ruth, you said we were two of a kind. Yeah. Then can I hang on to you? I'm terrified. Sit down, everyone. Let's not waste time. Who are you? Traffic control, of course. Are we in hell? Not yet. May I ask where we are? This is sort of a halfway station. We have your dossiers. You have all made mistakes of greater or lesser value, and that's neither here nor there. You have reached what is usually called the point of no return. That is the point on a journey where you are exactly halfway. And so you have a choice. Do you wish to continue, or would you like to go back to where you were before the moment of finite death. You mean we are not condemned everlastingly? No one has judged you as yet but yourselves. None of you returns to face an easy life, but if you want to, you may. You mean there is a God who offers us a second chance? Of course. Everyone deserves that, don't you think? I wonder if the memory of this tale will haunt you, and if perhaps, if it does, that mistake or that vicious action you may have taken may give you a moment's pause to reconsider, and perhaps to try to repair the damage. I'll be back shortly. Jeannie Wallace 
had a fine baby girl. Carol Newman works in a center for retarded children. Bruce Newman is a successful star. Danny is serving a sentence for robbery, but is soon to be paroled. The Reverend Morgan Pell has gone back to Vietnam. We have no record of what has happened to him there. And Herb Moss broke off with his relationship with Barbara, who returned to her old love. Herb wisely never troubled his wife with his own indiscretion. It is enough that he suffers with it in his conscience. Our cast included Casey Kasem, Richard Crenna, Janet Waldo, Virginia Gregg, and Sam Edwards. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Next time, Mystery Theater brings you another tale of the macabre. The Angels of Devil Mountain, starring Warren Stevens. This is Hyman Brown, inviting you to discover the joy of listening. Take one man with a gnawing hunger for glory. Let him hear the thundering roar of a fight crowd in his ear. That's our story. The Darkened Ring, taken from the files of John Steele, adventurer. friends. This is John Steele. Every once in a while I reach way back in my files and pull out a story I want to hear. One of those uh, off-the-beaten-track tales of haunting mood and smoldering action. This is that kind of story. Now, I first met Joe West when I was a sports writer for one of the big New York newspapers. He's quite a different guy now than he was the first time I saw him, but I'll let him tell you about it. Joe? How'd he get mixed up in the fight racket? I don't know. There's something about it. Smoke in the gym, the feel of a glove in your hand, the sweat, the blood, the roar of the crowd when you're going good, and the humming in your head when you're hurt and down. It ain't like nothing else in the world. Once you're in it, you can't get away. It's back a few years in New York, I'd fought a prelim at St. Nick's against a big muscle-bound date, and he almost ruined me. But in the sixth round, I caught up with him, and the way he hit the canvas, I knew it was all over. After the fight, I dropped in at Harry's, a bar over on 2nd Avenue. It's near the hotel, and I guess I needed a drink. Hello, Joe. Hello, Harry. What'll it be? Dear. Yep. How'd it go tonight? Tough. Yeah, I know. Thanks. I caught the last two rounds on television just before the main event. Give me another. Sure. He gave you a hard time on the fifth. Yeah. Did he hurt you? Nah. Looked to me like... What's the matter? Huh? You spilled your beer. I don't know. I'll clean it up. Dizzy. Next one's on the house. Huh. I said to Abe, if Joe would keep his right up, he'd be taking most of those on his glove. That's how you got him on the sixth, wasn't it? What, what? What's the matter with you? Nothing. You don't look right. It's nothing. Well, drink your beer. Yeah. Look out, you're going to spill it again. 
Here. Thanks. How many you had tonight? Well, you wasn't even oh, reaching West. in the... Caught your fight tonight. Hello, Harry. Hi, Mr. Lasky. Main event was a stinker. Kid got belted in the second. I heard. Looked like he was having a hard time. I'm okay. Big guy can hit. Yeah. You come a long way. A year ago, you never would have caught him. No. Will you introduce me? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Joe West, Jane Howard. Hello, Joe. Hello. And I'll, uh, I'll see you, Harry. Sure, Joe. What's the matter with him? How you feeling, Joe? Tired, I guess. Sure you are. Anything special you'd like to hear? No. Just something slow and easy, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Well, let's see. Uh, how about, uh... I hadn't anyone... Till you... I was a lonely one. Till you... You like music? Huh? I used to fly... Oh. I do. Don't you belong to Lasky? I came with him. I don't belong to him. It's a pretty song. You better go back. Why? I don't know you better. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm tired. I know. I'm a fighter. I know. Okay. Stay. That's how it happened. Look, a couple of words, and that was it. Something about her, like, like a little girl, I don't know. The way she talked, the way she said my name. Made me want to fight for her. Cry for her. I knew it wasn't right. I tried to tell her, but it was what she wanted, and we got married. From then on, she was always with me. Seattle, Portland, Sacramento, San Francisco. Hundred dirty little rooms in a hundred towns. She was there. I never let her see me fight, but when I come home late at night, she'd be waiting for me, and I'd tell her everything that happened. Sometimes I'd be mad if I'd lost, if I'd had a dizzy spell. I'd hurt her, but she always understood. She'd feed me, banish my cuts, say my name that way, and everything would be all right again. I was in Reno about six months later. I'd fought a tough little punk from New Jersey, and I was late getting back to the hotel. Baby? Baby? Joe? I didn't know you was asleep. I got tired. It's okay. You all right? Of course I'm all right. Come here, Joe. Uh, the light. Leave it on. <sighs> Did he hurt you? No. You're cut. That's nothing. Oh, it's nothing, I said. I lost. Yes. It's crazy. I was going good till the fourth. Had him tied up in the corner and he was hurt. Then he lets fly with a wild one, catches me on a year. I couldn't get going after that. Saw the openings. I was late every time. It's all right. Hands were like lead. I couldn't move them. Late every time. It's all right, Joe. Saw the openings. Couldn't come in. Did he hurt you? No. What do you keep asking for? You're so late. Well, no, it didn't hurt me. You've been drinking? So what if I have? Nothing. I lost the fight, you understand? He had me on Queer Street in the ninth. I'm lucky to get through the round. What are you trying to do? I didn't mean anything. I needed a drink. I was rocky. When I come out with a temper... All it... right, Joe. I'll get you something to eat. I don't want anything. Lie down and rest. Won't take long. I don't want anything. Lie down. <sighs> Did you mail the letters? Huh? Did you... What letters? I... What letters? Joe. Tell me. Please. Where are they? I... I put them in your pocket. I asked you to mail them. It's nothing, Joe. You just forgot. What's that? What? That thing. It's a Victrola. Where'd you get it? I thought you'd like it. Where'd you get it? I only made a down payment on it. Why? 
It's so lonesome, Joe, waiting for You know me. I don't want a lot of junk to cart around. I got enough that carries it is. I'll take it back to This racket, you gotta move, you gotta move like you tie me down. I'll take it I back. I don't want it, I don't want it. Just listen to her. Maybe it'll help. No. Listen to her. Remember? I'll turn it off. Leave it on. <laughs> baby, baby. Oh, it's all right. Whatever I do, whatever I say, I love you. I know. You. Remember that? I love you. Yes. I don't want to hurt you. You're I don't wanna... not. Jesus, this way I'll be punchy in four months. Shh. Maybe I'll go haywire, but I love you. Get away from it. No. Give it up. There are other ways to make money. That's all I know. Please. Look, it's, it's, it's in me. I can't get it out. Baby. It's all right now. Joe. Well, after that thing started to break right for me, I put together 12 wins in a row the last three main events. Papers began giving me the big build-up. Lou Getzey, my manager, was talking about a crack at the title, said we'd better start working our way east. Everywhere we went, the crowds was good, and the sports writers was calling me the up-and-coming challenger. With all the noise and everything, Jane seemed to get used to the idea of me staying in a fight game. At least she didn't say nothing more about it. She had the victrola and the song and me, and she said that was enough. I was in Chicago about a year later. Lou had signed me into the Coliseum for the main event with Jackie Graham. Everybody said this was it. The winner was sure to get a crack at the kid and the title. Jane had been after me to let her see me fight, but it was Lou's idea to let her come to this one. He said I needed a lift. So Graham was good, fast on his feet. He could hit hard with both hands. We fell each other out for the first two rounds, but in the third, he caught me coming off the ropes, and I went down for an eight count. I hang on for the rest of the round, but when I go back to my corner, I know I'm hurt. I look down the third row at Jane. She's trying to smile back. In the fourth round, he got me in a corner and gave it to me with both hands. The crowd was on his feet yelling for the kill, but I covered up and took everything he had to give. When I went back to my corner, Lou ran out with a sponge in his hands, flicking water in my face. How you feel, Joe? Mm, rocky. Smell this. Bah. More. No, that's enough. Ice bag on that Ivic. How's he hit? All right. You took everything he had. Yeah. He'll be tired next round. Where's Jane? Now forget about her. Where's she? She's there. I'm not looking. Forget she'll... her. You got a fight on your hands. Now be careful, Joe. Yeah. Stay away from that right. Yeah, yeah. Feel him out. Yeah. Feel this yeah, 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 yeah. Feel him out, Lou said. Feel him out. I kept my right high and stung him with a couple of lefts. Graham looked surprised. He closed in. I felt his right drive in hard under my heart. Couldn't beat him close in. I had to back off. Make him fight my way. I pushed him off. His right caught me on the side of the head. It was a good punch, but it didn't hurt. He was slowing up, and it didn't hurt. I backed off and looked at his feet. Sure, that was it. He was down on his heels, flat-footed, and his timing was off. I jabbed him, stepped back. He threw his right and missed. Then I saw he was off balance, wide open, so I tried it again. Jab, step back. His right whistled past my head, and I crossed with my right. His head snapped back, his mouth pieced out of his mouth, and he grabbed and held on. When the ref broke, his grand was glassy eyed and his hand reached out for the rope. I looked up at the clock. Still a minute to go. Graham was on his bicycle now, but I caught him in a corner right over his manager and let him have it. Rights and left of the body and the right to the head. I could hear somebody screaming for him to cover up. Then my glove drove hard into his face and dropped to the canvas. Neutral corner! Neutral corner! I want to see Graham. Eyes out, kid. Leave him alone. Oh, well, you were beautiful, see. Joe. You look like a champ. Cover up, kid, and keep moving. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. The time, two minutes and 36 seconds of the fifth round. The winner by a knockout, Joe West. <laughs> Come on, Jim, let's get out of here. All right. Watch the rope. Yeah. Atta boy. All right, let us through, please. All right, stand back, folks. Let us through, will you? Stand back, please. Let the boy get out of here. All right, break it up, folks. Yeah. Break it up. Where, where's Jane? She'll be along in a minute. I want, uh, I want to see her. I told her to meet us in the dressing room. Uh, yeah, you were great, Jim. 
You know what this means to us? Uh, yeah, a chance yeah. at the big dough like we always wanted. Yeah. Come on, boy, get up on the table. Yeah. Jane? Uh, she'll be along. Uh, right hand. Hey, uh, Grandma. Yeah. Uh, he'll be okay. There. Left. I never saw you throw a better punch. There. Now, lie down. Joe. Joe. Uh, hello, baby. Are you all right? Huh? Did he hurt you? I couldn't watch. Uh, sh- Kept hitting and hitting and everyone was yelling. Baby, baby, Are you sure, all right? Sure, I'm all right. He didn't hurt you bad? Yeah. I couldn't watch, Joe. I wanted to, but I couldn't. I know. It was awful. It's all right now, all baby. All right, come on, Janie. We've got to work on our boy before he stiffens up. I'm sorry. Lie down, kid. Uh, it's the first time I've ever... Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, hey, hey, take it easy, Lou. <laughs> What's the matter? Oh, I forgot to tell you. What, Joe? The cleaner brought back that dress he lost today. Well, that's good. Ah, uh, buy a hundred someday. You know, despite me, he's a crack at the title. Yeah, they're more than a crack if Joe keeps going like he is. Will that make you happy? Sure, baby, sure. You see the way he bounced back tonight? He was hurt in the fourth, hurt bad. But he'd come back and nailed his man in the next round. That's fighting. All right, other leg. Yeah. I thought he had you in the fourth, sure. That yeah, Graham's good. Yeah, sure, he's good, but uh, you're better. <laughs> uh. Oh, you know that dress the cleaner lost, baby? What, Joe? He brought it back today. Blue. Hey. He's tired, Janie. Yeah, he's tired. What's the matter? Nothing, Joe, nothing. Well, come on, come on. i got to get out of here. That's uh, probably reporters. Can't they come back later? Yeah, I'll brush them off. All right, boys, break it up. Now, take it easy, will you? Come on. Where's Lou going? He'll be back. Uh, to fight. Lie back and rest. I scared it, Grim. Lie back. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Cleaner brought back that dress he lost. I know, Joe. Uh, buy a hundred when I get that title. Yes, Joe. I know. Well, after that, Lou and Jane decided I need a rest. So we moved to New York so Lou could start working on the title bout. Me and Jane found a little two-room apartment on the west side. First time since I was a kid I'd lived in one place for more than a week. Felt good. I worked out at Stillman's gym every day, and at night we'd stop in at Harry's and they would play the song. I knew they were worried about me because Lou never let me do any contact work, and every once in a while Jane would talk about getting out of the fight game, but I think they both knew I couldn't stop now, not with the little title standing me in the face. But money don't last forever, and after a couple of months I got tired of doing nothing. Sitting still is okay for guys that like it. It wasn't for me. I missed the likes and the crowds and going places and doing things. I kept after Lou. Get us signed up. And then one day we went down to the garden and they drew up the papers. Ah, it was a big deal. A lot of people, reporters, pictures of me shaking hands with a kid. My kind of living. I was on top of the world when I got back to the apartment that afternoon. But Jane wasn't there. I walked around, kicking at the furniture, wondering where she was when she'd be back. And I turned on the patroller. I lay down in the bed. I was too excited to sleep. Just later, with my hands behind my head, thinking of the fight and the title. My watch was ticking in my ear. What? I said you spilled your beer. Oh, sorry. Hey, draw me another, huh? Sure, Joe. Here you are. Thanks. See, I can pick it up just like that. Nothing to it. Sure you can, Joe. Nothing to it. Hello, Joe. Huh? Who are you? Sure you can. I'm Jane. Say, you're some looker. Do you like music? Me? I'm nuts about music. Me too. <laughs> hey, you know we're going places, you and me. Are we? Sure we are. I love you. Joe loves Jane. Yeah. Jane loves Joe. You were terrific, Joe. Yeah, we're going to the top of the world, baby. That a promise? Sure. He never laid a hand on you. Don't forget. I never forget. Had him from the word go. Yeah, he's a pushover. Sure he was. Where's Jane? Back at the dressing room. Come on, let's hurry. Take it easy. Joe. Joe, you were wonderful. Yeah, how'd you like it? He was a pushover. It was wonderful. You weren't scared? Of course not. That's my girl. Did you mail my letters? Sure, I told you. I never forget. I love you. Come on, kid. Gotta get you in shape for the title. Yeah. Joe. Get you in shape for the title. Ah, I never felt better in my life. Joe. Shape for the title. Okay, Lou. Joe. Huh? The title. Joe, it's the me. The title. What? The title. I... 
The title. Oh. The title. Oh, baby. The title. Are you all right? The yeah, title. Yeah, sure, sure. The you title. The title. The title. I did? The oh, title. Up. The title. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, sure. I'm all right, baby. I, I, uh, I mailed the letters. What letters? The letters you get. What is it, Joe? It's nothing. It's nothing, baby. You lie there and rest. No, no, I'm sick of resting. I, uh, I, I wanted to tell you something. What, Joe? I, I can't be... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We signed for the title today, baby. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. Where you been? I... I've been out. Where? I went to see the doctor. What did you do that for? Please. I don't need a doctor. Joe. I never felt better in my life. I didn't go to see him about you. You what? I'm going to have a baby. A baby? Yes, Joe. No. What? I said no. But... I don't want it, you hear? Joe. I don't want it. Tying me down, I don't want it. I told you, I gotta move. I gotta move light. It's part of the fight game. It's part of me, and I don't want it no other way. You're tying me down. I don't want any part of it. All right. All right. No. Don't play. I'll break it. Stop it! 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 It wasn't the same after Jane left. I moved out of the apartment. Left the broken Victrola, all our things, and went back to the hotel where I belonged. I couldn't get her out of my mind. Work and help, so I worked all the time. I got so Lou had a hard time finding pugs for me to work on. They said I was kill crazy and nobody going to the ring with me. Lou kept trying to slow me down, but they didn't do no good. Punch, 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 that's all I wanted. The weeks dragged by, and then the night of the fight came. The garden was packed to the roof. When I went in the ring, the mob got up on its feet and yelled, like thought, this is it. This is the top of the world. And a kid came in the ring, and we were out in the center shaking hands, and the ref was talking. The New York State Athletic Commission. When I tell you to break, I want you to break. And I was back in my corner, and Lou was taking off my robe. I dug my feet in the rosin. Blue hit me on the back and the bell rang. And I went after him from the bell. Bob and Reed jab and cross, keep following, waiting in. The kid looked surprised and backed off. He was counting nice, kept his left stuck out there in my face. I was taking punches, but I was given three for one. So at the end of the round, I got him in his corner and the kid slipped and fell in a wet spot. The crowd was yelling, but he got up and laughed, so I closed in. Break for break. The end of the round, the bell. Come on, break. Lost your head, Joe? No. Slow down. You won't go five rounds at that rate. I know what I'm doing. You're crazy. I'll do the fight. You listen to me. Yeah? That kid's good. He'll knock your head off to keep like this. Now slow down. Yeah. You hear me, Joe? Yeah, yeah, Slow yeah. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slow down, Lou said. How could I slow down when I've been waiting for this one all my life? The kid was dancing and weaving, and I waited in and went after him. Right and left, left and right, counter, parry. No time to faint. Just stand and slug it out. In the middle of the round, he tied me up in the ropes, and I heard his voice in my ear. What are you trying to do, Wes? I'm knocking you out, kid. Okay, wise guy. Right, fella. Right, yeah. Then he was backing off and grinning, and I went after him again. Jab and cross, jab and cross. When I left, shoot for the heart and close. I looked up at the clock. Fifteen seconds ago, the kid was coming off the ropes. I threw my right and caught him on a ear, and he went down. Crazy, Joe. Yeah? I spent seven years building you up, and you're throwing it away because you're crazy. Hit him tonight. If you don't slow down, I'm through. Yeah? Gonna walk out of your corner, that's all. Okay, okay. Now, you listen to what I'm saying. He'll stay away from you because you hurt him. But you watch him, Joe. He's smart. Watch him. Yeah, sure, Lou. Lou was right. The kid wasn't grinning no more. He was backing off and moving around. His left stung me. When I crossed with my right, he wasn't there. I followed him around the ring, but his left was always in my face, and I was missing with my right. Then we were tied up in the center of the ring. His voice was in my ear again. Okay, West, you had your party. Yeah. Sweet dreams. I don't know where it came from, but a glove drove into my face, and my whole head exploded. I tried to shake off the blow, but the ropes was twisting in front of me, and the canvas was waving like a flag. Way off, I heard the ref counting. I knew I had to get up. What did he say? Seven? Six? Seven? Get up. I gotta get up. I pulled my feet under me and grabbed the twisting rope. Then I was standing up and the ref was wiping my gloves on his shirt. The kid's face was a blur around me and I felt his blows hitting me four and five at a time. And somewhere far away, I heard the bell. 
Lou had me around the chest and was dragging me to the corner. How you feel, Joe? You spilled your beer. Huh? How you feel? The letters, Joe. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. Want me to stop it? The title. No, 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 I'm okay. Smell this. Give it up, Joe. I'm okay, I tell you. Now stay away from him, Joe. The title. Yeah, yeah. Stay away from him. Give it up. No. Stay away from him, Joe. The title. The title, yeah. My legs felt like rubber when I stepped down into the ring and I tried to lift my hands, but the gloves were heavy. A kid was dancing around me. I didn't know where he was coming from next. Fist crashed into my jaw and then I drove hot into my stomach and I grabbed and held on. Then the ref focused and the kid was all over me. I tried to cover it up, but there was too many gloves I couldn't see. I felt the ropes against my back and a fist exploded in my face and I fell to the canvas. Open your eyes. The title. Give it up. Couldn't get up. How do you feel? Couldn't get up. The title. Joe. Give it up. This is Lou. Lou. Lou? Yeah. How do you feel? The title. Okay. Give it up, Joe. The reporters want to come in. You up to it? Reporters. Yeah. The title. You up to it? Give it up, Joe. Yeah. All right, not too long, fellas. Okay, all they get it, all they get it. We just want to ask them. How do you feel, Joe? I'm okay. What happened out there tonight? The title. Couldn't get off. What was the punch that got you? Uh, I don't know. Any plans for the future? Give it up, Joe. Couldn't get off. Do you want another crack at the title? The title. What? The title. What? Listen. You better come back later, fellas. He, he's not right. ready yet. All right. Come on, all right, now, break yeah, it up, yeah, will you, yeah, boys? Yeah, all right. uh, Joe, you take it easy. I'll be back in a minute. Come on. Come on. All right. The title. 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 Give it up, Joe. Give it up, Joe. Give it up, Joe. Joe, what are you doing here? Give it up, Joe. Couldn't get off. Joe, look at me. Give it up. This is Harry. Harry? Yeah, how'd you get here? I... I don't know. Give it up, Joe. You're all wet. You okay? Give it up, Joe. Couldn't get off. You need a doc. Give it up, Go on back and sit down. Give it up, Joe. Give it up, Joe. Give it up, Joe. Hello, Joe. Sorry about the fight. Give it up, Joe. I couldn't get off. Give it up, Joe. Of course Joe. you couldn't, Joe. Know just what you mean. Give it up, Joe. Broke the record, Ed. Uh, Give it up, when Joe. When I was too bad. Broke Jane's Give it record. Up, Joe. Well, that's the way it goes sometimes. Give it you, up, you just listen, Joe. Joe. I'll put it right back together again. I hadn't anyone to you. Give it up, Joe. I was a lonely one to you. Joe. Joe. Huh? Lou called. I looked all over for you. Baby? Yes, Joe. <laughs> baby, baby. I didn't know how sick you were. I, I couldn't get up. It's all right now. I mailed a letter. Of course you did, Joe. I never forget. I know. Just listen to the song. I do my dear. Listen. Top of the world, huh, baby? 
top of the world. Joe. The Darkened Ring, the story of a man who almost lost his right to a future in the violence of the present. Well, friends, because of a special broadcast, we won't be with you next week. However, if you like Joe's story, why don't you join us two weeks from this time? I'll have a man who learned that a misplaced love can lead to destruction. I like to call it men under pressure. So until then, this is John Steele saying, A life of adventure is yours for the asking, wherever you find it. Only don't look for it. It may find you. Well, goodbye and good hunting. John Steele came from New York. Follow clues down Mutual's Mystery Lane to further thrills and chills. Along the Sunday Avenue of Mystery and Suspense are Martin Kane, the two-fisted gumshoe, the shadow in a cloak of invisibility, true detective mysteries with real-life cases, and Nick Carter, master detective. Weekdays here, I Love a Mystery, every night over most of these stations, with the fabulous adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie in eerie investigations. Remember, all roads lead to Mutual when you travel the mystery trail. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Really, Vance, don't you think you're being a little obvious? Don't you think she rates it, Markham? <laughs> Have you ever seen a more beautiful woman? You've been staring at her for an hour. Is our foremost private investigator doing some really private investigating? That is a leading question, Mark. <laughs> the district attorney should know better than to prompt a witness. Besides, you haven't conceded that she's beautiful. I can see. <laughs> oh, she's much prettier than that, my friend. Besides, I'm certain she's been trying to attract my attention. Vance, she's dining with a gentleman. Both of them seem to me to be minding their own business. Are you sure you're not using a little hopeful imagination? Quite. Do you know the man she's with by any chance? No, I don't. Fact is, I can't make out his face very well. You can see a scar on it. I imagine he's about 40, and he's relatively bald and quite stocky. There's something familiar about him. And there's something very lovely about his blonde companion. Yes, there is. I think she's... Markham, did you see that? Did I see what? They're leaving. And I could swear she indicated she wanted me to follow her. You intend to go after her? Yes. Vance, wars have been fought over less. <laughs> <laughs> well, our check is paid. Let's go. They've just passed the head waiter. We can probably catch them in the foyer before they get into the street. All right, but after we do catch them, then what? That all depends on whether I did get a signal from the lady. Well... Here we are. Too late, Vance. They've already gone out the street door. Mm. Oh, no, no, the man is still here. You see that chap, the one with the scar? Oh, there he is, sitting over there in that chair. Yeah, the man is still here. That's the breaks I get. <laughs> Come with me a minute, will you? <laughs> right. I beg your pardon, sir. Well, what is it? The young lady you were dining with. Would you mind telling me where she is? What are you talking about? He's talking about the young lady you were dining with. We've been watching the two of you inside for over an hour. I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid you gentlemen were mistaken. What do you mean? I haven't been with any young lady all evening. Oh, 
Come on now, Miss Foster. Tell the sergeant what you told me. No, I, I can't. I can't talk. What's going on, Williams? What is all this? This is Miss George Foster, Sergeant. Foster, eh? Was her husband who was murdered a couple of hours ago? That's right. Sergeant Heath is up at her house now, looking the place over. I found her on my beat, crying, just like she is now. So I brought her here to headquarters. I see. Uh, Mrs. Foster. Uh, Mrs. Foster. Yes. Yes, what is it? You want to take it easy, Mrs. Foster. Let Officer Williams take you back to your house. No, no, no. I don't want to go back there. I don't ever want to go back. My husband was shot. I saw him shoot my husband. I don't ever want to go back to that house. You saw who shot your husband, Mrs. Foster? Did you know the man? No, no, I didn't. Can you describe him? Yes. Yes, I know exactly what he looks like. Well, that'll help us find him. Uh, Williams, take down the description Mrs. Foster gives you. <laughs> then take her into the rogues gallery and see if she can find the man in our files. <laughs> We're liable to crack this case without leaving headquarters. <laughs> Hello, Philo Vance speaking. This is Markham Vance. Are you entirely recovered from that little restaurant scene last night? Not quite. I'd hate to believe that girl wasn't attractive enough to stay in my memory overnight. Don't tell me you found out something about her. No, that isn't the reason for my call. A man named Foster was murdered last evening, Vance, just about the time we were having dinner. Between 7 and 8 o'clock, you mean? Yes, his wife saw the killing, was able to describe the man who fired the shot. More than that, she made a positive identification from a rogues gallery photograph. The killer was a man named Norman James. Really? Yes, really. Well, you're entitled to an easy case once in a while, Markham. This sounds as if you have one. Does it? Well, doesn't it? Listen, the man Mrs. Foster positively identifies as having killed her husband at 7.30 last night is the man we watched every minute between 7 and 8. The man who was dining with that beautiful blonde. <laughs> What do you want? What goes on a red nine? A black ten? A black eight. Look, beautiful babies can play solitaire. Why can't you? Maybe because I'm not a baby. What goes on a red queen? A yellow pumpkin. What? Don't bother me. I'm busy. I'm reading. It's a very good picture of you in the papers, Norman. Ah, it's not so good. Oh, I think it's beautiful. Shows that scar on your face so clear. Daddy. Now, what is it? That Mr. Vance you told me to make eyes at in the restaurant's awful cute. That Mr. Vance happens to be awful smart. You make sure you never talk to him, never see him again. You understand that? But he doesn't know who I am. How could I ever talk to him or see him? You know who he is. Sure. You could go to see him. Only, baby, you're not that stupid, are you? Who says I'm stupid? You do every time you open your mouth. What? This newspaper says that I'm going to be arrested for murder. Because of you, the district attorney and Philo Vance are going to be my alibi. They'll swear they saw me in the restaurant with you at the time George Foster was shot. Now, Mrs. Foster, please calm down for just one moment. You seem to have made a terrible mistake. It wasn't a mistake, Mr. Markham. I swear it wasn't. I saw the man who killed my husband. It, it was this Norman James, the man whose picture I picked out from the police files. But Mrs. I couldn't Foster... have been mistaken. I saw him. I'll never forget his face when he shot my husband. He did it, I tell you, he did it. Mrs. Foster, I dislike saying this to you, but it would be physically impossible for him to be in the restaurant where I saw him between uh, 7 and 8 o'clock and at your house killing your husband at the very same time. Now, wouldn't it? I don't know, and I don't care. And there is a possibility, of course, that Norman James had a twin brother, in which case I can figure out what happened. We're checking into his background now. Uh, look, Mr. Markham, you, you're the district attorney. You, you, you know all about murders and alibis and all that sort of thing. I don't know anything about them. All I know is my husband was killed. And I saw the man who did it. And that man was Norman James. I swear it was Norman James. I don't doubt either your sincerity or your identification, Mrs. Foster, but there are certain... Oh, excuse me. Come in. Mr. Markham? Yes, Williams, what is it? We made a thorough check on Norman James' background, Mr. Markham. He was an only child. No brothers or sisters, twin or any other kind. That's definite. I see. Uh, thank you, Williams. Right. Well, now what? 
So the man had no twin brother. I, I, I saw him kill my husband. And you say you saw him in the restaurant at the same time. I not only saw him, I spoke to him in the foyer. Oh, well, then what does this mean? Mrs. Foster, I say to you in all sincerity, I wish I knew. What? A black two goes on a red three, right? Betty, baby, you're a genius. Then take me out somewhere for dinner. Geniuses get hungry, too, you know. You're going to stay right here in your apartment. You'll have your dinner sent in. You're not going to move out of this place until I say so. Well, why do I have to stay right here in my apartment? Why can't I go out? You can go out during the day, but keep away from any place where a man might see you. Oh? I don't want Philo Vance tracking you down. I don't want them talking to you. I never talk to strangers. Somehow, Betty, baby, what you have makes strangers talk to you. Hmm? Right now, I'm on easy street. Nobody's got a thing on me. And except for one little detail, I'm completely in the clear. Hey, who could that be? Could be the detail I was talking about. Right on time, too. I'll go to the door. You take my gun out of my top coat pocket. Mm -hmm. You'll find a silencer in the other pocket. Screw down the end. Uh, which end? Never mind. I'll do it myself. Oh, I... I'm coming. Hold everything. I'll get you gun and silence, Raj. You can put it on yourself. All right, all right. Hi. Hi. You know, Betty. Sure. Pleased to meet you. You know that guy, dope. Oh. <laughs> well, James, you know why I'm here? I most certainly do, and you're right on time. You came for the payoff, right? That's right. Here's the gun and silencer, Dad. What's that for? Nothing. I just want to keep them in my suit pocket, that's all. How much would you say I owed you? What you promised? Five thousand dollars. Your life is worth that, isn't it? Yes, it is. But your life isn't. Hey, don't! <coughs> oh. Gee, Daddy. Is he dead? Wait a minute while I make sure. Yeah, he's dead all right. Gee, alive one minute and dead the next. That's life, isn't it? Yes, my brilliant accomplice, it is. You know, Daddy, when you said for me to get you that gun, I was scared. Why? I thought maybe you were going to kill me. Why would I kill you, genius? Why? Yeah. Well, because. Because I know too much. <laughs> Almost the more advanced. You want to tell me now why you developed a sudden interest in a very ordinary shooting? Yes, Markham. You called me a little while ago to tell me that an ex-heavyweight fighter named Joe Stockton had been found shot to death. That's right. After quitting the ring, Stockton became a strong-arm man for a racket gang. This sounded to me like just an ordinary gangland rubout. I called you only because I'd promised to advise you of anything that happened since George Foster was killed. That, of course, is the mysterious murder that has me confused. You've got a lot of company. Oh? Mrs. Foster positively identifies Norman James as her husband's murderer. And we saw James in a restaurant at the time of the murder. Now, how can that be? It can be very easily. It can? Yes. Well, maybe you'd better tell me as long as it's so easy. Well, this Joe Stockton, the one whose body we're going to see, he's about five feet ten. Just about. Have he said? Yes, why? Practically bald, about 40. Why, yes. How did you know? I didn't know. I merely surmised. Oh. And I also more than surmise now that I can give you the details of how Norman James could have killed George Foster. One more question. Did Stockton have a scar on his cheek? Definitely not. Oh. What's the O for? It's for the sudden collapse of a beautiful theory. I take back all my previous questions, Markham. They mean absolutely nothing now. I'm afraid I don't know how Norman James could be in two places at once after all. Nor do I know how I can ever again find that beautiful blonde.
This is District Attorney Markham. The Scarface murder case opened with the killing of George Foster. Foster's wife, who saw the murder, positively identifies Norman James, still at liberty, as her husband's killer. But Vance and I are certain we saw James in a restaurant at the time of the murder. The killing of a petty racket strong arm man proves no clue, even though Philo Vance believed it might at first. At the moment, Vance and I are questioning Mrs. Foster. Neither Mr. Markham nor I are doubting you, Mrs. Foster. But what reason did Norman James have to kill your husband? Oh, the reason, the reason. Is the reason important? I saw him do it. Isn't that enough? Not with the situation we find ourselves in, Mrs. Foster. Well... It'll be your word against his, and he has us to back up his alibi. Perhaps your giving us a reason for his killing your husband might help us. Oh, all right. My husband borrowed money from Norman James. I never knew his name, but I'd seen his face when he came to the house. My husband was supposed to pay him a very high interest rate. He couldn't pay it. He couldn't pay James back. So he was killed. So that's Norman James's racket. That's right. Mm. That second murder could have explained all this so easily, Markham. But it didn't. What are we going to do to break James's alibi, Vance? If I could find that blonde he was with at the restaurant, that might do it. I don't see how. I do. But it's too early for me to explain... Lend me an officer from the homicide department, a telephone book, and I might be able to locate her. You don't know her name? No, nor where she lives, but let me have what I asked for, and there's still a chance I can trace her for you. For me? No, I beg your pardon. For both of us. That's all, sir. Shave, haircut, massage, all finished. Pay the cashier, will you, please? Yes. Who's next, please? I am, Charlie. Ah, it's you, Mr. James. Uh, you want to shave, maybe? I want something, Charlie. But well, there's no maybe about it. You owe me a hundred bucks. I want the hundred or ten bucks interest. Uh, Mr. James, I wanted to ask you something. Things were a little tough. Yeah, tough for me, too. If you wanted the money, you asked me for it. You got it. You know you'd have to pay me, didn't you? Yes. Well, what are you waiting for? I haven't got it, Mr. James. Maybe I'll have it for you tomorrow. Tomorrow, huh? Yeah, tomorrow, sure. Give me another day, will you, Mr. James? Just one more day. Okay. That'll be two bucks more interest for that extra day. I'll be back tomorrow about this time. Better have the money, Charlie. Or the interest. I'll try. If it'll help any in your trying. Remember what happened to George Foster. He owed me money and he didn't pay. So I paid him off. Oh, never mind, thank you. Goodbye. Well, any luck, Williams? Oh, well, Mr. Vance. Any more numbers for me to call? There are only about three more on my list. I think I'll make the next call myself. Okay, you try for luck. Here's the phone. Thanks. Let's see. We called about 30 numbers, didn't we, Mr. Vance? So far, yes. I'm sure this has to work. Oh, maybe if I knew what you were trying to do, or... Shh. Hello, so long. How do you do? My name is Philo Vance. I'm trying to find a girl. I wish you luck, brother. Happy hunting. Oh, just a moment, please. I'm hoping that this particular girl is one of your customers. Well, what's her name? Well, I don't know. Oh, you're a big help. What's she look like? She's blonde. That's big news. I'd say she was the kind of girl who'd come into your establishment about three times a week. Does that help any? Well, it might. Give me a little bit more to work on. She's about five foot eight, very attractive, mm -hmm. very smart dresser. Her hair is blonde, but not golden. Platinum, huh? Dark eyebrows, nice mouth, gray eyes. Mm, well, I don't know what color her eyes are. Uh, do you know somebody that answers that description? Yes. Well, that's fine. <laughs> Does that make me a landmark for tourists? You are. As far as I'm concerned, I'm coming down to see you right away. You're the district attorney. You've got to help me. Norman James will kill me, just like he killed George Foster. He'll kill me. I know, Charlie. I heard you. You're a barber, and you borrowed money from James and can't pay him back. Is that it? Well, he lends money to a lot of us people. Barbers, newsstand men, taxi drivers. Well, we have no security, so he charges us high interest. And when we don't pay, he has us beaten up. He killed George Foster. He told me he did. 
You gotta protect me. You gotta arrest him. I could arrest him, of course. I could have had him arrested when Foster's wife identified him for us. But I'm sure I can't make a charge stick against him. Well, what does that mean? That he can take me out and kill me if he wants? No, I'll see that you're protected all day tomorrow and up until the time when Philo Vance gets the evidence he needs against James. Why can't you arrest him? Why don't you put him in jail? He threatened me, didn't he? Charging those high rates of interest is illegal, isn't it? Why can't you arrest him? Perhaps I will. In any event, Charlie, you have nothing to worry about. I give you my word that you won't be bothered by Norman James again. <laughs> bother me, will you? <laughs> a lot of men say I bother them. Isn't that silly? Everything they put in your face, they left out in your head, kid. I bet you don't think I have any brains. That's the only bet you ever made that you had a chance of winning. What do you want? I want to go out. With two. The beauty parlor, what do you think? Gee, you're stupid. Yeah, I know. You've been to the beauty parlor once this week already. You said I could go any place where there weren't any men, didn't you? Well... Well, there's no men in a beauty parlor except Antoine. He just does my hair. You need to wake on the inside of your head, kid. Oh, can I go, Daddy? It's only right down the street. I'll be back in a couple of hours. It doesn't take long for my hair to dry. Okay, okay, go ahead. You'll pester me to death if I don't let you. Oh, thanks. When I get down to see Charlie the Bobby, you'll sneak out anyhow. <laughs> so go ahead. I'll pick you up there. Okay. What are you going to have done? Oh, I think I'll have my hair just a shade lighter. Don't you think that'll be becoming? I guess Just so. a shade lighter. I don't know. Where I sit, you're lightheaded enough already. You know something? I don't mind sitting under this hair dryer at all. Not a bit. I am glad, madame. Madame? Yes. Well, I'm not a madame. I'm more of a... Um, whatever it is that means I'm younger. Yes, miss. Hey, you're cheating me. You ain't French. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I like you. I like you as well as I like Antoine. Except your mustache is cuter. <laughs> I think I'll have you every time I come in here. I'm a very good tipper. Oh, I'm sure you are. Oh, I'm sleepy. Noise from that dryer makes me sleepy. Well, why not sleep a little then? I can't. The noise from the dryer keeps me awake. Oh. Can you play solitaire? Mm, I imagine so. I just learned to play. That's quite an achievement. <laughs> sure, May's daddy. Daddy? Oh, forgot you're new here. I met Mr. James. He's waiting for me downstairs. I hope he won't mind waiting a little longer. He'll wait. Got a lot of patience. He has to have with me. The only time he doesn't have any patience is when he's jealous. Oh, he's jealous? I'll say. He killed a guy just because he took me out once. How do you like that? Joe Stockton? That's a guy. Uh -huh. Say, you read the papers, don't you? So do I. Gee, the things you can learn. Yes, I know. From other things besides newspapers. What? Oh, it doesn't matter. You say your friend Mr. James is waiting for you downstairs? Yeah, but he won't mind. Well, we won't keep him waiting long. I'll just turn the dryer up a little so we can get everything over in a hurry. There's Daddy. I mean, Mr. James. That's nice. Standing over there in the doorway waiting for me, just like I said he would be. Oh, thank you very much for doing my hair so well. Oh, it's quite all right. And I think I want a word with your daddy. Sure, I'll get him. Daddy! Yeah, baby? Come on over here. Look, kid, let's get moving. We got a... This nice man wants to speak to you. He just did my hair. Don't you think it looks beautiful? Hello, James. We meet again. Your Philo Vance. That's right. And after what your friend here just told me, I think I've got all I need to turn you over to the district attorney. After what I told you, I didn't tell you anything. Besides, I saw Philo Vance in the restaurant. He didn't have a mustache. The one this guy's wearing comes off. Can't you see it's a phony? <gasps> Better you don't like a beat. I don't think you can do anything at all, James, except come with me to see Mr. Markham. That's one man's opinion. Betty talked you're smart enough to put everything together. I'm getting out of here. I doubt okay, that. Okay, Vance, let's play rough. All right, come. Oh, you killed him, Vance. You killed Daddy. No, my dear, I didn't. I just knocked him out. I didn't kill him. I wouldn't dream of sparing the state all that trouble. I 
I'm a patient man, Vance, a very patient man, but I'm also a very curious one. Now, we know from his confession and, and from what his girl Betty told us that Norman James did kill George Foster and later the ex-prize fighter Joe Stockton. But we did see James in the restaurant at the time Foster was killed. Did we? Of course we did. He was sitting over in a corner with his girl. The girl was making eyes at you, uh, you claimed. Then they left, we followed, and there was James sitting in the foyer. Hmm. Markham, do you remember why I thought the prize fighter Joe Stockton would have a scar on his cheek when we were en route to the morgue to identify him? Yes, but he didn't have. I told you that. It was Joe Stockton who was in the restaurant, Markham, not Norman James. Oh, don't tell me that. I spoke to James myself. So did you, in the foyer. Oh, that was Norman James. But the man in the restaurant, the one we saw with the girl between seven and eight, was Joe Stockton. Stockton? He was built like James sat in the shadows so we couldn't really see his face, and he made sure we noticed the scar on it. You mean the scar was just makeup that was put on Joe's cheek? Exactly. Now, here's what happened. The girl had instructions to attract my attention. Your attention, that is, because you're the district attorney, and you were to be Norman James' alibi. I see. It was all set up for us to follow the two of them out the door. Then they were to disappear into the street, and Norman James was to be found by us seated in the restaurant foyer. He denied there had been a girl with him to intrigue us, to make sure we remembered him. That was the plan, and it worked. Yes. You see, James had time to kill George Foster between 7 and 8 and get to the restaurant afterwards, just as we were leaving. And then later, James had to kill Joe because of the possibility that Joe would either blackmail him or talk in the future. That's right. Huh? It was a very clever plan, and it almost worked. I figured the girl would be a key to all of this, and I also knew that a girl such as she would be a beauty parlor addict. She'd go to one several times a week. Probably a swanky one. So I called all the better beauty parlors in Midtown and finally found the right one. You most certainly did. That was quite a trick, finding a girl in a big city without knowing anything about her. Thank you. After I found her, I also found a way of making her talk. The result, you know. She put Norman James right in the middle of a double murder rap. Put him in the middle and us at the end of the Scarface murder case. <laughs> The Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a man who rose from a watery grave to accuse the living of his murder. A tale titled, You Only Die Once. Here is the tale you only die once. 
as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. The story begins some years ago in the beautiful Winthrop Mansion on the Hudson River. It is early evening, and John Winthrop, just home from the city, enters the drawing room to find his wife, Vivian, reading a telegram. Good evening, darling. Who's the telegram from? Oh, John, it's from my brother, Jerry. He's arriving tonight from Los Angeles. His train gets into Grand Central at 10 o'clock. Well, that's fine. I'm very anxious to meet your brother, darling. Oh, John, you'll love him. Jerry's a grand person. I'm sure he is, Vivian, if he's anything like his sister. Oh, for that, you deserve a kiss. Oh, John, I'm so excited about Jerry's visit. Well, if having Jerry here makes you so happy, we'll have to make his stay a permanent one. Come on, darling, let's go to dinner. Mr. Norton is here, sir. Hello, Jerry. Come in. I'm John, your brother-in-law. Hello, John. Jerry. Oh, Jerry. Oh, it's so good to see you again. Well, stand back and let me look at the bride. Vivian, I've never seen you looking so beautiful. Now, John, you know why I'm so fond of Jerry. Oh, Jerry, dear. What suddenly made you decide to come eat? You said nothing about it in your last letter. Well, you know your brother, always making quick decisions. I gave up my position in Los Angeles to come east. I, uh, well, I intend to settle down and find a job in New York. In New York? Mm -hmm. Oh, Jerry, that's wonderful. John, did you hear that? Yes, darling, and I think it's a fine idea. As I recall, Jerry, Vivian said you were an executive. That's right. Well, then, I think I've got your position. You mean you know of an opening? Well, with whom? Myself. You? Yes, for the past week or so, I've been contemplating hiring an assistant. My doctor told me I was overworking and needed one. Well, there's nothing seriously wrong with you, I hope. No, no. Just that my heart aches up a bit now and then when I've been working too hard. Well, what do you say, Jerry? Will you accept the position? All right, John. And I'll do my best to be of real assistance to you. No, oh, you don't know how happy this all makes me. John, do you think Jerry might come here and live with us? I think that's an excellent idea, if Jerry is agreeable. Well, there's nothing I'd rather do, but, uh, well, are you sure I, I won't be in the way? Oh, Jerry, of course not. John and I would love to have you live with us. Of course we would. All right, then. Thank you both very much. Good. Then it's all settled. Well, I must be off to bed. It's almost midnight, and I promised my doctor I'd be in bed every night by 11. I'll be up shortly, John. Oh, take your time, Vivian. I'm sure you two have a good deal to talk over. Good night, Jerry. Good night, John. <laughs> Well, sis, how have you been? Oh, darling, if you only knew how much I've missed you these past months. Well, aren't you even going to kiss me? Of course, darling. Mm. Oh, darling, I've waited a long time for that. It seems years. It's only been six months. How have you been doing, darling? Not bad, not bad at all. See this diamond bracelet? It was my wedding present from John. What else have you gotten? Two other bracelets, a necklace, and four rings. What's it all worth? Amounts to a little over a hundred thousand. Hmm, not bad, considering you've only been married three months. Oh, how much longer will I have to go on keeping up the act, though, Jerry? Never give up a gold mine until it's played out. And unless I miss my guess, John is still good for plenty more. He's a very rich man. Exactly. So you and I are staying here until we've worked, John, for every cent you can get. And when the time is ripe, you'll sue for a divorce and a big cash settlement. A few months went by. Months in which John Winthrop found himself increasingly happy. Vivian was all that he'd ever dreamed of in a wife. And Jerry, as his business assistant, was invaluable. In his happiness, John lavished gifts on his wife and paid Jerry an exceedingly handsome salary. The three lived in complete harmony until one night, one night late in September. Is that you, Jerry? Yes. How are you, uh, sis? In seventh heaven. Jerry, why didn't you tell me John was leaving for Chicago tomorrow morning? Well, he didn't make up his mind until late this afternoon at the office. Oh, where is he now? He's looking high and low for some papers in a brown envelope. Oh, it must be the Anderson papers he wants. I have them right here in this briefcase. Say, so where is he? I'll give them to him. He's up in your room. 
Up in my room? Yes, when he couldn't find the papers in the study, he went upstairs to see if they were in your desk. In my desk? Yes. Terry, is anything wrong? I don't know. Let me see. Did I lock my desk this morning before I left for the office, or didn't I? What difference does it make? What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. If he should... You seem to be quite upset, Jerry. Is it because you were afraid I found your desk unlocked that I might come across these? So, you found them, huh? Yes. What do you have there, John? Merely some newspaper clippings, Vivian. Allow me to read you a couple. The first one is dated five years ago, and it's from a New Orleans paper. Underneath a picture of Jerry and you, it reads, Mr. and Mrs. Philip Gordon, (gasps) arrested for $10,000 jewelry theft at Mardi Gras party. Where did you get that clipping? I found it, along with several others in Jerry's, or should I say Philip's desk. Allow me to read you another clipping. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Gordon, who pleaded guilty to the $10,000 Mardi Gras jewel theft, were today sentenced to prison by Judge Sawyer. Philip Gordon received a sentence of three to five... I don't want to hear any more. Stop it, do you hear? It was very clever of you two to pretend to be brother and sister when actually you were man and wife. No doubt sometime in the future, Vivian was to divorce me and receive a handsome cash settlement. Yes, that's right. We had planned that. But our plans seem to have been spoiled. What do you intend doing? I'm not going to Chicago tomorrow morning. Instead, I'm going to see my attorney and prosecute you both to the full extent of the law. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Yes, John, think of your reputation and your family name. They'd be dragged in the mud if this ever came out. You wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? You think you can blackmail me into silence, don't you? No, you're wrong. Come what may, I'm going to see to it that you're both punished. I... uh, Jerry, he seems uh, ill. Yes, he does, doesn't he? Uh, I'm perfectly all right. I think we've said everything that's to be said. I'm through with words now. First thing in the morning, I'm going to see my attorney and have you both exposed. You're going to learn you you made a fool of the wrong man. To continue the story, you only die once, as it is written in the sealed book. After John had gone to bed, Jerry silently paced up and down the drawing room, trying to figure a way out of their dilemma. Vivian watched him anxiously, her face pale and drawn. If John goes to his attorney in the morning, it'll mean stiff prison sentences for the two of us. You can be sure of that. Jerry, I couldn't stand going to prison again. To be separated from you, it... If they send me to prison, I, I'll die. You know how I feel, darling? The same way. There's only one way out. One way out? Yes. We must see to it that John doesn't go to his attorney in the morning. Jerry, you don't mean... Oh, no, Jerry, no. We don't get rid of him. It'll mean prison. Do you prefer that? Oh, no, no, but I'm so afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. I have a scheme, a scheme that can't miss if we play our cards right. Are you sure? Positive. The best thing about it is its simplicity. What is this scheme of yours? John's gun is in that desk over there. I'll use it to get rid of him. 
Once that's done, you and I will carry him down to the boathouse. To the boathouse? Yes. There I'll fasten some weights securely to the body. Then we'll take him out in the launch to the deepest part of the river and drop him in. The weights will take him to the bottom and keep him there. But, Jerry, in a few days they'll start looking for him. They'll drag the river. They'll start looking for him, but they won't drag the river. For as far as the police are concerned, John will have gone to Chicago. But, but how are you going to make them believe that? It's very simple. I have here John's ticket on the 6.30 train tomorrow morning for Chicago. After we've disposed of the body, you'll drive me to Grand Central Station, where I'll board the train as John Winthrop. Oh, but Jerry, you could never pass as John. You're, you're so much younger. Nonsense. John and I are about the same height and build. If I were to wear John's glasses and a false mustache, in the early morning light, no one would notice the difference. You wouldn't actually go to Chicago, would you? Of course not. After I'd made sure that I was seen by the conductor and the porter at the station, I'd, uh, I'd secretly slip off the train at the first stop. Oh, I see. A few days later, we'd notify the police that John had gone to Chicago, and we were worried as we hadn't heard from him. They'd naturally check to see if he'd taken the train. The uh, conductor and porter would satisfy them on that score. The police would begin a nationwide search... But, darling, they'll ask questions, hundreds of questions. All we have to say is that you drove John to Grand Central Station and watched him leave on the train to Chicago. Stick to that story and we're safe, do you understand? Oh, yes, Jerry. Remember, that's all you know. John got the 6.30 train for Chicago. And that was the last you saw of him. All right, darling. I I won't slip up. That's the spirit. Now, it's just 11 o'clock. We'll wait two hours to give John a chance to fall asleep. At one o'clock, we'll go up to his room and do what must be done. You all set, Vivian? Yes. I'll open the door. Quiet now. He's sound asleep. Yes. Just hold that flashlight steady. Hurry, darling, hurry. Steady, Vivian. <coughs> Quiet. Well, it's all over. Jerry, is, is he dead? Yes. He never knew what happened. Why, well, I'm glad he didn't wake up. I'm so glad he was sound asleep. Now, you pick him up by the feet while I get him under the shoulders. The next stop for John is the boathouse. <laughs> Just about 50 yards from here, Jerry. Then that's the place for us. Cut the motor when we reach it. We're just about there, Jerry. I'll cut the engine and we'll drift the rest of the way. You'll have to give me a hand with him, Vivian. With these weights around him, he's quite heavy. All right. What do you want me to do? You take his feet while I take him by the shoulders. When I give the word, we'll both lift and toss him over the side. You ready? Yes. Then lift. Jerry, he's so heavy. Just a little more. That's it. Now, I drop him. Well, darling, that's the last of Mr. John Winthrop. Now we'd better be getting back to shore. There's still quite a bit that remains to be done. Pull down and you collar up, Jerry. Right. Uh, pardon me, conductor, but can you tell me where my compartment is? Uh, the name is Winthrop. John Winthrop. Uh, you have your ticket, Mr. Winthrop? Uh, you have it, don't you, darling? Oh, yes, here it is, conductor. Now, let's see. Car 3476. That's this car right here. You just go aboard. The porter will show you the open compartment. Thank you, conductor. That's quite all right, Mr. Winthrop. I think we can count on him to remember I got on this train. I'll pick you up at the 125th Street station. Right. I'll wait there till you arrive. Goodbye, John. Take care of yourself. I will, Vivian. I'll phone you tomorrow night from Chicago. Don't forget, John. I won't. Bye. Here I am, Jerry. Come on. Let's get in the car and away from here. All right. Everything go all right? Perfectly. 
After the train pulled out of Grand Central, I had the porter show me to my compartment. I told him I hadn't slept for 24 hours, and I, uh, I didn't want to be disturbed until we reached Chicago. You didn't forget to give him a tip, did you? No. I gave him a $5 tip, just as we'd planned. Don't worry, that porter will remember me. Good. You're certain no one saw you slip off the train just now? Well, I'm positive. I just I took off my disguise before I left the compartment. Everything's working out just as I planned. All we have to do is sit tight for a few days. Then why are the men in Chicago who had appointments with John? When they tell us that John never kept his appointments, we'll get in touch with the police. And with tears in your eyes, you'll beg the police to find your uh, missing husband. <laughs> Continue the story. You only die once, as it is written in the sealed book. Following Jerry's plan, two days after John's death, Vivian notified the police that her husband was missing. Shortly afterwards, she was called on by Lieutenant Richards of the Missing Persons Bureau. You say, Mrs. Winthrop, the last you saw of your husband was when he boarded the train for Chicago? Yes, Lieutenant. I waved to him as the train pulled out of the station... That was the last time I saw him. A week passed, and then two. But the police found no trace of John Winthrop. It was as though he had vanished off the face of the earth after he had boarded the train for Chicago. The noted financier was reported seen in half a dozen cities all over the country, but... Each report turned out to be false. The newspapers played up the strange disappearance of John Winthrop, but but after he had been missing a week, the story lost its interest for the public and was quickly forgotten. When two weeks had passed, Jerry took Vivian, who was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, away for a rest. Making no secret of their destination, they went to John's Mountain Lodge, high on the Adirondacks. Would you like a cocktail, Vivian? Yes, Jerry. Oh, darling, isn't it wonderful being up here, just the two of us? It lacks only one thing to be perfect, music. Let there be music and let the wine flow freely. (laughs) I'll turn on the radio. Here's looking at you, baby. And here's to our good luck. May we always have it. (laughs) Oh, we're sitting pretty. Someday the police are going to give up looking for John. And then you're going to become a very, very wealthy widow. You really think so, Jerry? Yeah, of course. Naturally, it'll take time, but... Uh... We interrupt this program to bring you a special news report. At 10, 20, 35 this morning, New York Harbor Police found the body of the missing financier, John Winthrop, <gasps> in the Hudson River off 54th Street. The dead man had been shot in the head, and the police believe he was murdered. They are looking for his wife, Mrs. Vivian Winthrop, and Jerome Norton, her brother, for questioning. For further details, listen in on our regular news period at... Jerry... How could they have found him? How could they? I tied those weights securely. 
But somehow the body must have slipped out of the ropes and come to the surface. Jerry, what are we going to do? You heard what that announcer said. The police are looking for us. Yes, I know. Once they take our fingerprints, it'll be the end. They'll learn about New Orleans and that, that we aren't brother and sister. Well, Jerry, we just can't stay here. We've got to run for it before they catch us. Run? Where can we run oh, to? Oh, I don't know. Mexico, South America, any place. We have my jewels. They're worth over $100,000. Yes, but what good are they? What we need is cash, and all I have with me is $300. We don't dare go to your bank. They pick us up immediately. Oh, I'm sure that someplace we'll be able to sell my jewelry. I'll pack my things at once. Vivian, there's no sense in running away. How far do you think we'd get? The police are probably on their way here already. Jerry, what's wrong with you? We've got to run away. There's no other way out. There is another way out. If we're willing to take it. What way is that? The easiest and simplest way out of all troubles, darling. Suicide? Oh, no, Jerry, no. Would you rather go to the chair? Or even worse, be sentenced to life imprisonment? Life imprisonment? Oh, no, I couldn't stand that. Don't you see, darling, we have no choice. We're gamblers who played for high stakes and, and lost. Oh, Jerry, I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. It's better than rotting behind bars for the rest of our lives. Don't you agree with me, darling? Oh, I know you're right, Jerry, but I don't want to die. I want to live. So do I, Vivian, but... Do you hear sirens? Jerry, the police, they're here already. Yes, Police car and two motorcycle police are coming up the road. They'll be here in a minute or two. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, what are we going to do? We have the choice of going back with them and standing trial for murder. Or the other. You know what my choice is. Uh, how are you going to do it? Poison tablets. I have them here. I carry them a long time against just such a moment as this. Will, will we suffer much? No, darling. A moment or two, then it will be all over. The police are almost here. We haven't much time. All right, Jerry. Uh, now you're being the good loser that I always knew you were. Here's a tablet for you, darling. And one for me. Will one be enough? Yes, yeah, more than enough. Don't be afraid, Vivian. Do it quickly without thinking about it. Here, here, I'll take mine first. There. Now, you take yours. All right, Jerry. That's it. There. Yeah, that wasn't so hard, was it? No. Well, darling, they're here. But nothing they can do or say can matter to us anymore. We've beaten them, do you understand? They can't touch us. Yes, Jerry. I'll let them in now. Hello, Lieutenant. Come in, come in. You remember Mrs. Winthrop, don't you? You can stop the acting, Norton. Or should I say Gordon? We know who you and Mrs. Winthrop are. Oh, so you've already found out, huh? Yes. We did some fast checking this morning after Winthrop's body was fished out of the harbor. I'm going to have to take you both back to headquarters. I'm afraid you're a little late, Lieutenant. A little late? Yes. You see, a minute or so before you arrived, my wife and I took poison tablets. Huh? In a very little while, we'll both be well out of your reach. Brogan, get the first aid kit from the squad car. Yes, sir. You're wasting your time, Lieutenant. You're never going to send us to prison for John Winthrop's murder? Murder? We don't want you for Winthrop's murder. You don't want us for John's murder? No, for the simple reason he wasn't murdered. What, what are you saying? I shot and killed him myself. You only think you did. An autopsy this morning showed that John Winthrop died of heart failure. All you did was put a bullet into a corpse about an hour later. You mean... You mean he was already dead... Dead when I shot him? Yes, that's right. Lieutenant, help us. Don't let us... Jerry, I, I can't breathe. Oh. I, help me. I... Oh. Lieutenant, Lieutenant, don't let us die. Save us. Save us. Don't let us... Lieutenant, get the first aid kit. It's too late, Grogan. You mean they're dead? Yes. The chief only wanted them for questioning, but if ever two people deserved to die, they did. There was murder in their hearts. Yet I'll be doggone if the law would have been able to do anything to them. We couldn't have held them for murder. Yeah. That's right. It would have been hard to make a charge of bigamy stick with Winthrop dead. I guess about the only thing we could have held them for was mutilation and illegal transportation of a corpse. Yes, uh, justice sure has a strange way of working itself out. And so ends the tale. You only die once, as it is written in the sealed book. The uncanny hand of fate 
reached out for the two who had ruthlessly planned the death of an innocent man and doomed them to die through their own actions. Keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. A weird and magic tale of a strange life and an even stranger death. And of a murder terrible beyond all belief. sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Let every ghost signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program, bringing you another strange tale by The Whistler. Tonight, the story of a weird game of murder, of a threat which brought the deadly answer, not if I kill you first. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Joe Jager's signal gasoline station in Oakland, California. It's busy as a beehive, hours before most alarm clocks begin to jingle. Joe opens his signal station at the cold gray hour of 4.45 to get ready for early morning defense workers. Because, as Joe puts it, their jobs are helping win the war, and I'm glad to serve them. During the day, Joe finds time for another unusual service. Many servicemen's families don't have cameras, so with his fine speed graphic... Joe takes pictures of them for mailing to their men overseas. Well, we can't expect all signal dealers to open at 4.45 and take pictures for servicemen, as Joe Jager does. But every signal dealer has his own way of delivering extra services, even these days. That's because signal gasoline dealers don't operate just for today. With them, serving you is their permanent business and will be through years to come. They know your car needs even better service today, when it must last out the duration and parts are hard to get. That's why friendly signal dealers give the thorough, conscientious kind of service you can depend on. And that's why more and more drivers are finding out that to make your present car go farther, a mighty good man to know is your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, The Whistler. You 
probably didn't notice the item in your morning paper. It wasn't very prominent. Just a squib on the sixth page about another jewel robbery. $50,000 in sparklers missing from one of the homes out on the hill. Not much of a story because there doesn't seem to be any mystery about it. As the chief of detectives told the reporters, Simple as ABC. We knew it was in, an inside job because there's no sign of forced entry. Whoever did it got in the house with an ordinary house key. And not only that, but we found a screwdriver under a chair. It matched up with the marks on the jewel drawer where he jimmied it open. And that screwdriver came out of one of the family cars. So we start looking around. There's a maid, cook, chauffeur gardener. We look up their records, found out this chauffeur is an ex-con. Served two terms for burglary. And there you are. He wasn't very smart. Yes, it was very simple, wasn't it, officer? It makes no difference that the ex-con turned chauffeur swore he had nothing to do with it. Swore to you he's been trying to go straight. No, you're convinced. Only maybe if you knew what I do, officer, you might not be so certain. If you could see the little room over on First Avenue where young, tough Sammy Copeland is waiting for a business partner, pacing the floor, peeking out around a drawn blind, getting nervous. Maybe you'd be interested in the conversation when his business partner arrives. Albert Easley, cheap, dapper, and proud of it. Okay, Sammy, relax. All right, it took you long enough. Where you been? I said relax. You're in the big time now. You can't just dump $50,000 in hot rocks like your pawn a watch. It takes a little time, some diplomacy. You have to sit down and chat with the fence a while. I'll be sociable. Here, pull up a chair. Nuts. The main thing is, did you get it? It's all here. Right in the briefcase. How do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, look at it. 50,000 clams. 50,000? Shows you're inexperienced, son. There's only 30,000 here. 30? But you said those rocks was worth 50. The paper this morning Sure, said sure, that... sure. But you don't think a fence will give you the full value on hot rocks? He's taking a risk, too. He's got to have some profit. We got 30 for him. Oh, yeah? How do I know that? What do you mean? I mean, how do I know you ain't got the other 20 catched out somewhere? Listen, Squirt, you trust me. See, that's how you know. Now, relax, like I said, and be a good boy. You got nothing to worry about as long as you stick with me. Now I'll count out your 15,000. I want more than that. I want 25. What? And leave me only five? That's a fine way to treat a partner. I don't care about you. I want what's coming to me. You'll get it and no more. We split this 50-50. Well, why should we... Why should you get half? I did the job. I went in and got the stuff. I took all the risk. All you did was sit here and wait for me. Is that so? All I did is sit here and wait for you? Why, you runny-nosed little brat. Who do you think does your thinking for you? How far do you think you'd give that stupid brain of yours? I don't need you. No? How much of this 30000 do you think you'd have now if it wasn't for me? I'll tell you, not one cent. Who found out about the jewels in the first place? Me! Who cased the joint and found out about the chauffeur being the next con? Who swiped his screwdriver to plant on the scene? Who figured out every angle to make this one of the neatest jobs ever pulled in this burg? Now, you'd be so stinking hot with the police right now if it hadn't been for me. You'd never even be able to cash the rocks in. And now don't give me any more of this stuff. Now, listen, Easley. I'm sick of you playing a big shot. Maybe you did do all the thinking up to now. But maybe now it's my turn. I've taken 25 of that pile, and you ain't got nothing to say about it. Why, you... Well, you little rat. You'd pull a rod on me. Yeah. And I know how to use it, big shot. Now get counting. Twenty-five for me, five for you. How do you like that? Is that a way to treat a pal, Sammy? I'm no pal of yours, big shot. I can take care of myself. Okay, okay. It's twenty-five for you and five for me. Only if you're so smart. Why not take the whole thing? I might do that. Okay, then here, take it. Hey, what the... Now drop that rod. <laughs> That's better. I'll just keep this little rod for souvenir. Oh, you dirt. Yes, that'll teach you not to play rough with Albert Easley. You see, Sonny, you're not as smart as you thought. I'm always just a little bit smarter. Now get up and beat it. Go on. What about my money? Oh, you're so impulsive. I don't think you better have so much money around loose, Sammy. Maybe I better keep it for you. Until you grow up a little. Come around sometime when you've learned not to be a double-crossing baby. I'll kill you, Weasley. So help me, I'll kill you. Sure, sure. I'm scared to death. You will be before I'm through, I promise you. Okay, okay, we'll get going before I take you over my knees. You better order your flowers now, Big Shot. Because I'll get you if it's the last thing I do. 
Okay, go ahead and try it, Sammy. But just remember, two can play that game. I could plug you now if I felt like it. But I'll outsmart you at that game, too. We'll see about that. Just remember, Easley, I'm going to kill you. Not if I kill you first, Sammy. Okay, fair enough. So long, Easley. Pleasant dreams. Well, now, a pleasant pair, don't you think? The kind who make a game of murder and may the best man win. Winner gets the 30 G's. Loser gets six feet of mud in his face. But then Albert the Big Shot isn't worried yet. Maybe he didn't take Sammy seriously at first. But then that afternoon, Even something Harold, happened. Harold, paper, allies, Vance on Rhine, read all about it, paper. Well, hello there, Sonny, I'll have one. Well, hi, Mr. Easley. Here you are. Thanks, honey. Well, keep the chain. Good night. Gee, thanks, Mr. Easley. Hey, Mr. Easley, look out, look out. Jiminy, Mr. Easley. That was a close one. That guy looked like he was almost trying to hit you. Yeah. Yes, he wasn't fooling. Huh? Uh, thanks, honey, for yelling at me. Guess I'll have to be more careful crossing streets after this. Yes. Now you realize this is a pretty deadly game you're playing, don't you, Albert? You know it's just possible this kid Sammy might outsmart you. He might get you. He may get sent up for it. But he'll stalk you through the streets like an animal until he gets his chance. Yes, maybe you better figure something out, Albert. Do a little thinking about it. Talk it over with somebody. Dolores, maybe. She can keep your secrets okay, as long as you're spending the heavy sugar on her. Sure, talk it over. I'm not worried, you understand. Yeah, I can see that. I'm not a common gunman. I live by my brain. Albert, stop pacing up and down. You're getting yourself all upset. Besides, it's four in the morning and I have to go home. Upset? Well, who wouldn't be upset? Everywhere I go, the guy's on my tail. I can't go out in the street as I've been waiting in the doorway. Go to my favorite restaurant, I see him sitting there through the window waiting for me. He's everywhere. You're afraid of him, aren't you? Afraid? No, I'm not afraid of him. Okay, so you're not afraid of him. Why not let me go get some tickets to Miami? You need the rest. No, I'm staying here. And get this straight. I'm not afraid of him. Maybe he is out to get me. So what? He's not smart enough. Look at that car trick. That's stupid. He's not going to get me with tricks like that. I've got nothing to worry about. Okay. Now, how about taking me home? It's too late. I need some sleep. You'll take my car. The keys are there on the table. <laughs> okay, Sir Lancelot. But don't forget, you're no safer right here than you would be taking me home. Shut up. Okay. Okay, sugar. I'm just kidding. I don't suppose you can spare the time to see me to your penthouse door. You know the way. That's what I thought. Well... My mother told me there'd be nights like this. Anyway... Wait a minute. What is it now? Shut up. You hear anything? Hear anything now? What? Well, I don't know. It's just noise. No, he's hearing things. Shut up. There. Oh, yeah, I did hear something. What was it? How should I know? But there's somebody up here on the roof outside my apartment. Oh, maybe it's only the wind. The wind. Listen. Yeah. There's somebody walking around out there. Turn up that light. Hurry. Okay. Quiet. Don't move. Sugar. I, I see it. A shadow on the window. He's at the door. He's trying to open it. I'll get him. All right, put up your hands. Don't. Oh, please, please, don't shoot. Don't shoot. It's me, O'Brien, the night janitor. O'Brien? Yes. Turn on the lights, Dolores. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's me, Mr. Easley. Oh, for the love of heaven, don't shoot. Ryan, what are you doing up here? Well, somebody left a skylight open, and I come up to shut it. I, I saw a light here, and then it went off, and I just thought I'd better try your door to see nobody get in. I I didn't mean to frighten you, Mr. Easley. It's all right, O'Brien, it's all right. Go on, forget about it. Here's a little something for your trouble. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. O'Brien the janitor. <laughs> you see, we've been worried about shadows. Well, maybe you can laugh, but I've got the jit as good. I need a drink. Okay, you know where to find it. I'm going to bed. O'Brien. <laughs> I should have known. Sammy's not smart enough to try to get me here in the apartment. Hey, don't you want to join me in a drink? Before? No, no, thanks. This bedroom's the last stop for me tonight. <laughs> I think I'm going to get the best night's sleep I've had in a long time. You know, Dolores, I'd be... Dolores, come here. Where are you? Oh, in the bedroom. 
Well, what's the matter? What do you just stand there for? Well, oh, the bed. <gasps> Albert. What is it? A knife. Big enough to split a skull. A knife? What's it doing sticking in your bed? It was thrown there, probably through that window. Somebody who thought I'd be there. Asleep. Sammy. That's why the skylight was open. He came up here. Yes. There's no imagining this. Sammy wasn't kidding. He wasn't kidding. He... Oh, it got me. Yeah. And you're not afraid, are you, sugar? <laughs> You are listening to the Signal Oil Program. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Now you know, don't you, Albert? There's no telling yourself it might not have been Sammy. You know now that he does mean to kill you. Unless you can kill him first. And now you've got to think. Think hard to figure out a way to outwit him. You won't have much time. Maybe his next attempt will be more successful. And it might come any time. Any time. Who's there? It's me, Dolores. Okay. Got this place closed up tighter than a jail. Why not open a few windows? It's stuffy. Never mind. I like it this way. Okay, but in broad daylight... I said I like it this way. Okay, don't snap at me. I brought your paper. Figured you wouldn't want to walk down the corner for it. Thanks. I was down at the station today. Priced two tickets to Miami. We can get reservations Thursday. I said I wasn't going anyway. Okay, no harm in just pricing tickets, is there? Bring cigarettes? Yeah. Right here. Oh... While I was down there in the district around the station, a very funny thing happened. I thought I saw you. Very funny. You know I've been here all day. I know, I know, but that's why it was so funny. This guy looked exactly like you. What? He fooled even me. I walked right up to him and said, Well, Sugar, what are you doing down here? And then I see by the way he looks at me, it wasn't you at all. It was some other guy. Oh. <laughs> you got a double running around town. Very funny. Think what a mistake a girl could make in a situation like hey, that. Hey, hey, wait a minute. You're not exaggerating, Dolores. You mean this guy really could have been me? Fooled you completely? I went right up to him and spoke to him. I don't know what he could have thought of me, but I nearly slapped his face for the look he gave me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that gives me an idea. What's the idea I've been waiting for? It's made to order. What do you mean? Well, don't you get it? I got a double. There's two Albert Easleys. Well, that's what I've been telling you, Sugar. Only his name isn't Albert Easley. It's Parker. Parker. I heard the fruit man on the corner say good afternoon, Mr. Parker, to him when he went by. Oh, darling, it's perfect. A perfect alibi. I don't get it. Oh, never mind now. Say, where did you see him? Down on 14th Street near the station. And he seemed to be known around there? Well, the fruit man said... Okay, okay, baby, take it easy. I'll be back sometime this afternoon. Where are you going? Down to 14th Street to look up an alibi. <laughs> Now, this is more like it, Albert. Now you've got an idea. That brain of yours is going full tilt, and you've got a feeling you're just about to outsmart Sammy, but good. You're down on 14th Street, passing the fruit stand when... Hello there, Mr. Parker. Can I sell you some nice fruit today? I beg your pardon? Oh, we got us some nice apples. The kind that you like. I, uh, I thought you called me Mr. Parker. Why, sure. What else should I call you? Well, my name's not Parker. Hmm. Say, wait a minute. You are not the Mr. Parker, are you? No. You talk like him, a little older, maybe. And you sure look like him. A dead ring. Only your suit is a different. You mean I've got a double around oh, here? Well, you sure I have a mister. Bill Parker. He lives right down the street there in Mrs. Humphrey's boarding house. Uh, you sure you ain't the, his twin brother? Well, I'm afraid not. You see, I haven't got a brother. But, you know, I I'd certainly like to see this guy you... Suppose he's home now? No, I'm a pretty sure he's a not. He always goes down to the theater district in the afternoon. He's an actor. Uh, between the engagements, you might say. Oh, I see. Well, thanks a lot. Maybe I'll look up this Bill Parker. I'd, I'd like to see a guy who looks just like me. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, you look him up all right, Albert. You hang around his street all day watching for him. Finally, he comes home and you get a good look at him from across the street. But it's not enough. You're there the next day when he goes out and again when he comes back. And the next day, you notice everything about him. It's easy to find out how he talks. Just question some of the people along the street. People who are surprised that you're not Parker. Then to make doubly sure, you take the final step. Try it once. Oh, Mr. Parker, you're back early. Oh, just for a minute, Mrs. Humphreys. I forgot something. Run up to my room for a second. Well, here you're forgetting your key. What? Oh, yes. I, I forgot I left it with you. Well, Mr. Parker, you are. Always leave it with me. Uh, what? Oh, yes, so I do. Uh, uh, did you get to see Mr. Silver, the producer? No, not yet. Oh, dear, I do hope he'll see you. I know how much you're counting on that part, Mr. Parker, and we're all pulling for you. Sure, and I lit a candle for you this morning. Thank you, Mrs. Humphrey. <laughs> so it's sure to happen today, and you won't forget dinner tonight. We're going to have pot roast. But, Mrs. Humphreys, I... No buts about it. You've got to get some meat on your bones. One hot meal a week isn't too much. We'll be expecting you at six now, Mr. Parker. All right. Hmm. <laughs> it's a cinch. A cinch, sure. Even his landlady, who sees him every day, didn't suspect you weren't Parker. A few minutes in his room, and now you're ready. You get Dolores and give her the setup. It's bound to work. It's beautiful. A perfect alibi. Look, Sam is going to be at Charlie's Club tonight. I plug him on the data eight, and at exactly the same time, Albert Easley walks into the Hotel Commodore five miles away. Only it isn't Albert Easley. That's right. It's Bill Parker. Well, nobody's going to know that. Hey, one thing. How do you get Parker to show up at the Hotel Commodore on the dot of eight? That's where you fit in, baby. Oh? See, this Parker's an actor. Trying to get a part from him. Mr. Silver. It's his only chance. He's been starving to death. Okay, you get on the phone. Call Mrs. Humphreys. Tell her to have Parker at the Hotel Commodore on the dot of eight to see Mr. Silver in his room about the part in his new play. Your silver secretary. But don't worry about Parker. He'll show up okay. <laughs> Been trying to see Silver for a week. Oh, I get it. But what happens when he shows up there and there's no Mr. Silver? Well, he just figures somebody made a mistake. Maybe try some other hotels. But the desk clerk will remember what he looks like and when he came in. He'll identify me when the cops ask him and Parker will never let me about it. Sounds pretty good. It's foolproof. I thought of every angle. I even went through his closet and... And, and bought suits that look just like his. Uh, I'll have them in my wardrobe so one of them will check with Parker's description at the hotel. Oh, baby, I figured everything out. Nothing can go wrong. Yeah. Maybe you're smarter than I thought. Smarter than Sammy thought. And all I got to do is call this guy on the phone, huh? That's all. Then tonight, a few minutes before 8, you take my car, park it in a red zone in front of the Commodore, and get out quick without anybody seeing you. In a red zone? But you'll get a ticket. Oh, dear, that's just the idea. At 8 o'clock, the cop on the corner makes his last checkup on parked cars. I checked up on that. After I plug Sammy, I race uptown in a cab, pick up the car, have a traffic ticket in my pocket, date at 8 o'clock in front of the Commodore. <laughs> just another piece of my alibi. That's pretty clever. Sure, that's what I've been telling you. Albert Easley is a smart guy, a very smart guy. Yes, you're a smart guy, all right, Albert. It's all figured out. Dolores makes the call. Parker will be there. She drops you down near Charlie's club and goes on to park the car. You sneak in the back way, up the hall. The door's ajar. There's Sammy, sitting there, half-facing you. He's grinning about something, looking satisfied. You'll soon fix that. Yes, you wiped the grin off his face, and nobody saw you. You're out the back way before anybody has the sense to look for you. Into a cab, hurrying uptown, to the Commodore. Yes, there's your car. And even before you get to it, you can see the traffic ticket fluttering from the windshield. Everything's okay. It's perfect. Yes, perfect. You're home now, in your dressing gown. The traffic ticket on the table. The suits that look like Parker's hanging in the closet. You're just waiting for the cops. And you don't have long to wait. Yes? Uh, you Albert Easley? Yeah. I'm from headquarters. Oh, come in. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay, go ahead. Now, uh, where were you tonight around eight? Eight to... 
Why, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, it must have been just about eight when I stopped in the Commodore to see a friend. What was his name? Uh, Mr. Silver. Well, you know, funny thing, he wasn't registered there. I'd be missing Pawn. You can prove that? Of course. Yes, I thoughtlessly parked in a red zone outside the hotel and got a ticket. There it is on the table. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, this proves your car was there. What about you? Well, the desk clerk will remember me, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see about that. In the meantime, you'd better come along with me easily. If what you say checks, you'll probably be okay. If not, you might be held on suspicion of murder. So far, so good. Just what you expected, wasn't it, Albert? The detective takes a look at your suits before you go, questions you as to what you had on. You can't remember uh, one of those in there. So no matter what Parker was wearing, it'll check. Then down at headquarters, you parry all the questions and insist that the desk clerk be brought in to identify you. Finally, he is. Okay. Now, this is Mr. Arnold, the clerk who was on duty at the Hotel Commodore at 8 o'clock this evening. Now, uh, do you recognize this man, Mr. Arnold? No, I, I never saw him before. What? Don't you remember? I came in and asked you for Mr. Silver tonight at 8. Nobody resembling you came in tonight and asked for Mr. Silver. Sure, I'd remember that, but no one did. Huh? Oh, you... You you must be mistaken. No, I, I'm sure I'm not. I've never seen this man or anyone who looks like him. In a moment, the whistler will be back to tell you what really happened to the perfect alibi. Meantime, I'd like to pass along some facts I just found out on the battery situation. Did you know that last winter, so many batteries needed replacing, the demand for new batteries actually exceeded the supply by 25%? Yes, and this year, the demand is likely to be even greater. All cars are a year older, and ration driving is tough on batteries. What's more, with our motorized armies advancing at full speed, the military's demand for batteries will reach an all-time high. Now, I'm no crystal gazer, so I can't predict whether this winter's supply of batteries will be enough to go around. But I do know that your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer has just received a fresh stock of top-quality batteries built to signal's rigid specifications for longer service. Batteries so fine, they're fully guaranteed up to two years. In my way of thinking... That makes right now the time to have your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer inspect your battery. Then, if you need a new one, you can be sure of getting one of those guaranteed quality signal deluxe batteries. And now, back to the whistler. And so Albert Easley wasn't as smart as he thought he was. The perfect alibi blew up somehow. And now he's going to stand trial for the murder of Sammy Copeland. Sitting in his cell, going over every detail, he can't figure out what happened, what could have gone wrong. He has only one satisfaction now. At least he outsmarted Sammy. He got Sammy before the kid could get him. Or did he? You see, Albert, that's the part you don't know about. That's why your alibi failed you. Because Sammy did get you first. When you shot him at 8 o'clock, you interrupted his celebration of your death. Yours, Albert. Only it wasn't yours at all. The police might have told you that they found the body of a man that night. A man who looked enough like you to have been your twin brother. His name was Parker. Bill Parker. And your mistake was in not realizing that if you accidentally ran across him, Sammy might too. Only Sammy didn't look too closely. He simply unloaded that rod of his. And that's why your alibi didn't show up. Yes, you were pretty smart, Albert. But sometimes the smart ones have to pay off, too. And Sammy got you after all.
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil program will bring you another strange tale by the Whistler. The Signal Oil program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil. And by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Everett Hudson and music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bill Pennell speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Our tale is a blood-freezing story inspired by a nursery rhyme, a sweet, simple song. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of poses, achoo, achoo, we all fall down. It sounds young and innocent, doesn't it? But it is very old and very sinister. For the ring-a-ring of roses were the splotches that first appeared on the faces of those afflicted during the Black Plague. The pocketful of poses were the herbs that were carried, hopefully to ward off the fatal disease. The sneezing sounds, achoo, achoo, were the sounds of the final spasms. And we all fall down was, well... You can guess. Our mystery drama, A Ring of Roses, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by S.J. Wilson and stars Glynis O'Connor. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Science has brought most plagues under control, but not so those other epidemics of the past, those that plague us with their unseen, unknown, and unexpected terrors. And such is the tale of terror you are about to hear. Draw close to the guttering candle, for you will receive no warmth from a ring of roses. You know, George, I've heard about this place so often from Helena. I'm just dying to see her home. And I'm anxious to meet your friend Helena. Oh, I'm sure you'll like her. But will she like me, taking her best friend away from her? Come on, George. (laughs) You know you're irresistible. (laughs) Why do you think I'm going to marry you? Well, for one thing, my beautiful, exquisite, enormous pots of money... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, George, wait. Uh, Look, stop. Lori, get your hands off the wheel. What do you think you're trying to do? But we passed it. It's the sign to the house back there. Now, Lori. Lori, I never want you to do that again. I'm not going to let missing a sign risk your getting hurt. You understand? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have grabbed the wheel that way. All right, forget it. But please, never again, ever... And that is supposed to be the sign? Helena warned that we might miss it. 
Well, why would anyone use a rose-colored stone in a brass oval with no name or any identification on it for a house sign? Well, their name is Roston. And Helena said that generations back when their family first moved to America, it was rose stone. And so they put up a rose stone. <laughs> well, if they want people to get that meaning from it, they either enjoy guessing games or, more likely, just want to keep themselves very, very private. Yes. Guess what? As you said, they, they are very private. Well, I got that impression before we got here. And I also have the feeling that they're not very friendly either. Oh, how can you say that? When Helena's mother especially invited us over because she personally wanted to give us our engagement gift. Yes, and that's pretty peculiar too. How? How many parties, I mean showers, did your girlfriends give you? Four, right? No, three. The last one was a dinner. All right, and Helena was invited to every one, but she... I know, George. She didn't turn up for any of them. You know, Laurie, I've never seen you so wound up. What's spinning around in that pretty head of yours? Well, I, I don't know, but... Well, I am on edge. About what? I, I guess about meeting Helena's mother. You see, she, she's so strange. She seems so powerful and so terribly uncompromising. I was trying to change things for Helena, and, and then I let her down by becoming engaged to you. Well, now, don't tell me you weren't going to marry for poor Helena's sake. Well, at least not until she married first. We were going to share an apartment together in the city. You know what I'm going to do, Laurie? I am going to turn this car right around and head back to the city. This whole trip is more foolish than funny. Oh, no, George. Please don't. Hey, what's that? You hear something like, like, like singing? Let me open the window. It's a woman singing that old nursery rhyme. A two. We all fall down. But what's that snapping ring, sound? Ring, it sounds it's like a piece of leather. It sounds like a whip. George, what are you doing? I'm getting out. Something's happening here that I don't, don't like. Don't open the door. Please don't. We'll go back if you want to. I'll be right back. Keep the window shut and the door's locked. No, don't leave me, George. I'm coming with you. Wait. Okay, but stay close to me. Ring a ring of roses. Oh, it seems to be coming from behind those hedges. You know, it could be just kids playing games. If that voice is coming from a kid, he's using a bullhorn. Let's stop here. We might see through the hedge. Please be careful. Holy Toledo. Look at that. Let me see. That man. The old man with the beard. He's trying to catch the girl with his whip. Well, she's teasing him. She's making fun of him. If he lands that wagon whip on her, he'll split her face open. Look at their clothes, George. They're dressed like settlers. Back in the early 1800s. Yeah. You know, they could be rehearsing a play. If they are, he's lost his mind and his part. That man's going wild with that whip. But she's provoking him. Why doesn't she stop? Hey! Hey, you there! What are you two doing? Oh, George, you shouldn't have done that. And who is it who is ordering me and questioning me? I am. Over here. That's a terrible thing you're doing. Oh, George, please don't go in there. They know we're here. We must meet them. That's a dangerous whip you're using. That young woman can be killed by it. I see by your clothes you are a stranger. And I can also see that you are a kind human who wishes no harm to come to another. But this, this wench is my daughter. And what I am doing is the true way to gain the obedience of a child who will stray. But what in heaven could she have done to deserve being whipped? I did no harm to no person or to him. I have broken no law of God or man. Strumpet, hold your witch's tongue. Believe me, young woman, when I tell you that she has the demon in her, playing and wenching with the young master who owns this land. While I'm out here working at clearing their forest lands, 
She's up there in the great house with her enticements and tricks and enchantments. And if it has already come to this, that he has given her a gift for favors promised or already bestowed, the gift of a ring, an already cursed ring. He gave it to me fair and with the holy vow that he will marry me in the month of the next full moon. Marry you, Willie. You who can have fair to read and write. You who are lower than his mother's kitchen scullion. You give me that ring. I won't. I swear by the name and the soul of my sainted mother that you will never get this ring. Then until I do, though it mean your own death, you get the whip. Stop it! Oh. Don't! Why can't you be a little more reasonable? She may be telling you the truth. I am. I swear it on my dead mother's Bible, I am. Well, then, if you are, why don't you give him the ring and let your young man personally tell your father of his plan? No! No, he'll do no thing like that. He'll bury the ring in some secret spot and drag me away before the fall of night. For he doesn't want me to marry, to no one but to stay with him and clean and cook and wash for the rest of his devil life. As you can see, she's beyond talking of matters with sense and decency. She's been taken up with her planning and scheming to get away from me for the purpose of harlot's gain. And she hardly of marrying him. I'll kill you. Uh, George! Uh, she has an uh, axe! Uh, an axe! Uh, she's going stop, to kill him! Stop! Stop! For God's sake, stop! Uh, Oh, George, I can't look. He's dead. She killed her own father. What? Where is she? What happened to her? There she is. She's running away. Hey. Hey, come back. Come back. You can't get away. It's you who will never get away. The ring will circle you. George. George, don't try to catch her. She's like the wind. I'll never get my hands on her. She's almost in the forest. Come back. Come back. We're not going to hurt you. It's you who are going to be hurt. She, she's disappeared. Uh, even before she got to the forest. But, George, look what I found. It's the ring. She dropped the ring. Let me see it. You know what it's like? It's just like the road sign. Well, it, it's the same shape. The same color stone. It's smaller, but it is just like the road sign. Rose colors. George, George, we've got to get help. The police, yes, some... Where? Well, of course, the house. We've got to get to Helena's house. <laughs> This ring so rosy, this ring so red, does it belong to the living or the dead? We'll return shortly with Act Two. If you alone, I don't want to disturb your mother. My dear, you're not disturbing me in the slightest. This room has no secrets. Its acoustics are incredible. I'm Helena's mother. Hello, Mrs. Roston. We've just had a very, a very unusual experience. Laurie's pretty badly shaken by it. Yes, so I see. Helena, why don't you take Laurie to your room, let her refresh herself? Perhaps Mr. Williamson will tell me something more about what's happened? I think the police should be notified at once. The police? Here? Did you have an accident? Well, not exactly, but we happened to see something that can only be described as uh, gruesome, I guess. And the police should be notified. Mother, do you think... Helen, dearest, this is not the time for speculation. I shall be glad to have the deputy's office call. But can you give me some indication of what they're to be told? We don't like bothering our officers unnecessarily. They have enough to do as it is. But someone's just been murdered. Oh, no, not again. What? Now, Helena, restrain yourself, dearest. Laura, you say someone's been murdered. Who? Well, we don't know who he is, but he was trying to whip a young woman. 
And, Mr. Williamson, she took an axe and killed him. You know, how could you? I was praying that it wouldn't happen to you. Oh, poor Laurie. Now, why don't you young people make yourselves comfortable? A glass of sherry might calm you. But, Mother, you told me that it would never happen again. That thing... Helena, I said I had taken every precaution not to have it happen. But who am I to promise I will control the uncontrollable? Are you saying that this has happened before? Maury, maybe Mrs. Roston wants to explain. Oh, well, not really, but I feel I'm obliged to. However, it is difficult. How does one explain the inexplicable? I think they're ghosts. There are no ghosts, Helena. Dr. Medvey, the last scientist I consulted said it was undoubtedly an instance of photolysensory sensory projection. Helena pooh-poohs it. But uh, has either of you ever heard of that discipline? Oh, vaguely. It once came up in a course on parapsychology that I had at school. No one has ever proved PSP, Mother. Well, they've never proved ESP either, but a lot of serious scientists work with it. But, but George, what does that photo whatever mean? <laughs> It's quite complicated. Photolysis is the means by which light can affect the arrangement of chlorophyll grains in leaves. Chlorophyll grains? Leaves? There's a man not more than a mile from here who's been murdered. Now calm yourself, my child. There is no such man and no such daughter. This has happened before. I've seen it. Helena has. A very few close friends have. Unfortunately, you have, too. Uh, Mr. Williamson, do you think you'd still like to try an explanation of PSP? <laughs> well, it's spooky in a way. By that, I mean the, the scientific explanation of it. You see, we're all supposed to give off certain light and heat waves. And what is it happens in the case of individuals who are emotionally stimulated, uh, let us say, people in love... Well, the theory has it that people in a very intense emotional state give off more highly concentrated waves. Well, I just don't understand what chlorophyll and, and leaves and, and light waves have to do with a man being murdered. You see, it's tied up with photosynthesis. And scientists aren't sure how that process really works. But with the unusual intensity of light, the cells of chlorophyll rearrange themselves and are forced to give off some of the excess carbohydrates in which there is an unusual amount of stored energy. I'm not following this at all. My dear, Helena speaks of you as having the patience of a saint. <laughs> so, if you'd like me to telephone the deputies, I suggest you give your fiancé a chance to finish. There isn't much more, Laurie. Just at the openings in the leaves, they're called stomates, tend to react like projectors. And through the magnification of additional oxygen are supposed to be able to relay an episode they once absorbed when they were in the receptive state, like, uh, well, like film. Are, are you talking about something, something like motion picture film? Yes, Laurie, but it means something like a projector with a memory. A memory of blood in this case. Well, it happens that chlorophyll is very much like hemoglobia except that it contains magnesium instead of the iron found in blood. Are you saying that what we saw was a motion picture? Nothing more? Well, essentially, that's it. But when and where the original was recorded, we have no idea. But there's a building! There's a cabin out there! And there's a man's body bleeding! Why don't you go and see for yourself if you don't believe us? No, Laurie, there's nothing there. Helena, you too? Yes. As Mother said, I've seen it. Others have too. Around here, they call it the Enchanted Forest. But if you go out there again, you won't find a cabin or a man. Nothing. The police know all about it. They'll come and you'll just feel foolish. I, I don't know what to think. It all seemed so real. Well, now, why don't we come back to the present and the truly real? Because I have the real pleasure of giving you our gift to celebrate your engagement. It's a complete surprise. Even I don't know what it is. Laurie, dear, it isn't that what we're giving you is expensive or valuable. But it is dear to us. 
We hope it will be your first family heirloom. Here it is. No pretty wrapping, but it seems too lovely a box to cover with silly paper. Mother, I've never seen that box before. Well, now, isn't it nice that I can still have some surprises for you? That's a great-looking box, Mrs. Ralston. Those, uh... Those are roses painted on ivory, aren't they? Oh, it's so beautiful. I feel as if I'm depriving you of something very special if if I accepted it. Oh, no. Please, take it. It's, it's little enough, and you know what I think that box would be perfect for? It already has its purpose, dear. What I was going to say was that... It would be the perfect place to keep a lock of your first baby's hair, wouldn't it? And I'm afraid it's going to stay empty for some time. Oh, George, we don't know that. Not yet. We will have to find you another container for that when the time comes. This box already has its occupant. You mean there's something inside? Well, look and see. Well, go ahead, Laurie. My heart's beating so loudly. She's been like that all day, so excited. Darling, do you want me to open it? No, no, I'm all right. Just let me take a deep breath. Oh, no. Hey, that's... that's the same... Laurie? What, oh. What's wrong? Mother... Oh, it's just music! Give me the box, Laurie. And inside! Inside! Oh, the ring! Oh! oh. I've got her. Put her on the couch. Yes. Laurie? Laurie? Mother, do something. Don't just stand there. Eleanor, control yourself and get some water. Oh, Laurie, my poor Laurie. Wake up. Laurie, come out of it, honey. Darling? She's trying to open her eyes. Slowly, Laurie. It's me, George. Oh, who? What, what happened? Just passed out for a moment. Here, give her this water. Here, honey. Sip no, this slowly. I don't need it. But d- did I really see it? See what? The ring. Yes. Yes, I've got it. What What ring? This ring. The same one. With a rose-colored stone. Mother, how dare you? That's mine. You know what that ring means to me. Oh, please take that thing away. I don't want to look at it. Don't worry. You won't have to. Here, Mrs. Ralston, take it back. And I hope it isn't a sample of your sense of humor. Just one moment, Mr. Williamson. I don't particularly appreciate your tone or your attitude. What do you mean by my sense of humor? If you and your daughter know all about that axe-murdering scene that we saw earlier, then you must have known about the ring. What about it? It's mine. That ring, it's just like that road sign you have on the highway. Yes, the sign was copied from the design of the ring. It's been our family hallmark, so to speak, for generations. Is that why the girl who killed her father did it? Because of that ring? What do you mean? She had it. She she teased him with it while, while she sang that song. That same nursery rhyme in the box. Oh, oh no, what? That couldn't be. That's my ring. She couldn't have had it. Are you too sure you saw this ring? Well, that girl in the field. She dropped it when she ran away. Then where is it now? Well, George, you had it. What? You sure? I I thought you put it into your purse. Well, I'll look. Well, it isn't in any of my pockets. No, and it's not here in my purse. How could it be? There is only one ring, this ring. It's been in the Ralston family for generations. It was brought here by a Ralston early in the 18th century. And it has always belonged to the oldest child in each family. In which case it would be your daughter's, since you are a Ralston by marriage. Yes, that would be so if it were true. Uh, You're not going to tell them. Well, why not? It's time that silly cloud you've been hiding behind was blown away. Don't, Mother, please, I beg you, don't. Nonsense. I am a Roston. That ring belongs to me. Helena's father died in the Southeast Asian War. 
shot down even before he knew I was going to have a child. Mother, I hate you for this. I hate you. Helena, don't say that to your own mother. Why not? She hated me ever since she learned that her father and I had never married. Imagine that in this day. A girl making such a fuss about legitimacy. Stop it, Mother, please. We don't have to hear any more, Mrs. Oh, Wilson. Oh, yes, yes, you do. George, can't we get out of here quickly? You can go whenever you like, Miss Thornton. But out of your friendship for Helena, you must take that ring with you. No, I couldn't. I won't let her give it to me. Helena, what are you doing? The ring, she tore it out of my hand. I've got it and no one will ever get it from me. Let her go. She'll be back. And with the ring, she knows it's wrong for her to have taken it. Eventually, the ring must come to you, Laurie. We don't want it. But it will come to you. It can do you no harm. It's a silly superstition, but only Rostens is supposed to be vulnerable to the ring. And, Laurie, if you are Helena's friend, as you say you are, you will take it. But she wants it. She insists that it stay hers. Only as an excuse. But what sort of an excuse could the ring give her? The excuse not to marry. And why not? She considers herself fated, ill-starred, if you will. You see, at one time, the superstition arose that if the firstborn was female, the ring would prevent her from marrying. It's high time that ring is out of Roston hands. Why don't you just throw it away? What, with Helena carrying on as if possessed? Well, we just do not want it. I'm sorry, but we must get back to the city. Uh, yes, it's a long drive, and we'd like to make it before dark. I regret this has turned out to be so unpleasant, but then perhaps it couldn't have been avoided. Perhaps. But it's over now. George, let's go. I can't get away fast enough. I don't know what the speed limit is here, but whatever it is, we'll break it. Helena, I order you to come out of your room at once. At once. Mother, don't hurt her. She is my only friend. The only friend I have in the whole world run from the ring run for your life but without a ring what's a husband or wife we'll return shortly with act three Let us try and penetrate the shrouding darkness of the final act of A Ring of Roses. Laurie and George have been plunged into a strange, unreal experience. As the twilight lowers over the countryside, they are fleeing from the Rostons, the malevolent nursery rhyme, the flashing axe, the avenging curse, the fatal ring. What can flight outrace those forces of evil? That woman at Mrs. Roston, she's monstrous. Oh, I'm so sorry for Helena. Yeah, well, I didn't see any halos around her head either. Yeah, but just imagine having to live with that mother. Why does she have to tell Helena that she and her father never married? Do you believe it? Well, why would she lie about something that important? Maybe out of just plain malice. Or or what? It just occurred to me. Couldn't she have invented that story about the curse the ring puts on firstborn Roston girls? Well, to what end? Simple. It'd be a guarantee that she'd never be alone. That she could hold on to her daughter for life. Like the woodcutter. Oh, don't remind me of him. Anyway, I can't see how the ring and whatever it's supposed to do fits. Well, if she made up the business about fate keeping her from marrying Helena's father, now wouldn't that be a kind of evidence, proof for Helena that the curse was real? Well, then why would she give us the ring? Well, I'm only guessing, but couldn't it have been Mrs. Roston's way of telling her daughter that she wouldn't marry even if the ring was off the premises, so to speak? 
But George, whatever we think of Mrs. Rawson, she's still a mother. And what mother would sentence her daughter to a lifetime of misery? Hmm? Look, I'm sorry I got you into this mess. I didn't dream it would be that horrible. Well, you had no way of knowing. Well, looking back, I should have. Helena, always so strange, so withdrawn, so mysterious about herself, her home, and, and her mother. It should have been a warning. Honey, let's find a happier subject. Such as? Well, let's see. Uh, okay, it's not original, but it'll do. For instance, if and when we have our first baby, would you want a boy or a girl? Oh, don't be corny. Why not? Corn is fine as long as it's... George! A... George, isn't there someone in the road? Where? Well, look, straight ahead. Oh, yeah, that's a woman. Uh... Well, we're not stopping for man or beast or any mixture of the two. Here, that should get her off the road. Because if it doesn't, then she may be another bit of PSP and we can drive right through her. Darling, slow down. She's waving at us. George, slow down! No way. If that's a living body and it wants to stay that way, she'll get off the road. Oh, please. She isn't moving from the middle of the road. Damn her teeth, whoever she is. George, George, you're going to hit her. <laughs> Laurie, all right? Yeah, I think so. That stupid woman. It's Helena. Yeah. Well, just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Lori, Lori, please, I must speak to you. Tell her you'll phone her on Halloween. Hey, wait, Lori, don't lower the window. Well, she's in trouble. Better her than you. There can't be any danger in finding out what she wants. Haven't you been through enough? Helena, we're in a hurry. Telephone Lori tomorrow. No, don't go, please. Let me explain. George, wait, I don't have the heart wait a minute. to... Is, are you sure that's Helena? Well, of course. Her face, it, it looks so strange. Well, what's strange about her face? Look at her eyes. They're, they're washed out. They're sunken as if, as if she's taken some kind of drug. That's probably because she's been crying. I'm lowering the window. And you're also raising my temper. Well, what do you want me to do? Just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Oh, she's gone to the front of the car now, George. Oh, she does look dreadful. Why not? She is dreadful. I've got to find out what she wants. Just one minute. Let me talk to her for just only one minute. Okay. Sixty seconds. But don't lower the window more than an inch. Helena? Helena, over here. Now, what is it? Oh, thank you, Laurie. If you only knew how miserable I am about what happened today. It was all my fault. You don't have to apologize. It wasn't anybody's Look, fault. Mother had... Only the best intentions in giving you the ring? Sure she did. Nothing like unloading something on a couple of strangers that isn't yours to give away. But the ring does belong to her mother. Only to be given to her child, which excludes you. Well, that's true, but you see, after me, there won't be any Rostons. But you will marry, Helena. Just wait and see. <gasps> I doubt it. And even if I did... My children won't be Rostons. Helena, this has been the weirdest day in my life. Now, frankly, the sooner we get away from here, the better off we'll feel. Just one more thing. Prove to me that you are still my friend and... Please, take the ring. No, Helena. Thank you, but I couldn't. Absolutely not. Helena, why don't you just throw that ring away somewhere? I can't. I'm not allowed to. It has to be given to a Roston or... Or to the person closest and dearest to me. But how could you expect me to take it? Every time I'd look at it, I would remember that terrible scene in the woods. I swear, the ring has nothing to do with what happened out there. It never has before. This is the first time. And it'll be the last for us. Okay, Helena, stand away from the car. I'm backing up. Lori, if you don't take the ring, I'll die. I know I'll die. You won't die, Helena. Why should you? Because it will mean that I've lost my only friend and that I'll have no one to turn to and I'll be stuck here in this prison with my mother. And she'll never let me go. Never. So long, Helena. If I return to the house with the ring, my mother will do something terrible. If you don't take the ring, I'll throw myself in front of the car. I don't care anymore. I don't care. Helena, give me the ring. Oh, you mean you will take it? Oh, Laurie, you've made me so happy. I'm indebted to you forever. 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 
You're angry with me, George, aren't you? No. I'll probably never see her again. And if it meant that much to her... What well... probably meant even more to her was that she could twist and bend you in any way she wanted. Well, in a way, it was her last hope of getting out of that house. That's why I finally took the ring. Actually, what harm could it do? I don't know, Laurie, except that anything connected with the Rostons seems dangerous. That's because the Rostons are difficult to understand or explain. Well, that may be. But while we might never get to the bottom of that axe job in the woods, there must be a key somewhere to the Rostons. After all, they're not ghosts or optical illusions. They're people, living, breathing humans. Still, for all we know about them, they're just as haunted as that phantom woodcutter and his crazy daughter. Let's stop talking about them. I will, if you do me an important favor. If I can. You can Throw that ring away. You mean now? Right this second. Open the window and throw it out. But why? Honey, I consider it a special favor to me if you got rid of that ring. Well, I have no intention of keeping it. But I, I don't want to just throw it away. What do you want to do with it? Give it away. To whom? I haven't thought yet. Try thinking about it right now. You sound as if you're ordering me to do it. Actually, I'm begging you, Laurie, begging you to get rid of the damn ring. I said I would. But when? When I find someone to give it to. Someone who would appreciate it. It just doesn't make sense to just throw away something that's probably valuable for just anyone to find or to have it crushed under a car. <sighs> Say... I know what I could do with it. Drop it, Laurie. It's only going to get us into an argument. No, I'm serious, honestly. I just thought of where this ring could do the most good. Fine, you do what you want with it, but let's not talk about it. Oh, you'll agree. I bet you will. Oh, honey, do you realize that since we've known each other, we've never had so many disagreements? But I'm not disagreeing with you. Good, then let's change the subject. Or better still, let's, let's let everything take a rest. If that's what you want, fine. Laurie, what are you doing? Nothing. Laurie, what are you doing with that ring? Nothing, I said. Besides, you don't want to talk about it. Why are you wearing it? I was playing with it. I just wanted to see if it fit. Will you please take it off? What are you getting so excited about? That ring. If you can't throw it away, at least put it away. You're getting awfully bossy, George. You're doing it only to get a rise out of me. You can forget about it. Because I'm going to give it to that thrift shop around the corner from where I live. Great idea. Now, please take it off. All right. Anything for some peace. <laughs> Hey, that's funny. What is? The ring's stuck. I, I'll get it off. You shouldn't have put it on if it was too small. But it wasn't. In fact, it felt too big. Isn't that strange? I, I can't even twist it. Get the flashlight out of the glove compartment. Oh. Now turn it on and hold your finger under the light. There, can you see it? Your finger doesn't look swollen. No, it isn't swollen. But but the ring won't budge. George, George, do you hear something? Hear what? That voice, the singing. Don't you hear it? No, I don't. Wait. Yes, I do. It's that song. Where's it coming from? I don't know. It seems to be surrounding us. I'll turn the bright lights on. You keep trying to get that ring off. Um, I am trying, but it's as if it's cemented to my finger. And that singing. It's the same as the girls in the forest. Get rid of the flash and give me your hand. 
What for? Maybe I can get it off. Well, you can't. You're driving. There's no traffic, Laurie. I can manage the wheel with one hand. Why don't we wait till we get to a gas station? Then I can get it off with a little soap. Come on, give me your hand. All right. No, wait. I can't. Why not? Oh, I just can't, George. Lori, you're about to drive me out of my head. Why can't you give me your hand? Because, because I remembered something. What, for heaven's sake, what, Lori? Well, what Helena said back there, when when she wanted me to take the ring. She said a lot of hysterical things. That if she couldn't give the ring to a Rostin, it would have to be to a person nearest and dearest to her. Oh, Helena's all whacked up. Now give me your hand, Lori. But what if it's true? Oh, that voice, that terrible voice. Why doesn't it stop? Laurie, please give me your hand. No, because if you can get it off, then you'll be stuck with it. Who cares? I don't want anything to happen to you. Not for anything. <gasps> George, George, look straight ahead. Oh, It's them, no. the two of them, the old man and the girl. He's got an axe. I'm stopping the car. No, don't. Go around them. Throw them. Throw them down. Kill them. Do anything, the brakes George. aren't working. George, we're practically on top of Lauren, them. for the last time, give me your hand. The ring can't oh, harm no. us. No! <laughs> Laurie, are you all right? It was a tree we hit. Only, only a tree, Laurie. You hear me? Only a tree. <sighs> Laurie, the ring. The ring? What did you do? It's not on your finger. Your finger. Good Lord. She's dead. <laughs> So you gave Laurie the ring, Helena. Yes, Mother. As you told me to. Now give me the box. And we'll see if the ring has worked wonders once more. Here is the box. The one with the roses. Open it. Yes, Mother. But the music. Why isn't the music playing? It's a good sign that it's not playing. It's the sign that the ring has done its work. Your friend Laurie will not marry ever. Not ever. But the ring, Mother. Where is the ring? You'll find it in the woods. In the clearing. In the same place where I killed your great-grandfather 143 years ago. Go and bring back the ring that will keep us alive forever. Forever. Forever, you ghosts. Forever, you sing. But your death is as forever as your grim, rosy ring. I'll be back shortly. Let us end our tale of ring, a ring of roses. For as we also know, roses are red, roses are blue. But the rose of death is meant for who? Our cast included Glynis O'Connor, George Petrie, Sidney Walker, Elspeth Eric, Holland Taylor, and Carol Hilliard. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Car care expert Linda Clark joins us next hour. International Incident Number Four.
Jack Packard and Reggie York. Report to London at once for assignment in French Indochina. Signed the 21 old men of 10 Gramercy Park. Adventure. The American Broadcasting Company presents a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring the international escapades of Jack, Doc, and Reggie. Tonight's incident brings you The Pearl of Great Price. Major Packard, and you too, Sergeant York, sir. Good morning. morning. Glad to have you two gentlemen back at 10 Gramercy Park with us again. Oh, thanks. Right into the great reception hall, if you will, please. Come on, Reggie. Matter. Right in, please. Quite. Well, I say, Jack, the door closed with no sound at all. Sound's been deadened in this great room. But it made such a frightful noise on the outside. I say, Jack, do you have the feeling of having been to church when you come into this room? Why not? The cathedral-like windows, tapestries depicting the history of the world hanging from the vaulted ceiling three stories up, furniture and paintings and carpets that were used by emperors and queens and a princely horde from the beginning of organized government. Jeff, is that what all this represents? And more. No wonder I feel reverent. I'm communing with the ghosts of the great names of history. And it's against this background the 21 old men are working. Look here. Except that we've done a couple of nasty jobs for them, do we know anything about them? We don't know who they are individually. What they stand for, yes. Do we indeed? They're a group of international figures, each one representing his native country, gathered together with wealth and power and the good of the world at heart. Mm. Come to London at once for assignment in French Indochina. Who wants to go to Indochina? I do. So do you, if it's interesting enough. I'd still like to know just what these 21 old graybeards are up to. Well, it's pretty simple. The world's in chaos today. Governments are weak and suspicious. Everyone feels as though he, he's sitting on dynamite. Twenty-one old men use us and others like us as their undercover instruments to work behind the scenes and clean up festering spots with no one the wiser. A very excellent explanation, Major Packard. Uh-oh. There goes the tapestry back. Twenty-one old men are in session. Did you speak, Sergeant York? Not at all, sir. It's just the fact that you can see us from behind that ruddy glass while we seem to be talking to the empty air. Believe me, Sergeant, you are not talking to the empty air. I'm sure of that, sir. Before I give you into the hands of Monsieur Reynaud, our French representative, for your next assignment, the 21 old men have asked me to state that you, Sergeant York, were overheard referring to us as 21 old greybeards. Oh, I say. Quite all right, Sergeant. Quite all right. It is simply that the majority of our members are entirely smooth-shaven, and they feel out of character being referred to as greybeards. I shall refrain in the future. And now then, Monsieur Reynaud. Hey, uh, one more question, please. Well? What about our third partner, Doc Long? Uh, Are you looking for him? We are making inquiries. The matter has our attention. And now, Monsieur Reynaud. Major Packard, Sergeant York. Your next assignment will take you to the northernmost border of French Indochina, where it joins Burma. It is jungle country. It is dangerous country at this moment because there is deep unrest among the natives of both countries. Therefore, you will travel from the last civilized outpost to the lost city of Shiva, upon the backs of elephants. So, not elephants. Quiet, Reggie. Upon the backs of elephants with Hindu and Sikh outriders upon Tibetan ponies and camels. A circus, no less. What's our jumping-off place? That you do not need to know. One of our planes will fly you to Saigon, and another will take you to the last outpost. There you will contact the camel and elephant train. I say, what for? What's the assignment? That you will be told at the last outpost of civilization. Do not waste time on questions. There is a cab driver waiting who will take you to the airport directly.
Well, thanks for the ride. Oh, voila. Oh, voila. Jack, look here. This is no airport. Just the same this flying junk heap has landed. Come on, get out. Yeah. <sighs> Nothing but a blooming cow pasture. And all the cows look like buffalo. <clears throat> Not buffalo, caribou. Last outpost of civilization's right. No town, no hotel, and night coming on. Uh, hey! Where's he going? I don't know. He's delivered us here. Now I guess he's going home. Well, but look here, Jack. We're just being dumped out here in the middle of nowhere. Getting dark and no friends, no contact. Oh? But... Are you so sure? Hello. Where's it? Where did you pop from? I've got some Tibetan ponies hitched to a buckboard, or what's left of a buckboard, over there behind those banyan trees. Yeah. There goes our plane. Yes, I kept out of sight until he taxied off. Nobody told us we were going to meet a girl. Especially not an English girl. What are you doing out here in the fringe of nowhere? My husband was an OSS officer out here during the war. He liked it here. He brought me back afterwards. Oh, that explains you being here. And your husband? Dead. Oh, Don't bother. He couldn't resist the charms of the native women. And I found him on the doorstep one morning with a kris straight through him. I guess that taught him. Oh, look here. I should think you'd return to England. Has that got anything to do with your assignment out here? No. No. Is your curiosity satisfied? Yeah. Yes. Well, then, let's get into what's left of my buckboard after these four-legged Tibetan devils get through kicking the blazes out of it and head into town. All right, you shaggy little imps of Satan. Take us to the hotel. <laughs> Jolly good dinner. You know, I'm a great curry eater myself. Yeah, so I noticed. <laughs> I brought you out here in the garden behind the hotel where we can talk in the darkness without being overheard. It's about time we got down to something definite. You say you had direct word from the 21 old man? Yes. Listen. That music's coming from the Temple of Agog behind the garden. That's a real Chinese flute. Mm, it has the flavor of this jungle setting. Yeah, what are those chimes? Chinese bells, symbols. I don't know all the names for their instruments. Well, never mind that. What I want to know is, what are Reggie and I doing in the back country of Indochina? What's up? You're ten days' journey by camel or elephant from the Burma border. Yeah? Some place near the border is the lost city of Shiva. Well, I thought this was the last outpost. The lost city is dead. Dead? Banyan trees and jungle vines have swallowed it up. Except for a few priests of the old religion... Worshippers of Shiva, it is uninhabited. I've heard of these old cities of a lost civilization. Why are we going there? Keep your voices guarded. There is a pearl of great price hidden there. Pearl? Those are the words I was told to give you. Recently, the sacred temple in Lai King on the Burmese border was raped and pillaged. The marauders and their precious loot are said even now to be under the protection of the priests of the lost city. Uh, what's all this stilted English you're using? I'm repeating a message word for word which I was told to give you. Marauders from Indochina crossed the border and pillaged a Burmese temple. Yes. And brought their loot back across the border into Indochina. And are now under the protection of the high priests of the lost city of Shiva. And we're to round up the marauders and loot? The pearl of great price. What? That is all that is required of you. Return the pearl of great price. You mean look for a single precious stone in a sweltering jungle hundreds of miles... Here, aren't we getting an awful long way from the hotel? The further from listening ears, the better. So, jungle creeps right up to the very threshold of civilization, doesn't it? It's a fight. Man against nature. It never ends in the tropics. Those creeping vines gleam like serpents in the moonlight. Yeah, let's turn back. I don't like a... Hey, where do you look at that? Men creeping out of the jungle. Run, run. Oh, we can't. They're behind us. Hello! The jungle raiders! The jungle raiders! Tear into them, Reggie! Why don't they? Send up again! Reggie! Reggie! Enough! Enough! Oh, good guy. We want them alive. Tell this slimy native to take his hands off me. Oh, it's Gosordo. I should think so. I deliver these men into your hands and you treat me like a piece of merchandise. It was a mistake in the confusion. You have delivered them according to plan. The men sahib does her job well. 
Board an elephant. Oh, no. You're only spoofing, Jay. How do you feel? Rotten. Head splitting, stomach churning, tongue swollen. Hey, guard! Water! Give him water! Huh? Funny. Yes, sir. He's bound, head and foot. Yeah, same here. Same here. All right, remember? Funny. Oh, sure, yes. Hold that water bag to my mouth. Yes. Water. Yeah, beautiful stuff, water. Right, hey. Right, hey. Yeah, thanks, old boy. Oh, now I remember, Jack. We were set on by these jungle jackals and beaten into insensibility. Yeah, back in the hotel garden. They swarmed over us like locusts. Huh. What are we now? Listen. What's that? Monkeys. Birds. Yeah. We're plunging through trackless jungle. Captives on an elephant. Well, what's it all about? Hey, 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 hey. Well, I say, Jack, couldn't they roll up the canvas sides of this hotter? It's hotter than blazes. I got one or two glimpses out. There's nothing to see but jungle. Oh, the heat. The heat's worse in the open. Listen. Did I hear someone, something following us? Even a belly musician. Where am I hearing things? Whole caravan. Elephants leading off to break trail. Camels and Tibetan ponies to the rear. You mean we've been grabbed off by some roving jungle tribe? Well, what do they expect to get out of us? I don't know. Doesn't make sense. What's become of the girl? Flora? Two. They could have her on another elephant, I suppose, but looks to me like something else. Oh, all this swaying and rocking's doing things to my insides. Yeah, it'll get worse before it gets better. Keep your mind on what I'm saying. Yeah, you said... Uh... What, what did you say? I say I think Flora framed us with this bunch of bandits. But she had word from the 21 old men to help us. Or did she? Mighty funny she had to take us to the back end of that hotel garden to talk to us. And how did these boys happen to be back there waiting for us? Well, but she had to be what she said, Jack. Why? Because she's the only one who knew why we're here. She didn't even, we didn't even know ourselves until she told us. Hey, that's right. The pearl of great price. If she's an enemy, that may be a lot of hokum. How about that? Kidnapped on elephants without the faintest idea what our assignment is. Oh, boy, this heat's brutal. If we don't get someplace pretty soon, you've lost yourself a good right-hand man. Ah, good evening. It is getting cooler. Oh, such politeness. Who are you? I am the one who kidnapped you to this place. Uh, I'm not surprised you got the face for it. You do not like my face? Hey, what is this place? Where are we? What became of the elephant caravan? This is the lost city of Shiva. Sure. The lost city of... Hey, look, what is this? You kidnap us. You drag us out here trussed up like chickens. Then you turn us loose, give us this adobe cottage on the edge of the jungle with servants and fresh clothes, and treat us like guests. What's it all about? You are dissatisfied? Did we not bring your luggage from the hotel? Did we not return your weapons? Well, you did that. But why the about face? One minute we're captives. Next, nothing's too good for us. Listen. Okay, drums. Ceremonial drums from the temple. The old ones are performing the rites of purification with the dancing girls. Dancing girls? Those you will not see. They are the maidens of the temple. Look, I don't care about dancing girls or maidens. Oh, look here, Jack. Let's not go too far. Stop beating around the bush. What's up? You do not know? I do not know. You don't know why you brought us here? It was a commission given to me. Kidnap the two white men from the hotel garden... Deliver them by elephant train to the lost city of Shiva. Give them the Mahatma's quarters with the Mahatma's servants to wait on them. And after that... Yeah, after that, what? 
do their bidding. Oh, Joe, really? How about that? Bring us here and then do our bidding. Yes. The elephant and camels are tied up in the jungle to the west of the city. We await your orders. Uh, what about that white woman back at the hotel? What about Flora? She was but a small cog in the great wheel which has begun to turn. Uh huh. You know anything about a band of cutthroats around here? Cutthroats? Jungle bandits. Just got back from sacking a sacred temple over in Burma. I would not know. Ever hear of the pearl of great price? Well, did you? I'm not a dealer in precious stones. Look here, old boy. Your tongue says one thing, your eyes say something else. You call me a liar? Hey, hey, put that pig sticker back in your robe. Take it easy. That's better. But Jack, the old boy's eyes... Let it alone, will you, Reggie? Say, how about the temple? Can we get in? It is forbidden. What's to prevent us? It rambles all over the landscape. Half the walls have caved in. It is forbidden. Say, which side of the fence are you on? The dog of an infidel who defiles a temple with his presence shall have his throat cut before the morning. Take him, Reggie. That's a good boy. Tie him up. Will we ever get out of this jungle now? I don't know, but at least he's not going to keep us out of the temple. Hold it, Reggie. What now? I heard an echoing footstep. Let me get a look around this next corner. Well? Easy. Someone's coming. Get a look at him? Yeah, dressed in a priest's robe, but there's a dagger in his belt and a pistol in his hand. He's a man of peace, no doubt. Listen. When he comes around the corner, jump him. He's my man. <sighs> ah, good. Quick. Drag him in here under this stairway. Coming. <sighs> Poking around these dank, cobwebby places makes me think of tarantulas and puff adders. Yeah, uh, that's good. Uh, hello. Ring of keys. Hey, now we can go back and find out what's behind that locked door we had to bypass. I see, Jack, we're not getting anywhere. Well, we've had three hours in here without getting caught. And if all the priests we put to sleep were laid end to end, the chance... Come on, come on. Let's see where that big door leads to. If there's a pearl of great price in this decrepit old temple, we've got about as much chance take of finding it. Easy, it. Take it easy. We may have to search for days. And I suppose the priesthood will hold still for that. Here, this is the door. Uh-huh. Fifty keys. Which one fits? How about this? No. Oh. Hmm. Then this ought to do just about it. Aha! Uh-huh. Well, I'll be blessed. Exactly. Not so much noise. Yeah, sounds like a jailhouse break. Hmm. Too late now. Where do we seem to have got? True. Blasted tunnel. Reed torches burning along the wall. Dirt underfoot. Here, give me a flashlight. Here, well. Thanks. Here, look. Footprints of horses in the dirt. Mighty small horses. Tibetan ponies, the little ones. Either that or the small, shaggy burrow. Recently used, too. I think we found something. No doubt of it, but what? I don't know. Maybe the hideout of the raiders. Raiders? The gang that robbed the Burmese temple. Jove. The chappies with the pearl. Could be. Belly reed torches are all right for atmosphere, but they smoke like chimneys. Electricity much more practical. Less light, the better for us. Hello, Jack. Do I hear something? Listen. Sounds like Santa Claus. It does, doesn't it? Listen. Coming from around the corner, down the passage. I'm getting closer, too. Here they come. Well, I say, Tibetan ponies with sleigh bells. Pack horses. Ten ponies. Every one of them packed to the running board. Joe, Jack, could that be the loop from the temple? I don't know. Doesn't seem to be guarded. Just one native priest guiding the lead pony by the halter. Well, look. Look on the fourth, the sixth, sixth pony. Isn't that the girl? A girl. Bound hand and foot and strapped to the pack saddle. Well, is that our idea of chivalry? What's fair about that? Here they come alongside. You clip the priest, I'll grab the pony's halter, and we'll just keep going. Get him! That's a good boy. Come on. We've got the spoils from the temple. We've got the whole thing right in this pony caravan. (laughs) 
I say, where are you taking us? I'm taking us out to the west of the lost city to the elephant and camel caravan. Oh, this place is killing me. We'll soon be there. I got it figured out. What? The reason this pony train had only one priest in the tunnel to guard it was because the bandits themselves weren't allowed in the temple. Oh, say, good deduction. We weren't supposed to be in there either. Well, we caught them by surprise. The priest was delivering the caravan back to the bandits. What, native priests and bandits working together? Well, who knows which is which in this country. Well, where were they going with it? It's been hidden here since the Burmese temple was sacked. Our arrival probably made them nervous. They were going to move the booty to some safer place. <laughs> we grab it off first. And that's the reason for getting to the elephant caravan fast. The bandits find out that we grabbed off their loot. This jungle's not going to be fit for man or beast. Yeah, but I knocked out the leader of our elephant trains. You don't think that chap's going to be on our side now, do you? We'll give him a choice. He can still be on our side or get a hole in his head. Hey, now look, Shandu, or whatever your name is, you got nasty with us and we had to take care of you while we worked. We apologize. We'll do whatever we can to make up for the insult of knocking you out, but you got to get your elephant caravan going and get us out of here, I see? have been insulted. My ancestors have been insulted. My progeny have been insulted. Look, old chap, here's a hundred dollars American. Doesn't that wipe out all the insults? There is other things in the world besides money. Look, can't you get it through your head? We've captured the whole pack train of loot from the Burmese Oy, bandits. Hey, Ram Ray, Ram Ray. Yeah, you better say Ram Ray. Once they discover what we've done, they'll be on us like wild animals. They'll butcher your whole caravan. I think you lie. Reggie, go get the girl. Be back with her in a shake. Girl. They had a Chinese or Burmese girl tied to one of the ponies. Chinese or Burmese? You cannot tell the difference? Ordinarily, yes. This time the girl seems to speak Chinese, but her looks are... You have captured her? You have in your possession uh, that right, one... Honey. You're in safe hands. The one. Mandar ki devi ko namaskar ho. Namaskar ho. Dinne kam yum dangai. Meri yan hai bingo lai. Unko aapko bucha liya hai. Nishi wan me to dong, yeah. मैं सफारी को चला देता हूँ भाई भाई सफारी चला लो चलो Well, we certainly stirred things up. Are we getting underway? The caravan starts in five minutes. All right, Reggie. Cut those ropes off his wrist. Right, huh? Right, hold out your hand. There. Mm. What happened? What so you on becoming our friend again? You do not know this priceless one. This princess, Ye Devi. You mean this girl someone of importance? The pearl of great price. I say. Well, how about that? We're looking for a piece of jewelry and come up with a Burmese princess. Oh, <laughs> safari, Pikai! Come, the elephant train is ready. Sir, step forward. The elephant will lift you with his trunk to the howdah. Step right up, Reggie. Oh, I say. Braced by an elephant. Hey, look here now. Tell the brute to be careful. Oh, uh, Look, Jack. Run the elevator. It will be dark presently. The marauders don't like the dark. No one likes the dark in these jungles if he's wise. What about us? Ah, oh, we have elephants. All jungle beasts are afraid of elephants. Okay, go ahead. Major Packard. The elephant is ready. The Burmese princess first. Devi ji, aap haathi pe chadenge. Ho, wo thangko de chao. Devi ko le lo. Oh, oh, chalo. Hey, Reggie. Uh, give the little lady a hand when she arrives up there. What up? Here she comes. Hey, bongo. Ne kam na cha. I say, Jack, she doesn't need any help. We've got a jungle cat on our hands. If you please, Major Packard, the elephant will lift you now. Coming right up. Oh, chalo. Here I come. <laughs> How's that for elevator service, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, welcome home. We've got the sides of the howdah rolled up, and with the sun down behind the jungle, it's not half bad. Why doesn't old Shandu get the caravan on the way? Hey, let's get started. Hadiwala! Go! Hadiwala! Well, we're moving off. Ever see so much confusion? 
But we're on our way. Living monkeys and jungle birds don't help him in. Yo, Dick, you're my don't fall. Now, I say, my dear, you may be the pearl of great price, but you'll have to talk plainer than that if you want my companionship. Hey, listen. Chandu! Hey, Chandu, what's that fight? It is the enemy trying to break through. The enemy? It is the enemy trying to break through our rear guards. But they will not succeed. Our horsemen will hold them off for another half hour when it will be darkness. After that, we have nothing to fear. That's great. If that's the case, we should be out of this jungle and back in the outpost of civilization in just ten days. It is an enchanting evening, is it not, Major Packard? You were going to call me Jack, remember? <laughs> But it will be a pleasure. Hey, Flora, tell me something. Does that Shiva temple over there go on with that Chinese flute like that forever? You don't like it. It's not bad, but out here in the garden under an Hindu China moon with jasmine in my nostrils and a beautiful English girl on my arm. Yes. Well, you'll have to admit the Chinese flute isn't a Viennese waltz or moon music for an affair of the heart. On the other hand... Good. I just wanted to be sure. Oh, Jack. Oh. Oh. Well, well, well. Where have you been all my life? And to think, ten days ago, I thought you betrayed us into the hands of the enemy in this very garden. Forget business. We have something more important for this evening. Hmm. Poor Reggie. Oh? Mm hmm. He's inside the hotel guarding the Burmese princess till her government sends officials to return her to the temple. His. Fond of Burmese girls. Not in the least. He's in there fuming because you and I are out here. <laughs> Poor boy. We must find some nice girl to help him enjoy his stay also. Ah, yes. Sahib Pocket? Who said that? So dark here. There, by the banyan tree. What are you doing in this garden? So sorry, Min Sahib. It is important I deliver this message to Sahib Pocket. Message? This message, if you please. You've delivered your message. Now leave. I follow Min Sahib's orders. Here, hold this flashlight while I read this. Who'd be sending you messages out here? Listen to this. You are requested to return to London immediately for special assignment in connection with a $100 million diamond robbery. Signed, the 21 old men of 10 Gramercy Park. Adventure. That's all you care about. You care nothing for a pretty woman. All you want is adventure. Lady, I still have 24 hours to make you eat those words. You have just heard I Love Adventure, a new Carlton E. Morse production featuring Michael Raffetto as Jack Packard and Tom Collins as Reggie York. Next week, International Incident Number 5, The $100 Million Manhunt. An affair of girls and nations resulting in a high adventure halfway around the world. Other players included Al Malotin, Lal Chan Mera, Donald Morrison, Everett Glass, Barbara Jean Wong, and Harry Lang. Sound effects were created by Fred Cole, Robert Conlon, and Ed Ludus. The Pearl of Great Price was written and produced by Carlton E. Morse. Organ music and effects by Rex Corey. Your announcer, Dresser Dahlstedt. adventure came to you from Hollywood. La ti 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 la tu tu ti ta tu. Can you identify that beautiful voice? It belongs to me, Bert Parch, your MC on ABC Stop the Music program. I might call you this Sunday evening to identify a tune, and if you have trouble naming it, I'll even sing it for you. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Though it hath no tongue Murder will out. Rainier Brewing Company, brewers of Rainier Beer and Ale, presents Murder Will Out. Starring William Gargan as Inspector Burke, Chief of Homicide. 
with Eddie Marr as Detective Nolan in another challenging story written and directed by Lou X. Landsworth. The mystery of the swindled songwriter. On the second floor of a drab downtown office building was located the American Institute of Music Composers. Despite its impressive name, this establishment was not an institute. It was a bunco racket operated by song sharks. Their victims were unsuspecting amateur songwriters lured by the promise of fame and riches. On the morning of Saturday, April the 20th, 1946, a burly young man entered the Institute's outer office. Hiya, miss. Well, here I am again. <laughs> I guess you remember me, all right, huh? Uh, why, yes, I... I, I... Bailey. Bill Bailey. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Bailey. Uh, Mr. Morse said he'd have my song published today. Oh, I'll tell Mr. Morse you're here. Yeah. Oh, thanks, miss. Hello, lady. How do you do? Do you mind if I sit down here? Uh, please. Are you a songwriter? Yeah. Face one. You're off to press today. And between you and I, lady, I sure am a lucky guy. Indeed. Yeah. Love song. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Today's Shirley's birthday. Shirley? Yeah, that's my girl. I'm going to give Shirley this song I bit. Birthday present. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. But believe me, lady, I sure had to work. I don't mean writing the words. That comes natural to me. I mean, getting the dog to pay Mr. Moore for composing the music and pay, pay him to, to publish the song. Uh, I've come to see Mr. Moss about some words uh, I wrote. No. <laughs> well, congratulations, Miss... Uh, uh... Uh, uh, Mrs. Swope. Mrs. Henry Swope. Well, Mrs. Swope, it's a pleasure to have met a fellow songwriter. Thank you. Uh, but uh, I'm not a songwriter uh, yet. Uh, no? I-, I hope Mr. Moss thinks I have enough talent to let me join the... Uh, Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, how much does he charge? Well, he... Uh, 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 Mr. Bailey, Mr. Moss will see you now. Oh, yeah, uh, thanks. Well, excuse me, Mrs. Uh, Swope, and uh, good luck. Uh, thank you. Hiya, Mr. Moss. Mr. Bailey, let me shake yeah. your hand. You have genius, true genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess you could call it that. Oh, the lyrics you wrote. Such yeah. words inspired me to compose some of the greatest music of my career. It, uh, here, yeah. here, the piano. Yeah. I want you to hear the song even before I show you the printed copies. Uh, uh, listen. Yeah. Your hands are soft like baby's skin. Your lips are just like berries. How the way I love you is a sin. And I think you're the berries. We ought to get hitched like a trot to a trailer. I'll stay in like you was my tailor. My pearl of the deep blue sea. If you say yes to me, I'll be a happy deed. Well... You like it? Uh, don't sound a lot like Peggy O'Neill? Sister, Bailey, Peggy O'Neill has been close to the hearts for people for two generations. Well, you're in a hurry. I'll get your copies. That'll be $50. $50? Uh, printing charges. But I, I, I already paid $50. 25 for music, 25 for printing. You made a down payment. The full price is $100. $100? Hey, wait a minute. You said I could have professional copies for 25 bucks. Professional copies? Why, Mr. Bailey, you ordered the deluxe sheet music edition, specially dedicated to Shirley Hobson. Yeah, I have your signed order right here. Yeah, but, but you said it was for free. For 50 bucks, I could dedicate my song to Shirley, and I ain't going to spend no, 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 Mr. Moss, will you step in the other office, please? Excuse me, Mr. Bailey. Yeah, but I ain't gonna leave till I get my song, sir. Here. What is it, Ruth? Outside. Two men want to see you. I think they're the police. Plain clothes. Police. <laughs> So starts the mystery of the swindled songwriters. Another Inspector Burke mystery drama brought to you by Rainier Brewing Company. After the mystery, four contestants chosen from our studio audience as amateur detectives will compete for prizes. They'll be asked a number of questions regarding police findings and who they think committed the crime and the one clue that reveals the criminal. But first, here's Larry Keating. What's it going to be tonight, Larry? I was just thinking about that tune, Reed. It's been a long time since I've heard Peggy O'Neill. Well, you know how it is, Larry. The old favorites come and go. Mm, But not all the old favorites. Some come and stay. 68 years ago, and that's longer than most of us have been around, 
a favorite was born that's still going strong. And I mean Rainier beer. Yes, Rainier had to be good to please so many generations. And it is. What's more, today it's better than ever. The Rainier you buy today is made best to taste best. Yes, made best to taste best. Rainier's own hops, Rainier's own malt. But above all, the priceless ingredient of tradition. Sixty-eight years of brewing skill bring you the beer made best to taste best. Rainier for good cheer. Now back to our story, The Mystery of the Swindled Songwriters, starring William Gargan as Inspector Burke. In here, gentlemen. Just up in this other office. You're Dave Moss? Yes. Now, what can I do for you? We're police officers. I'm Inspector Burke. This is Detective Nolan. Oh, uh, how do you do? How are you? We're looking for a Hubert Collins. Know him? Hubert Collins. Hubert Collins. Yeah, Hubert Collins. You published three or four songs he wrote. Oh, uh, my my partner, Charlie Reed, might be able to help you. Yeah, where is he? Oh, he's out right now. Mr. Reed takes care of all financial matters. I take care of the artistic side of the business. Uh Uh-huh. Well, have you any idea where we might find Hubert Collins? I know. uh, Oh, is something wrong? Yes. Last night, an unsuccessful attempt was made to rob the store where Collins works. And the description we have fits this Hubert Collins. The person attempting this robbery was surprised by a special patrolman. There was some gunplay. The patrolman's condition is serious. Oh, how terrible. Oh, young Collins had such talent. Uh, look through your records, your files. Any information you and your partner can give us, no matter how small, phone headquarters. you been, Charlie. I came in while they were here. Ruth tipped me off. I waited till they were gone. That Hubert Collins, he's in trouble. So what? So he might make trouble for us. Drag us into it. How? Oh, we're operating within the law. Who's that? Some sucker told him to wait in my office. Get rid of him, do we? No, 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 not yet. He's good for another 50. Listen, I ain't got all day. I want well, my song. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey. Why, this is my partner, Mr. Reed. We were just discussing your talent. Yes, yes. Uh, Dave tells me you're a genius. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. But I want my songs now. Oh, Mr. Bailey, I already explained to you, you, you owe $50. Are you dirty, rotten crook? I already paid $50. No, 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 just Stalin. a minute. You... Don't sort any rough stuff, Bailey. No rough stuff. Take the joint apart if I don't get my songs. Let me yeah. go. Let me go. Do I get my songs or do I must you up? Let me go. I'll shove your little nose down to your ankles. Don't hit me. Don't. Bailey, Bailey, let go. Let go of him, you hear? Huh? Don't make a move. No, 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 wait. That, that gun. Don't, don't, don't use that gun. Get out of this office. O- okay. But I'll have you arrested pulling a gun. No, no, you won't. We'll have you arrested. Yes, we know the law. You threatened my partner's life. We'll swear out a warrant. That side door goes down the hall. Use it. Okay. Okay. But but I'll be back sooner than you think. And come back with $50. Or we'll sue you. We'll attach your salary. You? You? you, Yeah. yeah. Wait. Did he get his songs? I don't know. Come on. We'll look. In my office. No. No, his songs are all here. My desk drawer. All 12 copies. Okay, put them back. <laughs> if the sucker wants them, he'll be around. Yes, he'll cool off. He'll show up with the other 50. What's all the commotion? Oh, some chump was in here. Must have had to shout to cover up. What is it? That old lady sitting out there, Mrs. Swope. What about her? She wants to join the Institute. And she's got all her savings with her. $500 cash. Well, well, sit down, sit down, please, Mrs. Swope. Thank you. You're a songwriter. No, 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 no. Don't tell me you aren't. I recognize talent when I see it. Well, I, I don't know if I am or not, Mr. Moss. I've, I've written some words for a song. Here, here they are. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I want you to tell me if they're any good. Oh, I'll be brutally frank, Mrs. Swope. You, uh, you will tell me the worst. Oh, you can count on me. Now, let's see. <clears throat> we wedded in the springtime like the birds and bees. Oh, 
Mrs. Swope. Brian, oh, what is it? Beautiful, beautiful, Mrs. Swope. Genius, pure genius, that opening line. It inspires me to compose some of the greatest music of my career. Here, here, sit down by the piano. I don't want to lose the mood. Listen, Mrs. Swope, listen. We wedded in the springtime Like the birds and bees The bleeding hearts were bleeding. The love bark was on the tree. Then the angels took you. I saw this song I wrote for my dear dead husband named Henry Swope. In memory of Henry Swope. Ah, Mrs. Swope. Pardon me while I have an emotion. Uh, What is it? Is something wrong or are you ill? Oh, I'm overcome. Dear Mrs. Swope, the beauty, the poetry, the sheer magnitude. I wrote that in memory of my dear departed husband. Mrs. Swope, you're a genius. I demand you become a member of the Institute. I won't take no for an answer. Really? We'll make your song as famous as the end of a perfect day. We'll print thousands of copies. I'll even make a recording with my own voice now. Well, uh, how much will all this cost, uh, Mr. Mars? Mrs. Swope, such talent as yours should be given to the world. I insist you become... A senior member. Well, what does that mean? We will publish every song you write. You will be famous, wealthy, from the royalties you receive. Well, uh, uh, how much will it cost? Only $500, Mr. Swope. You owe it to yourself. To the memory of your dear departed husband, Henry Swope. <laughs> Another cup of coffee, Ruth? No. This might be it, baby. What we've been waiting for. A light, Charlie. Still want to go through with it? it? Takes money. I'll get the money. How? Simple, baby, simple. Let Dave take the 500 away from the old lady. Then we take the 500 away from Dave. Why not? Cops were nosing around. Sure. Cops start asking questions. Get wise to the racket. This is our chance, baby. We'll skip out. Let Dave hold the bag. What time is it? Yeah, a little after two. I uh, told Dave we'd meet him at five, the office. What do we do till five? Go to a movie, relax, enjoy ourselves. Let Dave do the dirty work. <laughs> June, the moon, da, da, Hello, da, da. Mr. Moss? What? Hubert Collins. What are you doing here? Listen, Mr. Moss. Hubert, you sap. The cops were here this morning. you got to help me, Mr. Moss. I've got to get out of town. Look, it's almost half past two. There's a bus leaving at three o'clock back east. You're out of your mind. Cops will spot every bus depot in town. I've got to take the chance. I can only get some money. Get back east. I can... Oh, no, no. No dice. Listen, Mr. Moss. I've spent over 500 bucks with you. All I'm asking is a loan of 50 bucks. Give me a break. I haven't got any money. Okay. I tried to pull a job last night. Know why? I'm not interested. So I could get more dough. You little fool. I didn't tell you to pull a stick up. You told me if I got more dough, you'd promote my songs. I'd be riding high, hit the big town. Get out. Not until you let me have some money, Mr. Moss. And if the cops pick me up, I'll drag you in. I'll tell them why I did it. To pay you. <laughs> Police headquarters, this is Dave Moss, Institute of Music Composers. Yes, yes. Some officers were here this morning looking for Hubert Collins. Robbery last night. Yes, that's right. Collins just left here, not five minutes ago. He's headed for the Central Bus Depot, blackmailed me out of $50, said he'd tell a lot of lies about me if I didn't... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, All right, all right. Send some men right down. You can pick him up. This way, officers. In this office. You two discovered the body? Oh, yes, we... 
We called the police. Yes. Ruth and I came back from a movie a few minutes before five. We entered my partner's office. All right, and... uh, you two stay in this outer office. Right. Close the door, Nolan. Okay, Chief. Well, looks like a cyclone hit this office. Yes. Let's take a look at the body. Why, it's that fellow we were talking to this morning, Chief, Dave Morris. Hmm. Looks like two bullets did it. Both, both bullets struck in the vicinity of the heart. Yeah. Desk doors open. Looks like the place was thoroughly searched. Uh huh. Robbery might be the motive. Uh, what if this was an inside job, Chief, made to look like robbery? Might be. Well, we let the medical examiner and the fingerprint men go to work. Have a detailed search the offices thoroughly. Come on. Where to? Talk to the victim's partner and that girl. Check on every person known to have entered this office today. Come in, Nolan. Well, we got all the people lined up, Chief, holding them separate. Good. Uh, I had a talk with the girl, Ruth, and that uh, Charlie Reed. Oh? Got their story. What about the reports? Anything new come through? No trace of the murder weapon yet. Ballistics identifies the two death slugs as having been fired from a 32 Smith and Wesson. Uh-huh. Medical examiner definitely establishes Dave Moss met his death sometime between 4 and 4 and 15 p.m. Well, uh, right now, as far as we know, there was only two persons know Dave Moss's death. Yes, the girl, Ruth, and the victim's partner, Charlie Reed. What do you think about our plan? You think it might work? I can't tell. The shock impact uh, might be a complete surprise to our suspects. Uh, We'll watch their faces carefully. Well, I got the record player rigged up in Lieutenant Williams' office and that record we found in Moss's office. When we're ready, uh, I'll press the buzzer, signal the lieutenant. He'll phone me, and then we'll listen to the record on the intercom. Good. That way everybody in the room can hear. Well, let's go to work, Nolan. Bring in our people. All right, all right, everyone. Sit down, please. Mr. Swope here, Mr. Reed. Oh, Chief, this is Miss Shirley. Uh, Shirley Hobson. And my girlfriend, Shirley. She come with me. Protect my interest. Yeah, here, officer. These songs Mr. Moss printed for Bill, all 12 copies. We want our money back. Yeah, or we make trouble. Mr. Bailey and me want to swear out a warrant and have Mr. Moss arrested. Arrested? Well, I don't understand. Mr. Moss is a dear, kind man. He's a philanthropist. Well, I don't know what that means, lady, but if you ask me, he's a dirty, rotten crook. Fit Bill's beautiful words to Peggy O'Neill. It's a dirty jip. Why, when Bill gave me those songs for my birthday, I could have cried. And then when I heard Mr. Moss charge $50 for that tune, I knew he was a crook. That's right, Inspector. Moss was a crook. He stole my money. He and his partners, Charlie Reed and that girl. What do you we don't mean? know what you're talking about. Just a minute, all of you. Hello? Lieutenant Williams, Inspector. All set. Who? Well, hello, Mr. Moss. Moss! Quiet, quiet, both of you. Can't you see the inspector's talking? Why, uh, some friends of yours are in my office, Mr. Moss. Uh, you what? Compose the greatest song of your career. Well, we'd all like to hear it. Go ahead and sing it, Mr. Moss. We weathered in the springtime Like the birds and bees the bleeding heart were bleeding. The love bark was on a tree. Why, that's my song he's singing. He's not singing that song. This is some trick. Yes, why are you doing this? We thought Mr. Moss might tell us who shot and killed him. Mr. Moss, what about it, Hubert? Why, well, I, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Last time I saw Mr. Moss, he was alive. He loaned me 50 bucks. The police picked you up shortly after four this afternoon. Yeah, but I was miles away. I didn't go to the bus depot like I told Moss. When did you last see Moss alive? Uh, about half past two, when he loaned me the money. Yeah, and the last time I seen Mr. Moss was this morning when him and his partner pulled a gun in No, the... no, wait. We can prove where we were. Yes, we were in a movie until almost five o'clock. Oh, dear. What will happen to my beautiful song? We don't know about your song, Mrs. Swope, but uh, we'll return your $500. Four hundred and fifty was found on Mr. Reed's person, and Hubert Collins had the other fifty. I already explained to you, Inspector, I had nothing to do with killing Moss. No, when we saw Dave Moss on the floor, Charlie looked in the drawer in the cash box. The four hundred and fifty dollars was there. I took it. We were partners. Here you are, Mrs. Swope. Your five hundred dollars, and we're holding one of you for the murder of Dave Moss. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the testimony of the suspects. You know all the facts and clues in tonight's mystery. Did you find the one clue that reveals the killer? In a minute, Larry Keating will question our four amateur detectives who were chosen from the studio audience about tonight's police finding. But first, have you ever heard this at your house? Gee, Mabel, I hope that isn't more company. We've got a house full now. Well, chances are it is more company. That's the way things happen. So why not be ready for them? The economical way is to keep a good supply of Rainier Ale on hand. 
It's the West favorite, bound to please whoever's at the door. It's convenient to serve, too. Just uncap a few cold bottles, and your refreshment problem is solved. Rainier Ale, the West's favorite, economical and convenient to serve. I'll remember that. Yes, and remember Rainier is made best to taste best. It's Rainier for quality, for flavor, for good cheer. And now here's Larry Keating, ready to question our four amateur detectives regarding the evidence furnished by Inspector Burke. Our amateur detectives tonight are Mr. Irwin B. Hershon of Hollywood, California, Mrs. Molly Malone from Springfield, Missouri, Mr. Keith Williams of St. Louis, Missouri, and Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, California. Before we get underway, I'd like to point out the rules of tonight's crime quiz. To each contestant who finds the murderer and the correct clue, Rainier Brewing Company will pay a $50 savings bond. If our amateur detectives find the murderer but do not have the correct clue, they receive a $25 savings bond. And here's something else. To each contestant solving tonight's mystery, Rainier also awards a special gold detective certificate, suitably framed. The winners of this award rate the honor of joining the ranks of expert amateur detectives. And now, Inspector Burke has given me the basic evidence in tonight's mystery. Each contestant will be asked several questions. For answering correctly, Rainier Brewing Company will pay $5 in savings stamps. Now... Let's review this evidence. First of all, here is Mr. Irwin Hershon. Is that the correct pronunciation, Mr. Hershon? That's correct. All right, fine. Here is your question. The victim, Dave Moss, was shot and killed. At approximately what time did the medical examiner establish his death? Between uh, 3 and 4 o'clock. 2 and 4, I think. Between 2 and 4? No, it couldn't have been 2 and 4. It was... Take your between, time. Between uh, about 2.30 and... Of three and four o'clock. Well, I'm sorry, old man, if you had said between four and four fifteen, you would have had it right on the nose. Better luck next time, and let's talk to Mrs. Molly Malone now. Mrs. Malone, the ballistics bureau identified the two slugs that caused the victim's death. What caliber were these two bullets? Thirty-two you know? Smith and Wesson. Thirty-two. I see you are consulting all the data you have there. Very good. That's the way. Give this thorough. I knew the time he was killed. Too. You did? Great. Well, I'm sorry, but we asked that the young man. But now here. <laughs> All right, you know so Maybe much, I Mrs. I won't know Mo the next one. I'll bet you will. Uh, do you know what make the gun was? Smith and Wesson. Oh, how easy. Well, oh, I'm sorry we can only give you $5 for all this information. $5 in saving stamps, but you'll be back again and get some more money, we hope. Now, here is Mr. Keith Williams. Mr. Williams, you're quite a big boy. How tall are you? Uh, six feet, three and a half. Six, three and a half, and you are from St. Louis, eh? That's correct. And I see you're with the amphibious forces in the Navy, right? That's right. Here's your question. The receptionist, Ruth, found out Mrs. Swope carried her savings with her. How much money did Mrs. Swope have? $500. That's a lot of coconuts, isn't it? That's certainly Good. Right. You get $5 for giving us the correct answer, Mr. Williams. Now, Mrs. Rita Hatton, if you please. Shortly after 4 p.m., Hubert Collins was picked up by the police. How much money did Hubert have in his possession? Fifty. Do you know where he got said fifty? From Moss. From Moss. He, he sort of borrowed it in a... Rather blackmailed the money from Dave Moss, didn't he? Yeah. But you get $5 in saving stamps from Rainier with our very hearty congratulations, Miss Hatton. Now here is uh, Irvin Horshawn once more. The victim's body was found by Charlie Reed and the girl Ruth. At about what time did this happen? At uh, quarter to five. A quarter to five, I would say, would be very close to it. A few minutes before 5 p.m., uh... Where did these two claim they were at the time of the killing? They were at a movie. And five dollars to you, sir, courtesy of Rainier. Very good. Mrs. Malone, once more. Mrs. Malone, I see you have the books at hand again here. <laughs> You're studying your Gladstone, I see. Here is your question. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? Look it up. Take plenty of time. Oh, let's go ahead. That's on page four, I think, Mrs. Malone. What? This is, uh, we're, we're discussing Dave Moss. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw him alive? That might be in the footnotes there. Do you want to look for it? Have we got it? No. At 2.30, uh, he pulled a gun on Dave Moss. Yeah. Yeah. He pulled a gun on Collins at 2.30. But now we want to know when, uh, when Bailey's... That's the wrong page. Yeah, wrong page. Now the question, I re... May I repeat the question? Granted. Here is the question. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? Is your secretary here? We could no. send... No. Uh, Mrs. Malone has it all written down on the back of old envelopes, laundry bills, everything. No. Haven't got it? Would you care to make a, a stab in the dark? When did... Now, think this over. You, you heard the story. When did Bill Bailey say he last saw Dave Moss alive? 
Guess I don't know that one. Well, I'm sorry. It was in the morning when Moss and Charlie Reed forced him out of the office at the point of a gun. Too bad. Now, Keith Williams again. When Bill Bailey was tossed out of the Song Shark's office, did he have the printed copies of his song with him? No. Where were these songs? They're in the desk drawer. You are right. Five dollars more to you, young man. Now, Miss Rita Hatton, please. A nice hand for Mr. Williams. Good. Miss Hatton, Mrs. Hatton, rather. Bailey's girlfriend, Shirley Hobson, came to police headquarters with him. Shirley brought Bill's birthday present with her. What was this present? His song. Oh, what a present. Five dollars to you, young lady. Very good. And now let's see what this evidence revealed to you. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Inspector Burke to check the papers each amateur detective received at the start of tonight's mystery on which to write who they think committed the crime and the one clue that reveals the criminal. Thank you, Larry. Well, I've checked the deductions of each of our amateur detectives, and I find that Mrs. Molly Malone of Springfield, uh, Missouri, said that Charlie Reed was the murderer. I'm sorry to say that she's wrong. Uh, Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, California, said uh, also that Charlie Reed was the murderer. I'm sorry to say that she is wrong. However, Keith P. Williams of Clayton, Missouri, and uh, Irwin P. Hershon of Hollywood, California, both said that Bill Bailey was the murderer, and they're absolutely correct, and both also gave the correct clue. Now let's see exactly what happened. We held Bill Bailey for the murder of the song shark, Dave Moss. According to Bailey's story, he claimed the last time he saw Dave Moss alive was on the morning of the murder, when Moss and Charlie Reed forced him to leave the office at the point of a gun. Now, immediately after Bailey left the Song Shark's office, the two swindlers looked in Moss's desk and found the 12 printed copies of Bill's song. Yet later, when Bailey's girlfriend, uh, Shirley Hobson, appeared at police headquarters with Bailey, Shirley had all 12 copies of this song. Unwittingly, and in a state of righteous indignation, Shirley gave Bill away. Because only by returning to Moss's office at a time later than he claimed could Bill have obtained these songs. It was this obvious slip-up that trapped Bill Bailey. Shortly before 4 p.m., Bailey returned to the office, demanded his songs. When Moss refused, Bailey started taking the place apart looking for his songs. Moss threatened Bailey with the gun. In the struggle that followed, Moss was shot and killed. Hurriedly, uh, continuing his search... Bailey finally found his songs, left the office, taking the murder weapon with him. Bill Bailey pleaded self-defense. Hubert Collins was held for the attempted robbery of the store he worked in and wounding the patrolman. Charlie Reed and Ruth were arrested by the Bunko Squad. Their racket was exposed and smashed. Thank you, Inspector. And so tonight we find that Mrs. Molly Malone of Springfield, Missouri, has won $5 in saving stamps. Mrs. Rita Hatton of Los Angeles, $10 in saving stamps. We have two first prize winners tonight, Mr. Irwin B. Hershon of Hollywood and Keith P. Williams of Clayton, Missouri. They each receive a $50, $50 in savings bond, won $5 in saving stamps, and Keith Williams, $10 in saving stamps. Congratulations. And each of the winners bring their awards a special gold detective certificate honoring our guest as expert amateur detective. And now, Inspector, what about next week's story? Next week's story, Larry, is about an innocent witness to one of the strangest cases on record. Threatened, terrified for his life, this person came to the police and revealed a fantastic plot. What this strange plot was will be told in the mystery of the startling secret. I'll see you then. Good night, everyone. Good night, Inspector. So we bring to a close another Inspector Burke mystery drama, starring William Gargan and brought to you by Rainier Brewing Company of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Brewers of Rainier Club Extra Pale Beer and Rainier Old Stock Ale. All characters and incidents used on this program are fictitious. Any resemblance to actual persons or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Larry Keating saying good night for Rainier Brewing Company and inviting you to listen in again at the same time next week. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.